stay tuned for Nero Wolf. If the chimes shudder a little on Sunday afternoon, well, they know there's mystery in store Sunday with men of action like Mike Waring, better known as the Falcon, who brings his fearless and romantic touch to the solution of another mystery. After the Falcon, it's high adventure. Then the big guy steps in. The new private eye, Charlie Wilde, concludes with a few casual homicides. The chimes mean mystery and action this Sunday afternoon on NBC. Transcribed. My boss is the smartest and the stubbornest, the fattest and the laziest, the cleverest and the craziest, the most extravagant detective in the world, Nero Wolf. <laughs> It's the adventure of Stamped for Murder with that brilliant, eccentric, private detective, orchid fancier and gargantuan gourmet, Nero Wolfe, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Instructions for this morning, Archie. Your notebook, please. First, Mr. Salen's back. Inform him that the Long Island peafowl he sent were most unsatisfactory. Peafowl's breast flesh is not sweet and tender unless it is well protected from all alarms, especially from the air, to prevent nervousness. Long Island is full of airplanes. Look, Mr. Wolf, I... I shall uh... want a dozen chickens that have been raised on bluebirds and a fresh-killed lamb for tomorrow. Uh, Mr. Wolf, please listen, there's... Uh... Mr. Goodwin, be quiet, and then dinner on the following day becomes a problem. Mr. Wolf, dinner any day is going to be a problem if we don't pay Sausenbach's bill. And pay it. With what? The bank account's empty. Ridiculous. They were $4,000 yesterday. But you bought that shipment of orchid bobs from wine old Gluckner. Mr. Wolf, we need money. You've got to stop eating and drinking beer long enough to earn some... Phew, <laughs> you're an alarmist. Will you, for the love of heaven, stop turning down clients and turn an honest dollar? I've got a couple of prospects right outside the door. Send them away. No, sir. Send them away. Tell them I've gone to Egypt. Nothing doing, sir. Confound you, Archie. Obey order. Send them away. Miss Kent, Mr. Rodman, come in, please. Thank you. you. Confound you, Archie. You're mutinous. Yes, sir, and you're stuck with it. This is Miss Gloria Kent and Mr. Rodman. They arrived as advertised with a pressing problem. Good morning. You people are here by sufferance only. I shall speak to Mr. Goodwin about it later. Yes, indeed. I don't like pressing problems, Miss Kent. What are yours? My father. Indeed? I'm in a court of domestic relations, Miss Kent. What did your father do? Beat you? Withhold your earnings? Discourage your suitors? Mr. Goodwin should have informed you this office does not undertake cases involving marital or family problems. But that's not... If Mr. Goodwin had not been beguiled by your pretty face... He might have warned you and avoided this embarrassment to you and annoyance to me. Now, 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 take it easy, take it easy. How many times have I told you you don't know how to handle women? Then suppose you let Miss Kent handle me. Well, it's simply this, Mr. Wolf. I had some money my mother left me. My father's just spent it without my permission. I want it back without a scandal. Thanks, Miss Kent. How much? How spent? Ten thousand dollars. Father bought a treasure map. Indeed, from whom? A pair of swindlers named Cross and Halleck. They've driven him crazy, talking about fortunes salvaged from the SS this and the SS that. He's got a map and old letters he studies. He's childish. Many fortunes have been recovered. Many more are weight on the sea bottom. How do you know your father has been duped? Well, I know. You do, Mr. Rodman. Yes. Cross and Halleck bought some old letters for me, written by my grandfather from Hawaii. They used them to manufacture the map and evidence. And that's what they sold to Kent. Father thought he was being so clever. He had the paper analyzed. Of course, the document research laboratory said the letters were genuine. They were. But something new had been added. I'd have never known if Mr. Rodman hadn't told me. You are a party to the swindle, Mr. Rodman? I was not. I never knew what they were up to. Mr. Wolf, you've got to help me. I can't do anything with Father. I can't convince him. Even Mr. Rodman can't... No, Miss Kent, I am sorry. This is not for me. But you must. You must. Not in my office, madam. No tears. Please, please, Archie, stop her. Okay, okay, okay. Archie, when Miss Kent has finished her disgraceful exhibition, show them out. How dare you walk out on the... Easy, easy, easy. I know him. I know him. You don't. He gets into a panic when women cry, or else he's curious about what Fritz is cooking for lunch. Now, just uh, wait a minute, please. 
Oh, aren't you ashamed of yourself walking out like that on that poor kid? That hysterical gamma. <laughs> She's lost all of her money. She needs help. I charge high fees, Archie. So charge a small fee. Do you want her to starve? Good heavens. Starve? How monstrous. I'm not kidding. While you'll be in here smelling your dinner, she and her father will be starving. I thought you were bringing me a paying client. Well, this is different. She's, uh... Beautiful. Archie, you're impossible. Oh, very well. Go back into them. Get names, addresses, facts. I am not committed to Miss Kent's case, but we'll see. Be a tribute I pay for your weakness for a pretty face. Rodman and Gloria Kent were gone, however... So all I had were the few facts they'd given me before they met Wolf. I felt guilty about that when he came back into the office and sat down in his specially built chair. He closed his eyes and I glared at him. Well, how much of you is awake? Mr. Wolf? Uh. Well, they disappeared. Did you tell me you were going to help this girl just to get her out of the office or did you mean it? You're a gadfly. No, sir. No, sir. You made a promise and you're stuck with it. What did you get from Rodman? Name, address, occupation. He's a librarian, that's all. Very careless, Archie. You missed a significant point. Such as, uh... How did Rodman discover the letters he sold were being altered by forgery? And used for swindle. How did he locate the dupe, Mr. Kent? Uh, I guess you're right. I'll ask him next time. But, uh, what about now? Are you going to get Gloria's money back? I assume you call Miss Kent Gloria solely in order to annoy me. It does. Stop it. Get Cross and Halleck. On my way. You'll find them at the Hotel Bogart. <laughs> Wrong, sir. According to my notes, their address is... Never mind their address. The Hotel Bogart is the headquarters for successful confidence tricksters. They celebrate their victories there while the money lasts. You will possibly find Cross and Haddock drinking whiskey or lunching. Probably both. <laughs> I located Cross and Halleck in the hotel bar and lured them back to our place on 35th Street. Wolf was sitting behind his desk with his hands crossed on his impressive middle, at peace with his lunch and the world when I ushered them in. He sat bolt upright and scorched me with a look. Good afternoon, Mr. Wolf. The tall one's name is Cross, the short one is Halleck. They uh, want to help me invest my money. Gentlemen, Mr. Nero Wolf. Huh? Ooh. You're a wolf. Hey, what is this? Confound you, Archie. How drunk are they? Not too drunk for business. Let's get out of here. Come on. Wait a minute. Chill, duck, you want me to keep him here, Mr. Wolf? Not by violence, Archie. Come back here, gentlemen. Unless you want seven years in the state penitentiary. Unless what? You got nothing on us, Wolf. Nothing. I have the Kent case. The Kent? That's a laugh. We're sitting pretty. Sitting pretty. You are not, sir. You imagine you possess legal immunity. Mr. Kent believes you are grotesque balderdash and will not sue for fraud. Miss Kent cannot sue because she is reluctant to accuse her father of wrongfully obtaining her money. Ergo, you think you are invulnerable. Now, listen. But you forget me. I'm a detective with a fee to earn. A big fee. Quiet, Archie. I am determined to get that fee. Therefore, as Miss Kent's agent, I can and will bring action against you. I'm indifferent to her tears... Or her father's disgrace. I'm indifferent to anything outside of money. You will return the $10,000 to me at once, sir, or you'll be in jail by morning. You mean that? I do, Mr. Cross. Alec, yeah. come here. Yeah. Come on, honey. Uh, okay. Here, Mr. Wolf. Alec and I have decided we don't want to get in any trouble with you. Here's your ten grand. Uh, let's have it. Give the dough to Kent, Mr. Wolf, and get the letters and map back for us. You've got a reputation for being tricky, but honest. We trust you. Come on, Alec, let's go. <laughs> well, how about that? Preposterous. No, sir. Take a look. $10,000, genuine coin of the realm. That man crosses a fool. Does he imagine I ain't to be fooled so easily? What do you mean he left the money? He surrendered too quickly, Archie. Too easily. And that money in the envelope he was carrying all ready to refund. Why? Well, maybe he's got a better sucker. I heard him mention a Ben Sanford. Nonsense. Does he need Kent's forged letters and map to cheat this Ben Sanford? Couldn't he prepare another set? Uh, I guess you're right. Something's fishy. 
In any event, it's no concern of mine, thank heaven. Uh, why not? I'm not committed to Miss Kent in any way. As a favor to you, I undertook to regain her money. I have done that. You may take it back to her and obtain the forged papers in return. But, uh... Silence, Mr. Goodwin. Go to your redhead charmer. Leave me in peace. I intend to spend this afternoon with my new world atlas. I left him 3,000 miles up the Amazon with his magnifying glass and drove up to East 69th Street. The Kent house was a broken-down little brownstone, and as I went up the stoop, the door opened and Gloria Kent burst out like a skyrocket. Hey, Miss Kent, easy, easy. Let go of me. Let go. What's wrong? What's wrong? Wrong. Wrong. Nothing is wrong. Nothing at all. Well, how about seeing your father? You want to see my father? Come inside. Oh, for the love of heaven. Come inside, Mr. Gooden. I'll introduce you. He's in a back room. Come right through the living room. What else came through this living room? A hurricane? No, Mr. Goodwin. Something else. There's my father, Mr. Goodwin. What in the devil? He's dead. His throat's cut. Father, this is Archie Goodwin from Nero Wolf's office. He and his boss refused to help while they could. Maybe he can help you now. Stop it. All I'm good for now is revenge. That's all, Stop Archie. it. Stop it and look at me. When did it happen? I don't know. When did you find him? Just now. Keep looking at me. Who went through this house like a hurricane? You? No. Where did you go after you left the office? To the laboratory. What lab? Document research. The place that checked the map. How long were you there? Until an hour ago. I was with Mr. Rodman. Keep looking at me. And then? I had lunch. With Rodman? Alone. And then I came home. All right. All right, now listen to me. I want you to go to Mr. Wolf's house right now. Have you got cab there? Yes. All right, take a cab. I've got to stay here, but I'll call Mr. Wolf and tell him you're on the way. Now get. I called Wolf. Told him everything, and he instructed me to advise Inspector Kramer, who arrived with the homicide squad. I gave the inspector everything while the squad photographed and measured, print dusted and detected. At 3.30, Kramer took me back to the house on 35th Street for a fight with Wolf. It's a great story, Wolf. Great. Kent buys a phony treasure map. Everybody knows it's phony except Kent. But Cross and Halleck try to buy it back, and Kent gets himself murdered. Did you find the map and let us in the house, Inspector? No, no, I didn't. The killer was after the map. The phony map? Certainly. Why? Well, if we knew that, we would know why Cross and Halleck so willingly paid back the money and why Kent was murdered. Maybe it's not phony. I'd better see the girl now. Oh, you fancy her for the murder? Well, I'll know after I ask a few questions. Tonight. She's had a shock, Mr. Kramer. She needs rest. Look, Wolf, I want her. Why bother with her when there's so much to be done? Yes, such as? Cross and Halleck, find them. And the mystery man they spoke of, Ben Sanford. These are the men you want now, not this poor, overwrought girl. Yeah. All right. The girl will be here for questioning tonight, though, huh? Tonight, Mr. Kramer. Okay. You'll hear from me later on. <laughs> well, you buffaloed him out of that, okay. Say, uh, why don't you want her questioned? Is she guilty? I don't know. Well, what did she say when she got here? She said nothing. She never arrived. She never what? She never arrived. Well, then why did you tell Kramer she was resting? Would he have believed the truth? <laughs> she must be found. More important, we must learn why Forge letters and Forge map produces turmoil. Find the killer and you find the map. You said so. I said the reverse, which is an altogether different statement. Archie, I want a photograph of that map. Get it. Oh, sure, sure. Any particular camera you want me to use? You'll find a photograph of 200 Vanderbilt Street. Are you kidding? The lab cannot check the authenticity of old papers without photographing them in ultraviolet light, infrared light, and so on. If this document research lab has examined those papers... They will have photographs. Get them. He got out of his chair and waddled back to the house elevator. It was four o'clock and time for his regular afternoon session with the orchids. I drove down to the document research laboratory on Vanderbilt and got such a shock that I grabbed the office phone and dialed Wolf at once. Mrs. 
Nero Wolf. Mr. Wolf, Archie here. What's the matter? Are you lost? No, sir. No, sir, but I found something. Photographs? No, Mr. Wolf. I don't think you'll ever see any photographs of the Kent map. I don't think any were taken. Indeed. But uh, guess who runs the document research laboratory? No, 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 no. Don't guess. You probably know. A man named Ben Sanford, and he's sitting right here looking at me. Bring him home with you. Home? But it's four in the afternoon. This is the sacred hour when you pray over your orchids. And Mr. Sanford can join the ceremony. Hey, how about this place? How about it? There must be a million flowers up here. <laughs> no, not flowers. Orchids only. Mr. Wolf has 10,000 plants. <whistles> never saw anything like it. And you never will again, brother. Hey, uh, what, uh, what kind is that on the bench? Oh, that. That's our pride and joy. Odontoglossum harianum. Above them, the Van Petersirana. And the pink ones are the Silogiani uh, panderatas. Now, the large object, mulching flower pots, is Nero Wolf. Mr. Wolf, Ben Sanford. Good afternoon, sir. Hi. I came along to be obliging. I've got nothing to say about anything. How much have you offered Cross and Halleck for their treasure map? No comment. Mr. Sanford, I'm going to make some assumptions. I assume that you are not, in fact, a document expert, but an accessory to the fraud of Halleck and Cross. No comment. And you actually prepare fraudulent maps for those swindlers. And then in the guise of an expert, guarantee their authenticity. No comment. Now this you must answer. You did guarantee the authenticity of the map and let us can't bought. It's on record. All right, I did. Then will you admit they were forged? What are you, a comic? No. You guarantee the value of the Kent map? Yes. As an expert? Yes. Then you've convicted yourself of murder. Murder? What is this? Mr. Kent was murdered, sir. Evidently for the map and letters he bought. But of all persons involved, you alone believe in the value of the map. No one else does. Therefore, you alone would have murdered Kent for the map. For the love of... Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Chew it over, brother. Chew it over. Either way, he's got you. Okay. Okay, you... You want me to level? Here it is. Level, Archie. Okay, boss. Thief-type talk. It means tell the truth. It's like you say, the letters were bought from Rodman. I forged the map and evidence on them. I guarantee them to Kent, the swindle. The letters are without value? Oh, sure, they're old, that's all, from 1851. Just tired family gossip and stuff. Indeed. There we have the problem again, Archie. Mr. Kent is swindled with a map and letters that are known to be worthless. He alone believes the fantasy of the treasure. There isn't any treasure, never was. Yet Cross and Halleck refunded the swindle money so eagerly. It is obvious they want those worthless documents back badly. Someone else wants them so bad he murders Mr. Kent. Why? I don't know. Ah, uh, gee, we must find the girl. There's a chance she turned to Mr. Rodman for refuge. I'm sorry, you'll have to go there at once. If the girl isn't there, bring Rodman. Yes? Hello, Rodman. Remember me? I'm Archie Goodwin from Nero Wolf's office. Oh. Oh, yes, of course. I came to get Gloria Kent. There's been a change in plans. Tell her to come out, please. Gloria? Well, she's not here. Why should she be? Haven't you heard? Heard what? Well, I guess you'd better come down and see Wolf. Uh, Mr. Goodwin, I'm afraid I can't. I'm rather busy. Look, Rodman, maybe you ought to know. Old man Kent was murdered. What? Yes. Yes, just after you and Gloria left us. Kent murdered? Well, uh, but this is awful, Mr. Goodwin. You it's... want to see Mr. Wolf now? Get your hat. Murder. Well, believe me, I never wanted this. I, I'm going to tell Nero Wolf the whole mess. Every word of it. Okay, then. Come on, let's go. Oh, yes, of course. Just a minute. I'll get my hat in the bedroom. Murdered? Kent, I never dreamed. Oh. Come on, Rodman. Come on, Rodman. Come on. What? I didn't hear you. Oh, Rodman. What the... Oh, Rodman. Oh, Rodman. Good Lord. What next? Come on, come on. Is it near a wolf? Archie here. We've had a tough break. 
Yes? While I was waiting for Rodman at the front door, he went into the bedroom for his hat. The killer was there. How do you know? He cut Rodman's throat. Kill. The back window was open. It's a ground floor apartment. He was out and gone before I had a chance. Archie, where were your wits? Let me alone. I've had a man murdered 20 feet from me. You think I'm cheering? Mr. Kramer is here, and he has news for us, Archie. He could not locate Cross and Halleck in their apartment. They had not been home all day. The maid informed him that she was waiting for her weekly salary. Well, so what? She was most angry and peppery, Mr. Kramer informs me. Red pepper? Exactly. Okay. Okay, maybe I know what you mean. I'll try to deliver the goods this time. Goodbye. I drove down to the apartment house on Gramercy Square where Cross and Halleck lived, took the elevator up to the 10th floor, found the right door, and slipped in with a pass key. Come on out. Come out wherever you are. I know you're in here. You fooled Kramer pretending to be the maid, but you didn't fool Wolf. You'd better... Sorry! Cut it out! Cut it out, you idiot! Lay off! No. Yes, Archie, Archie, you don't... Archie Goodwin from Nero Wolf's office. Remember me? Go. Give me the gun, Gloria. Give it to me. Oh, that's right. Who, uh, Who did you think I was? Alec. Oh, brilliant. So Wolf figured you out, huh? Oh, you are a brave girl. They killed your father. You came up here and waited for them. You were going to kill them right back, huh? Oh, that red-headed temper. And you bluffed Kramer into thinking you were the maid. I had to do something. It was the only thing I could think of. To come here and kill him. Well, you're coming home with Archie. And just remember one thing. When Wolf's working for you, don't try to do any thinking. It only gets in Wolf's way. I got Gloria Kent back to the house at 7 o'clock. I parked the car, brought her into the office, and got the shock of my life. There was a convention on. Wolf was there with Inspector Kramer representing the cops. Cross, Halleck, and Sanford were there representing the crooks. When Kramer saw Gloria, he scowled first at her... And then at Wolf. So it was a slick one after all, Wolf. You didn't have the girl. You had no intention of producing her. Please, Mr. Kramer, that can wait. There are other matters more important. I dine at eight. That leaves me one hour to solve your murders. Murders? More than one? Yes, two. Elmer Rodman. I haven't good one if you... Please, Mr. Kramer, not now. First, Miss Kent. Good evening, Miss Kent. I presume you have met these gentlemen, Cross, Halleck, and Sanford? I... Yeah, I'll take your purse, please. Huh? Well, why? I... Uh, don't think me as naive as Mr. Goodwin, miss. When you left your home after the murder of your father, you took the map and letters with you. They are in your purse well, now. That's true. Archie, the purse. Thank you. We have here an interesting situation. There exists some old letters and map, forged and fraudulent. They're worth $10,000 and more to Cross and Halleck and worth two murders to a killer. Why? There must be something of great value in the letters. Yes, such as? Something which Mr. Sanford could not see, although he worked on the document closely. Yet something which could be made manifest. What is the answer, Miss Kent? You know it? I swear I don't. Secret writing, Archie. Bring the chafing dish from the dining room. Right. Secret writing? I saw nothing when I worked on those letters. Naturally, Mr. Sanford, the writing is invisible. The heat is an agent. Makes most forms of secret writing visible. The chafing dish, boss. Thank you, Archie. Place it before me and light it. Right. Now I open Miss Kent's purse. From it, you see, I withdraw these ancient letters which he took from her house after her father's murder. That's not true. Archie. That's enough, Gloria. That's enough. From now on, you just listen. We remove the letters from the envelope and toast them gently. Secret ink vintage, 1851, will easily succumb to the agency of heat. Careful. Those envelopes will catch fire. Uh, hey, 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 they're caught. Don't be upset, Mr. Cross, Mr. Halleck. The envelopes! Uh. They'll burn safely in the dish. We can concentrate on the writing. Watch closely. I don't want to be accused of trickery. You fat fool. The envelopes are everything. Put them out, Sanford. Don't sit there. Put them out. Why, Mr. Halleck? Well, the stamps, the missionaries, they're worth a fortune. The missionaries? Of course. You know that. 
Mr. Cross knows. So does Mr. Sanford, right? Yeah, yeah. Of course, Sanford knows, you old fool. Let me... Uh, Mr. Sanford is not alarmed. Why not, sir? I don't know what you're talking about. Fifty or a hundred thousand dollars is burning before your eyes, Mr. Sanford. Cross and Halleck are burning their fingers, putting out the flaming envelopes. And you sit there quite indifferently. Why? Well, I've... Uh... I, you know the value of the missionary stamps on the letters you bought from Rodman. But you know these aren't the real letters. Isn't that it? Not the real letters? I told you I'm tough to crack, Wolf. You didn't fool me with those dummies. Dummies? How do you know? Mr. Cross didn't know. Mr. Haddock didn't know. How did you? Well, I... uh... I'll tell you, sir. Only one man could know I was framing Miss Kent as a decoy. Only one man could know I prepared these dummy letters and pretended to take them from her purse. And that is the killer. The man who murdered her father... And stole the map and letters this morning. You sir, Mr. Sanford. Well, I'll be... Mr. Kramer, there's your killer. You'll find the missing map and letters on him or concealed in his home or office. You won't need the evidence anyway. Look at his face. He's self-confessed. Self-confessed like fun? He was booby-trapped. <laughs> No, Mr. Craner. Not a complicated case, really. Very simple. Elmer Rodman sold a packet of old family letters to the swindlers for a small sum. They used the letters to perpetrate their fraud on Miss Kent's father. And the stamps on the letters were valuable? They were a special Hawaiian issue 1851, Miss Kent. Nicknamed missionaries, because missionaries used them for writing home. They are extremely rare stamps worth upward of $25,000 each. Hey, no wonder they were worth two murders. We found five of them on Sanford. Excellent. Somewhere or other, Rodman discovered the value of the stamps after he sold the letters. In his effort to get them back, he communicated his discovery to the swindlers, Cross, Halleck, and Sanford. So that's why they refunded the money so fast. Precisely. In an effort to have the sale rescinded. Rodman sought out Kent and tried to convince him of the fraud. Alas, he would not listen to the truth, Mr. Kramer. Oh, I get it. And while the others were hassling around, Sanford tried to steal a march and quietly resorted to murder. Ah, uh, there you have it. Ha-ha! Great job, boss, great job. So Gloria not only gets her ten grand back, but uh, five times twenty-five, which is about a hundred and twenty-five thousand worth of goodies... Now, figuring your rates by the hour, that means you've done a gratis job worth about... Yes, um... Ken. I did not know what I demand a large fee for what I've done. I will not go back on my word. But I can beg for a favor. I'll only be too happy to... Wait, wait, wait. I asked something that would not be easy to grant. What is it? Will you use your red hair, your pretty face, your admirable figure, and your ample fortune to lure Mr. Goodwin away from this house tonight... I would like to enjoy my dinner in peace. That won't be difficult, Mr. Wolf. <laughs> Let's have an understanding right now, Gloria. Difficult for you or for me? I'll be delighted. <laughs> Indeed. To spend an evening with Mr. Goodwin, there is only one word for you, Miss Kent. Intrepid. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's story by Alfred Bester was based on the famous characters created by Rex Stout, produced by Edwin Fadiman, and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Wally Mayer as Archie Goodwin, and Gene Bates, Howard McNair, Jay Novello, Larry Dobkin, Bill Johnstone, and Herb Vigran. Music by Joseph Enos. Next week, at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Careworn Cup. Don Stanley speaking. The preceding was transcribed. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The chimes ring for Dennis Day and Judy Canova tomorrow night on NBC. Also, Judy Canova prepares to go operatic tomorrow because her special guest is Itzio Pinza. This is Chester William Bendix Riley. The man called X follows on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf. Saturday Night Chimes on NBC mean a full hour of fun with Dennis Day and Judy Canova. Dennis always appears perplexed and bewildered. 
But one thing that doesn't perplex him is how to make a popular ballad come to life in his thrilling tenor voice. And there's music also on the Judy Canova show, plus comedy in the mischievous Canova manner. That's Judy Canova and Dennis Day, tomorrow night over most NBC stations. My boss is the smartest and the stubbornest, the fattest and the laziest, the cleverest and the craziest, the most extravagant detective in the world, Nero Wolf. <laughs> It's the transcribed adventure of The Case of the Careworn Cuff with that brilliant, eccentric private detective, orchid fancier, and gargantuan gourmet, Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> The place is Nero Wolfe's office. At the moment, the world's greatest motionless detective is sitting in the chair which was built especially to support his 300 pounds. His eyes are closed, and he's making sounds through his nose. Archie. Archie. Archie! Yes, Mr. Wolf, what is it? The phone, if you please, Mr. Goodwin. But it's on your desk, only eight and three-quarter inches from your left elbow. All you have to do is lean forward. Found it, Archie. What do you think I am, an athlete? Hello. No, wrong number, mister. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Wolf, if that old phone awakened you. Wrong number, and I was not asleep. I was merely uh, concentrating. On what? We're out of work. There's nothing to concentrate on. May have escaped your errant attention, Archie. But there are other subjects for thought besides murder. Mm-hmm. Sure, blondes. And blondes. You're right at that, brunettes. Fooey. That's not a nice thing to say about any girl, even if she does happen to be a brunette. Archie. Yes, sir? Go away. You annoy me. Suppose I did. It would get your beer for you. Fritz. Tonight happens to be Fritz's night off. However, you can always get your beer for yourself. Don't be an idiot. There are exactly 23 steps between here and the kitchen. As you very well know, I abominate strenuous physical activity. 23 steps times two is 46. You could walk very slow. Nonsense. Now that you mention it, to... <clears throat> I happen to be mildly thirsty, Archie, would you? Now that I mention it, you'd better let the beer go for tonight. Why? Our stock is running low. You mean careless? I've been careful, because something else is also running low. What? Money? Fiddle sticks, there's plenty in the bank. Sure, but very little of it is yours. Mr. Wolf, do you remember that batch of orchids you bought last week? Of course I do, magnificent and very rare specimen. I got a magnificent bill for him this morning, too. It was uh, large? It was large. Mm -hmm. Confound it, Archie, I shall have to do some work. You turned down half a dozen cases in the last few weeks. One of them may still require me. Most of them hired other detectives. However, there is a Mr. Wenceslas who might still be in need. His problem is what? As I remember, he's being followed by midgets. <laughs> he wanted you to do something about it. Not, not that he minded the midgets so much. It was the elephants they were riding. The man needs a psychiatrist, not a detective. Anyone else? I can check my files, but I don't think... Ha <laughs> ha! Saved by the bell. Another cliche like that, and I shall sure... answer the phone yourself. Assassinate! You see what it is. Okay. Hello. Yes, Mr. Wolf is in. Yes, he'll be in. He always is. What? But. Hmm. That was a Mr. Charles Porter. He was in a hurry. He's on his way over right now. Should be here in ten minutes. Prospective client, I trust. A thousand dollars worth of prospective client. Splendid, Archie, my beer. Okay, but, uh, <clears throat> look, I'm not sure you're going to accept his offer. Indeed, what does he want me to do for his paltry fee? That's the point. If I heard him right, he wants you to do nothing. The door, Archie. Yes, sir. I hear it. Mr. Porter? Naturally, I'm Charles Porter. Who else would I be? It's a large field. Uh, never mind. Come on in. I'm Archie Goodwin. Where is Wolf? Mr. Wolf is in here. Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Porter. 
Good evening. Fat, aren't you? It's moderately noticeable. Out to your chair for Mr. Porter. Don't bother. I'm too impatient to sit. When I have business to take care of, I take care of it quickly. Very well. Send him out of the room. Mr. Goodwin, nonsense. He's my assistant. He remains. I don't like it. Archie, show Mr. Porter out. Now, wait. There's no need to get temperamental. Perhaps I'm a little abrupt. Rude. I'm a worried man. And impatient. You're wasting time, Mr. Porter. I suppose I am. The reason I came to you... It... Young man, what are you doing with that notebook? Getting ready to make marks in it. But... No, oh, never mind. Mr. Wolfe, you have a client named Dorothy Spencer. Have I? There's no need to be coy about it. I happen to know. Then you know. I want you to drop her. Drop her? Refuse to handle her case. Close the books on her. You know what I mean. Why should I? The girl has no money. I have. That doesn't answer my question. Perhaps this will. Appear to be a small package of dollar bills. It happens to be a thousand dollars. Archie, will you? I will. It is a thousand dollars. Thank you. Mr. Porter. Yes? You're paying me a thousand dollars in order that I refuse to act for Miss Spencer. Nothing more. That's right. What does she suspect you of? I said nothing about... Well, that is... You must know that as well as I do. Possibly, and nevertheless, what does she suspect you of? Uh, being a blackmailer. Whereas your occupation really is... I'm a musician. Pianist. I'm appearing nightly at the Windsor Hotel. Archie, have you made out a receipt for Mr. Porter? Yep. Give it to him and show him to the door. Okay. Mr. Porter? Mr. Wolf, I want your assurance that the entire affair is definitely finished. My association with Miss Spencer, you mean. You have my assurance that it is. You will forgive a classical illusion. The carver. Thank you. Good night. Mr. Wolf, I have a secret about Mr. Porter. He <laughs> smells. Some perfume or other. More important, his right coat cuff is more worn than his left cuff. And a cop happens to be a musical term, meaning start again from the beginning. Oh, Porter thought it meant finished. Therefore, Mr. Porter is a liar. His ignorance of common musical term indicates that he's not a musician. The worn right coat cuff, that he is an office worker. That's kind of leaping to a deduction. But even if Porter's a liar, Mr. Wolf, there is something else. He, uh, he paid you a thousand dollars to drop a client named Dorothy Spencer... Mr. Wolf, you never had a client with that name. Well, that's that. Dorothy Spencer is not in. Anyway, she's not answering her phone. Uh, Mr. Wolf, I said... I know what you said. Ah. That a comment? I'm worried. Mr. Porter may have assumed erroneously that Dorothy Spencer had employed or was intending to employ me. That does not explain why he lied about his occupation. Maybe he didn't lie. After all, your deductions could be wrong. Phew. Okay. Take care of that. Right now. I'm phoning her. Hello. Uh, Windsor Hotel? Get me the manager's office. Thanks. Ah, uh, could, could, could you tell me if a Charles Porter plays the piano, it's... Uh-huh. She sounds blonde. I see. Thanks a lot. What do you do after work? You... Oh, oh, so long. She goes home and beats her husband. About Porter, Archie. Bad news. He does play the piano at the Windsor in the move room. So where does that leave your deductions? Untouched, of course. Let me think. Hmm... Yes, naturally. Naturally what? I came to the conclusion that Mr. Porter was an office worker. We have just discovered that Mr. Porter is not an office worker, therefore... You were wrong. I am never wrong. Therefore, the man who is here is not Charles Porter. Mr. Wolf, do you think a man of your weight should climb out on a limb like that? Fiddlesticks. Look up Porter in the phone book and call him. Okay. Take a second. Uh-huh. Archie, the phone company's best friend. <clears throat> yep, here he is. 
What do I ask him? Um, there'll be no need to ask Mr. Porter anything. Just phone. You're the boss. Yeah. I have to say something to the guy. Hello. I'd like to speak to Charles Porter. So would you. Who's... Oh, Steppens, huh? Yeah, that's right, Archie. Oh. No, no, don't, don't, don't bother why I call it a coincidence. Why? You know who that was? No. That was Sergeant Stebbins, Sergeant Pearly Stebbins. I might add, as though you didn't know that Stebbins happens to be a sergeant in homicide. Indeed. You expected this. I still don't know what your conversation was about. It was about Charles Porter, who maybe was a liar, but who isn't going to tell any more lies, on account of he was just shot to death. Well, well, if it ain't Archie Goodwin. Come in, Goodwin. Thank you, Sergeant Stebbins. I've been expecting you. Oh, that's sweet of you to say that, Pearlie. <laughs> Why did you phone Porter? His right coat cuff was more worn out than his left. So for that, you had to kill him? No, actually, I killed him because he didn't know his duck couple. Hey. Yeah, hey. He don't look good anymore, eh? Guys who stop bullets with their face never look good. Pearlie, you've been robbed. I did. Hmm. That corpse is not Porter. <laughs> now, relax, Goodwin, relax. His fingerprints were on file and they check. His girlfriend says he's Porter. If he could get up and talk, he'd tell you he was Porter. And what makes you think he isn't? Well, because when he visited us earlier tonight, he looked different. Not much, but... You said girlfriend? Yes, I said girlfriend. She's in the next room mopping up. She kind of broke down when we brought her here. You brought her here? Now, don't tell me what her name is. Why shouldn't I? It's Spencer. Dorothy Spencer. Ooh. That's what I was afraid of. Sergeant, I... Oh. Ignore him. He comes with the woodwork. His name is Goodwin, Miss Spencer. Archie Goodwin. Find what you were looking for? What I was looking... Somebody's gone through this place like a minor league hurricane. You? What business is it of Of mine? None, maybe. On the other hand, Nero Wolf might have other ideas. Matter of fact, I'm sure he'd have. Miss Spencer, why don't you go see him? The address is 601 West 35th Street. I don't see why... You want your boyfriend's murderer found, don't you? Now, listen, Goodwin, the police are working on this. Sure, they'll see to it nobody harms a corpse. Goodbye, Miss Spencer. Don't forget that address, 601 West 35th Street. Believe it or not, you used to be a client of ours. Oh, Mr. Wolf, you're getting to be so brilliant, it's boring. Boy. <laughs> That is, um... Uh... All right, tonight you deserve it. I'll get you another can of beer. But this is the last one. Unless you promise to do some exercise, like, uh... Like maybe standing up and sitting down five minutes a day. Thank you. <sighs> and why should I indulge in such idiotic behavior? Well, after a while, you might be able to see your shoes. I've already seen them. Oh, that was 20 years ago. Things have changed. No more buttons. Hey, that must be Dorothy Spencer. Hmm, she's undoubtedly young and beautiful. You deduced that from the way she pressed the buzzer? I deduced that from the gleam in your eye, bah. Bah, all you want. I'm going to keep that gleam shining. Hello, Miss Spencer. Come in. Thank you. Mr. Wolf. Is the large sitting down gentleman behind the desk? This is Dorothy Spencer, Mr. Wolf. You will forgive me not rising. It is due to a necessary conservation of energy rather than rudeness. Archie, a chair. Sure. Here you are, Miss Spencer. Thanks. Now then, Miss Spencer, have the police found anything but dust in Mr. Porter's closet? I... no. You were engaged to Mr. Porter? I was. That ring you're wearing, he gave it you? Yes. May I see it? Well... All right. Here. Thank you. Hmm, expensive. Very expensive. You may have it back. Miss Spencer, why are you marrying Charles Porter? I, I loved him. Hooey. Mr. Porter, according to Archie's description, was twice your age with considerably less than half your attractiveness. Love may perhaps be blind, but it is not astigmatic. I, I don't know what you mean. What were you searching for under the nose of the police? Nothing. Nothing at all. How did your fiancé earn his money? He played the piano at the... Boy, what he earned there in a year wouldn't begin to pay for the ring he gave you. Would you like to try again? 
I don't know how he made his money. I suggest that you do. I suggest that he earned money by the same method that he induced you to consider marrying him. Blackmail. Oh, but... Why was he blackmailing you? Old letters I'd written when I was too young to know any better. Your motives for murdering Porter would be twofold, then. Recovery of blackmail material and the avoidance of marriage to a man you dislike. I didn't kill Charles. No doorbell, Archie. Get Miss Spencer into the kitchen once. Must be the police. Yeah, let's go, Miss Spencer. Right through that door. And stay there until I call you. Front door, Archie. Uh, Mr. Wolf, do I know Dorothy Spencer's here? You know nothing. A simple role for you to play. Uh, I haven't got time to resent that insult right now, but wait until the next time you drop a collar button. Well, bless my soul, if it isn't dear old Inspector Kramer. How is the homicide department? Where's Wolf? Big surprise. He's sitting. Mr. Wolf. Good evening, Inspector. Where's Dorothy Spencer? This is not the Bureau of Missing Persons. The district attorney would like to talk to her. I should tell her so the next time we meet. Yeah, that could be right now. She's in this house. I don't see her. Mind if I look around for myself? You have a search warrant, of course. Uh, so happens, no, but... Uh... Archie, the inspector's leaving. Okay, I'm leaving. I suppose by the time I get back with a warrant, she'll be in Hoboken. Hoboken? Where's that? Look, Wolf, you can go too far. One of these days, you won't be able to talk yourself out of a... I... Ah... Trail me to the door, Goodwin, to show what a good detective you are. Oh, Inspector Kramer doesn't love us anymore. Unfortunate. Archie, take Miss Spencer to a respectable hotel. Register her under an assumed name. She is to stay there until notified otherwise. Luckily, the good inspector neglected to inform us that she was the leading suspect in a murder case. Hence, we are not accessories after the fact. And I don't want her arrested for murder as yet. Her beauty has won you over. Oh, you will then return here immediately. Okay. What are you going to be doing in the meanwhile? I, Archie, uh, shall be thinking. <laughs> Archie? No. No, not Archie. Ah, our impatient and non-musical friend came in through the window. How are you, Mr... Not Porter, of course. Where's the girl? Question is beginning to bore me. I don't know. I think she's here. So did the police. I might add that they were slightly closer to the truth. Incidentally, what makes you think she was Porter's accomplice? She must have been. Nonsense, she wasn't. Porter was blackmailing her. Just as he was blackmailing you. In her case, it was letters. In yours, a previous criminal record, perhaps, that your employers might be interested in. I want to know where she is. Maybe this would help you remember. Good heavens, don't find a pistol at me. It annoys me. Ah, the police, I should think, open the door for them like a good fellow. Oh, no. I'm leaving. But if I don't find that girl, I'll be back. Knock the blasted thing down if it isn't open. All right, well, I've got the search warrant. Oh, so no doubt a fine tooth comb. Bah. By the way, Inspector. All right, boys, cover the house. All right, Inspector. Yeah, what did you want? As your men go through the house, will you have one of them shut the back window? I've just had a burglar, and I suspect he left it open. Unless the matter is attended to, the house might be filled with <laughs> fresh air. Yeah, what's the matter with that? Fresh air, deadly poison. It clogs the lungs. And may I point out that the warrant you're clutching in your hot little hand is not a lease on the house. Finish your search quickly, if you please, and then... Uh, <laughs> why not try Hobo? So I just missed the inspector, huh? You did? That I can stand. I'm sorry about the burglar, though. Perhaps we can arrange to have you meet him in the morning. He left his calling card with name and address on it? He dropped his handkerchief here on my desk. Oh. Hmm. It's a handkerchief. It smells. <laughs> so it does. But, um... All of our unknown friends' clothes carry the odor. Therefore... Yeah? You will go out immediately to the nearest drugstore, buy a specimen of every cake of soap manufactured in this country. Mr. 
Mr. Wolf? He's there. No. I never realized just how many different brands of soap are made in this country. You should listen to the radio more often. So far, we've sniffed at 37 cakes. None of them smell like porter. Uh, let's see. 38. Hey. Let me have it, Archie. Yes, the soap. Ah, it's labeled orchid ovals. I should say basically mislabeled. Orchids have no odor. Our task for the evening is finished. Why? All we know is the guy washes with a basely mislabeled soap. No, the odor would not have been so persistent in that case. Unquestionably, our visitor works for a soap company that makes orchid ovals. Every employee of a plant in which perfume in large quantities is used inevitably carries the odor on his clothes. Oh. And you already deduced he works in an office. Uh Uh-huh. Ah. I I go see him in the morning? You do? (laughs) You know, Mr. Wolf, what with hiring rooms for girls and paying visits to a perfume factory, I'm beginning to feel like a maiden aunt. No one would ever mistake you for a maiden aunt, Archie. Thanks. Is that another deduction? Maiden aunts rarely need a shave. Good morning. One moment, please. Oh, can I do anything for you, sir? Yeah. That is, uh, <clears throat> let's postpone that question and slip in another one. I'm, I'm looking for one of your office people. He's in his 40s, 5 foot 10, brown hair and eyes, speaks in a sharp, quick voice. He owes and... you money, too. Uh, who owes me money? Mr. Wheeler, the man you were describing. He owes everybody money. In spite of the fact that he's office manager and makes lots and lots of money. How much does he owe you? Hmm? Oh, not, not an awful lot. It won't break me if I don't get it. Is he in yet? Well, he was, but he went home. He was sort of sick. Sort of? Mm-hmm. He got a phone call from somebody and rushed out. Mm, too bad. Well, I'd better scram. Well, you didn't answer my question yet. I'm off at five. My name's Gwen. Goodbye. <laughs> Wolf speaking. Archie here. Our unknown's name is Wheeler. He left the office this morning sick after he got a mysterious phone call. Bad, probably. Get to Dorothy Spencer at once and bring her here. Right. I'm at Wheeler's house now. Thought I'd better check. His wife's here, too. Blonde? Uh Uh-huh. How could you tell? Fetch your smirk in your voice. Get out of there fast and don't stop to console Mrs. Wheeler. Dorothy Spencer. Huh. Nobody home. Shut that door behind you, Goodwin. Uh, never mind pulling triggers. I'll shut it. Oh, Archie. I would prefer silence. Keep your hands high, Goodwin. It's unhealthy. All the blood had run into my head. Archie, he murdered Charles. He did. Tart, Mr. Wheeler. You really shouldn't have. It's against the law. Get into the bathroom, both of you. I already shaved. I phoned him. I thought maybe he had my letters. Porter couldn't keep his mouth shut about his other victims. He was going to force Dorothy to marry him. Did you find his material, Wheeler? Yes. In an office. He read it as a front. It's all burned. And why all the melodrama? You know about me, so does she. I can't trust anyone. Get into the bathroom, I said. Look, let's not lose our heads about this. Get moving, Goodwin. I like it here. All right, then. Here is where you'll get it. Uh, uh, hey, wait, wait, wait a minute. Something's wrong. I got shot and Wheeler fell down. I shot him, Goodwin. Stebbins. Dear Sergeant Stebbins. Oh, you little flat-footed angel. <laughs> it's lucky for you my flat feet got staked out here in time. Just for that, I'll buy you a pair of arch supports for your next birthday, but... I'm beginning not to believe this. You had it all figured out? Well, not exactly. Well, that is... Uh Ah, Wolf sent you here. Well, he kind of phoned in and suggested one of us shoot down here and do some rescue work. (laughs) That old devil. Hey, you're not kidding. (laughs) What are you laughing about? (laughs) Wolf wasn't sure whether you'd need rescuing from Wheeler or... (laughs) Stop killing yourself with your own jokes. (laughs) Or whether Miss Spencer would need rescuing from you. (laughs) 
You've been a very foolish young woman, Miss Spencer. I suggest that in the future you exercise more care in your correspondence. Oh, I shall, Mr. Wolf, but how can I ever thank you? Well, one, one way would be to listen wide-eyed while he explains how he solved the case. I have no intention Oh, of... come on, Mr. Wolf, stop stalling. Please, mm. Mr. Wolf. Well, uh... I'd be very happy to. As a matter of fact, I'd like to see anyone try to stop me. <laughs> a man came to me, offered me a thousand dollars to drop a client I didn't have. Why? Because obviously he wished to direct my attention to that client. Me? You, Miss Spencer. Now then, he identified himself as Charles Porter, a musician. But I tested him and discovered that he knew nothing of music. Ha! Ah! The da capo routine. Precisely. Therefore, he was an imposter. His purpose? Yeah? To indicate by no means subtly that enmity existed between Porter and Dorothy Spencer. Huh? Thus, when Porter was found murdered, I would presumably be convinced that Dorothy Spencer, balked in her effort to enlist my aid against Porter, had resorted to most foul and bloody murder. Most foul and bloody murder is very fancy, Dorothy. Shows he likes you. Oh. I thereupon ask myself, why should an unknown seek to convince me that Dorothy Spencer was Porter's murderer? And you answered yourself? One reason only, because he himself intended to murder Porter, as he did. For which peccadillo he has, thanks to Sergeant Stebbins' accuracy with a revolver, already paid with his own life. Quadiat ap demonstrandum. Latin for that's what you wanted to know. I think you're wonderful, Mr. Wolf, and I'm going to... Ah, be careful. Kiss you. Hmm, Archie, Miss Spencer is a very dangerous young woman. Today I feel brave. Do you, Archie? Very brave. What are you doing tonight? Nothing. Let's do it together. Bah. Oh, is that Mr. Wolf? I said bah. Would you very much mind conducting your romance elsewhere? I would not. And do so at once. I have a very important matter to attend to. Goodbye, Mr. Wolf. Goodbye. Night, sir. Very important. Very been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Lamont Johnson as Archie Goodwin, and Jane Webb, Peter Leeds, Bill Johnstone, and Wilms Herbert. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Dear Dead Lady. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The NBC chimes are excited about the big show. An hour and a half every Sunday night with Tallulah Bankhead as Femme C. Comedy with stars like Jimmy Durante, Fred Allen, Jack Carson, Groucho Marx, and a host of others. Music with Meredith Wilson, Mindy Carson, and many more. It presents drama with Mr. Jose Ferrer and many more leading stars of Broadway and Hollywood. It's the big show. Starts Sunday, November 5th on NBC. This is Chester William Bendix Riley. The Man Called X follows on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf. This Sunday marks the premiere of The Big Show on NBC. Not just any big show, it's The Big Show. NBC's hour and a half of comedy, music, and drama. The best of each. The Big Show will be heard every Sunday afternoon over most of these stations with Tallulah Bankhead as Mistress of Ceremonies. 
Your stars for this Sunday's broadcast include Jimmy Durante, Fred Allen, Ethel Merman, Frankie Lane, Mindy Carson, Meredith Wilson, Danny Thomas, and hosts of others. All this and Tallulah, too. No wonder it's the big show. My boss is the smartest and the stubbornest, the fattest and the laziest, the cleverest and the craziest, the most extravagant detective in the world, Nero Wolf. It's the adventure of the case of the dear dead lady with that brilliant eccentric private detective, orchid fancier and gargantuan gourmet, Nero Wolf. Starring Sidney Greenstreet. Nero Wolf had just come downstairs, having tended to his precious orchids. He was, as usual, seated in the library, which served as the office. He had just dialed a phone number and, with his eyes closed, was leaning back in his specially built chair, which was big enough for two, but not two of him. Uh, Halsbrecker's Market, domestic and imported delicacies. Mr. Halsbrecker, this is Nero Wolf. Oh! Yeah, Mr. Wolf. I was just about to ring you. Well, when... I have need of two pounds of duck liver. Ah. I do not, of course, refer to the commercialized Strasbourg pate. Well, I appreciate the order, Mr. Wolf, but... Uh... Next, my cook Fritz informs me that we require three fine fat geese. Look, Mr. Wolf, there's a little matter of an unpaid... You bill. might add 12 cases of beer, a bushel of Vermont apples, green for stuffing, and a gallon of Marquisa Patrisa Roman oil. Mr. Wolf. In addition, Fritz has listed six dozen eggs, four braces of Sussex woodcock, and a few pounds of Westphalian ham. You have all that? Well, I, I can get it, Mr. Wolf, but my bookkeeper... Thanks te- very much, Mr. Halsbracker. That will be all. Now, <clears throat> now then, Archie. Yes, boss? You seem to be worried. Oh, I am. This means, naturally, that I'm supposed to handle Halsbracker's delivery boy when and if he shows... I had thought of leaving that simple matter to you. And what about the simple matter of the money? Money? I I hate to bring up a vulgar subject, but where is it coming from? Oh, of course. You're right, Archie. I should have said... Said what? Charge it. Boss, look, you don't realize, I know, but we're into that truffle broker for 500-odd bucks and change. All right, all right. Then give him a check. Okay. Okay, I will give him a check. And I hope they'll let you keep the orchids in your cell. You're a wit, Archie. Uh Uh-huh. You know, I'm on the bank's mailing list. We got a notice this morning. You don't mean... Oh, but I do. Again? Yeah, you just can't take money out of an account, boss. Sometimes you got to put some in. This is the only way to deal with the man I work for, and if I hadn't thrown him that scare, he wouldn't have been willing to listen when the door buzzer rang, and a prosperous-looking young guy in the kind of clothes that don't grow on trees came in and stood in front of the boss's chair fiddling with the brim of his pork pie. My name is Oliphant, Mr. Wolf. Oliphant? Uh, yes, sir, Oliphant. I am the spiritual leader and guiding head of a small religious group known as the Seekers of the Inner Power. Ah, I see. Also a man addicted to marrying neither wisely nor well, but often. You read the papers? I do. Uh, Mr. Wolf, I am as aware of my sin-ridden past as anyone else is. The point is that I'm no longer that kind of man. Even a person such as I can see the light in time. Good. Might I ask why you've come to see me, Mr. Oliphant? I need your help, Mr. Wolf. Concerning? A certain young lady with whom I'm deeply in love. Oh, I beg you not to confuse the present emotion with any of my earlier escapades. What I feel for Miss Dana is the pure and righteous glow of an upright seeker of the inner power. I promise to look on you as thoroughly redeemed, Mr. Oliphant. Proceed. Oh, by the way, do I recognize the name of your young lady as a Park Avenue socialite, an amateur swimming champion? Yes, but she's sweet, wonderful, beautiful. I've asked her to marry me, and she's given me some hope. In time, I fully expect to make her my wife. Well, then where's the problem? The problem is the presence of another man in her life, 
I'm sorry, sir. I'm a detective, not a matchmaker. This isn't a question of making a match, Mr. Wolf. I have much too much respect for your talents to think of offering you such an assignment. Exactly. What do you want me to do? I want you to save Ilsa Dana's life. A life? Mr. Wolf, this other man I spoke of is insanely jealous. Not only of Ilsa's present, but of her past as well. He has threatened to kill her. I don't doubt your earnestness in this matter, Mr. Oliphant, but how would you know? I was listening on an extension in Miss Dana's apartment a few days ago when Hunter called. Hunter? Yes, sir. Jack Hunter. Known as Jack the Babe Hunter. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I know that canvas back. Huh? Sure. He's a coffee and cake prelim waltz. Oh, no, he's not. He's a boxer. Archie is being fancy. Overlook it, Mr. Oliphant. Is Hunter in love with this lady of yours? I doubt it. He's a man of complete moral and spiritual corruption, I believe. Naturally, you would. But what are the facts? In my opinion, he's after her for her money. She has money? To burn. And you, Mr. Oliphant? Me. Can you also afford to burn? How much do you want? The answer to that would be astronomical. However, if you leave a check for, say, $7,000, I shall look into your matter the very moment I have completed a little research into the nutrition of the Polynesian orchid. Elephant's check gave our bank account a slight blood transfusion. I think it was the boss's plan to spend a week or two in the plant room before he got busy on the case. And he'd have done it, too, if that phone call hadn't come in about a little after nine, just after Wolf had polished off one of Fritz's dinners and was settling back with a stein of beer in his hand. Don't disturb yourself, Archie. I'll get it. Now, well, look out. You don't strain yourself, boss. You got to straighten out an elbow to reach that receiver. You have an unfortunate flair for mixing humor with impertinence, my friend. Hello, Nero Wolf speaking. This is Elsa Dana, Mr. Wolf. How do you do, Miss Dana? We were discussing you only this morning. So I've heard. Through whom? Ted Oliphant. I see. The young man seemed to be quite worried about you. The young man should tend to his own affairs. He said you were in some danger. I know what he said. And not one word of it was true. Oh? Uh, I'd like to talk to you, Mr. Wolf. I'm sure it'll be an immense pleasure. Where do you live? I have an apartment at uh, 22 Blanton Street. Could you be here soon? I could be there in a quarter of an hour, Miss Dana. By proxy, of course. The proxy, naturally, was yours truly. Ten minutes later, at twenty past nine, I walked up to Ilsa Dana's door with a nosy elevator boy giving me the double O. The reason for his interest was that her door was open and the room inside was empty except for a little twisted pile of pale pink satin, which at close range turned out to be a woman. Which woman turned out to be Ilsa Dana? And Ilsa Dana was dead. She used to be pretty. She isn't now. Yeah, strangulation doesn't help any girl's looks, son. Make anything of it? Well, the position of her body and the bloodstains on her pointed fingernails tells me that she put up a tough struggle before somebody succeeded in smothering with a pillow from the sofa over there. Yeah, that figures. When did it happen, I wonder? In yeah, the last 15 minutes, I'd guess. Say, who's been up in the elevator this evening? Nobody for her. Well, somebody came up. Well, who says not? They could have used the stairs, you know. Yeah. How well do you know Miss Dana? I know exactly zero about Miss Dana. How could you write her up and down every day and know nothing about her? It's a rule of the house to keep your mouth shut. The rule also goes when being questioned by a cop. A cop? Who's a cop? Oh, I guess you're a cello player from the Philharmonic. Look, I happen to work for a guy named Nero Wolf. Oh. Heard of him? Maybe. Well, if your memory comes alive, son, I might see my way clear to uh, spend a few dollars with you. You understand? I'll keep you in mind. Going down, mister? I spent time trying to get sense out of the superintendent and a set of chambermaids, but they were as quiet as a ballpark on Christmas Eve. Then I called the cops and told them about Oliphant and Hunter. By the time I got home, the house was dark and Nero Wolf was sleeping. Next morning, I gave him the details while he drank three bottles of beer. When I finished, he sat for a long time and then started another bottle. The prize fighter. What about the prize fighter, Archie? Hunter? Well, I, I phoned the hotel he lives in before you got up. And? They told me he wasn't in. Hmm. 
You know, I begin to think that Mr. Oliphant brought us a more absorbing case than he suspected. You know, I'm glad you like it. I don't like it. I don't like work of any variety. But this thing has its points. Well, what do we do next? Next, we investigate my client. What? Merely because a reformed playboy employs a detective doesn't exempt him from suspicion acting. Oh, now who's that? I'm afraid we have no choice but to open the door and see. My name is Young. Vasto Young. It's nice meeting you, Mr. Young. What do you want? I want to see Nero Wolf. About? Uh, about a certain young lady with whom I am deeply in love. What? Will you repeat that? I want to see Mr. Wolf about a certain young lady with whom I am deeply in love. Mm -hmm. Her name, please? Ilsa Dana. Is it possible that you entertain plans of making her your wife? Why, well, uh, Yes, but uh, there's a problem involved. Another man? Uh, yes. Well, uh, do come in. Do come in. I think we've been waiting for you. Oh, Mr. Wolf. Here's another one. Ah, Mr. Wolf. You've come to me about Miss Ilsa Dana, sir? I have come to you, more specifically, about a man who has threatened her life. Hmm. How unusual. He's the treacherous kind. Mild-mannered, you know. As we say in my profession, he underplays it. Your profession, then, is the stage. It is, sir. Go on, you interest me deeply. I was present recently when he told her that he would certainly kill her unless she mended her sinful ways. Sinful? No one denies that Ilsa has had... Uh, Shall we say a checkered career? But the man's attitude is totally fanatical. What's his particular brand of fanaticism, Mr. Young? Theodore Oliphant is a religious maniac. Well, what do you know? He's come to give Theodore a bad report card. I don't understand. I, I've come to ask Mr. Wolfe to prevent his murdering Miss Dana. Am I allowed a direct question, sir? Why, of course. Where were you between 9 and 9.20 p.m. last night? 9 and 9.20... Why do you ask? You said I was permitted a direct question. Oh, well, I was walking in the uh, park, as I remember. Do you make a habit of walking in the park? I have lately. I'm preparing for an important role in the forthcoming production. What's so important about last night? From your point of view, a great deal, sir. Well, what do you mean? Last night, Miss Ilsa Dana was murdered. What? Mr. Goodwin here discovered the body. No. I'm afraid I must insist, Mr. Young. Uh, oh, why, why are you looking at me like that? Uh, are you accusing me of... A, I a... have accused you of nothing, my dear sir. Well, now, look, you're making a mistake. Oliphant killed her. You may be sure of that. I have your word. I know him. He was trying to reform her. Wanted to make her a devout follower of his cult, the Seekers of Power. I heard him tell her to her face... That if she refused redemption, he would see to it that she didn't live on in her wickedness. You could produce other witnesses? Do you know, in your own smug way, you're as detestable a character as I have ever had. All right, all right. Let's everybody take five. Yeah? Nero Wolf? He's busy. This is Archie Goodwin. You'll do, Goodwin. This is Jack the Babe Hunter. Oh? Uh, how are you? Great. Except the cops seem to want to talk to me about some murder fandango because, as I get it, you name my name. You got it wrong. I doubt it, and I'm coming over there to set you straight. Why'd you ring me in on this mess, Wolf? You knew the girl pretty well. Me and how many more? Besides, what time was she murdered? Last night, between 9 and 9.20 see. So if you will inform the police where you were at the time, that should be that. Yeah. By the way, Mr. Hunter, where were you at the time? I don't see your badge, Wolf. I was only wondering. I haven't been near the Dana woman for over a month. But if you're really interested, I'll give you the name of the killer. Please do not keep us in suspense, Mr. Hunter. A couple of years back, Ilsa financed a guy in a big and lousy Shakespearean play that closed like a clam and nothing flat. Go on. It was money down the drain. The guy's got nerve. And he was in love with her, and he figured she'd do anything for him. So he comes back to her to finance him again. This time in Hamlet, no less. I see. I don't have to tell you what a flop that would be. You needn't tell me the actor's name either. You know? Mr. Barstow Young just left here. 
Yeah? Well, he's your man, Wolf. He got so sore when she told him she wouldn't toss any more moolah into his broken-down career, he went off his rocker and tore it down. Your reason for thinking so? I met him on the street one day, and he started beefing to me with blood in his eyes. So I could do not to punch him. The results might have been less fatal if you'd followed your instincts, sir. Ugh, I couldn't. Guy's built like a broomstick. He's weak as a cat. Hit him once, he'd crack like dry plaster. I see. Hmm, hmm. What's on your mind? This man you're accusing of Miss Stainer's murder, Mr. Hunter, he was very much in love with her. She was thinking about marrying him, he said. He said? Yes, he did. I heard him, too. He was talking to a skullcap. Ilsa wasn't going to marry anybody. No? No, she couldn't. Why couldn't she? Well, but she just couldn't, that's all. So long. Well, now we got a perfect circle with everybody pointing at everybody else and nobody able to prove a thing. What Hunter says isn't impossible, Archie. You think Young did it? I don't think at all yet. But if there's anything more dangerous than a woman scorned, it's an actor scorned. We have another visitor. Yeah, who are you expecting? At this point, anybody. Hi. Oh, you. Yeah, I told you you might hear from me. Come on in. Who's this? A uh, fellow runs the elevator at 22 Blanton Street. What do you got for me, kid? Postcard. Postcard? Yeah, the cops missed it, but I spotted the edge stuck under a rug. Nice of you to have delivered it. Well, maybe he was just being curious. Curious? It's not every elevator boy who has a chance to see Nero Wolf in the flesh. Oh, him? <laughs> Come off it, High Pockets. I'm here because you mentioned something about spending a few bucks. Oh. I wouldn't cross the street to see the best gumshoe that ever breathed. Look, gumshoes don't breathe, and how would you like a sock? Archie, of... pay him and let him go. Yeah, pay me and let me go. Sure, Mr. Wolf. Here you are. Thanks. Don't mention it. Anytime, pal. Anytime. How do you like that fresh little punk? Archie, the lad has done us nobly. Yeah? Typewritten card addressed to Miss Ilsa Dina. Well, what's it say? Rather peculiar message. Have you prayed tonight? It's signed with the single letter O. Have you prayed tonight? Yes. Signed O? Exactly. Weird, isn't it? Well, what's weird about it? What could be plainer? Have you prayed tonight? Now, I ask you, who is the man in this deal who's interested in praying? All of us, I hope, are God-fearing. All right, all right. But I ask you again, what does O stand for? It could stand for O'Brien, Obituary, Omaha. What about Oliphant? Oliphant, too. Look, what, what's with this indifference? The case is cracking and you slough it off. You remember what Young said? Oliphant threatened to kill her because she wouldn't join that cockeyed movement of his. Don't exhaust yourself, Archie. We have a hard night ahead. Yes, but I don't understand. But I don't mean to stifle your imagination, my friend. But if you'd reserve your deductions for a little while, you could lend me some much-needed assistance. What do you want? I want you to become a burglar. A burglar? I want you to hurry over to the dead woman's apartment on Branton Street and ransack it. For what? How do I know? We need help. Anything may help us. Go through the place with a fine tooth comb. I tore the late Miss Dana's apartment to shreds, but I saw nothing. Then, just as I was about to give it up as a bum job, I noticed a little writing desk in the living room. Pride loosed the lock and spotted something among a pile of papers that belonged in no well-to-do flat. It was a pawn ticket. Lot 8N046. And the address was a pawn shop around the corner on 6th Avenue. It wasn't more than 90 seconds later that I walked into the joint and tossed the ticket across the counter. Oh, oh yeah, this, uh, want to redeem it. And fast, up, Pops? Yeah, it's nothing that's worth much, mister. No? Uh, oh, what is it? This? Small steel filing box. Oh. Anything in it? I don't know. Come to me locked, never been able to get it open. We got it open, Wolf and I. Smashed the front end with a poker. There were some odds and ends inside, old earrings, some thumbtacks, a cigarette lighter, just trash. Then the boss stuck his fingers in and pulled out a plum. This is it. What do you mean, this is it? You fail to recognize this classic document? Huh? 
A marriage license, Archie. A marriage license. Yeah, well, whose marriage license? The wording is self-explanatory. Listen. This is to certify, etc., etc., thus licensing on this third day of May, 1946, the marriage of Miss Ilsa Dana to Mr. Johan Jaeger. Johan Jaeger? Exactly. Well, who in the world is Johan Jaeger? We'll soon see. I don't get it. I can understand. It's a befuddling little puzzle. It'll be very easy for one to make a fatal mistake here. But, of course, you won't. I won't. Three hours later, I'd herded all the suspects into the office, and he sat in his chair and glared at them. Oliphant, Young, and Hunter. It was tense and tight, and the boss let it stay that way, saying not a word to anybody while he calmly sipped his beer. It was Oliphant who cracked first. I didn't kill Ilsa. I couldn't have. Jealousy is a very compelling motive, Mr. Oliphant. And you came to me, remember, complaining that there was another man in Ilsa Dana's life? Whatever I complained about him. And jealous as I was, I didn't kill her as the sacred power is my holy judge. Being unacquainted with your sacred power, I'd have to ask you for a better authority. Sacred power? Oh, it simply wouldn't have been possible for me to have done it. Why not? Yeah, why not? Because I... I was at Mickey's Night Owl Club last night from 7 until 4 a.m. Contemplating the sacred power, no doubt. That can be proved, Mr. Oliphant? Let me call now. Let the head waiter tell you. Hmm. Will you take your embarrassment as an indication that you're telling the truth? Hey, wait a minute. You you can't let him off like that. Don't be bothersome, Archie. Yeah, but we got that card he wrote, the one about have, have you prayed tonight, signed with his initial. He didn't write that card, Archie. Now, look. And the O is not his initial, is it, Mr. Barstow Young? Uh, I'm afraid I, I don't understand. On the contrary, I am afraid you do. But for the record, I'll explain. Oh, Archie. Yes, boss? Hand Mr. Young that large red volume off the shelf behind Mr. Hunter's head. This one? That one, thank you. Now then, Mr. Young, you will favor me by opening the volume to page 1133. But why? Open it, sir. Good. You will now count six lines down from the top and read what you see. Have you prayed tonight? Thank you, Mr. Young. What the devil is going Mr. on? Mr. Young has just given us a reading from a tragedy. The line, have you prayed tonight, is spoken by the hero to the heroine just before he murders her. The name of the heroine is Desdemona. And the hero, as I'm sure you all know, is Othello. Othello? Yeah, the O was not Oliphant, Archie. Othello, I think, was a Shakespearean play which Miss Dana financed for our Mr. Young. And knowing she would recognize the quotation as well as the threat behind it, he sent it to her to warn her that he meant to murder her. You won't have the unmitigated gall to deny that, will you, Mr. Young? No. No, I don't deny it. Do I call the police? But I didn't kill her. The fact that I sent the car doesn't mean I killed her. Well, it'll do for my money. But not for mine, Archie. What? Mr. Young couldn't have killed Miss Dana. Why not? Because he lacks the strength to strangle such a healthy young woman, a champion athlete. Wide awake and full of fight. He's rather a frail person, as we know. And smothering Miss Dana with that pillow was no easy task. She struggled. Therefore, she clawed the wrists of the murderer. I'm sure that if you examine Mr. Young's wrists, you will find no scratches or scars. Here, let me see that. Go ahead. Well, Archie? Ah, you're right. Nothing. I was sure there wouldn't be. The person who actually killed Miss Dana was a powerful physical specimen. Yeah? Yes, Mr. Hunter. In all probability, a professional athlete. A muscular man in good condition. You pointing at me? Seems quite likely, doesn't it? You're out of your head. Am I? Yeah. Yes, sir, Dana. Var ihr Frau? Nicht wahr? Jawohl. I... I mean... You said yeah, Mr. Hunter. And you meant yeah, yes. I asked you in German if Elsa Dana was your wife. And you, in the heat of emotion, answered me yes in your mother tongue. Look, what's going on here? Allow me to present Mr. Johann Jaeger, Archie. Him? I've known it since we first saw that marriage license. You see, Jack Hunter is the English translation of our friend's real name back in Germany. Where he comes from, Mr. Johann Jaeger. Oh, what do you know? So you proved nothing. Yeah, I was married to Ilse. That's why I said she couldn't marry anybody else. But I didn't kill her. She was my wife. I loved her. Oliver told us you were insanely jealous of her. What if he did? You know better. Do we? Sure you do. 
You also told yourself over the phone that every word Oliphant said was a lie. Interesting. What is? How you could possibly know what Ilsa Dana told me over the phone. I hadn't mentioned it to you or anybody else. Oh, well... Well, you see... It... I see most clearly, Mr. Yeager, that you must have been in the apartment with her listening on the extension phone, or you couldn't possibly have that information. And it was only a few minutes after that telephone call... That Ilsa Dana was smothered to death. And I see it's about time I said good night. Wait a minute, Jaeger. Wait a minute. Good work, Archie. I advise you to sit still, Mr. Johan Jaeger Hunter. I was right. I told you he threatened the killer. But why? I've only guessed at the story. Reconstructed it, so to say. But I think you and Mr. Young are to be congratulated. On what, sir? On not having won your fair lady. You've always thought of her as a sweet, demure society girl. But actually, she was a vicious person, as bad as the man who killed her, if not worse. She tortured him cruelly for four long years. How can you say that about her? How can you doubt it, Mr. Oliphant? There must have been a great many men in her life. We know at least two definitely, you and Mr. Young. But she was in love with me. She was in love with me. I'm sorry to shatter your illusions, but she was not in love with either of you. She was using you for her purpose. What was her purpose? Tementing the man she married. That was her preoccupation day and night. She delighted in tyrannizing over him. As one might in breaking a bull or taming a wild mustang. Do I come near the truth, Hunter? Yes. Until I couldn't stand it any longer. May I ask then why you married her? Why? Because I couldn't help myself. I crawled for her. I married her on the terms that nobody should ever know I was her husband. She was too good for me, she told me. That to my face, over and over. But we belonged to different worlds. But I was crazy about her, so I took it. What I've taken, you wouldn't believe. Oh, I am sure I would, Mr. Hunter. I'm a very understanding man. The question is, will a jury believe you? And that we must begin to learn immediately. Archie. Yes, sir? Phone for Inspector Kramer. have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Peter Berry was based on the famous characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Herb Ellis as Archie Goodwin and Lee Millar, Marna Keneally, Larry Dobkin, Barney Phillips, and Jerry Hosner. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Headless Hunter. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> And don't forget, this Sunday marks the premiere of The Big Show on NBC. Not just any big show, it's The Big Show. NBC's hour and a half of comedy, music, drama, and the best of each. The Big Show will be heard every Sunday afternoon over most of these stations with Tallulah Bankhead as Mistress of Ceremonies. Your stars for this Sunday's broadcast include Jimmy Durante, Fred Allen, Ethel Merman, Frankie Lane, Mindy Carson, Meredith Wilson, Danny Thomas, and hosts of others. No wonder it's The Big Show. And Theater Guild on the air this Sunday presents Judy Garland in Miss Alice Adams. So don't forget, Tallulah Bankhead brings you the big show Sunday on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf, which follows transcribed in 30 seconds. What's on the menu at Duffy's Tavern tonight? Well, there's a full serving of laughs with Archie the manager, played by Ed Gardner, and his unpredictable friends, Miss Duffy, Clifton Finnegan, and Eddie the waiter. It's Duffy's Tavern later this evening over most of these NBC stations. And this Sunday, the big show comes your way once again with Bob Hope, Jimmy Durante, Perry Como, Jose Ferrer, Mindy Carson, Eddie Cantor, Meredith Wilson and his orchestra, and many, many more. 
And, of course, your MC once again will be Tallulah Bankhead. That's this Sunday for The Big Show. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we take you to the most famous brownstone house in New York City, the one located at number 601 West 35th Street. Oh, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf. Want something, Archie? Would you be interested in taking on a case involving a woman who was found stabbed to death in one of New York's fancier men's clubs? Can't you see I'm already occupied, Archie? My Oncidium hybrid is ailing. But, sir, cash. C-A-S-H. Remember, you need it to live on? Well, you're actually learning to spell. You'd better learn to count. We're broke. Thank you, Mr. Goodwin. Now, if you'll just go away and stop interfering. Oh, just a minute. Yes, sir? On your way out, switch on the fan. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's that one and only man of moves. The most famous detective in modern fiction. That corpulent, orchid-raising, beer-drinking gourmet who also happens to be a genius. Rex Stout's incomparable Nero Wolf, starring Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight, Nero Wolf's long-suffering assistant, Archie Goodwin, tells us of the case of the careless cleaner. <laughs> We didn't know Clay Michelson very well at the time, though Mr. Wolf had hung one of the Michelson's paintings on the library wall. But then I guess we should have considered ourselves lucky not to have known him or his wife, Fila. Two weeks ago, they had a quarrel. Oh? Oh, Clay, darling. I didn't expect you home so soon. I thought you were going to the museum to see the Van Goghs. I decided not to, Fila. Oh. Well, if you were... Uh... Plan to paint this afternoon. I'll get out of the studio. I want to run some errands anyway. Why don't you make your phone call from here, Fila? Phone call? Who is he, Fila? He? Who were you waiting for this afternoon? Please, Clay, don't start that jealousy routine again. Don't try to kid me. You're being stupid, Clay. I'm stupid, all right, but I'm getting wise pretty fast. I'm through, Fila. I've had enough. I'm leaving you. So stay out of my way and keep your boyfriend out of my way, too, whoever he is, or I'll kill him. Yes? What can I do for you? Uh, uh, Sleepy. I want to have a drink and go to bed. I'm sorry, sir. The Garrison Club's a private establishment. No rooms available to the public. You think I'm drunk? Oh, no, sir. Why why do you suppose I came here? Well, I'm sure I wouldn't know, sir. I'll tell you why. I came here to see my old pal, Lou Saunders. That's why. You know Mr. Saunders? Do I know? Look, I paint him. Lou sells him. Mr. Saunders... Is your agent? I'm Clay Michelson. Just call Mr. Saunders. Clay, what in the world? Lou, tell this guy who I am. But I'm sorry, Mr. Saunders. It's all right, Mr. Martin. You see? Let's go have a drink. Yeah, yeah, sure, Clay. Yeah. You know what, Lou? I left Fila. Yep, I walked out on her. Is this something I can do, Mr. Saunders? Yeah, have someone fix a bed in the other room of my suite. Mr. Michelson will be staying with me. At least for tonight. <laughs> Mr. Wolf? Yes, Archie? It's Friday. Good. Fish for dinner, then. Nope. I was not referring to dinner. You were not? I can think of nothing more interesting at the moment. Oh, I can. My salary... Of course, according to the Julian Canada... We're on the Gregorian, so let's stick to it. Today is Friday. Today, I get paid. Archie, there's a drop. Oh, don't exaggerate. You can't be getting the cold shutters just because I'm asking for my money. I can distinctly feel fresh air flowing into the room. Well, it's possible I might have opened a window six inches. You're insane. Shut it at once. Nope. Are you trying to blackmail me? Hmm, think it might work? Never. Then the window stays open. You're fired. I accept your offer. All you have to do is pay up. I have hired you again. Oh, Mr. Wolf, you've cleaned out the bank balance again? Well, that is... <clears throat> well, hadn't you seen those Miltonians? Would I have voluntarily given up my paycheck for them? Orchids are very beautiful, Mr. Wolf, but blondes are... The door, Archie. 
I am unemployed. Confound you, it may be a client, and if it is, and we can uh, extract the fee. You follow me, Archie? I'm already on my way to the door. Mr. Wolf, I've got to see him at once. Well, come in. Thank you. Mr. Wolf, this is... My name is Sanders, Mr. Wolf. We've met before. Yes, I I remember. As a matter of fact, you sold me a painting of Michelson. Yes, well, that's why I'm here. It's about Michelson, Mr. Wolf, that I've come. Frankly, I... I think the man's about to go mad. He and his wife have split up and... and Uh, Such a splendid artist, too. A pity. I don't know what to do. He's drinking like a fish. For two weeks, I've been letting him live in part of my suite at the Garrison Club, but... uh, He's just steadily getting worse. I try a hospital... I can't. The publicity. Mr. Wolf, Clay admired you so that time we all had dinner after the painting transaction. I, I thought maybe you could talk to him. Maybe you could get him on his feet again. I'm not a doctor, Mr. Saunders. But I'm sure he'd listen to you. Excuse me a moment, Mr. Saunders. Nero Wolf speaking. Inspector Kramer. Uh, good evening, Inspector. Got a guy called Lou Saunders at your place? Garrison Club said he'd gone to your place. Yes, he's here. Well, see to it that he doesn't leave until I get there. You hardly do that, Inspector. I have no reason to detain Mr. Saunders. There's plenty of reason. It so happens a woman's just been murdered in his suite. Murdered? Yeah. A Miss Hilda Lundgren. What's happened? Now, will you hold him? Uh, do you know a Miss uh, Hilda Lundgren, Saunders? Hilda Lundgren? I've never heard of her. She seems to have chosen your suite to be murdered in. I'd better get right over there. Mr. Saunders says to tell you he'll be right over, Inspector. Now, listen, Wolf. Good day, Inspector. Murdered? Murdered in my suite? Mr. Wolf, you've got to come with me. Uh, Mr. Goodwin will accompany you after the formality of a retainer, Mr. Saunders. Oh, anything you say. Here, here, I'll write a check. Good, uh, 500. 500? Fine. My friend and assistant, Mr. Goodwin, will go with you. I have great confidence in his ability to bring back every detail of a murder, particularly where a woman's involved. Okay, you photographers, picnic's over for tonight. Pick up your stuff and get out of here. Come on, you sound real mean today, Inspector Kramer. Well, if it isn't Nero Wolf's favorite stooge, what are you doing here, Goodwin? I got bored with my knitting. Look, I wasn't asking for humor. I'm Louis Saunders, Inspector. Saunders? Ever seen that woman before? I... Yes. Yes, I believe I have. I can't remember where, but the face looks familiar. Mmm, lovely-looking woman. Blonde and really built. Well, she ought to look familiar. She's one of the cleaning women here at the club. She is? Cleaning? Well, since one of gals like this been reduced to cleaning floors, what's happening to the world? There ought to be a law. Yeah, there is. She was killed with a knife, or haven't you had time to notice? Uh, that's not a knife, Inspector Kramer. That, that's one of Clay's Chinese letter openers. He, he... What was that? Well, nothing. Nothing at all. Yes, it is a strange knife. What were you saying, Mr. Saunders? I just, just said that that looked like one of the letter openers belonging to one of my friends. Who is this Clay? Clay Michelson, the artist. But you can't possibly think he'd do a thing like this. I think everybody did it until we know otherwise. When were you last up here, Mr. Saunders? Me? Why, just a little while ago. I changed my clothes just before I went to see Mr. Wolf. She wasn't here then? Well, I don't know. I didn't come into this room, just in my part of the suite. Your part? Who occupies this room? Mr. Michelson. He's been staying with me. Strange wound, no blood. What do you think you are, Goodwin, a medical examiner? Oh, but I Yeah, 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 the killer probably wiped the blood away. Saunders, have you any idea where your artist friend might have run off to? I haven't seen Clay all afternoon. He spends a lot of time down in the bar. Well, he'd hardly sit in a bar if he's killed somebody. But... Well, why would he pick on the cleaning woman? Oh, this is no ordinary cleaning woman. Get a load of that figure. Watch She's... it, Goodwin. Watch it. You're liable to stretch your brain. But you're wrong. In spite of everything, Clay's still terribly in love with his wife. He he, he wouldn't... Oh, uh, hello. Where did you get in? Yeah, who's this? Clay. We're your friends, Lou. They won't serve me any more liquor down at the bar. I gotta find my flash. Mr. Michelson, may I introduce you to Inspector Kramer of the police? The... Who's this guy, Lou? He's Nero Wolf's assistant. Wolf? Police? Well, what do you all want? Somebody park overtime? 
Where's my flask? The one with my initials. I just bought it this morning. Mr. Michelson, do you know that somebody was murdered here in your room? Murdered? Why don't you guys go away and joke with somebody else? Where's my flask? You better get hold of yourself. I said there's been a murder. Understand? You serious? Yep. And I wouldn't be surprised if Inspector Kramer here considers you top suspect. Me? They think I did it? You better pull yourself together, Clay. Yeah, because I got a lot of questions. Excuse me, the phone. Now, sit down, Mr. Saunders. I'll answer it. Hello? 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 This is Fela. Who is this? This is Inspector Kramer. Hello? Hello? Who is Fela? Anyone know? Well, that's my wife. Your wife? I, I want to speak to her. Come back here, Michelson. Let me alone. I'm... You're not be... going anywhere. Now, stay back there. You're wrong, Inspector. I am going somewhere. Junior's got a gun. Yes, Inspector. You should be more careful about your gun when you shove people. Now, look, Mr. Michelson. I'll I wouldn't see want... Mr. Wolf myself. Stay back, Inspector. You haven't a chance. We'll nab you before you get a block away. Well, then I'll just jerk these phone wires. There. And I'll lock the doors. That should hold you long enough. Good night. Hmm. Here, Wolf speaking. Wolf Kramer. Indeed. Clay Michelson may be on his way over there. Hold him until I get there. Hold him? Why? Not more than ten minutes ago, he held me up at the point of a gun. He carries a gun? It was my gun. <laughs> Careless of you, Inspector. Ah. Goodbye. <laughs> Come in. Mr. Wolf? Yes? My name is Clay Michelson. Yes, I was rather expecting you. You've got to help me. They think I murdered someone. You shouldn't have run away from the police. I, I've been drinking a lot, but, but I wouldn't murder anyone. Feel it, tell you that. No way. You see the model in that painting of yours I purchased? What difference does that make? I tell you, they're after me for murder. You obviously loved your wife deeply at the time you painted her. Oh, here you are, Mr. Wolf. It... Michelson. Clay. Good Lord, man. The police are on their way over here. He came for my help, Mr. Saunders. Oh, I'm glad he did, Mr. Wolf. But we left Inspector Kramer talking from a phone booth. He'll be here any minute. Then we have only a minute to decide why anyone would want to kill a cleaning woman. I didn't kill anybody. She was a beautiful woman, Mr. Wolf. I gathered that, Archie, from your unusual interest in the case. She was stabbed with a letter opener from Mr. Michelson's house. Which might add, Mrs. Michelson, to our suspect list. Fela? You can't suspect Fela. You're very gallant, to Michelson. Just how was this beautiful young cleaning woman, this Miss Lundgren, stabbed? Um, in the heart. Her eyes were wide open. Pupils dilated with shock. And Details I... later, Archie. Kramer will be here shortly. The moment I would like to know where everyone was. Well, Mr. Saunders was here with us, you remember. I don't know where Mrs. Michelson was, but I could go see her and find out. No, it won't be necessary, Archie. Mr. Michelson, where were you? Me? Why, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I can't seem to remember. It's hardly what we would call helpful. I, I was drunk. Maybe, maybe I went to Fela's. I've been over there lots this week trying to talk to her. Yes, I, I must have gone over there. Have you ever seen the murdered woman before? No, I never saw her before in my life. I've seen her before, Mr. Wolf. Indeed, Mr. Saunders. I seem to remember your earlier statement to the contrary. Well, uh, I didn't know her name, but when I saw her, I remembered her. I understand she was quite an alcoholic. Hmm. Unfortunate woman. Beautiful woman. Well, look who's here, Inspector Kramer. Oh, here you are, Michelson. And as usual, you didn't have the courtesy to ring the bell, Inspector. And give you a chance to get this guy out of here? Nothing doing, Wolf. Now, come on. We're going to headquarters. Mr. Wolf, you can't let him take me. I didn't do it. I'm afraid there's not much I can do about it, Mr. Michelson. Come on. You come along too, Saunders. I gotta get a statement from you. Of course. This way. Come on. Well, all right, all right. I just got an angle. Really, Archie? Sure, it's simple. Saunders been going for this beautiful cleaning babe. Clay worms in. Saunders kills her. Perhaps there was jealousy somewhere in this case, Archie. Yeah, Wolf speaking. Mr. Wolf, this is Fela Michaels. You don't know me, but you once bought a painting from my husband. I've got to see you, Mr. Wolf. You've got to help me. Hmm. 
Please just make us and have some of this delicious beer. Another can, Archie. And now, Mrs. Magerson, may I ask how you found out there was a murder in the first place? A policeman came to see me. He told me what had happened, that they were looking for Clay. I don't know what to think. He's temperamental, he's jealous, and he's sometimes violent, but I can't imagine anything like this. Not Clay. Maybe some of those friends of his, but... You uh, don't care for your husband's friends? No. They all live off him. They're leeches. Mrs. Magerson, did your husband come to see you this afternoon? This afternoon? No. Quite positive? Oh, yes. That was his alibi for the time of the murder. He said he went to see you. Of course, he was fuzzy, usual effect of alcohol on the brain cells, but... Uh... Uh, Mrs. Michelson, might I be a little indiscreet for a moment? Indiscreet? Have you been seeing some other man? I don't know what you're talking about. Please, Mrs. Michelson, I'm afraid your face gives away more than you tell. I thought we were here to talk about a murder, Mr. Wolfe. Indeed, but your husband's jealousy might well fit into that category. Oh, Clay, imagine things. You're a very beautiful woman, Mrs. Michelson. Now, if you will try telling me the truth, perhaps we can accomplish something. But I tell you... Uh... All right. So I thought I was in love with another man. Your husband suspected but didn't know. Huh? No. Clay didn't know. He wouldn't have given me a divorce anyway. You sound as though you want your husband back. I did, but I didn't even know where he went. Indeed, Mrs. Michelson. Archie informs me that the murdered woman was quite lovely. What are you trying to suggest? You said yourself you wanted your husband back. Yeah, one woman jealous of another, that's always murder. Why, that's stupid. Clay wouldn't play around with a maid. That's stupid. Clay loves me. I'm not jealous of anyone. No one, do you understand? Archie. If you'll see Mrs. Michelson home... Yes, sir. Thank you. I can find my own way. I'd prefer Archie took you, Mrs. Michelson. You wanted my help, didn't you? I... Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Michelson. If you will just wait outside for a moment, please. What have you got in mind, Mr. Wolf? Try exercising your own judgment just once, Archie. You mean she's the one who's jealous? Perhaps, Archie. Perhaps she may want us to think she was jealous. Perhaps she actually doesn't want her husband back at all, only to pin a murder on him. Oh. You see, in this case, it would be simpler than divorce. Yeah? Yeah, she might just be trying to get rid of him. She might, Archie. But then she's a woman, so don't count on anything. <laughs> she might even be telling the truth. This is where I live, Mr. Goodwin. Nice. Very nice. I like Greenwich Village. I'm trying to figure out why Mr. Wolf sent you along with me. <laughs> I'm a sucker for beautiful women. <laughs> I wonder. Archie. Huh? Does Mr. Wolf believe me? He hasn't made an official statement yet. Nice furniture and things. You sound like an appraiser or, or someone looking for something. That's because it's November. Mr. Wolf sent you to search my apartment. You could be wrong. I don't... Oh. What's the matter now? Thought you said your husband hadn't been here today. He he wasn't. And what's his flask doing among these papers on the desk? Very prettily decorated with his initials. He was looking for it at the club. Flask? I don't know what it's doing there. Yeah, sure. You're trying to help, Clay. Right into the electric chair. But... His only alibi was his being here this afternoon, and you said he wasn't. Then what is his flask doing here? He said he just bought it this morning, so he must have been here today. I don't know what you're talking about. Where's your phone? Well, you've got things wrong. I don't know anything about that flask. I... The lights... Who switched off those lights? Feeler, put those lights on. Put on those lights. Oh, oh, the lights. Get to the lights. That flask... Gone. Nero Wolf speaking. Wolf, where's Feeler Michelson? Feela, perhaps you might try the lost and found, Inspector. Now, look, I know she was over at your place. I thought you were interested in Clay Michelson. Well, I let him and Saunders go for the present. They're clean until I get the medical examiner's report. Oh, when will it be ready, by the way? An autopsy takes time, you know that. Where's the Michelson woman? I believe she had a date with Archie. Why do you want her? I'm sure it never dawned on you, Wolf, but this cleaning woman who was killed was some dish. Maybe Mrs. Michelson was the jealous one. 
Your thinking is beginning to bear an amazing resemblance to Archer's, Inspector. Also, it maybe never dawned on you that Fela Michelson hasn't offered an alibi for the time of the murder. Hmm. You're right, Inspector. Yeah, you are. Come on, Wolf. Quit stalling. Where's Fela Michelson? Hmm? What? Oh, I really don't know, Inspector. But perhaps as a last resort, of course, you might try her home. Good night, Inspector. Ah, uh, inevitable. The moment I'm comfortable. Come in. Mr. Wolf. Oh, thank heavens you're here. I always am. Where's Mr. Goodman? I don't understand how it happened. I swear I don't. What happened? I haven't got any idea how it got there. Got where? Calm down, Mrs. Michelson. I... Uh, now, just what got where? Clay's new flask. Your assistant, Archie. He, he came home with me and that new initial flask was there... He thinks Clay was there this afternoon and that I'm trying to frame him or something. Oh, here you are. She's here, therefore. This is our gal, Mr. Wolf. She's been lying right down the line. I tell you, Clay wasn't there. Then why did you give me this clout on the head and grab the evidence and run? I didn't. I didn't hit you. I ran, but I didn't hit you. And I didn't take that flask either. Oh, next thing she'll say, there wasn't any flask. Stop gaping at Mrs. Michael Sinatra and open the door. Yeah, sure. Well, Mr. Wolf, they let Clay and me go for the... Fela, what are you doing here? After your visit this afternoon, Mr. Saunders, she decided to come down and see me. After my visit? What, what makes you think I was at Fela's? It was Mr. Saunders, not your husband, who came to visit you this afternoon, wasn't it, Mrs. Michelson? I... I don't have anything to do with Mr. Saunders. Then might I ask why you called him today? I, I wasn't calling him. I was calling Clay. You told me earlier yourself that you didn't know where Mr. Magazin was. Well, I... All right. So what if it was Mr. Saunders who came this afternoon? As he has for many afternoons. What are you trying to get at, Mr. Wolf? Saunders? He and Fela? Yes, Archie. Mr. Saunders, the artist's friend and agent, happens to be the one who was making a fool of the artist. But that's all over. I told him. That's what I was talking to Mr. Saunders about this afternoon. I didn't want Clay to know. Clay would never have come back. All but... right, so it was Fela and me. I admit it, but that's not murder. I suggest that it is, Mr. Saunders. I suggest that one of you two murdered the cleaning woman. Whichever one of you carelessly left the whiskey flask in Fela's apartment. This is murder, Mr. Wolf. Not a joke. Not at all a joke. You see, our cleaning woman was not murdered by the knife found in her body. She was poisoned. What do you mean? Not by the knife? Poison. She undoubtedly drank from Michelson's flask while she was working in his room at the Garrison Club. But she was stabbed. True. However, Miss Lundgren was an alcoholic. Saunders mentioned that, and I checked with the club manager. But how does that prove there was poison in the flask? That she was poisoned? Archie, would you mind uh, repeating your description of the dead Miss Lundgren? First, uh, as to the wound. Okay. There was no blood. Someone advanced a fantastic theory about wiping the blood away. And now, Archie, the description of the body of Miss Lundgren. I mentioned the fact that her eyes were wide open, the pupils were dilated. At... Hey, dilated pupils? Yes, Archie. The lack of blood had already made me wonder about the entire affair. When you added the dilated pupils... What's special about dilated pupils? In death, that is a common symptom of poison by a certain vegetable drug of considerable potency. But what was the point of stabbing her? The poison did the job. However, the killer later used the letter knife in an effort to deceive the police. However, he unhappily forgot that the dead don't bleed. I think you're guessing, Mr. Wolf. Am I? All I can say is that I was at the pool in the early afternoon. Hmm. You're very certain you were at the club pool... And the murder was committed, Mr. Saunders? Certainly. From one until three. Excuse me, please. Wolf speaking. Inspector Kramer, medical examiner's report just came in this minute. And get a load of this wizard. The dame didn't die of stabbing at all. I know. You, you know? She died of drinking a fatal dose of poison known as deadly night shade. What? How do you know that? Inspector, do they know what time she died? Time. The medical examiner says 2.30. Thank you, Inspector. Oh, incidentally, if you care to drop over here, you may pick up the murderer. Goodbye. 
I heard him, Wolf. She died at 2.30. As I told you, I was in the pool at 2.30. Which is exactly how you prove yourself a murderer, Mr. Saunders. Oh, I prove myself... Even the police didn't know what time she died. Until just now. And the body wasn't found until the evening. How did you know she died between one and three? I, I, I didn't know, but... You I... probably were at the pool at the time. The maid drank the poisoned whiskey. You put in the flask of your friend Clay Michelson. I tell you, you're crazy. You planned to get rid of Clay, who stood in the way of your marrying Fila. When you came back to your room at three and found that the maid had drunk it instead, you stabbed her with Clay's letter opener to cover up the real cause of the murder and throw suspicion on Clay. Oh, this is nonsense. Ridiculous. That's and then, thing. when you learned that the woman for whose love you were willing to commit murder was through with you, you took Michelson's new flask to Fila's home, confident that it would be found there. Yes, and then he attacked me and stole that flask again in order to make it look like Fila had done it. Exactly, Archie. Mr. Saunders, the chances are that your fingerprints will be found on that whiskey flask. And they'll be able to trace the poison to wherever you purchased it. The chances oh, are... Oh, no, you don't. Careful now, all of you. Guns bore me, Saunders. Oh, yeah? I'm leaving. You are not... Clay! Oh! Clay. Yes, Mrs. Michelson, your husband has been there for some time. Clay, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Well done, Mr. Michelson. I think you proved that an artist's life may indeed be exciting. I have been an awful fool, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Michelson, you might remember for the future that unreasoning and unjustifiable jealousy sometimes creates the very conditions that it fears. You're being very kind to me, Mr. Wolf. How can we ever thank you? By prompt remittance of your check on receipt of my bill in the morning. <laughs> Good day, Mr. and Mrs. Michelson. Good day, Mr. Wolf. Good day. What's the matter with Archie? You look glum. Yeah. I always have the lousiest luck. Meaning? A hectic case with two beautiful dames. Michelson gets one, the undertaker gets the other, and what do I get? Hey, that reminds me. You got a fee. I get paid. <laughs> You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was written by Cheryl Hendricks and based on the famous characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Betty Lou Gerson, Howard McNear, Dan O'Herlihy, Vic Perrin, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Beautiful Archer. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun and laughs with the chimes later this evening when Ed Gardner stars in Duffy's Tavern. As usual, Duffy won't be there, but Archie the manager will definitely be on hand to spread his whimsical advice where it'll do the most damage. Tomorrow night, there's action on NBC with Herbert Marshall starring as the man called X in another exciting battle against the forces of international intrigue. Next, Sam Spade. Later, William Bendix on NBC. Pat Novak, for hire. Sure, I'm Pat Novak, for hire.
That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. It's about the only way to say it. Oh, you can dress it up and tell how many shopping days there are till Christmas. But if you got yourself in the market, you can't waste time talking. You gotta be as brief as a pauper's will. Because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, everybody wants a piece of the cake. And the only easy buck is the one you just spent. Oh, it's a good life. If you work real hard and study a little on the side, you gotta trade by the time you get to prison. I rent boats and do a few other odd jobs you can't afford to pick it on. It works out all right if you put your tongue in hock. Because down here you shouldn't talk. It's like installing a set of drums in a belfry. You make some noise, but it's never the right kind. I found that out a few days ago. Must have been Tuesday or Wednesday night anyway. I was sitting in the office reading Time magazine when the door opened. I looked up and had to keep right on going because the guy was so tall he'd have to bend over to see through a transom. And he had a voice deep enough to rent out as a bassoon. Good evening, Mr. Novak. I'll take your word for it. You have a small office. I'm small time. What's on your mind? My name is Leahy. I want to hire you. Yeah. Sit down. Are you cold? Yeah. That overcoat around your neck, you're either cold or a priest. Oh. I'm a priest, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry, Father. You got a slow brogue. What do you need? A few hours of your time. I want you to help a man escape from prison. Uh Uh-huh. Father, you'll never get along with a bishop. Mr. Novak, in a curious way, this is an errand of mercy. Well, this isn't my year for mercy. I'm sorry, Father. Maybe you don't like to hear it that way, but if I got the right fee, it wouldn't be mercy anymore. When I say it's an errand of mercy, that's what it is. Sometime tonight, a man is going to break out of Alcatraz. If he's allowed to get into town, he may kill somebody. You want me to stop him? That's right. And if he doesn't kill anybody, he can still be shot down by the police. Well, that's the percentage, Father. If he comes off that rock, he knows that. Stop worrying about him. If you could bring him to me, I know I can talk him into going back. Tell headquarters they'll do the same thing. If I did that, I'd break a promise. This is the only thing I can do. Will you help me? Yeah, I suppose. How do I pick him up? Treadwater in the bay he comes by? He's due in at Pier 19 sometime tonight. When he comes ashore, bring him to me. I'll be waiting at the ferry building. Well, suppose he doesn't want to come. Suppose he wants to party. How am I going to get him there? I don't ask you how to say the beads. If you're any good, you'll get him there. But you don't want him in sections. I want him all at once, Mr. Novak. I wouldn't ask you this if it weren't important. But i got to help him. He's one of my boys. Yeah, sure. What's his name? Joe Feldman. Feldman? Yeah. If I don't worry about the spelling, you don't have to either. He's one of my boys. Slow down. Nobody's pushing your father. I don't know when he's due, but I'll be at the ferry building from 8 o'clock on. Yeah. I only got one worry. Is there really a guy named Father Leahy? I suppose you'll have to take a chance on that. Yeah, well, it's a big chance. You come in here with a story anybody can see through like a screen door and I'm supposed to buy it. You could dig up a collar. What happens if you're a fake? Just try to guess right. Suppose I don't. Then you're in the same spot Pontius Pilate was. Good night, Mr. Novak. Whoever Joe Feldman was, he had a good friend. Because when Father Leahy walked out of there, I knew he was all right. You could tell without even testing him. The way when you pick up a pool cue, you know right away whether it's any good or not. He stood at the door for a minute, and then he walked out. And you got a funny feeling that he didn't walk into the night that he was big enough to wrap it around his shoulders and take it with him. I got a last look at him as he turned the corner under a street lamp. He looked even taller now, and you knew if somebody stood him in an oil field, you couldn't tell him from the rest of the derricks. Well, I made a couple of phone calls, and then I closed shop and went down to the end of Pier 19 to wait. The bay looked as dark as a bruised crow. The fog was beginning to drift in over near the piers. By 9 o'clock, you couldn't see a thing. You felt like a guy trying to shave in a bathroom full of steam. I was about... 30 feet from the end of the pier when a small boat pulled in and let somebody out. I was sure it was my boy, so I moved behind a shed and waited. The boat pulled away and the guy started down the dock. I waited until he moved past me. Oh, I'm sorry. You ought to be glad. How's the rock? Huh? You lonely, mister? What do you care? If you are by a beer and talk to the bartender, I'm busy. All right, you're tough, Feldman. Let's go now. You got dates for us? You're going to see Father Leahy. Come on. Why, are you doubling for Gabriel? Leave me alone, mister. I don't want to go. Now, look, Junior, if we draw straws, you're going to get the short one. Oh. 
There's supposed to be a gun in your pocket? Well, you get a chance to find out. That's what I'm going to do, because I have one, too. If it starts to hurt your stomach, back down. <laughs> now where's yours, Mr. Timid? <laughs> it's a bad night for bluffing, so goodbye. Yeah, come here. <laughs> go easy, fellow. It's a big one. Well, you can let go easy, then. Come on, drop it. Drop it in the water. Let go. <laughs> now, you want to start again? No. All right, I'll see you, man, lady. I got to make a stop first. Make it after. It'll take five minutes. Look, mister, if you want to do it the easy way, let me make the stop. You go with me. All right, five minutes, and then you see Father Leahy. Suit yourself. I doubt if I'll make heaven, but if you want to run interference, it's all right with me. If you need the credits, you need the credits. Joe Feldman wasn't very friendly. He sat over in the corner of the cab, and he didn't say a thing. He just kept looking at me and waiting, like a guy feeding arsenic to a rich aunt. A few minutes later, the cab pulled up in front of a hotel on Geary Street, and we walked in. One look at that lobby, and you got the idea. The place was about as cozy as an abandoned mine shaft. Over by the wall, there was an old mohair couch, and the legs on it were so warped, pretty soon it was going to look like period furniture. There were a few chairs, and... Over by the stairs, a faded calendar of a girl in tights holding a jar of mayonnaise and winking, whatever that meant. And there was a broken clock over the desk. But you knew it was all right, because nobody there cared about keeping track of time. It was something you got rid of in a hurry, like a bent quarter. Well, we went up to the second floor. We walked down a long hall that smelled like an ante room to a sewer. When Feldman knocked on the door, she opened it right away. The room was full of taboo. She stood leaning there for a minute, a sort of a girl who moves when she stands still. She had blonde hair. She was kind of pretty, except she could see somebody had used her badly, like a dictionary in a stupid family. Feldman seemed to know her. Hello, Ann. Well, the harvest hands arrive all at once. Yeah. It's good for the crops, but tough on a woman. Come in. Who's your friend? A missionary, I guess. He grabbed me down by the docks. Does he talk or just stand there looking healthy? He growls a little. Do you really growl? Come on, hurry up, lady. Your friend's got a date. I'll bet you bite instead. <laughs> Don't worry about him. He can go over in a corner and play fifth wheel. Now, look, he's got five minutes. Use him quick. Yes? I uh, came up with a message, Ann. The time's been changed. Stay around till 10 o'clock. All right. Is that all? Yeah, that's all. You want the other four minutes? Let's go. All right. Open the door. Yeah. You didn't open it fast enough. When Feldman hit me, I wobbled for a minute and went down like the price of winter wheat. If Father Leahy had any loose prayers lying around, now was the time to crate them up and ship them over, because I wasn't going to stay awake long enough to test the varnish. I rolled on the floor a couple of times, and then I took a rain check on the next couple of hours. When I woke up, it was like buying a new Nash and then finding out you can't drive. Joe Feldman was lying next to me with his throat cut like a pound of rib roast. His head was over to one side, and his body was twisted over the other way as if he couldn't make up his mind which direction to die in. I got up and rolled him on his back. He was grinning like a Pullman porter at the end of the line, and his mouth was half open as if he expected you to drop in a suggestion on your way by. I noticed right then how thin and small he was, about as fat as a shadow and tall enough to scrape his head on a lampshade. Well, there wasn't anything I could do but wish him luck. So I called the check stand at the ferry building and had them page Father Leahy. About two minutes later, he answered. Hello, Father Leahy? This is Novak, Father. Yes, Call in the outfield. Your boy's dead. I see. What happened? Somebody didn't like him lots. I wasn't around for the main event. Where are you, on the pier? No, I'm in some cave up on Geary Street. He wanted to come by here first. Father, who's Ann? I don't know. Has Feldman got a girlfriend? He's got two sisters, I think. One of them's named Ann. A tall blonde with lots of speed? That's your definition, but it'll probably do. Now, she was around for a while, in case you ever want to check. Get on the back stairs and pretend I never heard of Joe Feldman. I'm sorry, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry it worked out that way. So am I, Father. 
If you liked him, I'm sorry. He may have been a nice little guy. Huh? Well, I could do without him, but if you like it, I'll say he was a good little guy. How little? I don't know. We could start a picket fence with him. Why? Because you've got the wrong man, Mr. Novak. Huh? If he's under six feet, you've got the wrong man. Whoever you've got up there it isn't Joe Feldman. Well, he's happy about it now, Father. Whoever he is, I'm sorry. It's the percentage. Why the percentage? If it isn't Joe Feldman, why? That's the waterfront, Father. If your name's Joe Nobody, you still can't do better than eight to five. <laughs> At least Joe Feldman was smart. If you're going to get your throat cut, it's a good time to send in a substitute. As soon as Father Leahy hung up, I knew hanging around that hotel was going to be a waste of time, like sending mash notes to a bearded lady. If I couldn't prove the guy was alive, they were going to charge extra down at the desk. And if Hellman down at Homicide ever found out I brought the guy up here, I'd have about as much chance as a bottle of scotch at a cocktail party. So I picked up my hat and started for the door. I looked at him once more, but he wasn't going to say goodbye, so I started out. Boo. Oh. Hello, Hellman. Expecting me, Novak? No, I'd have rolled him first. Yeah. Invite me in. Crash the party, Hellman. You'll be more at home. All right. He sure looks lazy. Who is he? He's supposed to be Joe Feldman. But Feldman let him do the hard work. They must be good friends. You better check. I don't know the guy. Yeah, help me roll him over. Okay. There. Here, here's his wallet. You let me have it. You're going to break your fingernails. Give it here. All right. Yeah. No money in here. You're going to drop the case? Here's his card, Mike Greeley. Oh. Didn't he like you either? You're wearing out the rug, Hellman. I don't know the guy. You brought him up? I checked at the desk. Well, check on who left then. I brought him up here on a phony lead. Why? Because I was hired to tow him around. He liked the room, so we dropped by. And he cut himself shaving? I wasn't around. There was a girl here for the handshakes. Oh. What kind of girl? I don't know, Hellman. How many kinds are there? Her name was Ann. She had a fast pulse. That's all I know. You must know more than that. If you don't, you'll never get a lawyer. I won't need one. You'll save money at least, because you got a real hole this time, Novak. We get a phone tip and find you in the murder room. You got half a story, Hellman. I know, but I'll get the other half. Until then, you're under technical arrest. It's practically the real thing. Oh, you got a technical head, Hellman. I wouldn't tip myself off. Somebody else would. Walk around, Novak, and tire yourself out. Because you'll wind up sitting down. In the meantime, I'll have you tailed. Your men couldn't follow a moose through a revolving door. Now, look, Hellman, I'm going to double back. This guy's a phony lead. I was supposed to meet a guy named Joe Feldman, but he never showed up. He didn't? No. I got a dead copper to prove he did. Your boy, Joe Feldman, killed a sergeant named Grubb at the Gold Rush Club Club a half hour ago. You better start that walk, Novak. <laughs> Two kind of raps you can't ever beat. Cheating a woman with kids and killing a copper. So I knew Joe Feldman could put in for reservations right away. And I knew Hellman would stay with him like a February cold. He'd stay with the whole thing. And I'd have a real tough time explaining. <laughs> I couldn't explain it to myself. What about the message up in that room? Why did the little guy tell Ann to stay until 10 o'clock? Why did he get off at Pier 19 instead of Joe Feldman? Once he got there, what was Feldman doing at the Gold Rush Club, and why did they spot him so fast? Well, it pointed to one thing, a police tip-off, but that's as far as I could go. On the way down, I stopped at the desk, and I asked the clerk to see the register. He pushed it over toward me. It was a dirty brown thing that looked like an old tortilla somebody had left behind. It didn't do any good. The registration was a phony. Well, I had to do something in a hurry, so I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. He's a good man, and he used to be a smart one, too. And still he started chasing a jigger of beer with a glass of whiskey. I finally found him in the Pied Piper room, arguing with somebody about the words to Annie Laurie. Ah, Patsy, a drink for Mr. Novak. Something cheap but impressive. Oh, stop it, will you, Jocko? Are you going to be drunk all your life? Yes, it's only a matter of willpower, Patsy. I'm probably the only man in the world who intends to carry a hangover into eternity. Well, stop long enough to give me a hand, will you? I'm in trouble. Of course you're in trouble. You'll always be in trouble because you can't recognize it, Patsy. You're fuzzy, Jocko. You have the social outlook of a bull with a hot foot, and there's no hope for you because if from time to time a moral feeling does sweep over you, you mistake it for influenza and go to bed. All right, all right. Oh, you try hard enough. You go through the motions, Patsy, but you never get anywhere. 
You go stumbling through life doing a tight wire act on a rubber band. You're always in the middle. Will you listen to me? It's because there's no variety in your life. You won't allow it. You're a broken-down banjo, not a very good instrument to begin with. And to make matters worse, you allow everybody to come along and pluck the same string. All right. Are you all through now, Jocko? Yes. You sound angry. I think you have a bad disposition, too. What kind of trouble? Well... I tried to help some guy out of prison tonight. You got drunk and thought you were the parole board? No, I did it for a good guy, a priest named Leahy. Yes? The guy was already out, and Father Leahy was trying to hurt him back without getting shot. But this guy, Feldman, didn't want to play. Another drink will clear this up for me? I picked up the wrong guy. I took him to a Geary Street hotel. I napped a while, and they cut him up like a piece of parsley. Sounds like a gruesome hotel. The dead guy's name is Mike Greeley. I don't even know who he is. Well, this is no time to start building a friendship anyway. Uh, who is in the room? Some girl. She may be Feldman's sister. Would she kill a man? Well, if she did, he'd be crushed to death. No, I'm sure somebody else came in that room. You better talk to Feldman. Well, he's a hard man to reach. A sergeant almost made it tonight. Feldman shot his way out of the Gold Rush Club. Hmm, that's one way to get out of a nightclub. Well, Hellman's steamed up, so you got to help me, Jocko. You'd better look up Father Leahy. You'll probably be electrocuted, and if you are, he may have some drag. I want you to go down to the Chronicle Morgue and pull the clips on Joe Feldman, will you? Get everything you can, and then hit the horse parlors. Find out what they know about him, huh? Maybe he's a heavy drinker. I'll check the bar. Jocko, wake up and get down there. If I don't pace Hellman on this thing, I'll be a dead pigeon. What am I supposed to do? I don't know. You might start cooing. Good night, lover. Well, as soon as I left Jocko, I went down to the Gold Rush Club on O'Farrell Street. It was a little nightclub where they charge 80 cents for a drink of whiskey that'd kill a redwood. The floor show was just as bad, and the headliner was an oriental dancer whose only talent was a zipper. I sat at the bar, and I tried to pry some talk loose, but they liked the boss. I finally got a hold of a fat waitress who should have been wearing a harness instead of slacks. She told me a little. The owner was a guy named Charlie Giffen, and he used to make book with Joe Feldman. She told me that Joe's sister worked at the Gold Rush Club for a while, but she got sick a few months ago and quit. I asked the girl if tonight's shooting was a police plant. She didn't know, but she said that Feldman had been in to see Giffen tonight, and on his way out, he ran into trouble. I gave her five bucks, and she looked hurt as if somebody had given her a plow for Christmas. She showed me where Giffen's office was, and I walked back there. Giffen wasn't there, but the taboo was. Do you have the right door, Mr. Novak? You seem to be in all of them. Do you mind if I lean in the doorway? No, but I'll bet you need shoulder pads by this time. Where's Charlie Giffen? Why? I want to ask him about Joe Feldman. Ask me. I'm his sister. I'll ask you about Mike Greeley. Who killed him? I don't know. Is he dead? Yeah, he couldn't stand the bleeding. He was all right when I left. What were you doing up there? Waiting for Joe. My sister and I were going to meet him up there. Relax, Mr. Novak. Relax for me. No, when people relax for you, they do it on the floor. I was out long enough for homicide to catch up. They want me for Mike Greeley, but I'm going to send them you or Joe. You're forgetting my sister Norma. Should I? For most things, yes. But she was up in that room tonight after me. I'll ask her. Ask her about the money, too. Well, you're out in front of me on that. You can see me better that way. Joe had a lot of money on him tonight. With the police out, he wouldn't carry it with him. By now, the money's gone, so's Norma. Uh. Do you know where it is? No. Well... You growl, and you bite, and you lie. You must have a full day. Sit down, relax. I want to see Giffen. He won't be back tonight. Now lean back. That's it, Patsy. Well, you really want that money. I can split a motive. Can you split it 90-10? If you can't, you better get your breath back. I won't need it. I don't want to talk anymore. Come here and make me stop. Over close. If I get any closer, I'll be on the other side of you. Yes. Hmm. Patsy. You ought to get time and a half, darling. Hello, Ian. Thought you were coming in to curl up with a good book. Uh, Mr. Novak came by full of questions. This is Charlie Giffen, Patsy. I got some questions for you, too, Giffen. Well, ask him down the bore of this gun. Over by the desk, Novak. Did you lose that knife, Giffen? By the desk. That's it. Where's the money, Novak? I gave her the last report. Where's the money? Joe gave it to somebody. Try the Red Cross, mister. You got a tender face, Novak. Now get out of this club before I slap on a cover charge. Oh, 
I was getting sick of tonight. In three hours, I'd seen more service than a mix master in a cooking school. When I left the Gold Rush Club, I dropped by headquarters. Hellman had nothing to show but his badge. They had a dragnet around the city for Joe Feldman, and they'd lined up the record on the dead guy in the hotel. He'd been a friend of Joe's before his trip to Alcatraz. There wasn't much I could do. If homicide couldn't find Joe, I couldn't find him. So I looked up Norma Feldman in the phone book. She had an apartment out on the avenues, but when I called, there was no answer, so I tagged by my apartment to see if Jocko had left a message. When I opened the door, Norma was there, and she had a gun to keep her company. Come in, Mr. Novak. Yeah. I came up here to kill you. Well, if you're Norma, the rest of the family's ahead of you. What's happened to my brother? I don't know. Please, what's happened to him, Mr. Novak? Well, if he killed a cop, he's hiding out. I know he didn't mean to do that, Mr. Novak. Joe's not that way. Somebody told the police he was going to be there. That's why I came up here to see you. Oh, put down the gun, huh? You can't shoot through the tears. <laughs> Mr. Novak, if you know where he is, tell me. Make him give himself up. Make him stop hiding like a small, frightened animal. You look big to that copper. Please. Please find him. You got me. Yeah. Hello, this is Jocko. Yeah. You sound ruffled. Joe Feldman's sister just walked in to kill me. Don't argue. It's the best offer you've had. What'd you find out? Feldman has two sisters. I know. They both go to pieces. The Gold Rush Club is owned by Charlie Giffen. He owed Joe Feldman $2,000, and the horse people say Joe collected it tonight. Well, that fits in, Jocko. Everybody in town's after that dough. They'll have to look some more. Hmm? I'm out on Arguello Boulevard. Homicide just fished Joe Feldman out of the gutter. If Homicide finished second, he was a lucky guy. He didn't have the dough on him? No. Well, he stashed it somewhere. Then he left it with a woman. Yeah? Because he's got a woman's compact in his pocket. You uh, better hit the sister's place. How do we know he got it there? A woman's compact? If he didn't get it there, Alcatraz is getting too social. Well, the minute Jocko hung up, things began to fall into place. But I knew the last piece was going to pinch somebody hard. If the Feldman blood was going to turn bad, Father Leahy was a good man to send in, so I called him. He was out, but I left word for him to get out to Norma Feldman's apartment. Norma and I left, and on the way, we picked up Hellman. When we got out to her place and started up the stairs, we could hear people moving above. There was no point in trying to keep quiet, because Hellman was creeping up the stairs like a stallion with a broken leg. Yeah, if you got a bomb, touch it off, too, huh? Well, open it, Hellman. Hello, Novak. Did you find the dough, Giffen? You mean my stolen dough? Yeah. Come on, Ann. No, you and Ann better wait. This is Hellman from Homicide. We're leaving. You better move, Novak. Not until you settle a murder rap. Can you pay it off that fast? I can do it on the way to the door. Oh, wait a minute. Point the gun at Hellman. He's official. I can tag you both, so move away. You too, Norma. Ann and I are leaving. Look, Giffen. Homicide gobbles up nightclub big shots like you. You're nothing to me, copper. Move away. You got the hammer. Use it and come on through. All right, I will, copper. Hey, yeah, hey, you need a refill, Giffen. That's right, darling. Hand him your gun. And, and you couldn't have done that. You couldn't have taken him out. All right, so they fell out. You better take him for murder, Hellman. You little bum. That leaves you all the money. I can spend it, darling. Well, you better do it fast, then. Grab him, Hellman. Yeah, yeah I got him. Oh, you can fucking pull both murders. My Greeley and my brother. I'll testify and I'll ride there in a cab on your dough, Giffen. Yeah. Are you going to pose or take me, Hellman? If you're anxious. Sorry about you, Norma. You get nothing out of this, but that's better than I got. Goodbye, Ann. Lots of luck. Thank you, darling. You know what kind. I hope you're rot. Come on, Hellman. I'm ashamed of you, Ann. Leave me alone, Norma. I'm ashamed of you, Ann. What you did to Joe, I'm ashamed of you. Leave me alone, Norma. I'm sick, you know that. I didn't know how it was going to work out. Poor Joe was trying to help you when you got greedy. He was trying to help you. That's the only reason he came out. You let this happen. I told you I didn't know how it was going to end. I thought they'd get him and take him back again. There's no good in you, Anne. They couldn't find good in you anywhere. You let that happen to Joe. You stood by and watched him walk into something like that. All right, I stood by. What can we do about it now except weep, and that won't help him. But hating you will... That'll help Joe a little. I'm here at least to hate you for the short time left. Please, Norma. Giffen told you to spend it fast. Well, you better. You better spend it fast. 
Ask him at the hospital if that isn't so. What do you mean? Ask him out there what you've got. They don't. You ask him what you've got. Ask him what's staring you to pieces. Ask him, they'll tell you. They'll tell you you've got cancer. Norma, please. They'll tell you cancer. Ask them. They'll tell you you're full of it. Now spend your money. Spend your money and see that it lasts as long as you do. (laughs) (laughs) Goodbye, girls. Hello, Mr. Novak. Well, did you miss much, Father? No. Feldman luck is running kind of bad tonight. It does for some people, I guess. All they get is unhappiness. They wear it the same way you'd wear a sports coat, only they never seem to get a new one. I'm sorry about tonight, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry it's not a smoother world. Yeah. But if it were, you'd be out of a job, Father. See you later. If you get a bad first break, you never run the table. That's what happened to Joe Feldman. Charlie Giffen owed him dough and wouldn't pay up. But Joe didn't care until Norma showed up and told him how sick Ann was, so he decided to collect from Giffen and divide the dough between the girls. Father Leahy couldn't stop him. All he could do was try and make it work out. Joe was going to get the dough and meet the girls in that hotel room, but he changed his timetable and sent Mike Greeley up to tell the girls. Giffen showed up there and figured that Mike had tumbled to a double cross, so he killed him. Anne engineered the double cross, but she didn't mean to go that far. She wanted all the dough and tipped off Giffen. He was supposed to turn the dough over to her and then have the police pick up Joe, but Joe got there early. He took the dough away from Giffen and shot the copper on the way out. Giffen followed Joe and killed him out on Arguello, but the dough was gone. He finally tumbled to Norma's place, and that's how her apartment filled up so fast. Well, Hellman asked only one question. What did I get out of all this? Nothing. Father Leahy offered me 50 bucks, but I didn't want it. Jocko was with me, and he offered to give it to charity. I guess he did, because where Jocko spent it, the drinks aren't worth money. Pat Novak for Hire was previously released by ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, for listeners in the United States, and rebroadcast for our men and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover.
When it's December and the winter has caught hold, Broadway comes up with a miracle. Silver trees grow out of the sidewalks. Men with beards and red velvet suits suddenly appear from out of the Bowery and dedicate themselves to being jolly. And reindeer roam the tundra of the spectaculars. It's a time of Crosby records, noses against department store windows, and wishing you'd kept up the Christmas club payments. Everybody's happy. Even the finance company sends you season's greetings. The atmosphere hadn't touched the alley, littered and dark, except for a stark cone from a flashlight held by a policeman. Up here, Danny. Shot twice in the back. Still breathing. Come on. Come on, Doc. Take a look, Doc. Let's put him on the stretcher. I don't think this one's got much time. Give me a hand here. Yeah. Easy. We'll have him in the hospital in five minutes. Know who he is, Mugman? Yeah. His wallet says Ben Justin. Here it is. The ideas of what happened? I think he knows who shot him, Danny. He was saying he'll get even. Any names? Uh-uh, no. Easy with him now. Just slide the stretcher in here. We'll ride with him. Let's go, Mugovan. Yeah. Okay, Joe, let's get this ambulance on the road. Kill him. Kill him with my bird. Who are you going to kill, Ben? Watch it, Danny. Fly him now, here, hold the bottle up like this. Yeah. Is it all right if I talk to him? You better hurry. Who shot you, Ben? Can you hear me, Ben? Ben. Wait a second. Hey, Joe, you can take it easy. Take your time. He's dead, Danny. Then the slow ride through swarming avenues, the slow tolling of the ambulance bell, because the rhythm of death is slow. Through the windows of the moving car, the procession of fleeting faces, of melting forms scurrying from the bitter touch of an unknown wind. Then suddenly, at a stop, because death in the city must wait its turn, the face peering in, avid for a furtive glimpse of pain, seeing only the shroud-covered man, turning away in regret. The ambulance moves again, and within it, silence, because there are no more questions that can be asked of the dead. At headquarters, the setting up of a file on Ben Justin. The word, murdered, neatly typed in triplicate. Then the fragments of his life drifting in to be pieced together, to be entered under the correct heading, on the correct line. Ben Justin lived in an apartment on West 86th. He was married to a woman named Evelyn. Go there. Ask her the question the dying man wouldn't answer. Ben didn't tell you? He was bleeding to death and he wouldn't tell you who killed him? No, Miss Justin. I like him for that. For a lot of other reasons, but this one's the best. And you will want to help us find his murderer. No, uh-uh, that's your job. That's what you get paid for. They shot him down in an alley. Sorry, there. but that's how I feel about things. You get what you work for in this world. No one can do it for you. You want Ben's killer? Find him. That way he'll belong to you, just you. If you know something, Mrs. Justin, we can hold you. Now, wherever did you get an idea like that? How would I know who killed Ben? It's his secret. He's taking it to his grave with him. Maybe I didn't tell you. Ben's last words were that he would kill him with his bare hands. Ben can't do that now, can he? But you can do something, Mrs. Justin. You can tell me about Ben. You can tell me who wanted him dead. Tell you about Ben? I could take my lifetime. But I'll brief it down for you. Ben did good by me. Dressed me in fancy clothes, showy. Showed me off to his friends. Didn't mind if one made a play for me. Grinned it off. Grinned about it when we got home. Cuffed me a little, and we go to sleep laughing. That's about Ben. Doesn't help us much. Then try this. Ben used to work for the Imperial Insurance Company, an investigator. Go ask them about Ben. I bet those insurance people knew more about him than even his wife knew. It's their business. Imperial Insurance? On Lower Broadway. You can excuse yourself now, Mr. Clover. I want to go over my wardrobe, pick out a black dress for Ben's funeral. Silk... Yeah, Silk. He liked me in it. Uh, 
Yeah, it's very intriguing what you tell me, Mr. Clover. Look, why don't we go downstairs and chat about it over a cup of coffee? Hmm? Now, Mr. Kogan. Oh, you don't understand, kid. I haven't had my breakfast. How can I do my best for Imperial Insurance without something hot in my stomach? We're trying to find out who killed the man. For this, I have to miss my breakfast? I tell you, you don't understand. My wife sleeps in the morning. She doesn't ben make Justin me... Ben Justin used to work for you. I want you to give me what you know about him. Now. Because it won't wait. Well, on an empty stomach? All right. All right. Yeah, he worked for us. One of our hottest cases. You're a goalie that kissed us goodbye. You don't know anything about him after that. You're just... Uh... Look, kid, did I say that? I know a lot about Ben. Let me open my mouth a little, huh? It's open. A year ago, we put Ben on the Colton murder case. Remember it? Who doesn't? Mrs. Colton found murdered, shot to death in her house on Long Island. That one cost us, uh, the company, a hundred grand. The police were handling it. Why did you put a private investigator on it? Oh, don't let it bother you. Justin flopped, too. He said he couldn't find a thing to prove that Mrs. Colton's nephew and his wife committed the mayhem. Remember Johnny and Dottie Reed? The lovable kids that all of us thought were the murderers. The state, us, till they were acquitted. No evidence, not even from our own boy, Ben. And after that, Ben quit. How did you know? Oh, I told you, yeah. He turned in a memo that we should pay the kids the hundred grand insurance the aunt left the boy. Shook hands all around, resigned. Then right away we find out he was making merry with the Reed kids, all over town, in their home. How do you know that? It was a password in our office, how... Ben and his wife were always in the company of the kids. Why? The kids were acquitted? They have the right to make their own friends? For a hundred grand, we keep trying. Uh. Do I get coffee now? Yeah. yeah. Here's a dime. Let it be on me. Hello. What can I do for you? My name's Danny Clover from the police. Yeah. Is your name Reed? Yeah, that's right. I wanted... Uh... You've got to look in your eyes. You want to talk to me, don't you? Come on in. In here. I know that look, Mr. Clover. The police and I have been chummy before. Is your wife here? Vacuuming the rugs in the dining room. Daddy! Hey, Daddy! Yeah, what do you want, Johnny? Turn off the Lewitt and come in here. We've got a caller. I hope you don't mind the way Dottie looks. <laughs> Holiday cleaning. What'd you say? Oh. Uh, this is Danny Clover, Dottie. He's from the police. I'll be honest with you, Mr. Clover. I'm busy. Well, just a few questions about Ben Justin. <laughs> Guess I'm right, Dottie, huh? Soon as I saw this morning's paper, I told you a policeman would be twirling his hat at the door. Then you talk to him, Johnny. I've got to get my work done. I'm afraid you'll have to hold it off for about five minutes, Miss Reed. Do you have a warrant? I don't need one. All I uh, want... <laughs> Dottie gets all mixed up. Ever since the cops scattered a debt last year, well, she just could be lost, and the only person around, a cop, and she wouldn't ask him which way was home. Johnny isn't kidding. Cops. How well did you two know Ben Justin? We're not going to his funeral. Not even flowers, Mr. Clover. Funny. I heard you were pretty good friends. Two weeks ago, Johnny and I took turns yawning in his face. He still wouldn't go home. Then he used to drop in here often. Mm, maybe a couple times a month. <laughs> when I shook his hand after we were acquitted, he took that to mean buddy. He couldn't get through his head out of shaking anybody's hand. Ben now. Justin tried to send you to the chair. I don't understand. Neither did we. You inherited a lot of money when your aunt was killed, didn't you, Mr. Reed? You people can't leave us alone, can you? Hey, you shouldn't have asked that, Mr. Clover. Dottie's going to be upset all day. It's going to be like this for the rest of our lives. Daddy. No matter what we do, where we go, it's going to be the same way. Get him out of here, Johnny. Get him out of here. You heard him, Mr. Clover. You better get out. Dottie's busy. <laughs> If I turn on the radiator, Danny, it's cold in here. Huh? You stand it. There. Danny, you've been over and over the transcript of a year old trial maybe a hundred times. You want something juicy to read? Here, try this pulp. It's good, huh? Tells me the thrilling things detectives have happened to them. For two bits, it thrills even me. The things that go on. Mrs. Colton was killed with Johnny Reed's gun. Our ballistics man proved it. Brought it in evidence. Exhibit A. But no fingerprints. No fingerprints. 
And if you read the transcript another hundred times, there still won't be any. What are you trying to build, It Danny? bothers me. You mind, Muggervin? Danny, listen to me. The kid had a right to the gun. Messenger boy for a brokerage house. Briefcase is full of stocks and bonds, sometimes even money. A boy needs a gun in a career like that. They present him with it, courtesy of the house. And it killed his aunt, endowed two kids with $100,000. The gun could have been stolen from him, just like he said. His wife put her arms around him. He felt different somehow to her without the gun. That was the first they knew it was missing, just like they said in court. Yeah. I don't understand what you're after, Danny. The kids were acquitted. I know. They said they spent the day picnicking on the Jersey Palisades. Nobody could prove different. Nobody could prove they were at the murder house that day. They were acquitted. I told you I know, Muggerman. Then what's with you? You think you found a free and easy way to solve Ben Justin's murder? I take it back, Danny. I, uh, I didn't mean to say that. Why so chummy with the Reed kids? You mean Justin and his wife? You care about anyone else? Justin was a top insurance investigator. He couldn't find a thing to prove that the kids were anywhere else but eating ham and cheese sandwiches on the Palisades. That cinched it. When an insurance company... Danny, you gotta go. You just gotta. Here, I brought your overcoat. I'll help you into it. It's not too much, Tartaglia. Where am I going? To the residence of one Mrs. Evelyn Justin. She just phoned in, Danny. She was crying, then screaming. In between said cries and screams was sandwiched that someone was trying to kill her. I made her go slow so I could take her down in shorthand. Here, Danny. Her very words. Yeah. Get your coat, Muggerman. It's a cold ride. Down this hall, Muggerman. Come on. Right behind you. Wish I'd taken that call. Sounds real quiet in there. Locked, huh, Danny? Lean on the bell, Muggerman. Yeah. Danny! Danny, something happened. Kick it in. <laughs> Mrs. Justin! Watch it, Danny. The place is a furnace. Mrs. Justin! Danny, you can't go in there. Don't be crazy. Yeah. I don't understand. What happened? We ring the bell, we blow the place up. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. There should be plenty of action on CBS Hopalong Cassidy show tomorrow night. Hoppy will be invading the land of the Gunhawks. And though this may not sound full of action at first, he'll finally play dead to capture a band of vicious marauders. Hopalong Cassidy, starring Bill Boyd, comes your way every Saturday evening on most of these same CBS stations. Join him in the land of Gunhawks tomorrow night. On the eve of the holiday, Broadway opens wide its loudspeakers, takes last year's tinsel off a back shelf, considers its tarnish, shrugs and hangs it in a doorway, in a shop window. Just above the summer resort sports shirt sprinkled with artificial snow and decked with dust-covered holly. It makes glints in the winter's sun, sways gently in the winter's wind, and it makes you all warm inside, doesn't it, kid? The warm-eyed women walking by, hugging the warm fur close to them, makes you merry, and the music floating out of the metallic throats. Good, huh, kid? But turn it up. That way you won't hear the dissonance of death. That way it won't intrude that explosion uptown. Anyone killed? No one knows yet, but when they do, it'll be given to you. Hot off the presses, shining from the translux, gift-wrapped with red ribbons. But before that happens, they've got to clear away the charred litter, hold the crowds back, assure the lady her kid wasn't in there. You don't know where he is. And then finally a man comes up to you. It's all clear now, Danny. We can go in. They find anything? Uh-huh. They said in the kitchen. They said to watch ourselves. The walls are still smoldering. Okay, let's go, Mugger. Yeah. Yeah. He said in the kitchen. Uh-huh. Watch it, Danny. Doorway don't look any Come on. Too. Not much left, is it, Danny? You were here before. Not much left, huh? Broken up in smoke. Hey. Yeah. Mrs. Justin? Yep. Explosion must have done it, huh, Danny? The way she... The way... She was beaten up first. Slugged. See? Here. Mm. Here. Yeah. They made sure, huh, Danny? If we hadn't rung the doorbell, maybe they... 
Call it in, Muggerman, to homicide. Hi-ho, Danny. I come bearing gifts from the boys in technical to you. You thank them for me, Gino. Goes without saying. Christmas is coming, Danny. Courtesy is the motto of the season. A fellow has to... Goes without saying. What have you got? Gift number one. You are confirmed in your deduction that Mrs. Justin was slugged, left unconscious to... To, uh... Well, you were there, Danny. I don't have to spell it out for you. No, Gino. For this pearl, my thanks. This, a poet once but said... Tag, Leo. Yeah, Danny. Gift number two. The doorbell was rigged to a booby trap of a type commonly used in the last... Hmm, last. What am I saying? Ring the doorbell and... Boom! Blast! Poof! It was that professional. To the contrary, wise is Mr. Gordon from Technical. He says it was a clumsy imitation. Gordon didn't like it, huh? He sniffed his nose at it. However, in the matter of an inferno machine, what matters clumsy, huh, Danny? Anything else? Nothing else. Except an itching in my brain. Huh? Yeah. I am making out my Christmas list, and it itches me. Want to give Mike Shrek, the bald-headed miracle detector from Philadelphia, for Christmas. Ah, uh, the joy he has brought me. I should return it with a likewise. You... you got a suggestion, Danny? Yeah, only a question, Gino. How did you know it was Mrs. Justin you talked to on the phone? Well, she told me, Danny. Several times she told me. Well, what reason would I have to disbelieve what a lady tells me? You're trying to make out I'm a gulliver, Danny? You know... Pardon me, Gina. Likewise, I'm sure. When they tell you their name, see if you... Danny can... Clover speaking. Now, this is Swifty Crenshaw of the 34th Street Post Office, Mr. Clover. They referred me to you. Why? Oh, because I'm holding some undelivered mail for Mrs. Evelyn Justin. Bet you'd love to get your hands on it. Yeah, I would. Fine. Just ask for Swifty Crenshaw. Everybody knows me. Bye now. Hey, who was it, Danny? A Swifty Crenshaw from the post office. Swift... Cran? See? See how you two can be a Gulliver, Danny? You Mr. Crenshaw? Uh, you bet. My name's Clover. I spoke to you on the phone a little while ago. You bet. Just wait here. Here. Here you are. The mail addressed to Mrs. Ben Justin. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, there's not much there. Circulars, a few Christmas cards from people who heed our message to mail early. One there that's sealed and the center tried to mail a third class. Postage due on that one, but I guess we can forget it, huh? Uh, I can save you trouble turning over that postcard. It's for a free grease job with 15 gallons of gas. Uh, that other is for a book overdue at the library. You've been having yourself a time, haven't you, Mr. Crenshaw? Hey, you bet. What's in this envelope? How do I know? Hey, it's no use holding an envelope like that up to the light. It's Manila. It's postmarked yesterday. Addressed to Mrs. Ben Justin. The old box 626, 34th Street Station, New York, New York. Return address. The same. She addressed it to herself? Uh, what's in it? You bet, Mr. Crenshaw. Now. Okay, okay. Tell him to hurry. Mr. Jasper will speak to you. Good. Mr. Jasper on the phone. What about it, Jasper? You say you have a carbon copy of a subscription form for today's Lady Magazine? Where did you get it? In an envelope. Come on, your girl said you were looking it up, Jasper. The form is used by your company. Signed with the initials D.F. Who is D.F.? Donald Fraser. He would have gotten 400 points if he'd handed the subscription in. Why didn't he? Where does Donald Fraser live? 19 West 16th. He's a pretty good... Yeah. Thanks. You better come along, Muggerman. Right. You ring the bell this time, Danny. No, I'll ring it. I read someplace if you crash in an airplane, the first thing to do is to go up in another one. Now, you ring the bell, Danny. Thanks. (sighs) 
What do you want? Are you Donald Fraser? So, what do you want? We're from the police. <laughs> Didn't you hear, Donald? We're from the police. Let's go inside. <sighs> Sit down, Donald. Do you want a cigarette, Donald? I don't smoke. You drink? No, I can't stand the taste. He's got refined taste, Danny. You signed this magazine subscription form, didn't you? Or didn't you? I don't know. You know. You know, don't you? I signed it. All right. You took a magazine subscription on November 2nd, 1949. That's the date on this form. It's also the date Mrs. Colton was shot to death. So... What's that got to do with anything? It's got this to do with it. It's a magazine subscription for Mrs. Colton. You took the subscription. Who signed it? I'll tell you. You're not kidding. Let him alone, Margaret. I, uh, I came by Mrs. Colton's that morning selling subscriptions. Mrs. Colton said to come back later. She wanted time to make up her mind. When you came back, Johnny Reed was there with his wife. I said, leave him alone. Yeah, that's right. They were there that day. The girl yelled up to her aunt that I'd come back. Mrs. Colton said to take the subscription... The girl signed for her. That does it, Danny. Not quite. Donald, then uh, then Ben Justin got to you, didn't he? He was investigating the murder and tracked down a lead that a magazine salesman was on the Colton block that day. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, the very next day. Before I had a chance to turn the form in to Mr. Jasper. I, I, I shouldn't have done it. I know I shouldn't have done it. For a thousand dollars, the trouble I'm in. I didn't mean to do anything. He talked me into it. Oh, it's you. What do you want? Let's go inside, Mrs. Reed. Remember how busy I was yesterday? I'm busier today. That's too bad. I want to talk to you, and I want to talk to your husband. All right, come in. I've got an idea Johnny's going to throw you right out, and I want to watch. Johnny! Johnny! Yeah? Look who's here, Johnny. Huh? Oh. Hi, Mr. Bowman. Can I get you something? I just broke out a quart of beer. No, thanks. I want to talk to you alone. Ah, sure, sure. My pleasure. Hey, go make us some coffee, Daddy. I told him you were going to throw him out, Johnny. You're making a liar out of me. Just get the coffee, Daddy. Then you'll throw him out? If he annoys me. All right, Johnny. Now, what's a good word, Mr. Clover? What have you been doing with yourself lately, Johnny? Oh, this and that. I got enough money. I'm lucky with the horses. The money gets used up and replenished. I envy you. Yeah, got a system. That's fine. I'm glad to hear of it. Is this what you come all the way out here to talk to me about? You impressed me the last time I talked to you. <laughs> you kidding? No, I'm not. Say, uh, you think Dottie needs any help with the coffee? Yeah, probably. She's all thumbs. But she doesn't like you, Mr. Clover. Uh, maybe if I help her with the coffee. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you do that? Help her with the coffee. Uh, mine's with cream, Mr. Clover. Two sugars. What do you want? I just came in to tell you to get your hat and coat. That sounds familiar. That's right. You're under arrest. <laughs> hey! You're doing all right, Mr. Clover. You're under arrest for murder. Let me tell you why it sounds familiar, Mr. Clover. Because it's happened before. What happened before? A year ago, when Johnny and I were arrested for the murder of his aunt, the police separated Johnny and me. Then one cop came to me and said Johnny confessed. That way I was supposed to break down. They did the same thing to Johnny. <laughs> oh, as a policeman, you're a real nothing, Mr. Clover. A real nothing. <laughs> hey, let me laugh with you, huh? Oh, say, you remember what they tried on us before, Johnny, trying to make us confess? Well, your friend Clover just tried it again. <laughs> oh, Clover, Clover. All right, you had your fun. Don't you think you ought to go home now? I haven't had my coffee yet. Daddy makes such lousy coffee. It really isn't worth it. You know, I don't understand you. Throw him out, Johnny. That's what I mean. I came here to give you something for Christmas. Maybe I'm a little early. Maybe I should come back. If you're giving, we're receiving. What do you got? This. The magazine subscription form that your wife signed last year in your aunt's house. Where'd you get it? From Mrs. Justin's post office box at 34th Street Station. You got it figured, huh, Mr. Clover? Sure. It's proof that the two of you were at Ms. Colton's the day she was murdered. The piece of evidence the D.A. didn't have at your trial. Johnny, they can't try us again, can they? You, uh, 
planning to reopen a trial with new evidence, Danny? It won't be necessary. Justin bought this subscription form from the salesman. He was blackmailing you with it. Then a little while ago, he got afraid of you two, passed it on to his wife. That's where she had it, huh? That's where she mailed it for safekeeping after you killed her husband. You thought you destroyed it when your wife called headquarters and had me set off that booby trap. And now you've got it. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Danny. How much you want? How much were you paying Justin before you killed him? Don't bargain. How much? All of it. Everything you got. I want you to sign a confession, you and your wife. Let me sit down. Think about it. <laughs> Serve the coffee, Daddy. You gonna stir it with that gun? No. I'm gonna kill you with the gun. You want one slug or two? Johnny! Hey! 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 This will put you out of your misery, Johnny! Half of it, Mr. Clover. All of it. You can have anything you want. I've got what I want. Let's get your coat, Mrs. Reed. In the midnight cold, Broadway echoes with sounds you hear only in darkness. The fleeting whispers that speckle places where there's no sun. People pass and touch you. You look down, there are fingers of dust on your shoulder. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Anthony Barrett, Sam Edwards, Virginia Gregg, Michael Ann Barrett, Sidney Miller, and Jack Crucian. Now, here's Larry Thor. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's program concludes the present series of Broadway's My Beat. We thank you for listening and hope to return to the air in the near future when Danny Clover will bring you more adventures along the Great White Way. Next week at this time, most of these same CBS stations will bring you a new program featuring Edward R. Murrow, Columbia's famed news reporter. This new program will be called Report to the Nation, and during its 60 minutes, Mr. Murrow will bring you not only important war and political news, but also summaries of all that's bright and new in the world of music, the theater, sports, and the other colorful, varied fields of American life. You'll hear recordings of great speeches and great events in the week preceding each Friday night broadcast. Report to the Nation will report the news for CBS listeners in this unprecedented series of broadcasts. Be listening for Report to the Nation next Friday evening on CBS. Dan Coverly speaking. This is CBS, the Star's Address, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, first with premium quality and best for you. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a missing persons detail. You get a call that a man is missing. He failed to return from his work the day before. There are no leads to his whereabouts. Your job, find him.
Here is Chesterfield's record with smokers, and important to you. No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report of a doctor who has been examining a group of Chesterfield smokers for a full year and two months as a part of a program supervised by a responsible independent research laboratory. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. First with premium quality. Chesterfield. First choice of young America. And that's from a survey made in 274 colleges and universities. Try Chesterfields today. Chesterfield. Regular or king size. They're much milder and best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, June 16th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of Homicide Division, missing persons detail. My partner is Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detectives Thad Brown. My name's Friday. I was on my way back to the office, and it was 11.59 p.m. when I got to room 24. Missing persons. What was his mental condition when you last saw him, Mr. Ford? Where'd you last see him? Was he driving his car? Mm Mm-hmm. And what time was that? Yes, ma'am, but what was the exact time? I see. And your address? And the phone, please. Now, can you think of anything you forgot to tell me? Right. Right. Now, you gave me that before. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, was your husband a drinking man, ma'am? I see. Okay, Miss Borg, we'll make a check. Call you back. Yes, ma'am, we'll do our best, thanks. Anything? Man by the name of Borg missing. Mm -hmm. I'm sure glad my wife doesn't call for help every time I miss a meal. Trouble with most guys is to let a woman keep tabs on them. Check on everything they do. Let me see that 9-7, will you? Yeah, there you go. It's everything his wife gave me. Mm-hmm. When you get the jails and records, I'll check Georgia Street County Hospital in the morgue. Looked like a routine investigation. Lots of things can keep a man from getting home. A few drinks, sick friend, unexpected business conference, a flat tire on an isolated road, maybe just boredom. But there are other things that can keep a man from getting home. It had to be checked out. Henry Borg, 51, male, white American, address 1571 East Barendo Street, had failed to return home at the usual time on Monday. His wife called one of the men he worked with and found that he hadn't been at work all day that day. He still hadn't come home the next afternoon. She called us. I checked the Gaga file to see if he was one of our regular customers, mental case or alcoholic. He wasn't. Frank and I checked the jails, the hospitals, and the morgue. They had no record of him there. No John Doe's fitting his description. And Borg had no criminal record. We could assume that he was at least alive. Frank called Mrs. Borg back, told her not to worry, and asked her to call us immediately if she heard from her husband. Wednesday, 3.10 p.m., still no word of Henry Borg. The day watch had made another check of the jails, the hospitals, and the morgue. Mrs. Borg called three times. The day watch officer's notes described her as very upset. I called her back and asked her to come in the next day to file a missing persons report. I asked her also to bring in the best picture she had of her husband. Thursday, 2.40 p.m. Mrs. Borg was waiting with Frank when I got to work. She'd already filled out the Form 316. She was holding an aging Pekingese dog in her arms. Joe, this is Mrs. Borg. How are you, ma'am? My partner, Joe Friday, ma'am. Hello, Officer Friday. I talked to Mr. Smith and filled out the paper. Here's that picture you wanted. Oh, yes. Thank you very much, ma'am. It's a good likeness. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, Ms. Borg, I see here that you haven't put anything down under personal habits for your husband. Well, I don't understand. Well, does your husband drink at all, ma'am? Henry? No. He takes a glass of beer with his supper when he comes home, but he's not what a person would call a drinking person. Gamble? Gamble? Yes, ma'am. Cards, dice, horses. Oh, I should say not. He never does nothing like that. You've never known him to gamble at all, then? Henry? I should say not. Now, Miss Borg, you say here that your husband has no relatives. Oh, only a brother, Ed, older brother, but I didn't put him down. We don't know where he lives. Haven't heard a word about him nine, ten years. Mm-hmm. What about your family? Your husband friendly with your family? My family hasn't spoke to me since the day I married Henry Borg. 
Mrs. Borg, I see you only have one friend listed to Hal Bishop. That's the man your husband rode to work with, isn't it? Yes. Do you know Mr. Bishop's address? No, I don't. Did your husband ride to work with Bishop every day? You say he left his car at home Monday. Did he ever drive it to work? Well, he usually drove our car, but then he'd ride with Mr. Bishop pretty often, too. I didn't think anything about it. It didn't seem like anything. Well, did your husband spend much time with this Bishop? No, just at work. Henry used to like to spend his free time with me. All right, now, ma'am, please don't get upset here. Did your husband have any financial problems, debts that were worrying him? Financial difficulties, like bills and things? No, Henry always took care of it. Do you think there might have been anything you didn't know about that was worrying him? Officer, if Henry was worried about anything, I'd have known it. He'd have told me for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, what about your home? Do you own it? What do you mean? Was there a mortgage on it, I mean? Yes. Do you have the pink slip on your car? No, no. Well, is it possible that your husband was behind in the payments? No, no. He would have told me. Well, did he owe money down where he worked? No, not that I know of. His job, maybe. Was he worried about that? Mr. Snyder, that's his boss. Well, he always said Henry would have a job as long as he was in the contracting business. Henry makes good wages. Mm-hmm. Now, you say here his mental condition was good. Has that ever been poor? You ever know your husband to black out? How do you mean, black out? Well, has he ever suffered from lapse of memory? Is there any history of epilepsy in his family? History of epilepsy? Oh, no, not Henry. Why, he's a healthy man. He hasn't had a sick day. Now, Miss Borg, have you and your husband been getting along lately? What do you mean by a thing like that, officer? You think Henry and I had a fight and that's why he left. Is that what you think? No, ma'am. We don't think anything here, but these are the things we have to check out. Well, it's a waste of time. Don't you think I'd have already told you that? If Henry and I'd had a fight, I'd have told your first officer the first thing I'd have said. Yes, ma'am. Something's happened to my husband, officer. I just know it. Something's happened to him. Did you and your husband go out together much, ma'am? Well... One night last month, we went to the Coconut Grove, there in the Ambassador Hotel. And we used to go up the movies pretty regular. Was he in the habit of leaving the house at night alone? No. Just when he went out with Francine. Francine? Yes, our our Pekingese here. Three fifty-five p.m. Thursday, June eighteenth. Began to look as if Henry Borg was in trouble. From what we'd been told, he wasn't a man who had just suddenly decided to leave home. We had to find out if the facts we'd been given were accurate. Thursday, four ten p.m. We contacted Borg's friend Hal Bishop just as he was leaving the construction job where they both worked. He said he hadn't gone by Borg's house to pick him up Monday because Borg hadn't asked him to. The way they worked it, Borg always told him the day before if he wanted a ride. At first, Bishop said he hadn't noticed anything strange about Borg recently. Then he decided Borg had been a little irritable the last few days. He said it wasn't like him to be irritable. That he'd never known Borg to miss work before. And that he'd never heard of any trouble between Borg and his wife. He said that Borg didn't talk much about his wife. We called on the neighbors of the Borgs. They said nothing to indicate any flaws in Mrs. Borg's story. Henry and Martha Borg were average people in an average neighborhood. He went to work every morning at 7 a.m. Came home at 5.15. His neighbors didn't know much about him. He was a quiet man. They lived in the same house for 13 years. Martha Borg was 47, maybe 48. They never had visitors. After 13 years in the same neighborhood, she apparently had no close friends. Two of her neighbors had noticed that in the past year, Martha Borg would leave her house three or four times a week at 11 a.m. Always at 11 a.m. She invariably got back before her husband did. The neighbors said she usually brought some shopping home with her. They did go out frequently in the evenings. However, there were no reports of family trouble between Martha and Henry Borg. Thursday, 6.20 p.m., we talked to Adolph Wernicke, whose grocery store was on the corner a half a block from the Borg home. They'd been trading with him ever since they moved to the neighborhood. I don't know what to tell you about Mr. Borg, officer. He always seemed like a nice fellow to me. He didn't say much, but nice. Sure is funny, him disappearing like that. Mm-hmm. You got any idea if he had any trouble with his wife? No, that wife, she's a funny one. Different from Mr. Borg is day and night. Well, how's that, sir? Mm, I don't know. I had sort of. She's all right, I guess. Kind of show off, though. Kind of person who dresses up when she goes shopping around the corner. Likes to buy fancy groceries, stuff I never get calls for. Like those anchovies up there on the shelf. Now, I'll bet you I won't sell two cans of them in a year, but Mrs. Borg comes in and she'll buy them. Now, Mr. Borg, he don't like that kind of stuff at all. Told me so himself. Yes, sir, but how'd they get along? Do you ever say anything about his wife? I'll tell you the truth, officer, I don't know. As far as a man and his wife arguing, I don't pry. Hurts business. Come to think of it... He did say one thing. It was a long time ago, about two, three months ago, maybe more. Well, what was that? What did he say? Well, he came in here, just about like this time it was. Didn't buy anything, just kind of hung around. 
Remember, he seemed out of sorts. I asked him if he was feeling all right. He said he was. Just felt like he had to get away from the house. Now, that'll happen to a man. Just feel like you got to get away for a while. But you know what I mean, officer. No, sir, I'm not married. Thursday, 7.50 p.m. Borg's description and the circumstances of his disappearance have been broadcast to all units. Still no word. 4.10 p.m. Friday, June 19th. We checked Borg's union. He hadn't reported for a new job. We filed an all-points bulletin. 8.05 p.m. I checked back into the office. Mrs. Borg was waiting. Sergeant Friday, I'd like to know just what's going on around here. My husband has been missing almost a week, and I don't see why something hasn't been done about it. If you can't find my husband, then why don't they put more men on this case? This is a terrible thing. I'm a woman alone, and the police haven't done a single thing. My husband may be dead. He may be dead, and nobody's doing anything about it. In my work, you hear it every day, but you can't get mad. It's against regulations, and you can't blame them either. They're in trouble, so you let them talk. You try to explain. They don't listen, but you try. Well, we're doing all we can, ma'am. They're always talking these days about giving policemen more money. It seems to me there are certain policemen who aren't even earning the money they get right now. Yes, ma'am. What are you doing for my husband? Miss Borg, here's the file on it. Now, we've made regular checks on the hospitals, the jails, and the morgues. Thursday night when you came in to file that Form 316, we had a complete description of your husband broadcast to all radio units in the city. It was teletyped to every police division. Today, we sent out an all-points bulletin over the state wire. Every police department, sheriff's office, and highway patrol unit in the state knows that your husband is missing. Here, you can see the bulletin right here, ma'am. Now, in these cases, ma'am, we start with nothing. We don't know where they've gone or why they've gone. Most of them turn up by themselves. Some of them don't. We do everything we can to find the ones that don't. Miss Borg, there are 4,000 police officers in this city looking for your husband. p.m. When we thought Mrs. Borg was feeling better, we sent her home. We reminded her again to notify us immediately if she heard from her husband. 9.10 p.m. The desk at Central called and told us that they'd picked up a John Doe. From what they said, he apparently was suffering from amnesia. While I went down to Homicide to check out some reports, Frank went over to Central to see the man they picked up. 9.16 p.m. Frank came back to the office. Joe. Yeah? Just checked out that John Doe at Central. Anything on him? Yeah, it's Henry Borg. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Years ahead of them all. Chesterfield is years ahead of all cigarettes. Chesterfield quality is highest. Here's the proof. Recent chemical analyses give an index of good quality for the country's six leading cigarette brands. The index of good quality table, which is a ratio of high sugar to low nicotine, shows Chesterfield quality highest. Chesterfield quality, highest. 15% higher than its nearest competitor. Chesterfield quality, highest. 31% higher than the average of the five other leading brands. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield, first with premium quality and best for you. Try Chesterfield today, regular or king size. p.m. Officers Gorman and Mayer brought in Henry Borg, alias John Doe. They found him wandering around in the 900 block down on South Spring Street, the financial district. Wasn't much reason for anybody to be loitering around there at that time of night. All the businesses in the area were closed. The officers investigated. When they questioned the suspect, he would not or could not reply. They took him to Central Division, where the watch commander, Lieutenant Hale, had him shaken down. His wallet was missing. No papers, no identification. In his pockets, the officers found eight cents a key ring and several keys. No cigarettes, no matches. He was dressed in a good quality worsted suit, very rumpled. No tie, no hat. Norman and Mayer had rolled his prints at the city hall and sent them to Leighton Prince for classification. During this time, no one let him know that we had any idea who he was. The two officers that had picked him up stood by. Frank and I walked over to where he was sitting. Do you know who you are? Feel sick? Been drinking, maybe? Would you have a rough night? Look, if you can talk, mister, I think you better make things a lot simpler here. We're trying to help you. How about telling us who you are? Maybe there's something wrong with you, mister, but we don't think so. We want to know who you are. We want you to tell us. 
If you don't, the only thing we can do is let them book you at city jail as a John Doe. That's the law. Now, look, if you're trying to hide something, if you're wanted, we're going to know it in a few minutes anyhow. If you want to wait, we'll wait it out with you. You want us to think you're an amnesia case, is that it? Well, maybe you got a good reason, but it won't work. I've been in this department a long time. I've seen a lot of phony amnesia cases. I've only seen one real one, and he didn't act like you. You want to know what I think? I think you're pulling a phony. Come on. How about it, mister? I get it. Missing persons, friend. All right. Yeah. You bet. Thanks very much. Right. Okay. That was Leighton Prince, mister. They got your fingerprints classified. Now, we know you're not wanted for anything. Look, we know you're not a bum. Your clothes are good, and you look like a guy who takes good care of himself. A man like you doesn't walk around without a wallet. What happened to you? You got a problem? Tell us about it. Maybe we can help you. Now, why don't you tell us who you are? You probably got a wife. She must be mighty worried about you right now. All right. Book him. I lost my wallet. How? I don't know how. Where? I don't know where I've been. Now, you listen to me, mister. We want to know who you are. We want to know where you've been, and we want to know right now. I don't know who I am. Let me see your hands. What? Your hands. Come on, hold them up. Let me see them. That's it. Now, I'm going to tell you something about yourself, mister. You work for a living, don't you? Hard work with your hands. Like a mason, maybe, huh? Yeah, maybe you're a mason or a hod carrier. You could be a painter. Some kind of construction work, I'd say. Something like a plasterer, for instance, huh? You couldn't be a plasterer by any chance, could you, mister? I don't know. Okay. You ready to talk to us now, Henry? I wasn't trying to fool you. I was only trying to fool myself. Now, we've been looking for you since Tuesday, Borg. Your wife's pretty worried. I'm not going back. No matter what you do, I'm not going back. We're not going to make you go back. That's up to you, Borg. All they pay us for, mister, is to find you, to make sure you're okay. None of our business if you go back. I'm not going back. All right, now, look, you're pretty upset, Borg. Why don't you tell us about it? It's crazy. It's crazy what I did. It doesn't make any sense. You fellas, you wouldn't be interested. Maybe I'll just go if it's all right with you. I'll just go. Yeah, it's all right. It's okay if you want to. Look, we're going to be around here another hour. We haven't got much to do. Our work's all cleaned up. We're just about ready to go home. Why don't you stick around and talk to us, huh? We'd kind of like to hear what happened. Yeah. Just might help you clear things up in your mind if you talked about it. Oh, it's crazy. I know it's crazy, but I guess I do want to tell somebody about it. How about a cigarette? Will that help? Yeah. May I give you a match? I am a man 50 years old. I work hard. I learned my trade as a boy of 16. I've been at it ever since. My wife and me, we got a new car. We got our own home. Almost paid for. A man my age, when he gets home nights, he wants to take it easy. Read the paper. Watch the television. Bought a $400 TV, 21-inch screen. Now, yeah. You want to know what happens when I get home? She wants to go out. Don't make any difference how tired I am. It don't make any difference if I've been working hard all day. She wants to go out. Do you know what that's like? Well, it doesn't sound like the reason a man would leave home, boy. I don't mind it once in a while if it was just once in a while, but she's after me every minute I'm home. Here for the last few years, it's been every night. I don't know what's come over her. She didn't used to be like that. Martha used to be a sensible woman. Now she acts silly like a young girl. She's different. Goes in for fancy clothes, all kinds of fancy food, even anchovies. And I don't like anchovies. Last month, I swear, she even made me take her down to the Ambassador Hotel. Imagine me at the Ambassador Hotel. All I ever hear from her is we've just got a few years left to have our fling. I don't want any fling. I'm a plasterer. That's hard work. I get home, I want to rest. It isn't like I cared if she goes out. She goes to the movies almost every day. Goes before noon, she tells me, before the prices go up. I don't care about the money. I want her to have a good time, the clothes, the things like that. I don't care. I love my wife. I 
guess you think I'm crazy after what I did, but I love my wife. I see, sir. And that dog, that Francine, what kind of a name is that for a dog? You ought to hear her talk to it like it was a person. How long you had the dog, Borg? I don't know. Two, three years. Well, the reason I ask seems funny. You just decided to leave home last Monday. Dog's been around two or three years. The ambassador thing was last month, he said. Well, what did it? It was the lessons. Lessons? The dancing lessons. What? But there's this social club up around Pico and Figueroa. People go there to dance. People our age, she says. Only I can't dance. That's when she gets this idea I gotta take dancing lessons. Did you ever hear of anything like that? A man my age has gotta take dancing lessons? That's when you left. It was Sunday afternoon when she got this idea. She kept picking at me all afternoon. It really got me. I thought about it all night. I couldn't sleep. Monday morning, I just didn't go to work. I got drunk instead. Got sick, too. Just couldn't think of anything else to do. Guess you know the rest. I lost my tie, my wallet, lost my hat, too. And they picked me up. I was just kind of wandering around when they picked me up. Seems like a shame when a man can't even go home. Mm-hmm. You sure you don't want to go home now, Borg? Maybe if you talk things over with your wife. No. No, it wouldn't do any good. Nothing I could say to her would do any good. I can't go home. Well, it sure has been interesting hearing you talk, Mr. Borg. <laughs> it's almost like hearing somebody tell about me, remember, Joe? Yeah. You had something like this? Had it. With me, it was canasta, though. I hate cards. A waste of time. Yeah, I sure thought it was the end for me and Faye. Remember, Joe? But it wasn't. No, for a while, Eric sure looked like I was going to lose my happy home. Guess I would have, too, but I talked turkey to her. You know what I mean, Borg? No. What do you mean? Talk turkey to him. Make him understand. You let a woman push you around, Borg, you're dead. Well, Miss Martha... I... Look, they're all the same. I sat her right down on the sofa, and I said, Now, look, Faye, and I told her what the score was. She took it, too. It's the only way to do. You try what I say, Borg, you'll see I'm right. I can just see, Martha, if I ever tried to put my foot down. That's what I thought. I was all set to give it up, move in with Joe here, right, Joe? Yeah. Then I figured I might as well at least get a load off my chest. Once I got started, I lost my temper. You know, it's a funny thing. Faye's always thought more of me since then. You ask her. She'll tell you so herself. Says she respects a man who'll stand up for his own rights. Right, Joe? Well, I don't know. With me, I, I don't think it would work. Sure it can. Now, Borg, you listen to me. You tell her you're a working man. Tell her when you get through work, you want to take it easy and nobody's going to run you. Set her straight, Borg. Get tough if you have to. She won't give you any trouble after that. I just don't know. Martha... Did... Won't do any harm to try it. I'd like to see Martha's face just once if I even told her to shut up. I wouldn't want her to have anything handy to throw. Borg, look, it's 12.10. We've got to be getting home now. You take my advice. You go home, too. Have a talk with her. See if you can't work it out. Huh? No. No, Sergeant. Thanks a lot, but I can't go home. Well, like I told you, it's none of our business, but I think you ought to try it. Well, here. Well, look, you're going to need car fare. Here's a dollar. You take this and go on home. That'll get you there. Well, okay. You'll get this back, Sergeant. I'll pay it back to you. I I guess maybe you're right. Can't hurt anything to try it. That's your stuff. Thank you a lot. I didn't mean to put you fellas out this way. Good luck to you, Borg. You'll see. It'll work. Maybe it'll work. Well. But I don't know. Martha. I'll get out of cancellation, Joe. I should wrap it up, huh? Yeah. What time did you say it was? It's 12.10. Yeah. Well, Joe, I better make a phone call first. This time of night? Why? What's the matter? I just remembered I told Faye I'd call her. Friday, July 28th. A month had passed since Henry Borg had left our office to go home. We'd heard nothing further from him or his wife. We assumed that they had reconciled their problems. 6.10 p.m. Officers? Oh, hello there, Borg. Nice to see you again. Hi, Borg. I was afraid maybe you fellas wouldn't remember me. It's been a while. I tried to get out and see you before this. Well, fine. How are things going? Did it work out like I said? I brought you something, Sergeant. Some cigarettes for both of you. Like you to have them. I hope it's the right brand. 
Well, yes, sir, that's the right brand, all right, but you don't owe us anything. I want you to have them. That's all right, sir, you keep them. All right. Well, anyway, here's that dollar, the one you loaned me. Okay, Borg, thanks very much. I sure owe you fellas a lot, and I really mean it. My wife and I, we sure appreciate what you fellas did for us. It... Was that clock right? Yes, sir. Uh-oh, got a rush. Got an appointment. Be late if I don't hurry. Appointment? Yeah. Got to get over to Arthur Murray's. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 31st, a meeting was held in the office of the captain of homicide. In a moment, the results of that meeting. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, we hope you've been listening to Dragnet regularly, and we hope you've tried our Chesterfields. If you haven't tried them yet, then tomorrow's your day. Get a carton, regular or king size. It only takes one carton at Chesterfields to show you why Chesterfield is best for you. Believe me, they're much milder with a wonderful taste. America's best cigarette buy, Chesterfield. <laughs> Since the subject, Henry George Borg, had committed no crime, he was not held and the case was officially marked closed. You have just heard Dragnet a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Vic Perrin, Irene Tedro. Script by Paul Coates. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield's, either regular or king size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfield's much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. By special request, Dragnet is being sent to our servicemen and women all over the world. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Have you tried new cork-tipped Fatima? It's the smooth smoke. Here's why. New Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for longer filtering. And Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. Remember, Fatima has the tip for your lips. Try new Fatima. See how smooth it is. Fatima is made by the makers of Chesterfield, Liggett and Myers, one of tobacco's most respected names. Adventure, intrigue, mystery, romance, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Together in the sultry setting of tropical Havana and the mysterious islands of the Caribbean. Bold Venture. Once again, the magic names of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall bring you Bold Venture and a tale of mystery and intrigue. Now look, Mrs. Baker. Please let me finish. I, 
I know I'm not as young as you might like, but I am well off, and I could make you very happy, Mr. Shannon. What are you blushing for, Slate? You've never been proposed to? A catch like you? Now you keep out of this, sailor. Go darn a shoulder strap, mend a sock. Your trousseau's an apple pie order, dear. Besides, if a fellow's going to get married, somebody has to give him away. I give you away. Take him, Mrs. Baker. Thank you, dear. I'm quite sold on him. He's everything they told me he would be, and more. I was recommended, huh, Mrs. Baker? By Darby and Joan. Hmm, Darby and Joan. Joan sounds familiar, but Darby throws me. Look it up in my file, sailor. Darby and Joan incorporated a Lonely Hearts Club. It was there that I saw your picture. There that I fell in love with you. Sailor, have you been handing out my picture again? Stuffing it in mailboxes. Didn't hit a Lonely Hearts Club, though. Too many people were throwing rocks at me. Now, what does it matter how it got there? All I know is that I saw it and they gave me your address and... I'm here to ask for your hand in marriage. Say yes, Mr. Shannon. Look, Mrs. Baker, there are a lot of other fish in the sea. You'll get over it. We'll be friends. Have another cliché, Slate? I just made some fresh. Well, you don't understand. You see, I'm a widow, a lonely, unhappy widow. My husband was lost in the Texas City disaster in 1947. Since then, I, I've tried to replace the man he was. But you're the first one I've found. Oh, I'm that... sorry, Mrs. Baker. Baker, really sorry I can't marry you. You don't know what a happy girl he's just made you, Mrs. Baker. My heartfelt felicitations. I'll get you a cab, dear. <laughs> Having fun, Laura? Love it. I like the way all of this fits you. Swank hotel, heated swimming pool, patio, all of it. It's a good background for you, Laura. Yeah. Yes, it is. Oh. Laura. Want to go in? No. Laura, what are you going to do with my wife? Don't worry about it. She'll be found. She'll make a headline in the paper. Mary Baker and I will have tea. We'll take a walk. You'll be found. Uh huh. Just don't worry about it. I'm not worried. An executive like you, a career girl who runs a Lonely Hearts Club, odds and ends and details, tea with a woman, walk with a woman, the killing of a woman, second nature for you, Laura. Not really, darling. It becomes a matter of overcoming an obstacle like you did. I guess. After all, Frank, your wife thinks you're dead. Your wife thinks you went up in an explosion. Letting her think that's more cruel than what I'm going to do. Dying only takes a moment. I guess. But understand this, Laura. When that boat went up in Texas City and 500 people turned up dead or missing, well, I became one of the missing. I know. You couldn't stand your wife. That's right. Why I ever married her. For her money, darling. Let's not be coy. That's why you've come back. To get her money. And me. Mostly you. Without your wife's money, darling... I'd look at you sitting beside me and see a man slowly turning to flab. That's me for you. Let's take a dip, Laura. Whatever you say, Frank. Touch your motor, sailor. Okay. These are in. I'll hop up on the pier and make a fast. Throw me a line, sailor. Okay, secure. Give me a hand, Slade. <laughs> the sea air make you dainty, I'm busy. Let me to give you my hand, Senorita Duval. I have one I'm not using. Sure you can spare it, Inspector LaSalle? Thanks. Explain a man like Slate to me, LaSalle. What makes him so cozy about handing a girl off a boat? Perhaps his brain is occupied with women he has handed over to death. Hi, LaSalle. Had a rotten day today. No fish. Huh? You said something, LaSalle? You will come quietly, huh, senor? You will not upset the equilibrium of the harbor of my delicate stomach. <laughs> you, you tried by Cobb. I got some on the boat. Fetch it, sailor. The policeman has a tummy ache. And also in the head. From looking at your picture. You look at it, senor. What sickness does it give to you? Are you kidding? 
It's one of my more glamorous poses. Where else have you seen an open throat like that? You want Slate's permission to wear it in a locket around your necklace, Al? Gee, my Slate, he's in demand. Aren't you, boy? What'll I write on it, LaSalle? To my favorite gendarme, with regret? A confession would be nice to write on it. What have you boys been up to? A confession to the murder of a Mrs. Baker. Well, that's the lady who wanted to marry me. You think I'd kill an intelligent lady like that? The motive we will discuss later in the calaboose. But first we will study the matter of her lying on the patio of your hotel with a bullet wound in her heart, with a gun that made the wound in your room where I found it, next to her purse empty of $150 and full of this picture of you. You're crazy. That picture was taken by a chubby, red-headed sidewalk photographer for 25 centavos. I never... In the jail, we will take one of you for free, senor. Please, do not make me to shoot you in the leg. Our police doctors are so overworked, but the hangman... Slack for him, huh? Get bail, sailor. After you get your mouth closed, get bail. Miss Sailor! Miss Sailor! Did you get it, King? Yes, Miss Sailor. To the penny. Enough to go, Mr. Slate's bail. Did Mr. Crevelin give you any trouble this time? Oh, Mr. Crevelin was very kind. He said this is the eighth time we have hawked the boat. Two more times and he will put a gold star beside our names. Five more times a certificate of merit. Ten more times and... Uh, what are you staring at, Miss Sailor? A chubby redhead. It is not true what they say about chubby redheads, Miss Sailor. But this one has a camera. Wait here, King. I'm going to have my picture taken. Hi there. Uh, oh, I fall on my face. You are so beautiful. Take my picture and I'll autograph it for you. Oh, I faint from the sheer joy of such a suggestion. However, I will take your picture and you will send me 25 centavos. See? See. Si. Bueno. Stand as you are. So. So. Smile. So. So. It is done. Uh, my card. My address. Send money. I will send picture. No money, no picture. Known as law of supply and demand. I like the way you handle your camera, senor. Uh, Luis, my name to those who enjoy me. I enjoy you. Tingles all over, see? I'm fighting it, but uh, tingles all over, see? Uh, the picture would still cost 25 centavos, senorita. I'll pay you for Slate Shannon's picture, too. Por favor? Slate Shannon, a man whose picture you took the other day. Is, uh, is a mistake. Adios, senorita. Goodbye. Hey, come back here. Hey, you, Louis. What happened, Miss Sailor? Why is he running? I don't know, King. Let's tell Slate. I'll bet it'll tingle him all over. You get arrested once more, Slate, and we'll be wearing barrels where our jeans ought to be. I get more costly all the time, huh, Sailor? Three thousand bucks to bail me out of a murder rap. You get any more costly, you can drag out the tin cup your Aunt Sophie sent for your birthday. <laughs> ah, good old Aunt Sophie. She knew I'd make it someday. You haven't got much time left for nostalgia, Slate. Better start collecting your memories. I just got you out on bail. You're still number one chum for the murder of Mrs. Baker. Yeah. Tell me again about the photographer, sailor. I told you. I mentioned your name, the wave went out of his red hair, and he took off after it. <laughs> Darby and Joan, Lonely Hearts, Incorporated. Man's wanted for murder, and he thinks of... He thinks of our picture of him got put on the market. Run on home, sailor. No, 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 no. No, no. Better still walk. I'll stand here and watch. And when I'm out of sight? The Darby and Joan. Maybe they'll rent me a murderer. <laughs> Hello. My name's Slate Shannon. You're a lonely heart. Welcome to Darby and Joan, Incorporated. From here on in, your troubles will be bubbles, and the cares that infest the day will be replaced by a bevy of whatever you like. Blonde or brunette, Mr. Shannon? Tall, short, kittenish, or uh, one who bakes bread like mother? <laughs> oh, about like you. Somebody I can't make up my mind about until it's too late. I'll help you out. Get up from behind this desk. 
Well. I'm your easiest customer in months. What do your club rules say I do now? Rule one, we find out if we have a common interest. And talk about it? If it needs talking about. Mine does. Not mine. See, we're different. We won't get along at all. Well, I can recommend Miss Wormsley to you. She's not beautiful, but she crochets like the dickens. Would she know what my picture is doing in your files? What are you talking about? You heard me. I am so far away. <laughs> yeah, I am. This better? You're hurting. That's the impression I wanted to give. The picture. In a little while. Hold me. Wait a minute, the door. Forget it, just hold me. Tied a slate like you hate me and want to love me. Yeah. You didn't have to hit him so hard, Frank. That's the way you hit people with the butt of a gun. Well, get him out of there. Drag him away someplace. I can't look at him helpless. He's not that kind of a man. You mean you could go for a guy like that? The way he looks now? All right, don't answer me, Laura. I'll just drag him away. Our stars Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, and the second act of our story. The thing to do in mental strife, aching for affection, no girl, no wife. When Moon is nicely situated, try Darby and Jones Incorporated. I offer this suggestion with fingers crossed. Walk, don't run, first figure the cost. If love is making you crazy in the head, it once happened to a lady, it killed her dead. King, what is it with you men? What do you mean, Miss Sailor? I mean, what is it? Mrs. Baker was looking for a husband. She was gentle-looking, had a kind of beauty that becomes a woman her age. Why should everything suddenly get violent? I don't know. I just don't know. All people have secrets locked away. Secrets sometimes have death in them. That chubby photographer, King, he's the boy that someone ought to talk to. He's the boy I'm going to talk to. No, wait for Mr. Slate. He will be back from that Lonely Hearts Club soon. I doubt it. When Slate gets mixed up in a club like that, he starts organizing smokers, field trips, good and welfare committees, first aid classes. Oh, I've seen him operate before. That kid's a joiner. I'm going to see that photographer. Oh, oh I'm sorry I didn't see you. Can I help you? Uh, do you have a payphone here? Right over there by the steps. Oh, thank you. When Slate gets back, tell him to wait for me. I'll be back shortly. Hello? Laura, this is Frank. That Duval dame's going to see Louis. Meet me there right away. <laughs> Laura! Over here, in the alley. That's why I adore you, Frank. Your bag is so full of tricks. Why didn't you wait for me in front of Lewis's shop where you told me you'd wait? Someone else is waiting there. Miss Duval. Shannon's good companion. Is the lady shilling for the snapshot artist? Why didn't you go right on in? Because his shop is locked. Because there's a sign on his door that says, Out, back in 30 minutes. And I'll bet the run in my stocking you made him hang it there. Uh-huh. I called him, disguised my voice, told him there was a wedding party that couldn't go on unless he was there with his tripod and flashbulb. Say, that's a bad run. When we've finished, I'll buy you all the stockings you'll ever need. I'll come higher than that, dear. Higher because I killed your wealthy widow, remember? I'll remember it like it was our song. 
Now that you've met me, talk to me in an alley. What? It leads to the back entrance of Louis' shop, into his dark room. That's the one we'll use because it'll be interesting what Miss Duval has to say to our Louis. We break in like common burglars hide in the dark. Uh huh. A thought tease you, Laura. I did things like this when I was a little girl hiding under front porches. Go on, Frank. It'll be fun. Come on, Louis. Stop fumbling with those keys. Open the door. Very well, senorita. Inside. I will lock it. Now. Now, what is it you wish? The picture you took of Slate Shannon. Por favor, senorita. You talk crazy. All right. Let's hear what the cops think. Unlock the door. Uh, wait, senorita. You're going to give me that picture? Uh, wait. Uh, I I will give you the picture. Here. Here it is. One more thing, Louis. Yes. Yes, I will tell you. I will tell you everything. But permit me, there are some prints in the room and back. I must attend to them. I will return immediately. All right, back. Hello, Louis. Huh? No. No, please. Get him out of the way, Frank. Yeah, sure. Hey, what goes on? Where? Don't fight it, my pretty. Just relax. Just inhale. This stuff takes no time at all to put you asleep. That's it. That's it. Oh, yeah. Everybody here. Oh, yeah. Frank, it's the police. They heard the shots. She's groggy enough. Just stick the gun in her hand. Now, let's get out of here. <laughs> Tell me again, Mr. Slate, how the Miss Lonely Hearts took you in her arms and all of a sudden there was a slam, bang, alagazang on the back of your skull and the nightingale sang and the stars dripped gold. <laughs> I really made it live for you, huh, King? Where's Sailor? Fly, Mr. Slate. It is thin fingers of the law. Save it for amateur night, King. Tyler, Sal, what brings that sparkle to your teeth? Mm, they sparkle when I grin. I grin because I am jolly. I am jolly because I have come to return a deposit you made on your life. What? Your $3,000 bail, senor. We have found the motive for the murder of Senora Mary Baker. It was jealousy. I'm sorry she's dead. She seemed a fine woman. She was. This we have learned. When her husband was lost in the Texas City disaster, she was insane with grief. They had to prevent her from taking her own life. But it didn't stick, huh? She told me she was rich. Who gets her money? For the dead, there are always those who wait to get the money. They weep, then grovel for the money. But from Luis, the photographer, they will get nothing. A redhead? What are you talking about? He has also been murdered, senor, by the same who killed the senora. Murderer, to wit, one Sailor Duval. You lost your marbles, LaSalle? I thought it would interest you. Visiting hours are from 2 to 2.15, senor. And don't bring back the bail. We have no use for it. I will give you three minutes, senor. Thanks. Maybe I can do something for you sometime. Like break your leg. Three minutes, senor. I will stand here watching them fly by on my watch. Look at me, Slate. I'm a killer. Like the role? What happened, sailor? I went to Louie to get that picture of you. He balked. I said I'd call the cops. So he gave it to me. Then he went to the back room to enlarge a snapshot or something. Then there were shots. Then... Then I woke up with a gun in my hand. Louie at my feet. And a cop pulling my eyelids open and saying... Quit stalling, babe, or the Spanish equivalent. Then... You got the picture? Yeah, I'll give it to you. Turn your back, Slate. You go on, stir, happy. Give me the picture. Here. Huh. Well, what do you know? We only saw half the picture the first time, sailor. This is all of it. 
Hey, you see that woman pointing a finger at me there in the background? What about her? I thought she was a tourist pointing out one of Havana's oddities. Ah, that's Laura of the Lonely Heart. Don't go away, sailor. Bounce your iron ball. I'll be back soon. Hi, Laura. I brought you something. Well, you don't have to bribe me. Oh, take a look. You and me together in one picture. We'll take a million more. You were pointing out a pigeon to the photographer. You were showing him Slate Shannon. I wanted you for my album. I stay up late nights with my album. Pigeon. Me. For the murder of Mrs. Baker. Well, I thought you were a man in the crowd. Now I know better. How were we the last time? Like this? Just about. <laughs> about now comes the hit over the head. A jealous customer. We get all kinds. Relax, Slate. This time there'll be no hurt in it. Show me. All right. My lips on your cheek. Here. 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 You'll never make it, Laura. You just got a customer. Get out of here, Frank. I'll see you later. What's he got to give you, Laura? Get out of here. I just gave her something, Frank. A picture. You want to see it? Here. Go ahead. Look at it. Laura. You lost it good, didn't you? Laura here handles all your work, huh? You won't like her, Shannon. Ask her to love, she'll love. Ask her to kill, she'll kill. Either one buys a man grief. Slade, don't listen to him. He's furious because I'm with you and not him. You got anybody you want to kill, Shannon? A photographer, a wife? A wife? You had one of those, Frank? Yeah, I lost her. Uh-huh. No, that's not the way it was. She lost you in Texas City in 1947. Then you followed your wife to Havana and teamed up with Laura because you got lonely for your wife's money. It's a great loneliness. Now what, Frank? Now what? I start running. I'm leaving you, Laura. To Mr. Shannon. He can have you and the two murders on your hands. Bye. Frank. What, Laura? <laughs> Now you know how much I hated him, Slate. You did it for me, huh? I wanted you to see me do it. <laughs> you know, it's a time like this when I'm putty in a girl's hands, especially when she's holding a gun on me. You can change that. How? Make me believe you want to change. All right. Believe me? Uh-huh. Making love at the point of a gun, that's exciting. Throw the gun away. I can take it from here. I believe you. I'll keep my eyes open, Slate. I want to watch your face. Slate, don't touch that gun. Slate. For a girl in the Lonely Hearts business, you sure got a talent for being lonely. Slate, I, I, I believed you. Don't you see this is Laura for you, Slate? For no one else. Listen to me. Listen to me, Slate. Just you and me. Let me know when you're finished, Laura. And we'll take a walk. Sailor's hands must be numb bouncing that iron ball. Hey, Sailor, where are you? Out here on the patio, taking a sun bath. Come on out. Hi, Slate. Sit down. Oh, it's a jazzy sunsuit you're wearing. You like it, huh? Never saw the like. Blue and white striped canvas. The latest thing. <laughs> Picked it out of a mail order catalog, huh? Swiped it while the turnkey wasn't looking. They issue suits like that for the girls in the pokey? Uh-huh. I cut it down for my uniform. Well, bye, Sailor. Hey, where are you going? I don't know. That, uh, that convict suit, uh, yeah, that stuff's liable to rub off. No, it won't. Come here. See? Hey, where are you going? It rubbed off. You made me a happy convict, Sailor. So where are you going? To get me a couple of rocks. I'll make sand out of them with my bare hands. <laughs> And 
So our two stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, have brought to a close our latest Bold Venture story. Special music was composed and conducted by David Rose. May we invite you to listen again next week at this time for another exciting adventure starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall together in Bold Venture. Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Stranger Than Fiction, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, dangerous my stock and trade. If life's twisting you like a tornado and you want out, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, writing this letter is a hideous necessity, but a rival has come into my life, or I should say, this woman has come back into my life, and in such a way as to cause me the kind of humiliation I will not tolerate. You may have read my husband's best-selling novel, The Awakening. Everyone else seemed to have. Well, I must know whether this particular woman is or is not the heroine of this This tale tale of passion. passion. This This should should be an easy easy enough enough assignment for you. Please call me at my home so we can arrange an immediate appointment at your office. Sincerely, Victoria Beasley. Hmm. Now, Brooksy, that's what I call a world-shaking problem. Well, you wouldn't make so light of it, my lad, if you'd read Samuel Beasley's book. It was banned in Boston. Oh. One critic called it an emotional hot foot, 700 pages long. <laughs> well, I must get to this cultural milestone as soon as I finish the Rover Boys in the Indian country. Right now, I'm going to call Mrs. Beasley. <laughs> Okay, Mrs. Beasley, I'll just sit here and wait until you stop prancing up and down. Mr. Valentine, you don't seem to appreciate the position my husband's placed me in with this this book. Here, Mrs. Beasley, have a chair. Nobody's made you look ridiculous. Friends don't snicker and whisper behind their hands every time you pass. Look, please, So you can sit there with that superior smirk on your face. Well, if I'm smirking, it's because I'm trying not to laugh out loud. I didn't come here to... With someone like you, Mrs. B, I've got to say what I mean to make a dent. Oh, Brooksy, you read the society columns. Oh, sure. A girl's got to be improving her staff warfare, you know. All right. Now, how is Victoria Beasley usually described uh, this time without the routine? Really, now, Mr. Valentine. Well, without the routine. Victoria Beasley, glacial beauty, wondrous wit, soul of poise. Please. Evoked an almost audible gasp of admiration when she arrived at the Duchess's party, late as usual. I'm leaving. Now, wait, wait, wait a minute. Won't you admit this does call for a laugh? A woman with all those assets getting green-eyed over a fictional gal her husband dreamt up in a novel? Sam is a broker, not a writer. Oh, say that about Samuel Beasley on a quiz program and the man will come up with, ah, too bad, better luck next time. I cured him of all his literary pretensions ten years ago when he married me. Lord knows where he found time to write this book. He did it out of sheer malice. You mean you thought you had a colorless milk toast character for a spouse and now he's the pop of a bestseller, stealing all the limelight from you. No. That's not it at all. Then what is it? The Diana in Sam's book actually exists. Everything that happened between her and the hero actually happened. Almost every critic said it has the ring of truth. Oh, well, that doesn't mean that... The whole situation. A community like our own, Deer Lake Park. The description of Diana. The cold, distant wife who didn't know what was going on. Mm, The glacial beauty, yeah. You sound as though you knew the heroine. I think I do. And that's where I need your help, Mr. Valentine. Oh, look, haven't I tried to explain So many things are so very clear now. For instance, every Thursday for the last year, Sam's received a telephone call at 5.30. He's always made a point of answering it himself. Well, does it have to be another woman? It could have been his bookie. They're very punctual, too. Once I reached the phone before he did, the party hung up. I'm sure it was a woman. The woman. You recognize the perfume, no doubt. Let me finish. Every Thursday night, he's made an excuse to go into town and never once mentioned what he did. Well, of course, you keep Sam informed of all your moves. That's aside from the point. Your commentary doesn't interest me. 
I just want you to find out if Diana in Sam's book is or isn't Peggy Wilkinson. And who's that lady? Her family has the estate next to ours at Deer Lake Park. She's always loved Sam. Probably would have married him if I hadn't come along. You mean except for the last year, Peggy's been content to forget, if not forgive. Peggy's the kind of girl who's willing to wait things out. She makes a career of being naive, wholesome, and athletic. And you think she's the Diana in The Awakening? You may have seen Miss Wilkinson in the Sunday supplements. She's always carrying not one, but six tennis rackets. Say, tell me, Mrs. Beasley, what's it going to do for your pride to find out if all this is true? Or is it a little feminine mayhem you have in mind? What I have in mind is none of your business. Question is, are you interested in a flat fee? Oh, excuse me, will you? Valentine. Oh, yeah, Riley. Oh, what's on your mind, Lieutenant? What? Hey, look, start from the beginning, will you? And this time, stop with the red lights. Huh? Huh? Oh, now, wait, I can't answer that. Looks like I'm going to take the case, so I might be violating the confidence of my client. Okay, stop yelling, will you? We'll be right out there. Mrs. Beasley? Yes? Do you know a man named Michael Waldron? I do. And you left my telephone number in case he wanted to get in touch with you? That's right. We were supposed to have lunch in town together today. How do you know? Who was that on the phone? Lieutenant Riley. Homicide. What's the tie-up, George? Well, what did he say? Enough to take this out of the class of a family brawl. Mrs. Beasley, somebody tried to kill your husband. Well, while we're waiting for Miss Brooks to get here with Miss Wilkinson, what about some drinks? Oh, Sally. Yes, ma'am. Right away, ma'am. Uh, just a minute here. Uh, yes, Lieutenant? Mrs. Beasley, suppose we forget about the social graces until we get rid of the business at hand, huh? The business being to prove I took a pot shot at Beasley here. Take it easy, Walton. Hey, Lieutenant, Mr. Beasley's been strangely quiet. Would you mind him telling us what happened? Oh, that's going to be just dandy. He'd like nothing better than a pin it on me. Michael, please. Let's face it, Vicky. He resented every moment we've been together. Why should I, Walden? You're five years younger than my wife. Our friends applaud her choice for a companion when I'm occupied. You're handsome, very charming. Okay, and... okay, okay. You guys can knife each other some other time. Are you sure nobody wants anything? What? Are you still here? I told you that... No... Uh, no, Sally. Uh, nobody wants anything. I was talking to Mr. Beasley. You can go now, Sally. Just as you say, Mr. Beasley. Mr. Valentine, a moment ago you asked me for my version of what happened here in my study. Yeah, it seems to have been lost in the shuffle. I can be very brief about it. I was sitting there at my desk, typing, doing some work on a new story. Suddenly there was a shot through those French doors. I didn't see anybody, and I assure you I didn't stop to investigate. I get it. I made a beeline for the drawing room. And strangely enough, a minute later... In Walk Waldron. Here we go. Let me ask you something, Beasley. I'll ask the questions if you don't mind, Valentine. And when I'm through, I've got something to ask you. Why you're mixed up in this at all, I... Uh, uh, Mrs. Beasley. I don't think I can be of much help, Lieutenant. When I left for Mr. Valentine's office, Sam was here in the study. I decided I wouldn't bother him. Didn't you even tiptoe up and peek in to say goodbye? I told you. He was working. I could hear him at the typewriter. As far as I'm concerned, I was merely dropping by to pick Vicky up for lunch. I didn't even hear a shot. <laughs> of course, it might have been one of my readers expressing a critical opinion. Please, Mr. Beasley, don't try to be funny. You know, you people rank pretty high socially in our fair city. That's why I'm here. Ordinarily, you'd have to be a corpse before I arrive. Just one minute, Mrs. Beasley. I'll take that. I, I, what do you mean? Whatever it is you're trying to slip into your pocketbook. I'd like to see it. You haven't anything to hide... Have you, Mrs. Beasley? Why, no. This is just a... A gold cigarette lighter. Yes. I must have dropped it over there by the doors. Mm. I... Very interesting. Initials M.W. Uh, Lieutenant, you needn't look at me like that. It's not mine. Well, well, we'll see about that, M.W. And you weren't supposed to have been here in the study. Michael. And that's all right, Vicky. They can think whatever they want, but they'll never prove anything. I'm sure that's a world of consolation to my wife. Isn't it, my dear? Well, suppose we go uh, back downtown together, Waldron. While we check on this lighter, you and I have a few things to talk about. Why not? Oh, Lieutenant. Yeah? I admit this lighter might point very definitely to Waldron. But it doesn't stop there. Well, you... All right, all right. Where does it stop? I'll be able to tell you better when Brooksy gets here. Now, Miss Wilkinson, as I told you, there's no reason to be nervous. 
The lieutenant has to ask these questions. But I don't understand. I knew nothing of what happened to Sam until Miss Brooks told me. Oh, but I didn't tell you, Miss Wilkinson. I made it a point not to. I... Well, I, I couldn't help guessing something was wrong. Lieutenant, must we drag Peggy into this? You've got Waldron in the other room to take down to headquarters. Why this inquisition? Valentine and your wife dragged this young woman into this mess, not me. Surely, Sam, you can't object to us doing everything we can to find out who tried to kill you. Your concern for me is very touching, Victoria. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Beasley, whether you know it or not, your wife has a theory that the heroine of your book is modeled after Miss Wilkins. Mr. Valentine, that was supposed to be a matter of confidence between us. Attempted murder changes all that. Victoria, you really believe that? Me, the Diana in The Awakening, that irresistible creature who unleashed such raging passion in a man? Sam was so carried away, he couldn't help dropping some unmistakable clues. How long has this been going on? Just the last year? For well, the whole time we've been married. Now, Victoria. How many people have known it all along? Laughing at me. Oh, this is ridiculous. Peggy is the last person anybody would picture as the femme fatale. She's the outdoor type. Much too wholesome for that sort of thing. Just, just to look at her, anybody can tell that. Well, why stop there, Sam? You with your marvelous knack with words. Why don't you say I'm just about as glamorous as a dish of cottage cheese? I use Life Boy in my tub instead of perfume bath salt. The direct opposite of the striking and glamorous Victoria. Uh... Just where were you all morning, Miss Wilkinson? I had no airtight alibi, if that's what you mean. I was out horseback riding, all by myself. Ah, oh, look, look, let's stop uh, sparring, huh? Now, look, Valentine, you said you were going to pull some kind of rabbit out of the hat. Well, come on, come on, let's have it. Okay, do you happen to own a cigarette lighter, Margaret? I, well, yes. I didn't know there was any law against that. Could this be it? The initials M.W. could stand for Margaret Wilkinson, as well as Michael Walton. Now, while you were out horseback riding, you might have taken a slight detour. And you might have wanted to kill Beasley because he wouldn't get a divorce and marry you. Well, Miss Wilkinson? Very well. Why shouldn't I admit it? It's all true about this morning. And the book. Well, I don't you know, know what you're what saying, about Peggy. That. Yes, and I don't care. Oh, this will really cause a sensation. The wholesome, colorless Peggy Wilkinson turns out to be the fabulous and much-discussed Diana. Oh, and I'll love it. You heard her, all of you. This tweedy little thump has been making a fool of me. Me. Well, Miss Wilkinson, I guess we'd better get into town. I'm afraid not, Lieutenant Riley. Huh? Because I'm not going to press charges. What? Uh... George, did you hear the man? Yeah. I came here to make an arrest, and that's what I'm going to do. I refuse to prosecute. As far as I'm concerned, Peggy was out hunting squirrels, and her marksmanship was incredibly bad. I think you're right, Sam, but I don't. I want the world to know that you couldn't hold a man, Victoria. <laughs> and of all things, you lost him to me. I think that washes everything up, Lieutenant. Thank you very much for your trouble. If you were anybody else, Beasley, I'd... I, I, I... I'd better get out of here before I lose my... Peggy, I'd better take you home. Oh, yes, sir. Victoria, you'd better go and reassure Waldron that he's a free man. I'll do that, Sam. I'll be right back, Mr. Valentine. Yeah. Well... Where does that leave us, George? I don't see any point in hanging around now. Oh, a very important point, Brooksy. A particularly fat and juicy pill. Oh. Not what she wanted to know. So, sit down at the great author's typewriter and make it out. Okay. What amount shall I make it, George? Oh, I... I beg your pardon. I, I was looking for Mrs. Beasley. Uh, this is my day off. I, I was just leaving. Mm -hmm. Well, so long, Sally. I, uh... I was in the next room before. I couldn't help overhearing Mrs. Beasley say Mr. Beasley was using the typewriter when she left this morning. So? Uh, the reason the typewriter man was here was to bring this this new machine. Goodbye, Mr. Valentine. George. Yeah, Brooksy. This is a noiseless machine. Then she couldn't have heard it. With the doors of the study closed. Now, why did she lie? You mean Victoria took a shot at her husband and then came to us? Oh, but why would Peggy... I don't know, Mr. Angel. I don't know. But unless I have the proud Victoria sized up all wrong, the lady is still out to do murder. We'll return to tonight's adventure, George Valentine, in just a moment. You like your car. Probably everybody in your family and most of your friends like it. But there's someone who doesn't like your car. And his name is Old Man Rust. He's most destructive when your car is standing idle for long hours. 
He sneaks in with condensed moisture and starts nibbling at internal engine parts the moment you cut the ignition. But if you've got RPM motor oil in your car, don't you worry. So when you cut the engine, RPM doesn't drain off vertical parts. It stays on the job and prevents rust from ever getting started. Other compounds in RPM, motor oil, prevent gummy carbon and lacquer formations, put a stop to corrosion and oxidation. It adds up to complete protection, another reason why RPM is first choice in the wet. Ask for RPM at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations, where they say, and mean, we take better care of your car. Now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. A marble cold society beauty, Victoria Beasley, by name, would rather die than be humiliated, hires you to prove that the heroine in her broker husband's sensational first book is a former sweetheart of his, Peggy Wilkinson. You don't want any part of a divorce-bound shuffle like this, but then an attempt is made on Sam Beasley's life. Said Peggy takes the blame and the wife trips herself up with a stupid, needless contradiction which seems to give the lie to Peggy's confession, all of which sends you, George Valentine, into frantic action to prevent another try at murder. George, what are you going to do? Find Victoria. Okay, Walden, where is she? That's what I'd like to know, Valentine. What did you say to Victoria? She just brushed past me, told me to stay here until she gets something cleared up once and for all. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Well, wasn't Mrs. Beasley more specific? Where was she going? What was she going to do? That's all she said. But you've got to stop hounding her, Valentine. Me? Hounding her? You're a little mixed up, Mr. Waldron. Victoria came to us. Well, there's no time to go into detail. Why don't you admit it? Her husband hired you to spy on us. You can't do that to the kind of person Victoria is. She's easily upset. And I'm not going to let you. Now, look, Buster, i got places to go in a hurry. You're not going anywhere. You're going to leave Victoria alone. You're a big, well-built lad, Waldron, but don't try to maul me. You're staying right here, even if I have to... Sorry, but you forced me into this corner. I told you i got places to go. Don't keep looking around like that for help, Peggy. I waited till Sam left so I could be alone with you. I'm here to kill you in your own house. Victoria, put that gun away. You don't know what you're doing. Oh, yes, I do. In the presence of others, you admitted that you came between me and my husband. It was you who were phoning every Thursday at 5.30. The other details are all there for the whole world to read. In Sam's book. No, Victoria, no. No jury will convict me for trying to protect the sanctity of the American home. Now, listen to me, Victoria. Yeah, being a laughingstock, I'll be a heroine, a noble figure. That's something I never could stand for, being laughed at. I'm willing to do anything to put an end to that. But you've got to believe me. I lied to that, Lieutenant. I didn't try to kill Sam, and I'm not the Diana in his book. You expect me to believe that? Well, I said it only because I'm human. I'm tired of being the dowdy thing that I am. Can't you understand what it would mean if people thought that I had all the glamour that you have and more? I haven't been waiting around for ten years to get Sam. Sorry, Peggy. I'm all through talking. I'm sorry about that. Oh. Oh. Oh, did Why, you... She... She was going to kill me. It's all right now, Peggy. Your wrist will hurt for a couple of days, Mrs. Beasley. But you're lucky to get away this easy. Well, I get on my knees and thank you most humbly. No. No, and you better not bother picking up that gun either. I'll just take that. Where did you get it, anyway? It's Sam. I took it from the drawer in his shipper over. I see. Okay, come on, Mrs. Beasley. You too, Miss Wilkinson. Where are we going? Right back where we started. Who knows? If I'm lucky, I may come up with another rabbit out of the hat. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I I don't like hogging the floor, but the time has come when you're going to have to do the listening. Well, get it over with, Mr. Valentine. I'm sick of this whole thing. I'm sure the ladies, too, are anxious to hear what you have to say. Well, you should be more than anxious, Mrs. Beasley. You should be shaking with fear over what you might have done today. You mean committing murder. I had every intention to. Victoria, you can't go on feeling that way about me. I told you, you're all wrong. Stop sniveling, Peggy. You're safe. I doubt if I could work myself up to the same fever pitch again. Oh, now you're just being an old softy, Mrs. Beasley. What I meant to say is that if Miss Wilkinson is right, you would have killed the wrong woman and paid for it with your life. I'm just as sure as ever that she's the Diana Sam wrote about. And about that attempt on your life, Mr. Beasley. Oh, yes, we mustn't forget that. If Miss Wilkinson has recanted her confession and Waldron here is staunch in his denials... I certainly am. That leaves 
Only you, Mrs. Beasley. Oh, you placed much too much importance on my hearing Sam's typewriter. I only said that to make my story sound more convincing. I didn't want to be implicated in something I had nothing to do with. Well, it seems we're right back where we started from, with a full-blown mystery on our hands. Maybe it would be best just to forget. I don't know about that. I... Stay where you are, Victoria. No, I'll answer that, Mr. Beasley. Oh, yes, but I... 5.30. Thursday. Same call, same time. Every week. Yeah. The other woman. Hello? Is that you, Sam? No. No, but I've got a question for you, lady. Oh. Oh, dear Lord, what I almost did. Yes, Mrs. Beasley. There is a real life, Diana, and that was she on the phone. Okay, okay who is she, Beasley? If a writer learns nothing else, he learns the value of confounding and bewildering the reader. That's the way I choose to leave it now. Oh, Peggy, I couldn't help believing what I did. And if Mr. Valentine hadn't oh, Brooks, stopped me, I would... Yes, George. Get on the phone and tell Riley to get back here. Oh, he's going to just love that. Well, it's only right that he should be in on the payoff. Same rabbit in the same hat? No. No. You've heard about how those long-eared critters increase and multiply. Well, at this point, there's a whole slew of the little beasties. Huh? In other words, Angel, now we've got all the answers. <laughs> Right, all right, Valentine. I get the picture of what happened between Mrs. Beasley and Miss Wilkins. But I and told Vera. you, Lieutenant, I'm not going to do anything about it. Awakening. Certainly under the circumstances, I'm not going to do anything about it. Oh, oh, oh most certainly. There have been two murder attempts, and we're supposed to just laugh it off, huh? Lieutenant, do I still have to hang around here? As far as I'm concerned, you can drop... Surely, Waldron, you don't want to miss the exciting explanation Valentine's promises. Yes, why don't you say something, Mr. Valentine? What have you got on your mind? I don't think you can stall much longer, darling. Okay. Okay, I admit I have been stalling. But for a very good reason. Still, if the time has come. Beasley. Hmm? You staged this whole business. Nobody tried to kill you. What? You fired that shot through the French doors. You're going to have trouble proving an obvious absurdity like that. Okay, if someone really wanted to kill you, some person in this room who knew you, he would have walked right up to you and let you have it. Not resort to any hit or miss tactics. Mm. That makes sense, Valentine. Go on. The gun your wife wanted to use on Miss Wilkinson, your gun, has one bullet missing from it. And that's the bullet embedded in the wall over your desk. Are you sure of that? Quite sure, Lieutenant. Mr. Beasley was so convinced that suspicion would never fall on him, he was, well, let's say, careless enough to put the gun back in his room where his wife found it. Why would Sam do such a thing? I'll tell you why. He'd make the headlines more publicity for that book of his. Yes, dear, that thought did occur to me. The sensation the awakening caused was beginning to die down. Something like this would have started people talking all over again. Make me seem even more ridiculous. It was fit payment for the ten years you lorded it over me. Making me a laughingstock among our friends. And I was to be the patsy in the deal. I've been waiting for this beastly and now is a good point, Buster. And the lighter, Sam? Were you going to purposely implicate me? No, Peggy. I never thought of you as Margaret when I planted that lighter with the initials M.W. I wanted it to point to Waldron. But I never intended to press charges. Oh, there must be something in the books that applies to a case like this. There's got to be. And I'm going to find it. Look, Beasley, I don't care how big uh, a man Lieutenant, you are. Lieutenant, huh? you haven't heard the whole story. I don't think I can take any more. Oh, you don't know about rabbits, Lieutenant, and how they increase and multiply. Miss Brooks, there's an awful lot of things I don't know, but I'm going to find out right now. Oh, Mrs. Beasley, I, I didn't know you had company. What, Shelley? I uh, just wanted to tell you I, I was back in case you needed me. But, Shelley... This is your night off. I'm sure she'll give you a detailed report some other time, but now... Lieutenant Riley, you should be ashamed of yourself. What's that? That's no way to talk about the almost legendary Diana. You know what you're talking about. You must be out of your mind. I was trying to stall till Sally got here. But how did he find out, Mr. Beasley? I'm sure he's coming to that right now, Sally. You mean my own maid in my own house? Yes, Mrs. Beasley. Those mysterious phone calls every Thursday. Thursday. <laughs> The traditional maid's day off. <laughs> Sam couldn't keep his appointment tonight. I can't help myself, Victoria, but it is funny. But not to me, Michael. You can get out and stay out. Victoria, I'm truly very sorry. Of course. You began tying things up, George, when Sally made those pointed remarks about the new typewriter. Frankly, I'm glad it's all out in the open. Uh, yeah, me too. Victoria, although this must necessarily add to your humiliation, after our divorce, Sally and I are going to be married. Oh, but... That's impossible. What? What do you mean, impossible, Sally? Well, 
I'm already married. But Joe's been in San Quentin for the last two years. Oh, this is wonderful. Oh, and this time, Michael, I can laugh with you. Oh, Sam, I'm very sorry. You look so hurt. Sally, you, you might have told me instead of making such a fool of me. But, Mr. Beasley, we just went to the movies and, and dinner every Thursday night. Oh, oh, brother. And after all, it isn't every girl who has such a beautiful book written about her. Oh, I don't know, Riley. I think the whole thing's pretty understandable. Oh, don't you even talk to me about the business. But the press middle-aged man turns an innocent little affair into a literary heat wave. The book Victoria kept him from writing for ten years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this seems to be the night for laughing jazz. <laughs> what goes with you, pal? Well, Sam's book should have an aftermath. The awakening is complete. How come? Well, I'm betting Victoria is going to feel sorry for her spouse now. And after ten years, they're really going to get together. Yeah. <laughs> Who cares? Well, that's the beautiful part about marriage, Riley. It really can take a beating and still survive. Oh, you're so right, darling. More people ought to try it. Or am I being too subtle again? Oh. Well, uh, well what I really meant, Angel, was that... Uh, <laughs> well, you see... Uh... <laughs> Go on. Squirm, pal. Squirm. <laughs> For the first time today, I found something to laugh at. <laughs> If you want to be off to a good start, a fast start, every time you use your car, just make sure it's Chevron Supreme gasoline you've got in the tank. This premium quality gasoline turns the engine over the moment you press the starter. Gives your car faster warm-up, too. More pep in traffic. A new ping-free power that lifts your car over the hills. Try Chevron Supreme and you'll agree it gets the best out of your car. Another thing, it's climate-tailored. In each different temperature and altitude zone of the West, count on Chevron Supreme for your car's best performance the year round. For today's high-compression engines, you just can't buy a better gasoline. So why not try it tomorrow? Get Chevron Supreme at standard stations and at independent Chevron gas stations where they say, and mean, we take better care of your car. Next week, as George Valentine is poking through the tall grass in a vacant lot, we'll hear him saying to Brooksy, Well, looks like we walked into something, Brooksy. What? That looks like part of a man's shirt. The collar of a man's shirt, with blood on it. Golly. Stephen must have torn the collar off so he could cover the wound. And the shirt came from Jonathan's. That's the shop where they look down their noses if your bill runs under $200. Then we better work fast, George. Yeah, because young Steve's life is worth under two cents. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Robert Bailey is starred as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Let George Do It is written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Lee Patrick as Victoria, Frank Martin as Sam, Peter Leeds as Waldron, Mary Shipp as Peggy, and Bernice Barrett as Sally. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective.
the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Anything can happen in San Francisco, well, almost anything, and when it happens, you usually find Michael Shane, private detective, somewhere around. That's why Mike and Phyllis Knight, his observant and easy-on-the-eye assistant, are locking the office at 9 a.m. and heading for the nearest corner to join Inspector Faraday on what the inspector describes as a wild goose chase, or as Phyllis more aptly puts it, a junket on office time. It it seems there are pirates in San Francisco Bay. Oh, it's spring, Angel, wonderful day, and I've always wanted to go aboard a yacht. Yacht, my eye. It's probably phony, too. Hmm? What about our clients? You haven't cleaned up on that insurance case Oh, let them wait, let them wait. Haven't... Sixteen men on a dead men's chest, Joe Ho, and a bottle of rum. Oh. Here's the elevator, darling. Oh, this is going to too many pirate pictures. Pirates in San Francisco Bay. Do you suppose they're related to the Indians at Stanford? What are you muttering about? I always mutter when some publicity-seeking chorus girl lets herself be found drugged in her pajamas, wrapped in a blanket in the bottom of a canoe. She's no chorus girl, honey. She's the wife of a college professor. But when she says pirates boarded a yacht, killed her husband, and kidnapped her, well, now, really, Yeah, yes, mind, I know, I know. You just... don't believe it. Well, I'm the open-minded type, darling. You certainly are. Here's where we get off. Oh, smell that air. As I said before, honey, it's spring. Mm-hmm. And in the spring, the sap rises. Oh. Over here, folks. Oh, hi, Inspector. Hello, Inspector. Well, I'm in. Here, darling. Thank you. Sausalito, first stop. Oh, what a day for a motorboat ride. <laughs> Why, Inspector, you're actually glowering. What's happened? Plenty. I think I got my finger on the guy at the bottom of this deal. A movie press agent by the name of Jim Fonda. And never that guy pulling his Hollywood shenanigans in my town. Why, Inspector? No pirates. Oh, plenty of them, Phil. Too many of them. A whole brig full. There's 200 of them. What? You've already got 200 pirates in jail? Holy smoke. A brigantine is a pirate vessel, Mike. Huh? <laughs> right, Inspector? Right, fellas. Uh-huh. They might as well be in jail. For well, that anchor doesn't budge until I give the word. Lafitte's men, I suppose, from around the hall. No, no, nothing so romantic, my dear. They're Captain Kidd's men from Central Casting in Hollywood. <laughs> There's a movie company aboard the ship, and they're getting ready to sail down the coast on location when I clam down. Oh, aren't you a bit rough on them, Inspector? After all, press agents have to have their fun. Or do you know something I don't know? No, not a thing, Mike. I guess I lost my sense of humor. Hollywood had its laugh this morning. Now I'm going to have mine. Huh? <laughs> You know, they have to pay those pirates every day, you know. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Investigations, questions, delays. <laughs> well, where do we go first? The pirate ship or the yacht? The yacht. Maybe Professor Porter will be there himself, if he isn't still playing dead. Um, where's the wife? She'll be there, too. And so will Jim Fonda. Or I'll fire every detective on my staff. Well, that might not be a bad idea. Save the sarcasm, Mike. <laughs> That's only fool. Well, there's the yacht. Oh, that's Wow. There's nothing pony about this baby. She's big enough to go to sea. Yeah, but she hasn't been away from that dark side since the professor bought it. Hey, this doesn't look like a college professor's layout. A nice, tidy little investment there. Yeah, teaching's a sideline with Professor Porter. They tell me he's got oil wells working for him. If that's Annabelle, his wife, coming out to welcome us, they better be gushers. She looks very expensive. Inspector Faraday? Yes. Oh, and uh, this is Michael Shane and Phyllis Knight, Mrs. Porter. How do you do? Good morning. How do you do? Uh, uh, Please come into the lounge. Thank you. I'm a courteous man, Mrs. Porter, but I haven't time for courtesy this morning. I can't understand why an apparently sane woman would expect us to believe such a story. Do you mind if we stroll around, Mrs. Porter? I've never been on a yacht before. Yes, certainly. And now, Inspector, will you please explain why you got my Big-hearted Mike. He just can't bear to hear a beautiful redhead bald out, so he takes the powder. Oh, look, Angel, this doesn't add up. You don't plot publicity gags in a playhouse like this one. Huh? You've seen something, Mike. Or maybe it was just one look at the redhead. Hmm. I guess this is the master's stateroom. Two beds. What are you doing? The one bed layouts in the guest cabin. Mike, what did you see? Huh? Oh, just Mrs. Porter. She uh, used to be Annabelle Armstrong in the movies. Well, so what? Hey, now it's my turn. Hmm? I spy something beginning with the letter P. Give you one guess. Phil's in a blue bottle by the bed. Oh, <laughs> think I'll have a look. Mike, this entire bottle wouldn't put a child to sleep. Let me see it, honey. Oh, it doesn't spell anything backwards. 
It spells something for me. These pills prove Annabelle went canoe riding with her eyes open. Mm -hmm. Ow. What what'd you expect to find in the closet, pirates? Oh, that bag that hit my foot felt like it was packed. Hey, it is. And so is this one. Mm -hmm. Everything for a nice long trip. You know, I could take a honeymoon with this bag. <laughs> Say, the professor's a snappy dresser. Oh, Just fine. look at this sport coat. Come on, Mike. Let's quit playing house. I want to watch Annabelle act. Okay. I might have known how it would turn out when I brought you along, Mike. Why, what's up, Inspector? It's murder, my boy. While we're playing houseboat. So her story stood up. I'm buying it up to here. Well, I haven't heard it, but I think I'll shop around. Well, fond is the guy, all right. I just telephoned a general alarm. Ought to pick him up any minute. You telephoned? Yeah, there's a phone. The yacht's permanently tied up to the pier. I also sent for Porter's secretary. He may have some information. Inspector, do you mind bringing us up to date? We've been sightseeing. Well, Mike, here's the story. Jim Fonder is Porter's nephew. Yeah. Sort of a family black sheep. He's been causing trouble. Everything from forgery to some sort of blackmail. Uh-huh. Well, it seems Fonder headed for the professor's home as soon as he hit town. The professor's secretary sent him to the yacht. That'd be yesterday afternoon. There was a row. Porter threatened to send Fonder to jail and shoved him off the boat. Yeah. Fonder yelled he'd be back and told Porter he'd better have it ready. Mrs. Porter thinks he meant a sum of money. Maybe the secretary Taylor can clear that point. Uh huh. But uh, where do the pirates come in? Well, I'm coming to that. I'll tell you, Mike. After Fonda left, Mrs. Porter developed a headache. And that night she couldn't sleep. The professor went into the lounge to read, and uh, Mrs. Porter took two sleeping pills. Uh, three, my dear. Mrs. Porter took three sleeping pills. Uh, <clears throat> later she was aroused by loud voices, and then. And then a big, burly pirate with a red beard leaned over the bunk. I believe his beard was black, Miss Knight. Oh, yes. The light was on. No, the cabin was dark. This man, dressed like a pirate, seized me, threw a blanket over me, and carried me to the canoe. It was one we kept tied to the yacht. There was a body wrapped in a blanket on the bottom. He paddled for several minutes and then put the body overside. Maybe you'd better ask the questions, Mike. Well, you're doing fine, Angel. Thanks. Uh, Mrs. Porter, the uh, cabin was dark. There was no moon. How did you know the man was dressed like a pirate? He struck several matches. Oh? Yes, he was smoking the pipe. I see. And uh, why are you so sure that this man dressed as a pirate was Jim Fonda? I knew Jim. He was publicity man on one of my pictures. Oh, maybe I should explain. Uh, I'm Annabelle Armstrong. Oh, not at all. I recognized Annabelle Armstrong the moment I came aboard. Oh, thank you. Well, Jim Fonda had two peculiarities. His eyebrows were highly arched, and his left eye twitched. Hmm? I re recognized him despite his disguise the first time he lighted a match. Did uh, he know you had recognized him? I'm not sure. He might have worn the pirate costume as a prank. Jim had an odd sense of humor. I believe he intended taking me with him. He tried to arouse me when he landed the canoe. I was too heavy to carry far. Those sleeping tablets must have been pretty powerful. Mr. Shane, those tablets are a mild, harmless sort. I was wide awake. Then from fright at first, and then I acted. Don't forget, I used to be an actress. Why did you stay in the canoe after he left you? Well, I yelled my head off and nobody came. It was dark and... Well, I, I was afraid I'd fall into the water. I, I can't swim. Well, that's sensible. Do you uh, think you could locate the spot where your husband's body was dropped into the water? I pointed out the spot when the police brought me to the yacht this morning. That's right, Mike. We've had men grappling for the body all morning. There's no current and the water is quiet, so we ought to bring it up. Well, that's the police launch. We found the body, Inspector. That ties it up. Bring it in, boy. Well, you satisfied now, Angel? No, I am not, and neither are you. Mm-hmm. Say... I guess that'd be Mr. Taylor with the briefcase over there coming down the pier. Huh? Oh, yes, the secretary. Dark and handsome. Huh? And not too tall. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike Shane and Phyllis Knight in their adventures. Probably no other possession you may have requires the attention and constant care that your automobile does. The hundreds of bearings and precision gears in a car need continual protection against rust, friction, heat, and abrasion. That is why regular stopwear lubrication is so vital to the condition of your car. You see, stopwear lubrication is more than just a grease job. It's a system that's been worked out from years of experience to give your automobile the best possible care. 
When you leave your car at a Union Oil Minuteman station for stop wear lubrication, you can be sure that nothing on your automobile will be overlooked or hurriedly serviced. Each fitting is carefully and thoroughly lubricated according to the manufacturer's specifications. While your car is on the hoist, the Minutemen inspect out-of-sight points and check them for danger signs. Finally, as complete proof of Stopware's reliable lubrication, you receive a thousand-mile written guarantee with each job. You'll find your car rolls smoother, handles easier, stands up better with regular Stopware lubrication. Stopware guaranteed lubrication is available only at Union Oil Minuteman stations. Professor Porter's body has been recovered from the bay, and Inspector Faraday is hurrying to meet the launch at the end of the pier. Mike and Phyllis are following, but Phyllis is reluctant to leave Mrs. Porter and the professor's secretary, Bill Taylor, together in the lounge of the yacht. Come on, hurry, honey. They'll be here in a minute. You're getting awfully careless, Mike. I know what I'm doing. I wonder. Oh, cut it out, Angel, please. Oh, Mike, get tough. Be yourself. Why, what do you mean? Well, don't let a good-looking redhead blind you. So far, she's got all the answers, Angel. Good answers. All of them. All right, take it easy now. Yeah. Okay. Bring it over here. Hey, give me a hand. This is heavy. Okay. Okay, Sergeant, cut the ropes. Right. Hey, what are all those lumps? Some sort of weights. Made a sack out of the blanket. Open it up, man. Okay, here we are. Holy jumping catfish. Well, I'll be... I knew they were heavy reading, but I never thought of them as weights. Well, the professor went down wrapped in culture, the Encyclopedia Britannica. Yeah. One, two, three, four. Twelve volumes. Mm Mm-hmm. From A to J. Mike, look over by the inspector. Mrs. Porter and Bill Taylor. Of course, darling, they've got to identify the body. Oh. Look out, she's fading. Take her back to the yacht, men. Oh, this I've got to see Annabelle in a swoon. You better go with the ranger now. Hurry. Okay. Doc says can he have the body now? Okay, take it to the morgue. What about all them books? You know what to do with evidence. The blank and everything go to headquarters. All right, Inspector. Yes. Yeah. See any marks on the body? Not a scratch. Hey, where's Porter's secretary? Right here, Inspector. Bill Taylor. Does Jim Fonda strike you as the sort of fellow who'd pull a job like this? Well, I wouldn't like to accuse anyone of a thing like this. How long have you known him? About a year. Ever since I've been with Professor Porter. Oh. Uh, shall we return to the yacht? I'm afraid Mrs. Porter's ill. We can talk here. Miss Knight will look after her. Oh, uh, this is my friend, Mr. Shane. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Shane? Fine. Well, looks like Fonda put his trademark on this one. I don't know. I only wish I'd never sent him to the yacht. Hmm? Uh, when was this? Sunday. Uh, yesterday afternoon. Well, uh, why did you send him? Well, I never dreamed it. Well, he was insistent. Did uh, Porter tell you to keep Fonda away from him? Well, this is embarrassing, Mr. Shane. (laughs) Murder usually is, Mr. Taylor. Come on, let's have the story. Well, uh, Professor Porter disliked seeing his nephew. Why? Was he afraid of him? No, no, not exactly afraid. It was just that... uh... Well, look, Inspector, can this be kept confidential? How can I tell you until I know what it is? Well, a good many years ago, Professor Porter was involved in a rather nasty divorce case. Well, nothing like that stand up. His past is clean. Maybe he took on a new identity, Inspector. It's been done, you know. Yes, yes. Mm. Professor Porter did take a new name and arranged an entirely different past. You see, Professor Porter was William Steele. Mm. Hey, wait a minute. I remember that case back on Long Island. Mm, I don't know a great deal about it, however. But uh, Fonda did, huh? And made the most of it. Well, I'm not sure, Mr. Shane. But you see, I took care of Professor Porter's bank account, and uh, he gave his nephew large sums of money. Hmm. How much does Mrs. Porter know about this? I don't believe she knows anything about the divorce. But she knew Fonda had something on her husband? I suspect she did. She knew about the money because she spoke to me about it. Mm -hmm. How often has Fonda been tapping the professor? Almost every month. This was his second trip this month. Uh, Speaking of trips, where were you going on your vacation? My vacation? Oh. Oh, you found my bag. What's this about a bag, Mike? I found two bags fully packed in a closet. One belonged to you, Mr. Taylor, I believe. And the other one? To Mrs. Porter. Oh, well, uh, that's, uh, that's easy to explain. You see, the professor sold the yacht, and I was moving my personal possessions. Uh, I presume that Mrs. Porter had the same thing in mind. What about Professor Porter? Well, he always put things off until the last moment. Meaning? Well, the moving van isn't due until tonight. All right, Mike, that explains the bags. Now, let's get back to my office. I want Fonda. And uh, I'd like to see how Mrs. Porter's feeling. All right, go ahead. The coroner's inquest hasn't been set, but I want to see you and Mrs. Porter tomorrow morning. Okay, we'll be at Mrs. Porter's home. Mike, 
Huh? Michael. Yes, Angel? Now I've seen everything. Hmm? How is Mrs. Porter? Oh, she's beautiful, but bereaved. She's repairing her makeup. Come on, I want to get to my office. Mike, Mike, did you ask Mr. Taylor about the bags? Yes, Angel, yes. But he knows the answer. <laughs> Messages? Hollywood's been calling every 20 minutes, Inspector. What do they want? Tell her at Apex Studios. Wants his pirates. Tell him we got a murder case to settle first. Well, says you're going to have a lawsuit, too. Claims this is costing him thousands. Why don't you turn him loose, Inspector? The guy says you better do it pronto. That boat's stuck till I get my hands on Fonda. Come on, Mike. Let's fill it. Okay. Now. Let's get down to business. Yeah, let's go to work. Well, it's about time. What do you mean, Phyllis? Found a left a trail a yard wide. Too wide, Inspector. You uh, want to do me a favor, Inspector? You too? What is it? Check on that story about the sale of Porter's yacht. Yes, Mike, I had that in mind. Yes, Inspector? Is Bolton back from that pirate ship? He's waiting out, sir. Send him in. Pick up any leads, Bolton? Not a line. The guy just vanished. Oh, he can't do that. What did they tell you about Fonda? Everybody had a good word for him. He came to town ahead of the picture crowd last Friday. Oh? When was he on the boat? Yesterday. They said he seemed worried about his uncle. Hadn't been able to see him. Did uh, he tell uh, anybody why he wanted to see his uncle? No. Nope. Seems that he didn't do much talking. Does uh, Fonda smoke a pipe? Hmm? So you haven't found him, have you, Mike? No. Why? The pipe's a part of the description they gave me. Mm-hmm. The left eye twitches, too. You must know the guy. No. No, just the woman he kidnapped. Well, he can't get out of town. He must be holed up somewhere. You searched the boat? Yeah. Even turned up some girl pirates. Any pirate costumes missing? Wardrobe man says they're all there. Well, how about the odd parts? Wigs, scarves? Uh... I not thought of that. Could be. It'd take a week to check. Okay, take a week, but check it. Okay. Hello? That Hollywood guy's on the wire. Crying. Tell him I got a murder in my hands. The boat stays here. Father's not on that boat, Inspector. His friends are. Get back to that boat. Yeah, if I stay out there any longer, I'll turn pirate myself. Got any ideas, Mike? Well, I'd like to know about, uh... About that Porter yacht, Inspector. Yes? Professor sold it, all right. That satisfy you, Mike? Well, that cooks one idea, anyhow. I've got an idea, Inspector. Let's have it, Phil. Remember when lovely Annabelle was giving us Act Two? Oh, let's don't be catty, Angel. You be quiet. I know when you're getting ready to spring something. <laughs> I wish I knew as much. All right, all right, Smarty. Well, Mrs. Porter spoke of Jim Fonda in the past tense. A natural reaction. Probably glad to have him out of her life. Oh, you don't. Just heard from the coroner's office, Inspector. When's the inquest? Tomorrow. Funny thing. What's that? Doc says Porter's been in the water two or three days. Did you hear that, Mike? Well, that knocks the whole case into a cocked hat. But Mrs. Porter said it happened last night. Well, maybe she'll know the answer to this one. Maybe I know the answers. What? Remember when we went through the staterooms on the yacht? Yeah, yeah, you admired the bed. Uh-huh. There were two in the stateroom and one in the guest cabin. Yeah, they'd all been slept in. Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. But, but there was something missing. Hey, hey, I remember. The blankets. Now you're cooking. Look, this is no time for guessing games, Mike. Let him alone, let him alone. I thought he never would wake up. One blanket to wrap the professor in, one for his wife for a canoe ride. That makes two blankets. Where's the third one? Maybe it was for Fonda. You're wrong, Mike. And about encyclopedias? Twenty volumes to the set, covering everything from A to Z. Right, Angel, right. Where's the other eight volumes? Porter was dumped overboard with A to J. And you think K to Z are with Fonda? Say... Anybody on the yacht with that dame? Oh, Taylor's with her. She'll keep. Well, Fonda didn't keep very well. Well, maybe I left her uncovered so she'd lead us to Fonda. I've got a different slant, Inspector. The only place Annabella leads you is astray. I guess we'd better get back to the yacht. If you're still looking for Fonda, we'd better go. I doubt if there's anyone else there. All right, let's go. Fonda's the lad I'm still looking for. Uh, uh, then you better take along the boys with the long-handled rakes, Inspector. <laughs> We'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures in just a moment. The front wheel bearings on your automobile are made of finely machined, high-carbon steel. With proper lubrication, these bearings will last the lifetime of the car with no other attention. But notice, ladies and gentlemen, that we say, with proper lubrication. 
For front wheel bearings do require extra protection. They're exposed to damage from brake dust, grit, and water. In addition, they must support the heavy weight of your automobile. For these reasons, and because they're expensive and difficult to replace nowadays, front wheel bearings should be carefully and thoroughly lubricated. Your neighborhood Union Oil Minuteman knows this. That's why he takes such pains to do a thorough job of lubricating front wheel bearings. First, he washes out all the old grease and dirt with solvent. Then the bearings and races are individually cleaned until they're dry and shiny. Finally, the clean, polished bearings are replaced in the races. Then, with special equipment, every surface is snugly packed in a thick coating of Union Ball Roll grease, and your front wheels are all set for months of well-lubricated, easy rolling. The cost for the entire service of your front wheel bearing assembly is nominal. So for safer, easier driving, just stop in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil's front wheel bearing service. Thank you. Mike, Phyllis, and Inspector Faraday are back at the yacht. A crew with grappling hooks is just arriving. It would be old home week if Mrs. Porter and Bill Taylor were there, but they've flown the coop. The inspector mutters to himself. I hope this phone's still working. Hello? Hello? Hello, Sarge? Yes, Inspector? Get Cassidy on the short wave. Tell him to bring Mrs. Porter and Taylor back to the yacht. So, you did have them tailed. How do you think I keep my job, Mike? Mike? Hmm? Mike, you were right about the blankets, and the bags are gone, too. Sure they're gone. Taylor told us they were moving into town. And here's where the encyclopedia set came from. Where is it? An empty shelf, and I never even noticed. Say, let's go out on deck and see if they fished up anything, huh? All right. All right, dear. Oh. Hey, fellas, have you found anything? Two tire cases and a couple of pairs of old shoes. Well, keep on raking. Try it forward. Okay. It's beginning to add up, all right. Yeah, sure, sure it adds up. Fonda gets into town, goes to see Uncle Porter. And tries to pick up five grand. No, no, no. I'm not buying the blackmail scenario. Why am I? Too well planted like the rest of the deal. Anyhow, a crook working a blackmail racket doesn't have to work as a press agent. Okay, so Fonda goes to see Porter. And Porter isn't in sight. Annabelle and Taylor give Fonda a cock and bull story. He gets suspicious and starts checking. Yeah, but where? Around the neighborhood, at the university. And then? Annabelle and Taylor get ideas. Maybe Fonda is the answer to a little job they've already done. You mean Porter's murder? You're on the beam, Inspector. My guess is Fonda stood to get a slice of the professor's estate, a big slice. I'm beginning to like your story. Well, wait a minute. Let me finish it, hmm? They decide to knock off Fonda, hang the Porter murder on him, and live happily ever after. Take the whole part, huh? Right, right. So Taylor lets Fonda know that his professor uncle is on the yacht. And when Fonda shows up Sunday night, Taylor drills him. Hey, Aren't you boys guessing a bit too far ahead? Huh? You've got no proof that Taylor shot Fonda. In fact, you've got no proof that Fonda's even dead. No. But do you see what I see on that ledge? You mean the lamp? Yes, darling, a lamp. Where it couldn't do anybody any good. No, it's not very ornamental. Okay, okay, quit being clever. Move it. All right. A bullet hole. Yes, honey, a bullet hole. Not very old, either. And since no bullets were used to put the professor out of the way, and Taylor and the professor's wife are still alive... What is it, Sarge? Another bundle, Inspector. Well. Well, Inspector, blanket number three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the same kind of bulges as the other bundle. Yes, Angel. Encyclopedia Britannica, volumes K to Z. Looks like a police car. Cassidy, you hope. With our two murdering lovebirds. Yeah. Yeah. It's Cassidy, all right. Here they are, Inspector. Did you send for us, Inspector? Yes, I wanted to finish our chat. Why, what happened, Inspector? Nothing much. We just found Fonda's body. Get out of the car, Taylor. You too, Annabelle. Duck, guys, he's got a gun! Get him, Faraday! Get him! My gun's jammed! That got his tire! The car's caught fire. Come, here, come on, run for it. Hurry! Both unconscious. Yeah, pull him out, pull him out. Get her first. Easier Taylor. that way. Taylor's all in one piece anyway. It's the same with the dean. Just bump your head. Well, that's too bad. 
Mike, where are you going? To get the robe out of the car before it's burned. Have you gone crazy? No, no. Now, here. Here, let's throw this robe over Annabelle. Pull it up over her face. Hey, Taylor's stirring. He's coming out of it. Good, good. But I can't have Annabelle awake. Maybe I better conquer her. Let me. Wake him up, Inspector. Come on, you get up. Wake him up. Come on. Where am I? You're at the end of the road, fellas. Oh. Oh, where's Annabelle? Mrs. Porter. Mrs. Porter is dead. Huh? Oh, no. No, she couldn't be. Huh? Pull the blanket back, honey. Was she dead? I mean... I mean... I know exactly what you mean, boy. No. No, she talked. Talked plenty before she went. You've been out cold for ten minutes, fellas. Come on, you'd better talk fast. I had nothing to do with it. Oh, I helped dispose of the bodies, yes, but she made me. She threatened my life. She acted like a mad woman. I didn't do it. I didn't. Then who did? Annabelle. She poisoned the professor and she shot Fonda. He's lying. Don't believe him. Oh, so you came too, huh? But but you said she was dead. You, you tricked me. Which is nothing compared to what we're going to do to you, both of you. Yes, we tricked you. And you accused her of murder. Now it's her turn. Where did he hide the gun? At my apartment. Oh, you fool. If you kept your mouth shut. If you both kept your mouth shut, we'd still have caught you. Every clue that you planted, every clue that you thought would point to Fonda was a signpost leading us right to you. I don't want to talk to them anymore, Inspector. How about you? Not me. I've had all I want. Take them away, Cassidy. Well, Mike, this is my apartment, remember? Huh? Oh. Oh, yes, Angel. Yes. Uh-huh. What are you thinking of, Mike? The redhead? Redhead? Oh, her no. Oh, no, no. She did sort of go for it. In a mild sort of way. <laughs> Not me, honey. I knew she was a phony. Ah, don't give me that. No, look, Angel, look. What do you think I am, a fool? Yes, where blondes and redheads are concerned, yes. Oh, Angel, from the word go, I had her tagged. She tried to identify Fonda as the guy who kidnapped her. Well, I know it. Well, could you picture Fonda picking her up, wrapping her in a blanket, carrying her to a canoe, and all the time striking matches to light a pipe he was smoking? Tough, hot angel. Well, then why didn't you say so before? <laughs> Just because you look so cute when you're jealous. Jealous? What? Well, uh, you... Angel, please, Angel, not here. The neighbors are watching. <laughs> again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Tom Petty and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is Ed Stevens substituting for John Lang, saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. Ladies and gentlemen, despite all our efforts to know that living costs are rising, and certainly the high taxes of war are cutting deeply into our incomes, so why not help yourself and your country by starting a victory garden now? Growing your own vegetables will not only make a big saving on your grocery bill, but will provide a healthy, interesting hobby. Those who have no yards of their own may be able to find space in nearby vacant lots. So wherever you live, whatever you do, serve yourself and the nation with a victory garden in 45. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. 
stories start many different ways. This one started, strangely enough, with the flame of a match, whose feeble glow lit up a lightened face in the darkness. A frightened face, twisted by an agonizing fear of death. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. The night is a thief, some poet once wrote, that steals the colors from the day. It's kind of pretty if you like words, but for my dog, they're not exactly true. Because there are colors at night. The burning red of passion, the angry green of jealousy, and the ugly, terrifying black of fear. This was one of those nights when pickings were slim. I'd cover the town from Henrici's Bar in the Mart, out to Hyler's on the North Shore, and back downtown again with nothing to show for it. I was taking a shortcut through Lincoln Park to pick up my car. At that time of night, the park was pretty deserted, except for this girl walking up ahead of me. Not a bad silhouette, I might add, against the distant light. We were about halfway through the park when suddenly she stopped and threw herself onto a bench at the side of a path. There was something almost desperate about the way she did it. I ran up to her. Mm. Excuse me, are you all right? Yes, I'm all right. Well, I thought maybe you were sick or something. I told you I'm all right. Now, you please let me alone. Oh, now, look, lady, it's not what you think. I, uh, well, this park at this time of night, it's no place for a girl to sit around by herself. I don't need any help. Just go away. Oh, sure, sure. I'll get lost. I can see you're all right. Only you don't mind if I just sit here and smoke a cigarette before I go. It's a public park. I don't care what you do. Thank you. You care for a cigarette? No. Of course, in order to really enjoy a smoke, you've got to have a match first. <laughs> I said in order to enjoy a smoke, you've got I to... heard you. Here. Thank you. Here. Keep the book. No, no, you better hang on to these. I won't need them. Well, you might need them later tonight. After tonight, I won't need anything. Oh, now, wait a minute. That's no way to talk. The only time you're not going to need anything, sister, is after you're dead. Why did you say that? What? That about being dead. For no reason. Why? Because after tonight, I will be. The girl jumped up and started running. Here was a kid that was afraid. Afraid of death or afraid of life. But then isn't everybody. I turned the matchbook over and looked at the ad on the cover. Penguin Club. A little all-night jump and jive place over on Clark Street. That's one I've been missing lately. On a hunch, I ambled up North Avenue in that general direction, turned up Clark a ways, and there it was. It was good to get inside out of that wind. Check your hat and coat, mister. No, thanks. I'm just looking around. Can I get to the table? It's almost the end of the floor, sure. Well, anywhere in the back will be all right. Okay. The hat check girl, hostess or whatever she was, walked me through the bar to the edge of the main room. And then I stopped and really did a take. Out in the middle of the dance floor, under a little baby spot singing in front of a five-piece band, was Little Miss Desperate from the park. Nice voice, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. Who is she? Oh, that's Fanny. Fran Fowler. Have you been in here before? Not for quite a few months. Of course, she hadn't got much experience yet. From out of town, hmm? Someplace over in Wisconsin. Not bad looking, huh? Mm. In everything. Hey, what's wrong with her? She, I don't know. I can't! Well, how do you like that? Come on, folks, come on. Let's give the little girl a great big hand. Nothing like a real sad song to light up a real sad act. Especially for a real sad tomato like tomato. Hiya, Peggy, you got some alive one, huh? Hello, Tommy. <laughs> this is Tommy Mason, eh? He's the one? Yes, yes, he's quite the one, all right. Hey, Tommy, you, you sure covered up for Franny, all right. Never let down. Keep him going all the time. That's show business. You know how it is, mister. Oh, yes, yes, I've heard. The show must go on. It's a new thing. Uh, you gotta keep him laughing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Honest, Mr. He's this way all the time. What a joker. Oh, now, look, about that girl. Franny? Yeah, Franny. What seems to be the trouble? Well, that's hard to say, pal. Maybe she just found out she ain't no dinosaur. And she sure ain't. <laughs> Oh, don't you kill me. Uh, seriously, fella. Fella, why would a girl break up that way in the middle of a number and start to cry? Ah, uh, could be she got a cinder in her eye. But just to make sure, I'll go ask her. See you later, Tommy. Come on, fella. How's about buying a girl a drink? Oh, sure, sure, in a minute. Um, about this Franny. Look, do we have to talk about her? I, I thought you came in here for some fun. Maybe I get my fun wondering about people. What time's an explore show? Next one's a two, then four. Oh, they're not kidding about this all-night business. And still another one at daylight. She's singing all of them? How should I know? She missed most of the 12 o'clock show. Just got here for that last number. Any idea where she lives? A room in house around on Erie Street. Know the number? 391. You know you ask an awful lot of questions. <laughs> well, that's my business. I'm a reporter, Randy Stone. I might have known it. Look, you're, you're not going to bother her tonight, are you? Of all nights? Tonight? This is the night that Charlie Dane is being executed down at Joliet. What's that got to do with her? Well, how would you feel? Look, Mr. Stone, she's human. This is the night her boyfriend's going to die. I went up to the front of the bar to a phone booth and called the paper. There was something about this in the back of my mind somewhere. Something I ought to remember but couldn't. I had the girl on the board put me through to Gabby in the library. Library? Oh, hello, Gabby. This is Randy. Yeah, Randy? Uh, what have you got on the Charlie Dana case? Still a little early, Randy. Execution's not set until 1.30. No, no. I mean old stuff. Oh, I got the file right here, Randy. Dug it out earlier for background. Good. Anything on a girl named Fran Fowler? Yeah, let's see. Charlie Dana... Small-time gambler killed a guy named Tonelli. Oh, yes, yes. I remember that. A gambling beat. Execution originally set for November, but he got a couple of months' stay. Oh, here she is, Fran Fowler. Singer in a nightclub was supposed to be his alibi, but the D.A. blew her up on the witness stand. She admitted she wasn't positive about when she'd been out with the guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was it. I knew it was something. Anything more? Oh, details, Randy, details. Okay, Gabby, thanks. I'll catch up with you. Oh, Mason. Excuse me, were you waiting to use the phone? Uh, no, I was uh, waiting to talk to you. Why, certainly, but this time, no jokes, if you don't mind. I'm expecting a headache. <laughs> You're not funny, Stone. Who are you talking to? Well, isn't that uh, kind of my business? Uh, Peggy says you're a reporter. Yes, of a sort. You were asking about Fran, where she lived. That's right. you got to let her alone, see? You printed enough about her. Uh, just a minute, Mason. Those are my lapels that you're hanging on to. Peggy shouldn't have given you Fran's address. I don't want you bothering her. I said let go of my lapels, funny man, or something's liable to explode in your face. <laughs> now, you stay out of my way or I'll ruffle that shiny hair. Where are you going? See about a cinder in a lady's eye. You're not going to see her. I won't let you. Can't you see this whole thing's driving her crazy? Tommy, believe me, I'm not interested in harming her or anyone. I'm just a guy trying to do a job. Now, if you'll step out of my way... You're please. not going there. I won't let you. I won't let Charlie, you. Charlie, that's your last point. <laughs> My, my, that's a real nervous fellow. Now that he'd made such an issue out of it, going around to see Fran Fowler was a definite must on my schedule. I picked up my car and drove over to Erie Street. 391 wasn't much different from any of the rest of the rooming houses on the block. I got the number of her room from the mailbox and started down the dingy corridor to room 8. I knocked at the door, but there was no answer. I knocked again, and then I smelled gas. Hey, anyone in there? Miss Fowler! Fran! I put my shoulder to the door, and the flimsy lock snapped open. I rushed into the gas-filled room, holding my breath until I could smash open the window and let in some air. Then I saw Fran Fowler, the girl from the park, lying across the bed. And on the table beside her, one of those two burner gas stoves with both jets wide open. I turned them off and started shaking the girl. Miss Fowler, Franny, come on, get up. You gotta get out of here. How come I'm going to have to carry you? Put me down. You little fool, this room is filled with gas. It's not my purse. Where? On the table. Okay, I've got it. Oh. Fine thing, with a gun in it. Give that to me. Outside, baby, outside. It was six seconds flat when we hit the sidewalk in the fresh air. I put Fran in the front seat of my car and then ran around and climbed in behind the wheel. I headed out to Sheridan Road along the lake. 
The cool, clean air felt good in my lungs, and I could see Fran drinking it in, realizing now how close she'd been. I didn't make her talk until we were a long way out of town. And I pulled over to the beach side of the road and killed my motor. We, uh, seem to keep bumping into each other in the strangest places tonight. I... I guess I should say thanks. No, no, not at all. I'm the one who should say thanks. I still haven't returned your matches. Please don't make fun of me. No, I'm not. You see, I know now who you are. Charlie Daney's girl. Why don't you say it? In my book, you're just a kid on that in the park. What time is it? It's quarter to two. Then... Yes, it's probably all over by now. Like me to turn on the radio and... No. No, I, I don't want to hear about it. You must love him an awful lot. Love him? I despise him. Just... But still you were willing to alibi for him on a murder charge? I wasn't. I, I told him I wasn't sure of the time I was out with him, but he made me say it was the exact hour when the man was killed. Didn't you realize you might have been perjuring yourself? I didn't lie. I just didn't remember. It might have been like he said... When you're not sure, what else can you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How'd you happen to get mixed up with him? I... I didn't know anybody when I first came here. I was lonesome. And he was nice to you. He was. A lot more decent than most of the men who want to take you out when you're working in a club. And why do you hate him now? I didn't know what he did. A lot of people gamble. I didn't think too much about it. Then we got to going out evenings between shows at the club on my nights off. And the killing happened when you and he were supposed to have been out someplace together? That's what he said. He wasn't arrested until a few weeks after the... the trouble. I couldn't remember if I'd been with him during that particular time or not. Well, it's all over now. You did what you had to. That's about all any of us can do. But you've got to forget about it. Put it out of your mind. There's nothing more to worry about. Oh, that's just it. You don't understand. There is. What are you talking about? He promised. He promised, and I know he'll keep his promise. Promised what? I... I want to see him in prison. In the death house? I had to. I wanted him to understand, but he said I tricked him. What, by telling the truth on the witness stand? He said I double-crossed him, but now he, he didn't care. Why would he say that? He said he didn't care because the night he died, I would die. And I'm afraid. <laughs> You are listening to Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Brandy Stone. This was real. This was no act. The sound she made would tear you to pieces, like some pitifully frightened animal who'd lost everything in the world. I let her cry it out. After all those months of strain, she'd have to get it out of her system. He said the night he died... I died. Sure, sure. So you were scared. Who wouldn't be? But don't you see? That's just a cruel boast made by a cheap hoodlum who's trying to hurt you, make you feel responsible for his own plight. But he meant it. I know he did. Well, maybe he did at the time, but you've got nothing to worry about now. You had nothing to do with it. He paid for his own crime. Now he's dead, and you're still alive. He'll keep his promise. How can he? He's dead. I, I, I know you think I'm crazy. No, 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 no. But has anyone really tried to harm you? Oh, but this... This wasn't the night he was supposed to... Yes, I know. The execution was originally set for November. It was that night in November. I, I hadn't been afraid before. I, I thought it was like you said, because it was bitter. But all that day, I was upset. I, I told him at the club I couldn't work, and late in the afternoon, I got a note from Peggy saying, why didn't I go up to her cabin at the dunes for a couple of days? Nobody would bother me, no reporters, and I, I could get a good rest. So I, I, I drove out there that evening... It was quiet. Nothing around. Just empty sand dunes and her cabin all alone on the edge of the lake. I, I, I called Peggy at the club to let her know I got in all right. Oh, hello, Fran. Where are you calling from? Why, from your place. My apartment? No, your cabin. At the dunes? I was swell of you, Peggy, to let me come out here. Oh, of course, Franny. You're, you're welcome to use the place, but... I don't quite know what you mean. Well, your note this afternoon telling me to come out here. I didn't write you any notes. Oh, come on, Peggy, you did. You even told me where the key would be under the flower pot. The key? 
kid, that's where we always keep it. Everybody knows that. Peggy, I... I... Now, don't worry about it, kid. One of the girls probably sent you the note and just hasn't had a chance to tell me about it yet. I should have thought of it myself no. in the first place. No, wait, Peggy. I'm scared. Well, what in the world else? You remember what I told you about what, what Charlie said the last time I saw him? Prison? It was about tonight that he said when he died, I... Franny, now cut it before you drive yourself Peggy, back. I'm all alone and I'm scared. I don't know what to do. Franny, you got to hang up right away. You shouldn't be out there all alone tonight. Get in your car and come back to town as fast as you can. I'll, I'll wait for you here. All right, Peggy. All right. I hung up the phone and ran out of the house to my car. I turned on the ignition key and stepped on the starter. It wouldn't start. My car wouldn't start. I looked at the gas gauge. Empty. Somebody had drained the gas out of my car. I got out in a panic and started toward the highway. But there was a car out there. Parked behind the big sand dune. I turned and ran back to the house. It was like some crazy, frightening nightmare. I didn't know what I was doing, but somehow I managed to get inside and lock the door. And then suddenly I was at the telephone. Operator? Operator, answer me. Operator, you've got to answer. I want the police. Operator, please help me. Someone. Operator! It was no use. The line was dead. While I was outside, someone had pulled the wires away from the wall. Crawled over to the window. Looked out to the highway. There was a car out there. Its lights were on. But as I looked, they went out. And now, I was alone. In the dark. With him out there. When I came to, it was morning, and, and Peggy was there. She and Tommy had driven out after the club closed to, to find me. But you see, you didn't die that night. But neither did he. Could have been your imagination, you know, this man in the car. No, no, no. The news about this day of execution was on the radio. The man in the car must have heard it and gone away. Did you call the police? They didn't believe me. Just because I'm a nightclub singer, they said I was trying to get publicity. How about the car not starting and the telephone being dead? According to them, my car was just out of gas, and I must have pulled the telephone wires off the wall myself. In the panic you were in, you could have. But I didn't. I tell you, I didn't. All right, all right. Anyway, it's tonight that we're concerned with. I don't know what to do. I... I just don't know what to do. Well, if it's true, this fear you have, you've got to find it out tonight. If you don't, it'll haunt you the rest of your life. Oh, I know, I know, but how? You've got to go back to your room. Oh, no, I'm afraid. I'll be with you. Still got your gun, remember? By the way, what were you going to do with that? I... I didn't have the nerve to use it, even on myself. Well, if anything is going to happen, it'll happen tonight. Not tomorrow or any time after that, but tonight. We'll go back to your place now and wait until it's daylight. I drove Fran back to the rooming house on Erie Street. There were no lights on anywhere in the building. We tiptoed down the empty corridor to Fran's room, listened at the door a minute, and went in. The door closed all right, but it wouldn't lock. I must have sprung it when I forced the door. We settled down and waited. For what? Once I thought I heard steps on the sidewalk far out front. It was that still. And then I did hear steps, slowly coming down the hall. There's someone... in the hall. Keep it down. I am all right now. Nothing to be sorry about. I was kind of scared myself. It's a funny thing about fear. It's catching. 
Look out the window. But it's almost light. And this all night has gone for good. You see, it was all in your mind. Things you were frightened of. It was nothing, really. You won't be afraid if I go now. No. I've caused you an awful lot of trouble. Oh, now, you cut the hell or you'll get me going. And the kids at the club, I guess I should go back there and let them know I'm all right. What the doctor ordered for you is a little shut eye. I'll stop by on my way and give them the word. Good night. Good night. Oh, here's your gun. You might want to pawn it for a couple of pair of nylons. Yes, a real nice tomato-type tomato, as the funny man at the club would say. On the way over, I got thinking about him and that girl, Peggy. Come to think of it, that was one point Fran had forgotten to clear up for me about the note that sent her out to Peggy's cabin at the dunes that night. Yeah, my mind wouldn't let go of that. When I got to the club, it was daylight, and they were folding up the joint, and Peggy was sitting alone at the bar. Well... You got a nerve coming back here after... How's your boyfriend? He's not my boyfriend. It's a figure of speech. Where is he? He just left. Okay, I'll settle for you. If you don't mind, it's a little late for small talk, mister. Okay, I'll give it to you fast. It's about that note you wrote to Fran Fowler last November on the night Charlie Dana was supposed to die. What note? <laughs> a little late for small talk, remember? I don't know what you're talking about. You don't know anything about a note inviting Fran to stay out at your place at the dunes? I told her. I didn't know who wrote it. Were you telling the truth? Yes. Yes, I was. Okay, okay. Maybe you were. But you found out later who wrote it, didn't you? No, I... Now, tell me the truth. Or would you rather tell the police? All right. I did find out, but it wasn't like you think. Well, who was it? Tommy. Tommy Mason. Tommy Mason? The Mm -hmm. funny man? His idea of a joke, no doubt. A hilarious joke that might have scared a poor kid to death. No, no, you're wrong. It wasn't a joke. Well, then why? Why did he do it? Because he's in love with her. He made me swear I wouldn't tell her. He he wanted to wait until the time when she needed him, and and then he'd tell her himself. Until she needed him? That's... How was he going to make her need him? Use a condemned murderer's empty threat to frighten her out of her sanity so she'd need him? Is he crazy? He is where Fran's concerned. Where is he? I don't know. He's been like a maniac all night since you left here. After every show, he's gone over to Fran's place looking for her. He's crazy jealous. Jealous? Of whom? Of you. He thought she was with you. But what if she were? This was the night. This was the night he was sure she would need him, and instead she turned to you. Don't you see? Yes, I do now. Thanks. It was only about a half mile to Franz, but it seemed more like 20 miles until I turned off Clark up Erie Street and slammed into the curb. There was no one on the street. I was hoping he'd walk and I'd pass him on the way, but there was no one. I ran down the narrow hall, not daring to think what I'd find, and I flung open the door. Are you alone? Well, you... You're frightened. Are you alone? Well, yes, I've been sitting here since you left. I'm too tired to undress. Come on, let's get out of here. Grab your coat. But never where? mind, never mind, never mind. I'll tell you on the way. I shoved Fran out the door and we started cautiously back down the hall. We got about halfway when I grabbed her arm. The front door was opening slowly and a man made a dark silhouette against the gray light of the dawn. It was the funny man. The man with the slick, shiny hair and a permanent smile and the fast jokes. Only the smile was gone and he had a gun in his hand. Keep coming. Keep coming. We started towards him slowly. Tommy. Tommy, it was you. You who were going to kill me. You didn't know. You didn't know that I had a heart too, just like Charlie Dana did. Tommy, you never told me. You never let me. You didn't need me. You would have laughed at me like you laughed at my jokes. It, it couldn't have been you at the dunes that night. I followed you out there. And then drove back to the club. No, Tommy, no. You were lonesome, but you didn't need me. You needed Charlie Dana. I thought if you were afraid, you'd need me. And then you were afraid, but still you didn't need me. But I'd make you need me. I'd make you. Step by step, they moved closer. Keep coming. I could see his face twisted with jealousy and hate, his eyes wild, as though a spark might make him explode. And tonight, when you were afraid and should have needed me, you didn't. You turned to him. Tommy, please. But now you need me. Now that I have my finger on this trigger, you need me more than you've ever needed anyone in your life. 
You need me. You need me, Fanny. You need me. Say it. Say you need me. <laughs> I I can't shoot. I can't shoot. He started to shake and I ran forward to grab his gun. Look out. Drop it, drop it. It's all right. I got the gun. I can't. Is he hurt? Not to what he will be. Get up, funny man. No. Don't be too hard on him. He didn't realize. No, no, I... I guess maybe he didn't. It's funny, isn't it? You never really know what's going on in some of the best combed heads. Well, that's the way it goes. A little later than usual this morning... The day shift has already moved in and let the night crew wander off to their own private little beds. Well, at least I got to see the sun come up. And here I sit, still trying to make it all add up. But no matter how I figure it, the only answer I get is, you never know about people. <laughs> but bless them, maybe that's why we love them. See that man walking towards you with a smile on his face? What's he smiling about? Or is it just so you won't notice how he's screaming inside? Huh. Ooh, the trouble with me is I haven't had my coffee yet. Copy, boy. Night Beat. A dramatic series stars Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Night Beat is edited by Larry Marcus and directed by Warren Lewis. Music by Frank Worth. The part of Fran was played by Joan Banks. Paul Dubov played Tommy. Others in the cast were Georgia Ellis, Ken Christie, and Carol Richards. Frank Lovejoy will next be seen in Milton Sperling's production, Rock Bottom, released by Warner Brothers. Throughout the week, NBC brings you the best adventure mystery dramas on the air. You'll hear action-packed, fast-moving plots to hold your interest right up to the smashing climax on such thrilling programs as Big Town... Mr. District Attorney, The Big Story, and Dragnet, every week on most of these NBC stations. On Dragnet, you'll hear documented cases from the Los Angeles police files. The Big Story brings you true tales from the front pages of America's newspapers. Mr. District Attorney, the champion of the people, takes you through an exciting episode in the conviction of a criminal. And tomorrow night on Big Town, you'll hear crusading editor Steve Wilson crack down on the forces of evil. For the best high-tension dramas here, NBC's great mystery and adventure programs. Listen next week at this same time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. The stories that come out of the shadows to find their way into Night Beat. Now, stay tuned for Brian Donlevy as a soldier of fortune on Dangerous Assignment on NBC. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there. My name's Diamond, and I'm known along the big street as a guy who manages to keep his nose pretty clean and still make a few bucks while I'm doing it. Oh, sure, it gets a little grimy, but you've got to expect that. I'm a shamus, private eye, gumshoe. To the guy who hasn't ever been worried because he tripped over a corpse in his breakfast nook, I'm known as a private detective. 
And to some guys, I'm known by a lot of other names. Not the kind you'd find in a book on manners and social usages. But there are times when you might turn up on your desk calendar under the heading of what I must do today. Who hires me? How do I make a living? Well, maybe this will give you an idea. Fred, why don't you eat your toast? It's getting cold. Why don't you stop worrying about the temperature of my breakfast? I'm trying to read the paper. Did anyone ever tell you how charming it is to have breakfast with you every morning? Yeah. My ulcers. I'd like to go shopping today. Will you leave me some money? Fred, did you hear me? Mary, I'm reading. Well, stop reading and listen to me for a minute. I need some new summer clothes and I want to go shopping today. Here. Here's ten bucks. Buy yourself a bathing suit. Oh, that's very funny. Hmm? I need more than ten dollars. I want five hundred. What kind of a bathing suit are you going to buy, Mink? I'm not going to buy a bathing suit. I need some new clothes. Will you put down that paper and listen to me? Well, I see you made Jimmy Cello's column again, my darling. What? What prominent socialite is fighting with her wealthy husband and crying on the shoulder of a big-time playboy after the arguments? Is that... That's supposed to be me? Can you remember five minutes in the past five years when we haven't been fighting? Are you accusing me of running around with some playboy? Running around is right. I expect one of you to be the first to do a four-minute mile. How dare you? How dare me, why, you lushed-up little tramp. Tramp? Yeah, tramp. Everybody in town knows you're seeing Lauren Oliver. All right, so I've been seeing him. We're... We're just friends. Well, that kind of friendship is grounds for divorce in this state. Why, you oh, dirty... Oh, I'm sick of this whole rotten mess. And I'm going to do something about it. You're going to do something about it? Why, you conceited, pompous... You're going to do something, are you? Well, you better hurry up because I've got some ideas of my own. Uh, yeah? Lorne. Yeah, yeah, Mary? I've got to talk to you. What time is it? Ten o'clock. Well, it's still the middle of the night. Call me back this later. This can't wait. Fred found an item about us in Jimmy Cello's column this morning. He stormed out of here like he was going to kill somebody. Well, you're just a gal who can recognize the symptoms. Well, that's a nasty line. What do you want at 10 in the morning, Longfellow? Look, honey, I'll take care of Cello, and if that husband of yours gets out of line, I'll take care of him, too. You see what I mean? If things like that didn't happen, I'd be out of business. I'll lay you eight to five that before three o'clock this afternoon, one of those charming people will be walking into my office begging for help. Yeah? Rick? Oh, hello, Helen, baby. Hi. You gonna take me out tonight? Sure, sure. I'll be over later. We'll have a quiet evening. No, no. I want to go dancing tonight. If you don't take me, I'll throw a tantrum. But, baby, I don't have the cash. I'm tapped this week. Well, if you won't let me take, you'll borrow it from friends. You told me yourself he was good in a pinch. Yeah, but he's already black and blue from those three lunches at Lindy's. Besides, he's not only your butler, but he's a darn good businessman. He wants security. Well, give it to him. He's already got my badge, my book on the ten best ways to sneak through transoms, complete with illustrations, and my gun. Haven't you got something else? Yeah, but I'm saving the right eye in case of an emergency. Keyholes, you know. Look, honey, let's go take in a quiet movie. Well, and... I want to get dressed up and go to a nightclub. It's summer. The flowers are blooming, and the fox has left his lair. His what? Oh, I've been hibernating all winter, and I want to get out into some nice, smoke-filled dance floor. Why, Helen. Why, Helen, nothing. Please, Rick. Uh, hold it. Someone's knocking at my chamber door. Come in. Mr. Diamond? Yeah, I'll pull up a chair. I'll be right with you. Who is it? I'm afraid to look. I haven't paid the light bill. This is a detective agency, isn't it? You, sir, have just won yourself a new economy home-sized murder sampler, complete with a matching set of bodies. Me? No. I haven't got time to listen to your bright remarks, Diamond. I want to hire you. What did he say? He doesn't like my bright remarks. You won't even admit they're bright. What else? Oh, something about wanting to, uh... Something about what? Uh, uh, what was that last statement, sir? It sounded rather cozy. I said I wanted to hire you. What? I'll call you later, baby. Bye. Uh, wait, wait a minute. I, I... Now, uh, Mr. Uh, Sears... Mr. Sears, what can I do for you? I want you to follow my wife. Will I like the view? She's running around with another man. Well, if they're just running around, don't worry about it. It's when they get tired and slow down that things start to pop. There was a veiled article in Jimmy Cello's column this morning about my wife and this man. Yeah, I know Cello. So do I, but I'm not interested in Cello at the moment. Well, what do you want? Enough on your wife so you can get a divorce? Yes. Oh, well, that, that comes kind of high. 
I don't like cases like this, and I usually turn them down. If you want me to swallow my pride, it'll take a $200 retainer and a hundred a day in expenses. I'll write you a check. Oh, oh, just like that, huh? I am quite wealthy. Hmm. That's why I want the divorce, Mr. Dynam. There you are. Yes, sir. There I am. Now, what's the man's name that your wife is uh, seeing? His name is Lorne Oliver. Well, this is turning into a family gathering. You know him? Sure. Runs the Monarch Club. That's right. What's your wife's name, and we're going to get a look at her. Mary Sears. You can see her tonight at the Stork. We'll be there for dinner, 9 o'clock. I'll be there. Oh, uh, incidentally, that uh, comes under the heading of expenses, in case you have a short memory. I have a good memory, Mr. Diamond. You can send me the bill. Oh. Address and phone number? 45 East 65th Street. 45 East 65. Evergreen 41793. E- 41793. Now I've got to be going. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Sears. Yeah? What'd you hang up on me for? Uh, honey, this is because you always give me an argument. You never want to go anywhere. I'm getting tired of shows and hot dogs. I want to go dancing. What? And I don't mean Roseland. I want to go to the stork. I'm a growing boy, and I like to see the bright lights and throw my money around. But, Rick, you... you I'll certainly... pick you up at 8.30, and this time, don't wear slacks. <laughs> You're an idiot. Bye, idiot. Yes, that's the way it goes, just as I told you. The word private in front of detective means you're married to all the troubles in the world, and that includes everything. So if a guy turns up who's unhappy with his wife, you listen to him howl, and if he's got enough money, you take the job. It's for better or for worse. And until Mr. Sears came in, it was decidedly one-sided. I'd teach cooking to a bunch of headhunters for a fee like the one he'd given me. When I looked at his $200 check, I started getting that big man complex again. So I closed the office and went back to my flat. We'd probably be up late, and Helen always had some extracurricular activities after we'd get back to her place. You know, roasting marshmallows, fast game of canasta, or an exciting round of image on the living room rug. Anyway, I always got home pretty late in the a.m., so I spent the rest of the afternoon taking a nap. At 6 o'clock, I got up and dressed, and at 8.30, I picked up Helen. Wow. And at 9 o'clock, we were sitting at the Stark Club bar, right on schedule. Rick, when are you going to ask for a table? Honey, the drinks come faster here. But I want to dance. Oh, no, no, no. I mustn't overdo it, lover. Uh, How do you know? Maybe some mountain climber will ask you on a 20-mile hike tomorrow. Thank you, your feet. I am. I want to move them around that dance floor. Oh, Rick, I know you. You do something, you do it all the way. Yeah, let's nick. Oh, now you stop that. You're on a job, and you don't want to go in there because you've got to watch somebody. Well, Helen Asher, how are you, darling? Well, hello, Lauren. How have you been? Oh, couldn't be better. Why don't you ever stop over to my club? I'd like to show you around. She just brought a seeing eye dog. Oh, hello, Diamond. You two know each other, don't you? Yes. How did we make such a grisly mistake, Oliver? I don't know. I tried taking penicillin for it, but it didn't do much good. Well, it probably helped out in the other things. Why don't you try hanging yourself? Really? You always did think you were a pretty funny man, didn't you, Diamond? <laughs> It's easy being a comic. You just find an idiot for an audience. How do you like the performance? Stinks. Pardon me, Helen, but I see some people I know. You'll excuse me, won't you, Diamond? Oh, sure, yes. But the next time you drop around, bring some airwick, huh? Rick, even if you don't like him, you shouldn't say those things. It's liable to start a fight. Oh, he wouldn't take a swing at a midget if he was riding an elephant. I wonder who his friends are. They don't seem to be too glad to see him. The name's Sears. Is that who you're watching? Yeah, the wife. I don't know whether I approve or not. She's very attractive. Isn't she, though? Rick! This is business, baby. Business. I'm only drooling because I haven't had anything to eat since this morning. Well, then let's get a table. You've seen her. You've observed what she's doing. Now, let's get something to eat. Now, wait a minute. Here comes somebody else I know. Where? Standing at the check room. The little man? Yeah, here he comes. Who is he? Name's Cello. Oh. Jimmy Cello. Writes a gossip column. I read it all the time. Yeah? Uh, hello, Jimmy. Well, 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 a Broadway shama. Who's the uh, lovely redhead, Diamond? Helen, meet James Cello, but be careful what you say. Jimmy, Helen Asher. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Cello. How do you do? Is this an item, Rick? If I don't get us a table soon, she's going to make me give back her sorority pick. Oh, uh, <laughs> speaking of tables, I see some people I know. Uh, nice meeting you, Miss Asher. Thank you. Goodbye, Diamond. Bye, Jimmy. Rick, he's going over to see table. Hello, Walter. Hi, doll. Hi. 
Well, well, good evening. What do you want, cello? Oh, I just dropped by to see how the happy little family was getting along. Well, just drop away. Nobody asked you to stop by. Yeah, why don't you do that? And take Oliver here with you. Nobody asked him to stop by Fred, either. keep your voice down. This is my table, and I don't like a lot of crumbs lying all that over it. Who's a crumb? Come on, Lorn. I guess Mr. Sears has forgotten a few things. I haven't forgotten a thing, Shella. When you print one thing in that lying sheet of yours, and I'll have you sued for life. Listen, Sears, if I did print anything, they'd put you away so far, they'd have to pipe air into you. Oh, do go on, Mr. Cello. This is getting interesting. You'd better get out of here, Cello. No, no, no. Go on, Cello. What have you got an old money bag? He's a lying, dirty gossip monger. He doesn't have uh, a thing. Wait a minute. I don't like that. Why don't you ask your husband about North Africa sometime, Mrs. Sears? Well, just a minute. Fred, stop it. Fred. All right, now pick yourself up and get out of here, Cello. Yeah, maybe you're right. I've got a column to get out. It'll be all about you, Sears, in big time. Go on, get out. How about me? You gonna throw me out, too? You can bet your life I am. I'm getting out of here. You stay right where you are. Don't talk that way to Mary. I'll talk any way I like to my wife. Lorne, maybe you'd better leave. Here come the waiters. Now it's I'm gonna push this fat slob's face in. Yeah? Yeah. Lorne, oh, don't. All right, push him, All right, all right. Come, come on, break it up. Break it up. Come on. Hey, waiter, give me a hand. Come on, you... Take your hands off me, Diamond. Now, calm down, Mr. Sears. I'll kill that slob. Oliver, get... you shut up or I'll... Pull your pants up over your head and shove you in a glass like a breadstick. I don't like people meddling in my affairs, Diamond. You're fired. I'm what? You heard me. Now take your filthy hands off me. Ah, uh, well, they were lily white before I palmed that check of yours this morning. You can have it back. Here, eat it. What? I miss I'll have you in jail for this, Diamond. Why? It isn't every day you get to eat a $200 check. Oh, Rick, let's get out of here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, baby, but that's what happens when you go to work for a hyena like Sears. You think he's a nice guy because he laughs so much. But you find out later it's only because he chewed your leg off. We left Sears still spitting out pieces of the check I'd shoved down his throat and headed for Helen's apartment. I was sore. When I get hot under the collar, I don't make for good company. So I dropped her off with a kiss and went back to my flat and climbed in the sack. I smoked a dozen cigarettes before I got to sleep. And when I finally did, it must have been with a big smile on my face. All night, I kept dreaming that Lauren Oliver and Fred Sears were beating themselves to death with hot paper sacks. Sunshine Market. Locks popovers are specialty. Now you stop clowning and get over here right away. Walt? Lieutenant Levinson. Oh, oh. Where are you? I'm in your office. Yeah? Well, if any clients come in, give them a good sales talk. Tell them how many people you've killed or something. There's a guy in your office now. Prospect? Depends on what you're talking about. I think his name is Fritz Sears. Uh, tell him to go home. He canned me last night. I don't think he'll listen. All right, all right. So he's sore. He's got a right to be. acting like an idiot, Walt. You know I didn't have anything to do with it. I know you didn't, but we find the stiff in your office and we get a report that he fired you last night, but you had a fight with him. I gotta tell the commissioner something, Rick. Tell him Sergeant Otis is teething. Now you stop that. No, what do you know about the killing? The coroner just left. He said that Sears had been dead about eight hours. The cleaning woman found him at nine this morning and called us. Mm, that puts the time of the murder around 1 a.m. We found this clenched in the dead man's hand. What is it? An article torn out of the morning papers. Here, read it. Ah, oh, Jimmy Cello's column. Read it. All right, I will. Don't yell at me. Ah, Fred Sears, wealthy import-export man, is having troubles. He's finding it hard to explain about his past doings in North Africa, and at the same time, he's finding it just as hard to explain his wife's interest in the local playboy, nightclub owner, Lauren Oliver. Yeah. He got so mad at the Stork Club... Oh, I was there, I was there. He got so mad at the Stork Club last night that he took a poke at your columnist and then tried to beat up Lauren Oliver. Will this lead to a rematch between Oliver and Sears? We're having a whole bunch of them picked up. Walt, Walt, before you do that, give me a couple of hours, will you? Try to dig up your killer? I can't. You know what we've got to do. It's routine. Well, the commissioner is already having fits every time he hears my name. Now, look, Rick. Walt, I got a business to protect. And if he finds out the stiff was killed in my office, he'll probably haul in my license. Yeah. One hour, Rick. That's oh. all I can give you. I got a job, too. Oh, thanks, Walt. I suppose you've got an alibi for one o'clock. Call Helen. We were toasting marshmallows. Well, 
down, I had three good suspects. Lauren Oliver, Cello, the columnist, and Mrs. Sears. One of the three was built just right for the electric chair. An hour isn't much time to dig up a killer, so I grabbed a cab and headed for Lauren Oliver's office in the back of his club. Yeah, come in. How are you, Oliver? Oh, what do you want, Diamond? Not particular about who comes into my club. Oh, I'm surprised you can operate with that kind of policy. People probably see you in here every night. I think I'll have you thrown out. Where were you at one o'clock this morning? None of your business. Herman. Yeah, boss? Come in here and show a guy out of my office. Oh, we get rough, huh? Yeah. Okay, okay. I'll let you tell the cops who knocked off Fred Sears. Hey, this is the guy, boss? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you say someone knocked off Fred Sears? That's right, but don't start crying about it. It makes me feel so helpless. I'll tell my story to the cops. They'll get a lot tougher than I will. You won't get tough at all, Mac. Oh, stop flexing, Herman. You'll snap your girdle. Well, I guess it doesn't make much difference as long as Sears is dead. I was with his wife from about 12 o'clock to... to well, it was a long time after one. Well, where were you all that time? At my place. And I'll take a walk, Shamus. You got my alibi. One more question. Did you go out at all? Yeah, I went out and got the late papers. So what? I like to read. Okay, okay. You don't mind if I stop by and see Mrs. Sears, do you? No, go ahead. I'll see you later. Oh, Herman. Yeah? You can let the air out now. Your muscles are lovely. Well, Oliver had a good story if it checked. So that left me with two more stops. Cello's newspaper office was the closest, so I grabbed another cab, and ten minutes later, I was sitting at his desk. Oh, you don't think I had anything to do with it, do you, Diamond? Where were you at one this morning? I was covering a party at Richard Gray's. I was with friends from about 11 o'clock till after three. You can check. Come on, check. Look, poison pen. Sears had your column from the late edition clenched in his hand. He, he did, huh? Well, you don't think if I was going to kill a man, I'd leave anything like that around? I don't know. Well, now, obviously, someone is trying to make it look like I did it. Have you talked with Oliver and Sears' wife? Oliver's got an alibi, and I'm headed for Mrs. Sears' place right now. You know the address? Yes, yes. 45 East 65th. But Mrs. Sears couldn't kill her husband. I know her too well. No? Well, thanks, Cello. I'll check your alibi. If it stands up, then I'll have to really go to work on Mrs. Sears. Yes? Mrs. Sears? Yes. Oh, you look even better up close. What's on your mind? You mean right this minute? Well, aren't you nice? Don't crowd me, though. I can keep up a pretty good average in this league. I'd say about a thousand. Mm-hmm. May I come in? I think so. If you keep talking, I like to hear nice things. Well, you deserve them. But I can think of some nice things to say about a panther. We'll talk about my family some other time. Can I buy you a drink? It's a little early, unless you got some milk. Milk? Where's your husband? Oh, you know about him, huh? Oh, I'm sorry. It's looked as though it might work into quite a friendship. Where is he? I haven't seen him since last night. Why? Is he a friend of yours? He's been using my office. Oh? Yeah. yeah he died there last night. What? Everybody is so surprised. But, uh, how? Who did it? That's what I'm trying to find out, lover. Where were you at 1 a.m.? That's none of your business. Okay, let the law drag it out of you. Goodbye, dear. Uh, wait a minute. All right, I'll tell you. I was with a man named Oliver, Lorne Oliver. Oh, for how long? From about 12 o'clock to... Well, much later. That's what Oliver says. Did you go out at all? Just to get the papers. That checks with Oliver's story, too. Did you go out alone? I, uh... uh, No, I I went with Lorne. He says he went out alone. Oh, well, yes, yes, he did. I thought you said you went out with him. Well, that was later. Lorne was the one that went out to get the papers. Okay, what time is it? Oh... About two. When you both went out or when Lorne went out to get the papers by himself? Uh, when Lorne went out. Oh, yes. Now, now I see. Well, I, I'll, I'll see you later. I'll come back again. Oh, I'll do that after you get over crying for your late husband. I'll keep my emotions down to a minimum. I'll bet you will. I left her standing in the middle of the room looking after me like a vegetarian with an eye on a green salad. I closed the door and started down the hall for the elevators. For some reason, I never seem to get where I'm going. Hello. Hmm? <coughs> oh. Now, while you're still tuned in, Diamond, I'll give us some advice. Stay away from Mrs. Sears. Now, I want you to be sure and get the point. <coughs> Rick. 
Rick, come on, snap out of it. Uh, I'll go away. Come on, you don't look so good. Uh, it matches the way I feel. Oh, here's a new line. Where am I, Walt? In Mrs. Sears' apartment. Hello, handsome. She heard the scuffle in the hall, came out, found you, and called me. Swell. Who did it? I didn't see him, but his voice sounded like a thug that Lauren Oliver keeps around, a patty cake with. Oh, that was probably Herman. Lauren is so jealous. Well, your hour is up, and now I'm going to haul them all in, including Miss Herman. Oh, do you know Herman, Walt? Sure, Herman Sharp. Got a record a mile long. Uh, Walt, if a guy wanted to hire a killer, where would he go? You know all the stoolies as well as I do. Yeah. Mrs. Sears, what was the fight about last night at the stork? Oh, a columnist named, named Cello threatened my husband that he was going to print something in his paper. He said something about North Africa, and Fred hit him. North Africa? This is really getting mixed up. Was your husband ever in North Africa? Yes, during the war. He was a captain in the army. Walt, can you get me this Herman Sharp's address? He's the boy I want. Sure, but I'm coming along. Have your boys pick up Cello, Oliver, and take them both down to the station along with Mrs. Sears here. Well, you don't think I had anything to do with it, do you? I've known Jimmy Cello a long time. About five years ago, he used to run around with a little dancer named Mary Carroll. Sure he did. I'm Mary Carroll, but I broke up with him when I met Fred. Yeah. Well, you'll see him at the station. You can pick up where you left off. Come on, Walt. We went down fast and climbed into the prowl car. Walt put in a call and got Herman's address over the two-way radio. Twenty minutes later, we were standing in front of Herman's door... It was an old apartment house on the Lower East Side. I started for the door, but Walt had other ideas. Rick, we can't go in there. Why not? Because I haven't got a search warrant. Well, you got to go in if you want to crack this case. Not without a search warrant. Search warrant for what? To go in. Well, what do you want to go in for? I don't want to go in. You do. Do what? Go in. Well, go ahead. I haven't got a warrant. Well, what are you looking for? Herman Sharp. He's probably in there. He is? Sure. Well, what are we waiting for? Oh, what did I do that for? For that. What? Herman Sharp. Oh. Ah, is he dead? Yeah, been shot. What are you looking at? Newspaper on the floor. This morning's. Oh. Cello's column's missing. Been torn out. Then Herman's your killer. Swell. Who killed Herman? Don't you know? I'm not going to start that again. Well, go on back to the station. I'm going to check something and make a phone call. I'll be down in half an hour and point out your killer. <laughs> Calm down, calm down, this everybody. This is ridiculous. I want my lawyer. You'll get one later. Relax, Oliver. They can't hold us much longer. How do you feel, Mary? I don't like this any more than you do. Well, good afternoon. And happy Father's Day. Oh. Rick, where the devil have you been? Made a phone call to Washington, Walt. Mrs. Sears, did you know that your husband had a dishonorable discharge from the Army? Why, no. You knew it, didn't you, Cello? That's right, but I kept it quiet. He got it for running a black market. What's this got to do with the death of Sears? Oliver, you told me you went out to get the papers last night. That's right. What time was it? Uh, a little after two. You know what time the late edition comes up. How about you, Mrs. Sears? Uh, what Lorne says is correct. How about it, Lorne? Were you the one to go out and get the papers? Uh, yes. Uh, then, Mrs. Sears, why did you tell me this afternoon that you also went out to get the papers? Well, I... Mary, don't say anything. You don't have to. The stories don't check, so you couldn't have been together last night. Look, Diamond, what is this... Oh, gun? now you look, Oliver. You're both liars. But that doesn't make either one of you the killer. Oh, but Rick, Cello's alibi checks right down the line. Sure it does, because he was at that party. But the killer wasn't. Oh, we know that. He couldn't have been. Yeah, but the man who hired the killer to knock off Sears was. What are you talking about, Diamond? Oliver, where was your hired gun if last night? You mean Herman? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. He was with me until 6 o'clock, then he left. Walt, when you find Herman's gun, ballistics will probably say that it was the one that did the job on Sears. Herman? Yeah. Cello? You hired Herman to kill Sears, and then you killed Herman. Well, you're out of your mind. I didn't even know this Herman. We found the newspaper next to Herman's body. It had your column torn out of it. That doesn't pin anything on me. It just shows you that Herman probably stuck that article in Sears' hand after tearing it out of a newspaper. That's you. That's what you wanted to make it look like. You knew Herman. You knew about the clipping, so you killed him and tore the column out of this morning's newspaper. Of course I knew about the clipping. You told me about it this morning in my office. That's right. But you were the only one I told about it. You couldn't convict Jack the Ripper on that kind of evidence. I'm afraid he's right, Rick. Jello, what time does the late edition come out? About two o'clock. Walt, what time was Sears killed? Around one. Say. Yeah, yeah. The killer couldn't have gotten hold of that column at one o'clock. The papers weren't even out on the street. Well, then how did he do it? Only one man could have gotten that column before 1 a.m., the man who wrote it. Jimmy. He oh. tore it out of the galley sheets. The proofs that are made up before the paper goes to press. 
Cello hired Herman, gave him the clippings, and then went to the party. Oh, you're doing great, Diamond. Keep it up. You're still in love with Mary Sears. You were jealous of Oliver, so you hired Oliver's boy, Herman, figuring the cops would pin Sears' murder on Oliver. How am I doing? You're a good liar and a rotten detective. You knew I'd go to see Mary Sears, so you sent Herman to beat me up and make it look like Oliver was behind it. What? You tried to frame Oliver all along the line. Why, you cheap little scandal snooper. I'll fix it so you don't frame anybody again. Wait a minute. All right, break it out. Come on. Break it out. Break it out. Hey, Walt. (laughs) What is it, Rick? Bye. Good evening, Mr. Diamond. Uh, evening, Francis. Miss Asherin? Yes, sir. She's in the library. She's a little tired from last night. I think she's taking a nap. Well, I'll walk on my tippy toes. How about a glass of warm milk, Francis? I'm a little tired, too. Uh, yes, sir. Right away, sir. Well, look at the little baby. Mm-hmm. Oh, has not dream rain. Poor little tired baby. The evening breeze caress the trees tenderly. Oh, Rick. The trembling trees embrace the breeze tenderly. Hello, baby. Don't stop. All right. Close your really eyes. Then you and I came wandering by. Oh. Wonderful. And lost in our sigh were we. Ricky. The shore was kissed by sea and mist tenderly. Ricky. I can't forget how two hearts met breathlessly. Ricky, come here. Your arms opened wide and closed me inside. Ricky, come here. Uh, what is it, dear? Just this. Mm. Here's your milk, mister. Oh, my goodness. Now, this time I refuse to blush. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, High Aberback, Joan Banks, Parley Bear, and Sidney Miller. Music was under the direction of David Baskerville. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. It is now 45 seconds past 8 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. But remember, next week, Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock, it will be time for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the Mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, The Man They All Loved. The Egyptian desert isn't the best place in the world for a man who likes to hunt. But once in a while, the fleet-footed gazelle makes things interesting. So a couple of friends and I decided to take the day off, drive up the Nile near Helwan, and try our luck. 
It was quite a way, so I was up about four in the morning. I was still half asleep as I went down the stairs from my quarters to the half-lighted cafe. The tambourine still reeked with oriental tobacco smoke from a few hours before. As I walked along the bar past the empty tables, I never felt so glad to get away from a place in my life. I was wondering what a little fresh air would smell like as I cut off the light by the front switch and threw open the latch on the door. When I opened up, I got some fresh air and a lot more. He plopped in with the door spread eagle, like a sack of overripe potatoes, and he didn't move. I bent over and got a quick look. First thing that struck me was his unusual dress. Frock coat, headdress, heavy shoes, all in black. Just then, another figure moved from the shadows outside. A little beggar named Samak I'd seen a few times wandering the native quarter. Yes. All right, nothing here for you, Samak. But what is it? Imshi, move along. A man drunk with the liquor. Nobody's rolling him, Samak. On your way. But why not, Fendi? Anyhow, you're wrong. This guy isn't drunk. He's dead. I heal why it is true by the knife. So now it does not matter. I said cut it, Samak. Get out of this pocket. But Fendi. Yeah, give me that watch. I was first to find it, not you. Let's go. Give me that. Fendi, look. Look, look. look if there's a name in their wallet. Sure. It's an identification. Please let me see. All right, keep your hands off. What about it? Hey, come back here! Samak was gone just that quick. I caught the look in his eyes, and it was fright that sent him scampering off into the dark. Something about the wallet. So I took a closer look, and the name meant everything. It was the name of a man I'd heard a lot about, but had never seen before. Jonathan Mello. Jonathan Mello, a man of unknown nationality, he'd become a missionary for the Coptic faith, an ancient branch of Christianity centered in Old Cairo. Several years before, he had journeyed to the African interior to bring information to the native tribes. Since then, few outsiders had seen him. But ever so often, a word had come as good works and personal sacrifices, and his name had become almost a legend throughout the Middle East. Yes, Jonathan Mello was a man greatly loved and respected by everyone. And here he lay murdered at the door to my cafe. His name had meant something to Samak, too, and I figured the little beggar would soon be spreading the word around. So I got the body inside, latched the door. I had another look at the wallet. It was empty except for a receipt from the Pyramid House in Cairo dated the day before. And I put in a hurry-up call to Captain Sam Sabaya at his home. Fifteen minutes later, Sam was in my terrain, looking down at the lifeless form. So... This is the fabulous Jonathan Mello. Yeah, it's what the identification says. Mm. That in his clothing leaves small doubt that he is the missionary. Do you know he was back in Cairo, Sam? It had not come to my attention, Jordan. He surely must have returned very recently. Looks like he should have stayed in the Sudan. Yes, it would have been better for all of us. Finding an enemy of such a man as this poses a very strange problem. Uh, you haven't much to go on. No. Jonathan Mello was known to lead a most exemplary life. Maybe there's some things we don't know. True, Jordan. For example, why he should be found dead at your cafe. Oh, now, look, Sam. No, 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 Jordan. You have many accomplishments, but the skilled use of the knife such as this is not one of them. A lot of Coptics might not agree with you, Sam. It is not necessary that they learn of your connection with this, Jordan. No, they'll find out. Leave that to Samak. Samak? A little beggar who came up a couple of seconds after I found Mello's body here. And the beggar knows who this man is? That's right. He got away fast when he found out. I see. You see where that puts me, Sam? Yes, I do, Jordan. Jonathan Mello's death will be a profound shock to his people. They will demand immediate justice. Yeah, after Samak gets a word around. I bet it doesn't take him long. Jordan, you say you were going hunting up the Nile. That's the way it started out. Let me suggest that you continue with your plans. Stay out of Cairo for a while. Are you suggesting I run away? Only until this matter is cleared up. Well, supposing it isn't cleared up, Sam. If I leave Cairo now, I'll never get back. Do you not realize that it is for your own safety? Sure, but you ought to know me better than that. Jordan, for once in your life, you must listen to me. It is my duty to protect you when it is possible, but I, I can offer no guarantees. It's no good, Sam. I'm staying right here. <sighs> Very well. But you have been warned. Sure, sure. Thanks. We will cart the body away secretly and trust that Samak does not spread the news. Well, Sam took the body, and along about ten o'clock, I opened up for business. 
That's when I knew Samak had been real busy. Not a single person came in that morning. And the tambourine was just as empty at two in the afternoon. Even the Muslims crossed to the other side as they passed, which meant they sensed trouble and didn't want to be around. I got out on the streets and felt the unrest growing. When a knife sailed out from somewhere and almost parted my hair, I decided it was time to get busy. I remembered the receipt in Mello's wallet from the Pyramid House. It hadn't meant much, but it might put some light on Mello's activities since he'd returned to Cairo. So I made for the place over on Sharia Rangoon. The sign on the window puzzled me, but I went on in. I can help you, mister. Uh... Yeah, with some information. Sorry, I don't sell that. Did you ever see this receipt? Sure, Mike. I wrote it myself for a customer yesterday. Hey, wait a minute. Where did you get it? Uh, that's not important. Uh, what did he buy? Liquor. What else? It... Maybe I don't tell you. You sold that man liquor? What do you think I sell here? Elevator shoes? What kind of liquor? Champagne, scotch, bourbon, arak, gin. The very best. Fifty cases. What did the man look like? All in black. Headdress, frock coat, heavy shoes. Wait a minute. You don't tell me where you got that receipt, I don't tell you. Yeah, maybe you're mixed up anyhow. You think I forget him? When I'm going to make him a special price for a big sale, but he pays me like that, all in cash for quick delivery? Delivery? Where to? His boat, the Delta Queen. Qu uh, War 4 it was. Don't you ask me. Uh, thanks, I won't. Yeah, sure. I claim up for guys like you, mister. I don't going to tell you nothing. Uh, it didn't make a lick of sense, but there it was. Fifty cases of expensive liquor purchased by the circumspect Jonathan Mello. Well, that little receipt had set up a chain reaction that couldn't stop here, so I went on to the next link, located at Wharf 4 on the Nile. And the Delta Queen was some job. A sumptuous yacht that could have played stand-in for the Queen Mary. Brand new, with lots of shiny brass from stem to stern. Looked like our lowly missionary had been spending potatoes on a lot of things. There was nobody on deck, so I wandered down below. A passageway led to a big lounge, complete with a big bar. There were some cigarettes on a side table, American brand, so I took one. I reached for a match, but I didn't need it. And I saw her walking toward me. The flame of the cigarette lighter glowing on her face, green eyes, tawny blonde hair, and round shoulders. The perfect piece of equipment to make a layout like this complete. I accepted the light. Thanks. Not at all. Was I expecting you? No, uh, I'm an intruder. Suppose I start screaming. Uh, suit yourself, lady. I'm a little out of practice. Well, how do you like it? Mm. Everything's real ship -shape. The boat? Yeah, it's nice, too. All the comforts of life, huh? Almost. But I like to keep looking around, meet new people. Yeah. Your deal here looks good to me. Uh, who comes with it? Bourbon? Sure. The expensive kind. Our tastes are alike, aren't they? Maybe we have a lot in common. Oh, money, boats. I like Americans, too. I've been trying to remember. They grow them like you in St. Louis or Chicago. Uh, you're right the first time. The name's Rocky. I'm Corrine. Here you are, Rocky. Thanks again, Corrine. Why don't we sit down? Over here. Uh, maybe I ought to check the passenger list first. We're alone, Rocky, for a while. Okay. Now, uh, why don't you ask me why I came here? Is that important? Oh, makes good conversation. Wouldn't you rather just... Yeah. You get on to sail fast, don't you? We like boats, remember? So does your boyfriend. Do we have to talk about him? Yeah. Tell me about Jonathan Mello. Don't you know about him? Only that he's passed up just about everything most men want for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all this is quite a switch. He's been a good man. He's helped a lot of people. Now he deserves the good things in life. Yeah, he hasn't missed a trick. Where does it go from here? We're getting out of Africa. From now on, we're going where the bright lights are. See the world. Why don't you come along? Just the uh, three of us? There'll be lots of people around. It would be easy. How about it, Rocky? Corrine, you know where Jonathan Mello is right now? He's settling some business. What kind of business? Oh, I don't know. It's with a Prescott exporting company, Jared Prescott. Jonathan says as soon as that's settled, we're leaving. Well, happy sailing, Corrine. Rocky, you could wait for him here. No, thanks. Why? 
Because I don't like things that don't make sense. And none of this does. The liquor, the yacht, you, and especially... What, Rocky? That's something you got to find out for yourself, Corrine. I don't want to be around when you do. There was no place to go now but to the Prescott Exporting Company. It had a big layout of offices just off one of the Moose Keeper's R's. I liked the taboo the girl at the desk was wearing, but I didn't like cool my heels. So the next time she went out for a drink, I opened Prescott's door and went on in. He was on the phone. He was a big guy with a crew haircut and smoked a fat cigar. The ashes falling in his white vest as he talked. Surely a man like Jonathan Mello can be found in Cairo. You'll find him, that's all. Maybe I can help you, Prescott. Who are you? My name's Jordan. Jordan? Jordan. Let's see here. I don't recall an appointment with you. you can get one now, if you don't mind. But I do mind. What do you mean, barging in here like this, Jordan? It came about the big deal. What deal? Get to the point. With Mello, Jonathan Mello. I understand he wants it consummated in a hurry. Why isn't he here? I had an appointment with him three hours ago. Have you seen him? Yeah, I saw him early this morning. It's not doing me any good. Mr. Prescott, has it occurred to you that Jonathan Mello won't be here at all? That's ridiculous. Look, Jordan, I don't know what he's trying to pull on me, but you tell him... Ivory or no ivory. If he doesn't show up here before the... Hey, wait a minute. Ivory, did you say? Certainly I did. Let's not beat around the bush, Jordan. And, by the way, what have you got to do with it? Maybe there isn't any ivory. Look, I'm nobody's fool. Why do you think I sent a safari to the interior myself to check on it? My mistake. Jonathan Mello discovered the hoard of ivory himself. He has a right to sell, and I'm ready to buy. For how much? Fifty? Hundred thousand dollars? We deal in Egyptian pounds here, Jordan. Besides, nobody's going to top the price. Mello knows that. Just how much do you know about Mello, Mr. Prescott? That's beside the point. Everyone knows about him. Yeah, I thought I did, too. A lowly missionary with a lot of high ideals. And get the picture now. Expensive liquor, a yacht, and a slick girlfriend to go with it. How he spends the money is none of my affair. But his own people will be interested. You know anything about the Coptics? I'm a businessman, Jordan. I'm not interested in Coptics or anything else except a perfectly legitimate deal. Okay, we'll leave it that way. Jordan, I don't know who you are or what you want, but you tell Mr. Mello I won't wait much longer. Either he shows up today or the whole deal is off. Sure, I'll tell him. Next time I see him. I had everything from Prescott but the answer to the jackpot question. Who killed Jonathan Mello and why? Well, I figured the ivory hoard he had uncovered somewhere in Africa had something to do with it. That's why I was scouting for a payphone to bring Sam Sabai up to date. I avoided the bazaar and had walked maybe a couple of blocks when I spotted a character hugging the shadows not so far back and staying on my tail. I stepped it up, figuring to double back at him, when all at once he was in the center of the street and yelling. It was Samak, the little beggar who found me with Mello's body in the morning. That's when I climbed with a sprint record. I left a lot of natives far behind, but Samak had his robe up around his knees and kept coming. Samak was lagging, too, by then. I slowed to catch my breath when I saw another native running from the other direction right at me. Right then, I picked an alley. It was the wrong one. Not more than 30 paces ahead, it came to a dead end with nothing but high walls between me and the man running in. He had a knife like nothing I'd ever seen. A great curb-bladed scimitar, a yard long. I waited with my back to the wall as he came in for the kill. You are listening to The Man They All Loved, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Here is a special announcement for all you Rocky Jordan fans. Starting next Sunday, Rocky Jordan will come to you at a new time, 5 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Make a note of it so you can remember to tune us in next Sunday. The new time for Rocky Jordan is 5 Pacific Standard Time. Now we return you to Cairo and Rocky Jordan for tonight's adventure, The Man They All Loved. Imagine a man with his back to the wall at the end of a dirty blind alley in Cairo facing a character with blood-red eyes coming at him waving a huge curb-bladed scimitar. Well, that's me. Not the one with a knife, but the one backed against the wall. 
And the guy kept coming with Samak the beggar somewhere behind. Oh, help, Jordan, by the cimitar, you die! In the split second it took him to reach me, I thought of a million moves, but none of them worked. I knew one swing of that blade and I was finished. My eyes were on the raised scimitar, so I didn't see a third figure into the alley. But all at once he was there. A tall, dark-skinned man who had my assailant by both arms from behind, and the knife never came down. I had the feeling he could have crumpled the guy in his powerful hands, but he only slammed him back and rolling. Little Samak was already gone, and his chum got up running. Another time, Jordan, we'll meet again! And I was alone with the man who had saved my life. His intelligent eyes watched me as I got my breath. Well, we... Maybe we better shake hands. I'm most honored, Mr. Jordan. Oh, Abyssinian, aren't you? Yes. I am Jethro, an Abyssinian and a Coptic. Then maybe you don't know why they're after me? The beggar Samak tells everyone that he found you early this morning by the body of Jonathan Mello. Well, I, I still don't get it, but thanks. I've helped you, Mr. Jordan. Now you help me. You think I can help you? We both share certain interests in this affair, do we not? Yeah. Maybe you've been finding out some things about your missionary you didn't know before. Maybe he's not such a big man. Mr. Jordan, no one grieves more for the death of Jonathan Mello than do I. How well did you know him, Jethro? He was my greatest friend. To him I owe everything. He taught me kindness and understanding. It was he who provided the funds for all my education. Yeah, I used to hear things like that about him. It was his wish that with my training and education I would go back to the tribes and bring enlightenment to my people. Do you mind if I ask you something, Jethro? Not at all, Mr. Jordan. When did you see him last? Not for a long time. When he first brought me and my family to Cairo. Were you expecting him back? Yes. Let me explain that my father and I have a small construction business here. About a month ago, we received a letter from Jonathan Mello, who was then in the Sudan. It stated that he would soon be in possession of a great deal of money with which he wanted my father and I to construct schools and other installations for the tribes of Sudan. He was to arrive here a few days ago. But you never saw him? The next I heard was the news of his death. I wish to know why he died and why he did not contact us upon his arrival. Well, I can't answer the first one, but you'll find the second answer down on the Nile. I do not understand. It's all his. Brand new. And loaded with all the provisions for a big joyride around the world. Looks like all that money turned his head a little. Mr. Jordan, have you said that you will help me? Of course, anything. I wish to see Jonathan Mello's remains, if you can arrange it. Right away, Jethro. Let's go. Some young Abyssinian stayed with me, and I finally got to a phone and talked to Sam Sabaya. I briefed him real quick and then asked him about viewing the missionary's body. He said to come on down, and in another 20 minutes, Sam was leading Jethro and me down some steps at headquarters that led to the morgue. This way, gentlemen. Uh, right behind you, Sam. I had the remains moved to a room off the main hall. You will understand why. Oh, sure. Every precaution was taken to conceal his identity, Jordan. However... Many people already know of Jonathan Mello's death. Yeah, I found that out. You would still do well to take my advice and hide out for a time. No, not interested, Sam. In here. Was this the one? It is. Yeah. Three stab wounds. Any one would have brought instant death. Somebody sure wanted him out of the way. Indeed. Would that be all, Jethro? Jethro only nodded his head, moved silently out. He had nothing to say to Sam, so he left headquarters. We were soon walking away down the Sharia Nagoon. The desert twilight had given way to sudden dark, and a dim street lamp every four or five blocks didn't help much. In spite of my being with him, he seemed alone and lost. It was hard to know what to say. Uh, tough, was it, Jethro? Yes, but not a surprise, Mr. Jordan. How do you mean? That was not Jonathan Mello. What? Say that again. The man lying in the morgue is not Jonathan Mello. Are you sure? I knew him too well to be mistaken. And if it's not Mello, who is it? 
I can tell you that too, Mr. Jordan. His name is Matson, a hunter whom I saw often before coming to Cairo. A man who would not hesitate to kill. Did he know Jonathan Mello? He did. Their paths crossed often in the Sudan. Why would he want to switch identity with your missionary? That is quite obvious, is it not, Mr. Jordan? And now I can be certain that the real Jonathan Mello is dead. At the moment, that is all that matters. Look, Jethro, uh, how about coming back to the tambourine with me? No. No, Mr. Jordan. I wish to think on this alone. We parted there, and I headed back for the tambourine. It occurred to me that I hadn't eaten since four that morning, but something else interested me more. There wasn't much question why the disappearance of Jonathan Mello, but that didn't explain the killing of his imposter, the Hunter Matson. Well, I get back to the cafe, and good old Chris, my bartender, was real busy swatting flies. The tambourine had just one customer. Rocky. Well, you got better liquor on your yacht, Corrine. Rocky, I've got to talk to you alone. Okay, we'll go into my office. Yeah? Rocky, where is he? Where's Jonathan? You asking or telling me? I don't know. He was to come back. I've got to see him. You'll never see Jonathan Mello, Corrine. Fact of it is, I don't think he ever did. I don't understand you. And sit down and get it once through. Tell me, Rocky, what are you driving at? Jonathan Mello was never anything but a good missionary. But in his travels, he happened onto a fabulous hoard of ivory. Worth enough to build a lot of schools and hospitals. I know that. Ah, wait a minute. Before he could do anything about it, a hunter named Matson found out the whereabouts of the ivory. He killed the missionary, he assumed his identity, and came to Cairo to sell the ivory and use the money in his own way. Oh, that's impossible. Oh, no, it isn't. Mello had been gone a long time. Few people would recognize him. You, for instance. His name made no difference to me. No, no. Only the money. What about Matson? He's dead. How do you know? Because I found him that way at the door of my cafe. Me and Samak. Who's he? I'm beginning to wonder. Maybe it wasn't a coincidence Samak showing up when he did. I figure he was working for someone. He made quick work of spreading the word that I'd done the killing. Then you're in trouble, Ricky. A lot of Coptics don't like me. Rocky, listen, the yacht, it's ready to go. We can get away if we hurry. You make a quick switch, don't you, lady? You know how I feel about you, Rocky. I think you feel the same way. It'd be wonderful, you and I. We've been all over that. Look at me, Rocky. Hurry, get back. The beggar Samak was back in the job. I forgot all about Corrine right then and went through the broken window. Samak was already scrambling away and running hard. He kept to the alleys, always a few steps ahead of me. As he entered a dark passageway with buildings on either side that almost touched at the top, I realized he knew where he was going. I had to catch him quick. I was almost on him when suddenly there was another shadow and a flash of the scimitar. I got back in time as I did my feet cut on My hands made a grab. I came up with a piece of iron pipe. That was all. Against the biggest knife I ever saw. This time, Samak's buddy was at it for keeps. He swung the huge blade with both hands. I parried the first one. Then the next one. Third time I was lucky, and now he was swinging wild. I followed the blade, ducked it, and came around with the iron pipe flat against his face. The scimitar landed 20 feet away. He piled up at my feet. I looked around for Samak, but he was gone. You're not through yet, Jordan. The light from the room inside hit me as the door opened. He took one step into the alley, a cigar in one hand and a gun in the other. Right on time, Jordan. I didn't have an appointment, Prescott. Yes, you did. Drop what you have there. Samak led me to the right place, did he? He carried out his assignment very well. Only his pal with the scimitar bungled the job again. As a businessman, I should have known. When I want something done right, I have to do it myself. Yeah. Now, who gets all the ivory? Just you? That is my plan. You put on a great act for me back in your office. You knew Jonathan Mello and Matson were dead all the time. But I'm wondering how you know about the ivory hoard. When a man has ivory to sell, who else should he write to but a reputable dealer like myself? Sure. When you got Mello's letter, you had Matson out to locate the stuff, got rid of Mello, and came back in his place. All I had to do was get rid of Matson, and the road was clear. Except for you. I'm next. Sometime tomorrow morning, they'll find you here. The victim of the Coptic's attrition. Come closer, Jordan. You see, I'm a very thorough man. I don't intend to miss. 
The shots echoed back and forth from the sandstone walls, and I wondered why I heard. Prescott hadn't moved. Then I saw the two spots in his white vest. The gun suddenly dropped from his hand. He pivoted slowly and fell back down into the dirt of the alley. You all right, Mr. Jordan? Yes. Thanks to you, Jethro. Well, this is the second time today. It will not be necessary again. No. Samark's still loose, but nobody to work for. The police will find him soon enough. You know, I'm wondering something, Jethro. Yes? Why did you do this? Just to get Prescott or to save me? How can I say, Mr. Jordan? I only know that now the way is clear for the great work Jonathan Miller wanted done. I'm happy for that. You can be happy for a lot of things. No. You see, he taught me the ways of peace, not violence. Tonight I've killed a man. I think Mello would understand. Yes, he would understand. That is why we all loved him so much. It's CBS at a new time next week, 5 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. Rocky Jordan, starring Jack Moyles in the title role, is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arant. Tonight's story by Gomer Cool and Larry Roman. Remember the new time next week for Rocky Jordan, 5 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story. By the Whistler. Tonight, Highway of Escape. I am the Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the heart of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Frances Block was never meant for the desert, but fate put her there. Set her down solidly in the center of an expanse of creosote brush and Joshua trees, cactus and hot dry sand at a scrubby little group of nondescript shacks huddled in the shade of a few scraggly umbrella trees. Known to the truck drivers passing through on Highway 441 as the Duncan Wells Tourist Camp. Just Francis and Pete Crawford, her stepfather. For her, it was a prison. For him, it was a living and the only one he knew. It was on a particularly hot day in July that she decided she couldn't stand it any longer... On a Sunday morning when the temperature stood at 90 degrees at 8 o'clock. And Francis knew there was always more money than usual in the cash register on Sunday morning. 5, 10, 11, 50, 
1285. Oh. Morning. Oh, uh, hello. Are you open for business? Uh, not yet. Kind of early. Hmm? Not even gasoline? The pump's locked. Hmm. How far is the next town? 17 miles. It's a Warrell. Okay, I can make it, I guess. Hmm? Thanks a lot. You better get going. Um, just a second. Yeah? You, uh, going through to... I mean, uh... Los Angeles, yeah. Do there by noon. Can you take me? Huh? I've got to get out of here this morning. Right now. Oh, come on. You could take me if you wanted to, couldn't you? No, I, I'd like to, but... Oh, please. Look, I'll give you five dollars. Yeah, sorry, sister. There's company rules. No riders. I'd lose my job. Oh, they'll never know. Look, mister, you don't know what it means. It's life and death. Yeah? Yeah. It's life and death. Death if I stay here in this... This... This prison. Oh. I can't take it any longer, you see? You've got to take me away. You've got to. Hey, what's the matter? You sick or something? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sick. Look, look, I'll make it ten dollars. Ten dollars to Los Angeles. Yeah, but... That leaves me only, uh, two eighty-five. My bag's right there. It's all packed. I won't tell the company. They'll never know. See? Just you and me will know, and I'll get off in Los Angeles. Well, for ten bucks, you can take the train. Oh, no, there's no trains here. Just trucks. Guys like you. There's a train from the next town, ain't there? Yeah. Yeah, how about that? You can take me to the next town. That's all. Just in the next town. Well, uh, I don't know. I... Good morning, Francis. Oh, there's a little lady here uh, wants to ride into town with me. Sorry, mister. She's made a mistake. I have not. I'm going, you hear? No, Francis. You're not going. You can't stop me, Pete. You can't stop me. I'm not going to stay here. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. Well, uh, look, uh, mister, maybe uh, maybe you two better talk this over. I, I just thought I'd run into so wild, but... Uh... She gets this away ever so often. She'll get over it. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll see you on the way back, maybe. Huh? Yeah. So long. Uh, Oh. You did it again, you filthy... No, 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 there, Francis. I know how you feel, gal. This ain't no place for a young filly like you. But can't you see? There ain't nothing else I can do. Ever since your ma died, you I... You killed her. That's what you did. Francis, that's an awful thing to say. Just the same as if you shot her with a gun. Bringing her off to this godforsaken hole. Making her work when it was so hot she couldn't breathe. Well, you're not doing it to me, do you hear? Now, wait a minute. You ain't talking to me like that. Oh, no. Well, listen, you dirty desert rat. I've had all of you I'm going to take, and I'm getting out of here today. This morning. In five minutes if a car comes. You're still my stepdaughter, Francis. Until you're 21, I'm afraid I'm doing the deciding. Oh, now, come on. You just trot on back to the cabin and lay down for a while. You'll feel better in no time. Get away from me. You'll understand about your ma someday. I know this place ain't much of a spread, but it was ours, and we built it together. Come on. I said get away from me. Please, Francis, just this once. For me. All right, Pete. Wait a minute now. Put that knife down, Francis. You ain't in no condition to... All right. You ask for it. Friends, have you picked up your free federal use stamp protector yet at your signal gasoline dealers? The deadline has already passed, you know, for getting your new use stamp on your windshield. And since that little stamp has to hang on your windshield for a whole year, you'll naturally want to protect it from moisture or scuffing so it won't peel off. That's why Signal Oil Company had these little use stamp protectors made up for you. They're smart-looking, transparent, and water-resistant, so you can wash right over them without affecting your use stamp. And, of course, they're free, one of the little extra services your signal dealer offers to keep your car looking its best. Unfortunately, like all things in wartime, the supply is limited this year. Since every car will be needing one, I'd suggest that you get yours without delay tomorrow, if possible... Just drive into any of the friendly stations displaying signals, yellow and black circle sign, and say, I'd like one of the use stamp protectors that was offered free on the Whistler. And now, back to the Whistler. He's dead, Francis. 
It's over, and you're free now. You stare at him for a moment as he lies there on the floor in the middle of the small lunchroom, very still. For the first time in your life, you notice he has a kind face, a peaceful face. No look of fear on it. Just peace, deep, enduring peace. Yes, you're free now. You can leave any time you want to. Today, this morning, the next five minutes, if a car comes... You jump as a car pulls up out in front. Quickly, Francis. Move the body behind the counter before the driver comes in. That's it. Now, take it easy. Just relax. He mustn't know. Hi, beautiful. How about a cup of java? Hey, what's the matter? Oh, nothing. Uh, coffee isn't made yet. Huh. A uh, cigarette? A scarce these days. Uh, no. Well? What? Are you going to make it or shall I? Make what? A coffee. Say, are you sure nothing's the matter? Okay, something's the matter. I'm, I'm scared of my stepfather. Huh? He, he's horrible. I live here alone with him. I can't stand it anymore. That's too bad. Oh, please. Please take me with you to Saguaro anyway. I won't be any trouble. Oh, now, now wait a minute. Hold everything there. Now, now, now take it easy. Where is your stepfather? He's, he's asleep in his cabin. He's drunk. He'll wake up. Yeah, I, I, I see. Uh, you, um, uh, you got any money? Twelve dollars. But I can work once I get to a big town. Oh, I don't know. Oh, please. Please. I've been driving all night. I was going to grab a little shut eye here for a no, few I hours. I've got to go now. He, he might wake up and he might. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. Well, okay, come on. You know, after what you told me about that stepfather of yours, I got half a mind to go back and punch him in his nose. He's got no hold on you. Who does he think he is? Hey, listen. Let's do his thing right. Go back there and tell him right off. No, we can't. I'd like to anyway. I suppose it wouldn't do any good, only make trouble for you. Beats me, though, how any man can treat a gal as nice as you like that. You, uh, you are pretty, you know. Thanks. Hal. My name's Hal. Hi, Hal. What's yours? Francis. Oh, Francis, huh? Nice name. Uh, you hear that? What? The motor. Betsy doesn't like this heat any more than we do. How far are you going, Francis? Los Angeles. Yeah, it's a nice town. And we could have a lot of fun there. We? Yeah, hey, you and me. I um, wasn't going that far. You but... might change your mind, huh? I don't know, maybe. Los Angeles is a nice town, isn't it? Come on over. Oh. <laughs> there. That's better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Los Angeles is a great place. You know, I can get a couple of days off and... Uh-oh. What's that? Betsy means it this time. Hey, what was it? Uh, 17 miles of Saguaro from that camp? Yeah, but... Yeah, we've come five. Shorter to go back. I gotta get to a phone. Oh, no. No, now, you look, can't. Francis, don't worry about him. I'll be ready for him. No, but I can't go back. I'll, I'll walk. Now, you do nothing of the kind. Look, baby. All you need is someone to take care of you. And from now on, I'm the guy. You can't. Why can't I? Let me out. Told you to let me out. I don't want you to handle it. Stop the car. Stop it. Get hold of yourself, baby. Don't you trust me? No. I mean, yes, but... What about Los Angeles, John? Forget it's not. It's not you, I said. It's not you. Just don't ask me anymore. Stop That's the car. That's all I want to know. Just sit tight and let me handle everything. We made it. Now, where's the phone? On the wall by the door. Yeah. Well, what you gonna do, sit there? Yeah, I'll wait. I'll be sure you do. What do you mean? Eh, nothing. I guess I got the jumps, too. 
And don't worry about him. If he comes out, just let out a yell, and I'll be here in a second. Smile. <laughs> yeah, it's better. <laughs> you know, baby, I kind of like you. Keep that chin up. Yes, Francis, keep your chin up. You could use a little courage now, couldn't you? There's a chance he won't look behind the counter, just a bare chance. But if he does, there you are in a stalled automobile 20 miles from nowhere and not a car in sight. But wait a minute. Around the curve, a car. Hurry, Francis, you've got to stop it. Wait! 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 What is it? What's the matter? Take me to the next town. Hurry. Well, what's the matter? Uh, my uncle. It's my uncle. Something wrong? Yeah, yeah, he's hurt. Quick, I've got to get a doctor. Well, you're a mighty lucky young lady. I happen to be a doctor myself. Where is he? Oh, no. No, no, it's bad. It's, it's horrible. I don't want uh, you to... Ah, you see... just let me decide that. Uh, here, I got my case. You take me to him. He... He's in the lunchroom. I, I'd better wait here. Yes, yes, I understand. You just relax now, and I'll take a look. It might not be as bad as you think. Just wait there in my car. Don't stand there like that, Francis. Do something. The car, his car. That's right. Hurry up. Faster, faster. Sixty, seventy... Keep your eye on the center line, wavering like a snake between the wheels. Twelve miles now between you and the camp. Five miles to Sawaro. Seventy-five. Eighty. Almost lost it on that turn. The accelerator's down to the floor. Faster. Open your eyes, Francis. You can move. Open your eyes and crawl out of the car. You're okay. I'm okay. Better get off the road. Yeah. Take off cross country. I'll be watching. Watching the road. Cross country. Jay, turn that radio down. Goodness sakes alive, a body can't hear himself think around here. Oh, oh sorry, Matty. I don't know why in the world you keep that thing banging away night and day. Well, that's the dead blasted tubes. It gets louder and softer all of a sudden. A fella from Sorara coming up to fix her. Well, I ain't seen him. I should be here this afternoon. Think I'll go out and take a look around. Jake Watson, you stay right in that chair. You've been a mighty sick man. Hey, Matty, Matty, look. What? They're coming up the walk. Well, where could she come from? Hey, she's sick. She almost fell. Uh, well, Dad, blasted, do something. Well, you stay right there. What's the matter, honey? Uh, I don't know. Oh, there now. Just take hold of my arm. Thanks. Ma, you look all tuckered out. Come in. Thanks. Now, don't talk. We'll just get you out of this hot sun. Uh. Wouldn't surprise me none to find you was in my sunstruck. No hat and all. Land sakes, whatever you doing walking around out here? Now, hush yourself, Jay. Can't you see the poor thing can't hardly walk? Let alone listening to you jabber. Now, there, now, you sit down there, and I'll get you a nice cool drink of milk. <clears throat> you been walking far, miss? Yeah. Any particular reason? Yeah. I cracked up my car. Any more questions? No, no, I just thought it might be peculiar you picked this time of day to go walking. I'm sorry. Now, Jake, suppose you quit jabbering and let the poor girl rest a spell. She's about done in. Yeah, she's been in an accident. Car went off the road. Well, I declare. Ain't hurt none, are you? No. 
is tired. Well, here, you just lean back and take a good drink of milk. You'll feel better in a jiffy. Oh, there go them tubes again. Oh, turn it off. Yeah. yeah. Attention, please. Be on the lookout for a young woman in blue slacks and a yellow jacket, probably driving a Buick sedan, license number 8X43H7, about 5 feet 4 inches tall, blonde hair, name Francis Block, wanted in connection with the murder of Peter Crawford this morning at Duncan Wells. Lancey! Repeat. Hey, 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 that's you! Get out of my way! Oh, look out, Jake, she might have a gun. Hey, wait a minute, young lady. Let go of me! Oh. Hey, Betty. Betty. Four, she, she's gone. Oh, here. Here, let me help you off. Her? No. That's what we get for being good Christians. Hey, turn the radio off. Huh. A murderess. I knew there was something slick about that girl. That's all right. She won't get fur in this heat. Not in the desert. It's hot. Unbearably hot, 110 in the shade. You can't keep going much longer, Francis. Feet swollen and blistered, bruises that ache with every step you take. Three in the afternoon. You've been walking two hours since you left the farmhouse. 120 blazing minutes. Your head is full of sun, the flat horizon wavers, dust in your nose and throat. You've got to have water. Water from the clear, sparkling fountain in the square of Wilkins Corners, the little town ahead. You've got to take a chance. Maybe they haven't heard about you here in Wilkins Corners, Francis. Maybe they don't listen to their radios. Look at that sign down the street. Coffee, hamburgers. Take a chance. You may not get another one for a long time. Morning, miss. Uh, like something to eat. Well, it's come to the right place. Hamburgers, hot dogs, barbecues, whole wheat, white, rye, apple, peach, boysenberry, cherry, lemon meringue, coffee, milk, and coke. Hamburger and white coffee. Hamburger. Hamburger. <sighs> Mustard, ketchup, or tomato sauce. Ketchup. Mm. You're right up. Pre-war service now. <laughs> We've reconverted. <laughs> yeah, hi, Billy. What you doing down in Swirl? Oh, mighty busy today. Barbecue and whole wheat and coffee. Special. Special. What you mean, busy? Why, well, I don't mean to tell me you ain't heard about the killing, huh? What killing? Well, sure. Found a man stabbed to death at Duncan Wells Tourist Camp. Yeah? Yeah, a guy who runs it named uh, Pete Crawford. No. Yeah, dead on a mackerel. Then the killer got away, they say. Sheriff's got posse out. Well, I'll be... Hey, late. Did you hear that? What? I killed over to Duncan Wells this morning. Pete Crawford. Well, you don't say. Yeah. You catch a killer? Nope. You better watch out. Might be serving him a meal long about now. <laughs> He's dead, was he? Yeah, with a bread knife. Yeah. Doc Lawton was coming down from Cactus Garden. He claims he talked with the killer. Well, why'd he nail him? Oh, you know Doc, but scared of his own shadow. That's too bad. Yeah, it is. They say old Pete Crawford didn't have an enemy in the world. I mean, it's too bad Doc didn't do something. Oh. You know, the best time to nab a murderer is right after he's done his job. It surprised me none to see this thing end up as... Well, as another one of Sheriff Bradshaw's famous unsolved mysteries. Well, I don't know. You know. Murder's a funny thing. Ain't like going down to the feed store for a sack of barley. Takes planning, yeah. thinking. There's a thousand ways a killer can trip himself up. Oh, yeah. Just one false step along the way and it's all over. Yeah, well, maybe so. You know, I'd like to see that killer right now. <laughs> Probably pacing the floor somewhere, wondering if there was a slip-up. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be in old Doc Lawton's shoes, yeah. being the only witness. <laughs> Bet you the old boy's looking six ways before he leaves his house. Here you are, George. One hamburger. Yeah. Oh, there you are, miss. Hamburger on white, and I'll go get your... Co hey. Well, what's the matter? Now, where do you suppose she went? You forgot your hunger in a hurry, didn't you, Francis? A half minute more in that restaurant and it would have been all over. You're tired, worn out, but you can still think. A thousand ways you can trip up, make a false step, that's what he said. But you'll show them, won't you, Francis? First, get out of town and keep off the highways. Remember the sheriff's posse. The railroad, that's it. All the freight trains have to stop at that water tower a half mile out of town. Cross country again. 
through the brush under that blazing sun, keep away from the roads. And finally, the cool shade of the water tower with the drops splashing into a puddle there in the shade. You sit down and rest. Let your eyes close. Then... Someone's coming. Look, there's a piece of iron pipe in the corner. Remember where it is. Hello, beautiful. Hell. Thought you'd be here. You almost gave me the slip back there. What do you want? Gave you quite a run, didn't they? Hey, well, mind if I sit down? I got some talking to do. Mm. Yeah, it's better. <clears throat> nice and cool here. You know, maybe I'm a sucker, but I still think you're pretty nice. Beautiful, but dumb. You think you could get away with it? I don't know. I'm so tired. Yeah, I know you're tired, baby. Probably a little loony with a heat, too. No one in his right mind would have done what Shut you... Shut up! You don't have to rub it in. Now, listen to me. I can help you, see. I'm the only one who can help you get out of this. You haven't got a chance unless you play ball, understand? Help me. You! <laughs> Ow! Yeah. Sorry, baby. Maybe you'll listen to me. All right, Al. I'll listen to you. There's a way out of this. It's a short chance, but you'll have to take it. Wait a minute. Here comes a train. Get back there. It's afraid it'll have to stop. Then let me take a look. The pipe. If I can... No. I can't tell yet. Oh, wait a minute. Yep, yep, it's afraid of... So you were going to help me, were you? You didn't fool me. That's one mistake I didn't make. Yes, Francis, you were careful. You could see through his offer to help, couldn't you? Now, no slips, Francis, no false steps. The train is stopped for water. You hide, trembling behind the shack at the water tower. Then as the train starts up, you grab the rung of the ladder on a passing car, up the side. Now across the top and down the side before anyone sees you. But wait. There's a guard on top moving toward you. Down the tops of the cars. Don't look back. Watch where you're going. No false steps, Francis. No false steps now. <laughs> The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a word about today's pre-war bargain in gasoline mileage that's helping more and more wise Western drivers stretch their ration gas stamps. I'm talking about the good pre-war mileage you still get in Signal Go Farther Gasoline. Yes, it's true. You still go as far as before the war with Signal. And I'll tell you why. You see, the gasoline ingredients which you've heard are reserved for war are the very volatile, highest-octane components, such as isopentane. That's why Signal Oil Company frankly admits no gasoline today can give you all the pep and anti-knock performance you found in pre-war Signal gasoline, and which you'll enjoy again in even further improved Signal post-war gasoline. But when it comes to mileage, that's where Signal gasoline still shines. For today's signal formula still contains not only all the high-energy components that gave pre-war signal gasoline its superior mileage, but also new high-mileage hydrocarbons have been added. You can prove this for yourself by keeping track of your mileage. You'll find it's as true today as before the war. You do go farther with signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. No false steps, Francis. That's what the man said. And you are going to be so careful. But then how could you tell what kind of a false step it might be? And now it's all over. 
And everyone knows the answer to the killing of your stepfather. Well, it's all cleaned up now. Found the murderer dead right there between the railroad tracks. Oh, terrible thing, terrible. Of course, without the doctor's testimony, they might never have known how it happened. The doctor? Sure, sure, according to the radio. Doctor says he went into the lunchroom and found that fellow leaning over Pete Crawford with a knife in his hand. Boy, the doc practically witnessed the murder. Then the girl didn't do it. Oh, I knew she was innocent, the poor little thing. Yep, yep, she was innocent, all right. They figured the murderer was going to try to shut her up, too. That's why she had to defend herself with that piece of light lead pipe there. <laughs> Doggone it, he was already wanted in New Orleans for killing ten days ago. Terrible thing, terrible. Only one thing I can't figure. What's that? Well, after she got the murderer like she did, what do you suppose she was running away from? Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Eleanor Beeson, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. W-R-O-W, Albany, New York. Johnny Deller. This is Frank Harmon, Johnny, at Tri-Western Life here in Hartford. Hi, Frankie. Where have you been, anyway? Oh, I just got back from Lake Tahoe out on the West Coast. Well, then it's no wonder Jack Price couldn't get hold of you. Price? In your office down in Corpus Christi? That's right. He called and told me he'd been trying to get you on the phone for several days. Oh, well, I'm sorry. He has a problem, a pretty big one. When he couldn't reach you, he sent it on. He sent her on to us. It? Her? Which is it? Both. So come on over here, will you? There's no time to waste. Oh, what's it all about? Well, all I can tell you is... Well, somehow, you've got to prevent a murder. CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the New England office of Tri-Western Life Insurance Company. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the unworthy kin matter. After the Lake Tahoe mess, I was ready for a nice long rest. But a job's a job. So expense account item one, $1.10 for a cab back to Frank Harmon's office at Tri-Western in the big new building on the square. Glad you finally got back here, Johnny. Hiya, Frankie. Yeah, sit down. I'll get right to the point. Okay. Try to give you the whole story before she gets here. Oh, she? Name is Jean Unworthy. Unworthy? That's right. <laughs> That's a funny one. Well, our little problem isn't very funny. Now, listen. I'm listening. About four, maybe five years ago, up in Hypsilanti, Michigan, a prominent businessman was killed by a guy named Eric Bean. Oh, you're telling me. It was a ruthless, pointless, wanton murder. Simply because the victim refused to give him a few bucks. And the defense tried to get Bean out of it on grounds of temporary insanity. Yeah, that's right. But instead, they sent him up to the Michigan State Prison. Gave him life with no chance of parole. Oh, yeah, I remember. It just happens I was in on that case. Hmm? Oh, of course. Of course you were. 
Well, all right, then. Well, I didn't play a very important part in it, I have to admit, but I was there. And you were there during his trial? From the first to the last gavel. Yeah, and you know what Eric Bean did when the judge pronounced sentence on him. Yeah, that's right. Because it could be that Bean thought his remarks were partly aimed at me. I mean, there's talk about getting even with him. All right, sure. Sure, I'll go up to your lousy, stinking prison. Order! Order in the court! But if you think you can keep me in it, you're crazy. Order! Order! Will someone restrain the prisoner? prisoner? Because I'm going to get out. When I do, I'm going to kill everybody that had anything to do with killing me up. Officer, restrain that man. No! Don't take your hands off. Order! Yeah, yeah, Frankie, it was the typical threat of a tough criminal to get out someday and get even with everybody. By killing them. That's what he said. Mm. Including you? Well, I told you I really didn't have too much to do with the case. So there's no real reason for being to hold a grudge against me. Was there any real reason for the murder? Well, no. But listen, you know how little those courtroom threats usually mean? Yeah, well... Then you're not at all worried over the fact that Eric Bean escaped seven or eight days ago. Oh? Well? Mm, no, not particularly. Well, you should be, Johnny. Along with the rest of the people who were involved in that affair. Oh, Frankie, I told Johnny, you. Johnny, in the past five days, Bean has killed four of the people he promised to kill. No kidding. And the police have no idea where he is or when he'll strike again. Hmm. And another one of his intended victims is Mr. Albert K. Unworthy, who's now living down in Corpus Christi, Texas. And he's insured by our company for over half a million dollars. Well? Mm, yeah. That reminds me of a tip I've been meaning to give you. Whenever you buy Pepsi-Cola, get an extra carton. This is the secret of effortless entertaining. You know by now that as the parties go, so goes the Pepsi. So face reality and be ready for any number of thirsts by making sure there's always plenty of the light refreshment on hand. People go for Pepsi because it refreshes without filling and does it in such a good-tasting way. Come to think of it, why not buy a case of Pepsi? Then maybe there'll be enough for you to have some, too. Be sociable, look smart, keep up to date with Pepsi. Drink light, refreshing Pepsi. Stay young and fair and debonair. Be sociable, have a Pepsi. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. All right, now, Johnny, when Jack Price wasn't able to reach you, he dumped the whole thing in my lap, including the old man's daughter, Jean. She arrived here in Hartford early this morning, came in here and demanded that you be appointed a bodyguard for her father. Oh, now, listen, Frank. I phoned her at her hotel right after I got in touch with you. She's probably on her way over here to see you right now. Hey, look, Frank, I'm an investigator, now, not a buddy. listen, buddy, buddy. Are you forgetting Eric Bean may have you high on his list, too? So what? So what? If I keep my eyes open, my, my manners and my... Oh, I see. What? Yeah, put two of Eric Bean's intended victims together. Give him a wide-open chance to kill two birds with one stone, so to speak, and he's almost bound to show. Yeah, so the cops who've been standing by pick him up along with our two bodies... And the company has done a great public service. Hooray. No, that wasn't what I was thinking of at all. Frank, I couldn't go down there to Corpus Christi right away anyway. Why not? First thing tomorrow morning, I have an appointment in New York with an attorney for a deposition in that Lake Tahoe case I just wound up. Well, so you lose a few hours. And what's more, I hate those bodyguard assignments, and you know it. But when such an important client's involved, Johnny... Well, there's nothing but a lot of trouble with an A number one chance of getting shot in the back. Yeah, but don't you see... No, no, Frank, I'm sorry. If Unworthy wants protection, let him call in the police. They have a very good force there in Corpus Christi. Johnny. And when this dame, this this daughter gets here, well, simply tell her I don't want the case. And I mean it, Frank. That's final. That is unequivocally and irrevocably and absolute... Mr. Harmon? Oh, Miss Unworthy. Oh, please come in. Huh? 
Thank you. Yes. Come in and meet Mr. Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Suddenly I changed my mind. Even as that whole office suddenly seemed to change and take on a strange and wonderful glow. She was, so help me, one of the most beautiful girls I've ever seen. Tall, but not too tall. With honey-colored hair and a complexion that... And a figure that... And a twinkle in those baby blue eyes that... Oh, what's the use? The right words simply aren't. Not to describe this one. Wow. Well, uh... Oh, sit down, please, Miss Hunter. Oh, thank you, Frank. But I told you this morning to please call me Jean. Oh, yes. Of course. I forgot. And that goes for you, too, Johnny Dollar. Oh, sure, uh, Jean. I, uh... <laughs> sure. Can you leave with me right away, Johnny? I mean, for Corpus Christi? I hope you told him how urgent this is, Frankie. Well, yes, I did. Then well, you will come and watch over Daddy until they catch this murderer, won't you, John? Well, now, Jean... Yes? Well, I... That is, I... Yes? Johnny? Well, I have to be in New York first thing in the morning to see an attorney. Oh, well, that's just fine, then. Because I have an early morning date in New York with Madame Algamarino before I go on back home. Oh? Uh-huh. You know who she is? Oh, well, uh, sure, I've heard of her, but I, I I never thought anybody in the world actually had enough money to buy those clothes, those gowns that she designed. Oh, oh now you're kidding me, aren't well, you? Yeah. But I just love having her things. Oodles and oodles of them. Uh-huh. So we'll go down to New York tonight. I'll be staying at the Pierre. So you stay at the Pierre. And we'll have a ball. We'll really do the town. Oh, I just love New York. Well, now, then I... And tomorrow morning, while I'm getting some dresses and things... You can see your lawyer, and then we'll take off for Corpus Christi together. Jean. But come on, hon. We'll have to hurry if we want to make the four o'clock plane to New York. Well, And uh... Frank, dear, thanks so much for finding Johnny. I feel better. I feel that Daddy's safer already. Expense account item two, twenty-one fifty for a cab and plane tickets to New York for the two of us. With this charmer in tow, well, believe me, it wasn't easy, but I realized that with an important assignment on my hands, I better play it safe and behave myself. So, down in New York, item three is nine fifty for a taxi to the Pierre, where I dropped her off, then to the Gotham, where I got myself a room. That evening, the tab for cocktails and dinner at the Pavillon, no less, came to $58. And I was pretty impressed by the maitre d's immediate recognition of her. And his disappointment at the smallness of the bill she'd run up. Oh, and the tips, by the way, came to $14 more. Then the evening really got underway via the nightclub route. And I mean only the most expensive nightclubs. Where again she was recognized by all the maitre d's. And the total bill by the time I dropped her off at the Pierre shortly after 4 a.m. Only $130, including tips and taxis, of course. I hope my deposition the next morning in the attorney's office made some sense because I was bushed. But then, after leaving him on the way back to my hotel, I picked up a newspaper. And I nearly blew my top. Item five, six, whatever it is, 85 cents for a call to Frank Harmon back in Hartford. Now, now, Johnny. And it was you who gave that story to the wire services about my going down to Corpus Christi to save the life of dear old Albert Unworthy. But, Johnny, you yourself suggested it might help to flush out this killer. Oh, yeah, sure. Make it easy for him. Get two of us in one trip. Thank you very much. (laughs) Item 7, 287, 50 plane fare, tips and incidentals for the flight to Corpus Christi. By the time we got there... Well, I don't know. I don't don't know how to say it. But, uh, well, that, that genie is not only the most beautiful, the most charming... Well, put it this way. By the time that flight was over, If Jean had said, come on, Johnny, let's get married, I think I might have taken the leap without one single thought about the consequences. And after we landed and she stepped into a phone booth to call and make sure her father was still all right, well, I was almost annoyed at the sudden appearance of an old pal of mine, Doug Johnstone, kid brother of Jack, who dramatizes these radio cases of mine. How'd I know you were coming down here with Johnny? It's all over the paper. Yeah, I was afraid of that. Oh? Yeah, but uh, how are you anyway, Doug? I couldn't be better. Hey, uh, hey, boy, you certainly pick them, don't you? Uh, what do you mean? Your, uh, traveling companion, Jean Unworthy. Oh, uh, what do you know about her father, Doug? 
Well, I kind of thought you might want a little help while you're down here. That's why I came to meet you. Ah. Yeah, now, uh, here's what we ought to do. You, uh, put her in a taxi. Her home isn't far from here. Then you and I'll run on down to my office and talk a while, and I'll drive you out to their place later. Uh, well, now, wait, Doc. I think that's a very good idea. Oh, Jeannie, uh, this is an old friend of mine, Doug Johnstone. Hi, Doug. Jean, uh, I've uh, always looked forward to meeting you. Well, how nice. And my, I'm meeting more good-looking men these days. Johnny, Doug's right. See, it'll give me a chance to kind of freshen up and prepare the royal welcome for you here in Corpus Christi, all right? Well, I uh, kind of So you go ahead you... with Doug, and I'll see you at the house later. Taxi! Taxi! Huh? Okay, Doug. Let's go. Okay, now, Doug, as you were saying. As I was saying, well, sit down. Make yourself comfortable first, oh, General. Thanks. Well? Well, Johnny, old man Unworthy is loaded, all right. Despite this gorgeous daughter of his trying to spend it all. But when she turns on the charm... Oh, you are telling me. Always a sucker for a good-looking gal, aren't you, Jenny? Oh, now, Mr. Johnstone saw... Oh, I was sure, that, uh... Jean is different. The point is... Oh, she sure is. The <laughs> point is, though, that there may be something in the rumor that her old man is getting a mite fed up with some of her extravagant... Uh, uh Johnny, Johnny, hand me the phone, will you? What's the matter? You think I don't make a good secretary? <laughs> Oh, this here is Mr. Douglas D. Johnstone's office. help. Quick. She? Yes. He's here. That killer. What? He's here in the house, and he's going to shoot Daddy with a... No! No, please! Ah! You killed him! You killed him! Throwing a house party every weekday is no small accomplishment. Ask any housewife who's faced the perils of just one house party with fear and trepidation. But Art Linkletter's been at it so long that he never worries today about tomorrow's house party. And yet they always come out slick, smooth, and hilarious. Art's enthusiasm is part of the reason why. The way he lets his guests take the bit in their teeth is another. So you never know where the fun's going to lead once it starts. Listen Monday through Friday on CBS Radio. Now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Unworthy Kin Matter. Doug Johnstone and I tore out to the house, and yeah, Mr. Albert K. Unworthy was dead all right. Three neat, clean bullet holes in his temple. His daughter, Jean, was a, a wreck. One sleeve of her dress was torn. There was a red weld on her cheek where she'd apparently been struck by the killer. Oh, Johnny. Johnny. Oh, all right, now, easy. It was so terrible. So awful, so terrible. It's okay now, honey. Just try to take it easy and remember exactly what happened. Why did it have to happen to him? It was so good. So wonderful to me ever since the day that he adopted me, and now he's... I'm too oh, easy. Darling. Now, who else was in here, Jean? Were you in here with your father alone? Yes. Yes, Johnny, I don't know where the servants are. Daddy must have let them take the day off. Or... But this man... And this horrible-looking man came in. And... Can you tell me what he looked like? Well, I don't know. I saw him only a few seconds. He was short. And he was heavy... Heavy set. And that thick, black, curly hair that came down to a point on his forehead. Yeah, yeah. Go on, Jean. That... Strange, pale... That, that pallor... His face was almost gray. After seven years in the clinic. And one of his ears, it was kind of mashed like like a piece of cauliflower. There was a dirty scar, too, on, on his hand when he held that pistol on poor Daddy. Oh, Johnny. And his height, his weight. Have you any idea? Oh, I don't know. He was maybe, maybe five feet seven or eight. And he was heavy. Maybe 180 pounds or something. He was stocky. You ask me, that fits the newspaper description of Eric Bean almost to a T, gentlemen. Had you ever seen Eric Bean before, Jean? No. No, Johnny. And there was that wild animal look in his eyes. 
And he came rushing in here with that gun, and I tried to call you, but he he knocked me down, and he and then he. I guess I passed out. Ready, sir. Oh, Johnny, please help me. Yes, sure, sure. You want to call the police, Doug? Sure. Doug not only called the police, but the family doctor. And after Jean had given the police all the information she could, the doctor gave her a mild sedative and sent her up to bed. By that time, Jean's personal maid had come in, so after assuring her we'd do everything we could. Johnny. Johnny, dear, don't you see? Now you may be in danger from... Oh, dear. I guess whatever the doctor gave me, I... I can't stay awake. We'd come back, dear. Come back. On the way back to Doug's office, neither of us said a word. Not until we got inside and he closed the door. And even then we sat there quietly for a minute. Well, um, Johnny, you, uh, like a little drink? Uh, no. No, thanks. You have one. No. You, uh... No, nothing, I just... Johnny, you're thinking the same thing I am. Yeah, Doug, I guess I am. Mind if I use your phone? My call was to the police. Not there in Corpus Christi, but in Ypsilanti, Michigan. It's item 8440. I got hold of Sergeant Tim Brower, the man who'd originally arrested Eric Bean... Who now again was working on the case. What do you mean, am I afraid of him? Are you Dollar? Well, I I expect I ought to keep an eye out for him. Why? You'd be away down on his list. Like maybe Mr. Albert Unworthy and... Uh... Yeah, like Unworthy and Phillips and Mrs. Peterson and half a dozen others. The only ones he's trying to knock off now are the people whose testimony really set him up. But we'll get him before he does. Because he's just crazy enough to have set himself a very obvious little pattern in these four new murders. Yeah, what kind of a pattern, Sergeant? Well, the people around here... And in the order of their importance in the case. Oh? First it was the judge, Judge uh, Henry Packham, who actually set the sentence. Okay, Sergeant. And the chief prosecutor, Mr. Frederick Wall. Okay, Sergeant, that's all I need to know. And there was... Huh? Well, Johnny? Yeah, well, I, I guess you tip me off, Doug, when you said something about her father getting fed up with her extravagance. Her foster father? Oh, yeah, she told us that herself, uh, adopted. There was no real blood bond between them. Mm. So, I, I suppose it's no wonder she was taking him for all she could. And when she found he was going to pull back on the reins. Well, I'm afraid her description of Bean is what stopped me. Too perfect. Mm. I mean, when a man suddenly barges in, knocks her down, and fire And fires. Yeah. Three bullets into his skull. But when she said he was going to kill him, and we heard only two shots. Only two, Doug. Yeah. Johnny, you want me to go along with you? Just, uh... Let me use your car. Sure. You... You mean you found the murderer, Johnny? Yeah, Jeannie. And all the proof I need. Oh, thank goodness. And did you kill him when you found him? Kill? Yes. Him? What? Only one more thing I'd like to know. Yes. Well, what is it, Johnny? What you did with the gun. Oh. Well? It's... out in the little fish pond. Under the library when... Johnny. Johnny, not a chance for me. Not a chance. And I learned about women from her. Following Eric Bean's pattern, the police in Michigan were able to pick him up in less than two weeks before he could kill again. The expense account, the total, call it $500 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Constipation is something people don't talk about much, but it can be a problem for anyone, even doctors. And when constipation occurs, it's interesting to see just what doctors consider important about a laxative they might use or recommend. Well, a majority of the doctors we heard from had this to say. A laxative should be effective, gentle, close to natural acting. A medicine that can be used with complete confidence. Now, Exlax has been popular with many doctors and millions of people over the years because pleasant-tasting chocolated Exlax is effective. Overnight, it helps you toward your normal regularity. Exlax is so gentle, so close to natural acting, there's no upset. That's why many doctors and millions of people use Exlax with complete confidence. Exlax, the laxative that helps you toward your normal regularity gently overnight. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the what goes matter is just what it sounds like, a real puzzler. So join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Dick Crenna, Frank Gerstle, Russell Thorson, Stacey Harris, James McCallion, Bill James, and Gus Bays. This is John Wall speaking. Next, a study in terror entitled Nightman on Suspense on the CBS Radio Network. 590 WROW, Albany, New York. Broadway's my beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's my beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When the rumor gets around that summer has begun, Broadway is beside itself with glee. Somebody notices the sunlight and tells somebody else, and the word gets around. It drifts cross town, and a man reaches into his closet for a hand organ, puts the funny hat on his monkey, and takes a walk up to Broadway, just to grind out background music for the big grin. It's the time for the dachshund, and the silken ankle, and the flowered print dress. The orange juice is sweeter, the knish is lighter... The guy runs down the street screaming, I'm in love. It's June. And it was June under the Translux, too. A rare day. And the Times Square crowd had gathered there to consider it and take the story of it home to the little woman, dad and mom. There was a man lying in the circle of their feet. He was expensively dressed. He's dead, Danny. What happened, Mugovan? Ah, come on, come on, you people. Break it up. Come on, get going. What is it with them, Danny? What happened? How can you tell what happened? People milling around, crossing streets, going to lunch, looking at the want ads over there in the Times building. Suddenly a guy's face down on the pavement. Somebody laughs, drunk, and somebody sees blood. So we got him on the pavement and them watching. Uh, stabbed. Yeah. Know who he is? Uh-huh. Here, wallet. Loads of identification. Yeah. Earl Lawson, Park Avenue. Earl Lawson. Earl Lawson stocks some barns. He's got a name. Wizard or something. Makes money by the buckets. Anybody see it happen? A million people on Times Square. High noon, nobody saw anything. Nobody. Now, look, you people. Why don't you move along? Go home. Get out of here. The safest place in the world to kill somebody, Mugovan, in a crowd. Walk up to him, stab him in the back, keep walking. Well, it started off to be a pretty day. Yeah, real sunny. Just across the street, the file of crowd waiting for the movie that was better than life held on close to its place in line. Held on close against the insinuating whisper of the violent dead. It was a trick, kid. A trick to make you lose your place. To cheat you out of a front row seat where love and beauty and other high-class things are handed you on an air-conditioned platter. But a few were sold by the whisper and were drawn by it. And joined the cluster attending the dead man. 
The woman pushed her way close and turned away. She opened her purse, smeared a lipstick nervously across her lips, studied their reflection in a window, and then carefully, carefully retraced them with the perfumed scarlet. And death had raised its banner on Broadway. The home of the murdered man was a place whose sounds had been geared down to the soft purr of wealth. The swish of the ankle-deep carpets, the flute-like trills of the parakeets taking the noonday sun in exclusive cages. The butler who murmurs you into the library and asks you to wait quietly. You don't dare open a book because turning a page would release a clap of thunder. And finally, when you'll wait no longer, the soft voice at your shoulder. I'm glad you made yourself at home, Mr. Clover. This is a difficult house to do that in. It's quiet. You can say that for it. You're... Harlan Lawson. Dr. Harlan Lawson. Oh, then the book's on this shelf. My one literary effort. All 20 copies. 20 copies of the same drivel. New Freedom, Pennsylvania, the utopia that failed. Nice binding, though, wouldn't you say? Quite. Expensive. That's my brother. He's everything you say. He gave me those when I got my Ph.D., made a grand gesture of binding my doctor's thesis and burying it 20 times over on the shelf. Every time he fingers the gold lettering, I tell him how grateful I am. You don't get along, you and your brother? We suffer each other. Let's put it that way. He has his world. I have mine. And uh, your world would be... The back alleys of poverty. You see, I'm in the nature of a failure, Mr. Clover. I'm a social worker. Doesn't pay very much. But I take in tears and give in exchange baskets of fruit, my brother's castaway clothing, and the gestures of sympathy they taught me in post-grad humanities. But you keep on living here with your brother, with uh, Earl Lawson. I exist here. Is this why you came, Mr. Glover? To run your hands over my brother's library? To probe into me? Or is it... <laughs> no, no. Don't say to me Earl has somehow run afoul of the law. Don't say it, because I wouldn't believe it of Earl. He's dead. He was murdered. Your manner of saying it. You leave me nothing but to believe you. He was stabbed, left lying on the street in Times Square. He must have shuddered that it found him in a place like that. I'd swear he shuddered. Your brother dies and that's how it hits you? To each his own way, Mr. Clover. You're implying that it was I who killed him? Let's play it that way for a while. I've dreamed the wish sometimes, but I couldn't have killed Earl. I slept the morning through. Earl's butler will testify to that. He was serving me brunch when you came in. Expensive brunch with wine. Who else would want your brother dead? Besides me. That would be your thesis, wouldn't it, Mr. Clover? I suggest the scholars approach... Yeah, thanks. I'll try. Then back to headquarters and to the desk. Get on the phone, make inquiries, send out to the newspapers for files, read them, digest them, extract them. Start a file of your own, label it Earl Lawson Homicide. Fill out the form, date of birth, hour of death. Murder by sharp instrument to be filled out in detail by the coroner. And on the lines on the bottom of the page, the incidental information. Jot down the phrases. A self-made man. Shrewd financial mind. Known enemies, probably many due to financial manipulations. Send out for coffee and the sandwich because it's suddenly nighttime. And read some more. Then your door opens and Sergeant Tataglia is all business. Lady to see you, Danny. What does she want? She knows who killed our Lawson. What? She says Bring she her knows. in. This way to see Danny Clover, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Peggy Drake, Lieutenant. Please sit down. Close the door, Tataglia. All right, all right, you can stay. Miss Drake, the sergeant said you know... Not exactly. Danny, she told me she knew all about it. She said... What's that... on your mind, Miss Drake? I have the murderer's picture. Here. Here it is. Yeah. How'd you happen to take this picture? Well, I'm here on vacation. This afternoon was a good day to take pictures. I was at Times Square. I took a lot of pictures. and Well, this is one of them. You can see for yourself. Yeah. I found a store with six-hour developing service, and I got them developed. I was looking through them, and I saw this one. 
That's why. Yeah. Come here, Tartaglia. Now look at this. Ray Brewer. That's right. Ray Brewer sticking a knife into Earl Lawson on Times Square. Call records, Dino. Get the last known address on Ray Brewer. And anything else they've got interesting. I guess I did help with that. I don't know how much. Records? This man here with a knife. His name is Ray Brewer. A known hoodlum. A record of every misdemeanor on the books. Yeah, yeah, I cancel. Wait till my society back, back home hears about this. I belong to the literary society. We have open forums. I suppose this will be in the papers, well, I mean, won't it? Front page. Probably. What else is? What else? Yeah, what's happened to him lately? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. How are you making out, Gino? In a minute, Danny. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I got all that. We appreciate it, and thank you. Yeah, very interesting, if I may comment on the material gathered from records. What's interesting? Up until a week ago, Ray Brewer was confined to the county hospital for incurables. Yeah, I remember. He was a pretty sick man. Incurable? His heart. Docs gave him a month to live. But last week, he was discharged from the hospital. How come? To die in the bosom of his family, as the records guy phrased it. Where is this family? 1212 West 16th, the man says. Where are you going, Dan? See that Miss Drake gets home, Gino. I'm going to pick up a killer. Open up, Brewer, or I come in anyway. Brewer? Where are you, Brewer? Huh? Out here, Danny. Taking my ease on the fire escape, watching you. Watching you spill out your strength. Throw away the gun, Ray. They tell me you've got a month. If you throw the gun away, maybe you can live a part of it out. All of it. It's arranged. I live all of it. Thirty days, Hathray Brewer. <laughs> if I come out after you, Ray, it'll cut your time down to a half minute. You make me shake with fright. Stay where you are, Danny. I'll bring it to you. The gun, Ray. Now, don't drool, kiddo. You'll get it. Funny... When you rang the doorbell, I thought it was a boy from Milford's, but no, it was you. How come you find me so lightning quick, Danny? A girl, a visitor, got your picture sticking a knife into Lawson. <laughs> I never could learn to be camera shy. Broke a camera in my nose and smiled for all birdies. Turn your back to me, Danny. I feel a new smile coming out. Listen to me. You, you don't turn your back, you bleed in the face. Turn... You did that, you brought sunshine into my short life. <laughs> One for the road. Eh? It splintered through me, puncturing, ripping into the dark cells where pain lay waiting for it. Being released, scurry darted through me, opening endless doors on endless hurt. These new ones took over, finally. Gave up because they'd overdone it. I couldn't feel it anymore. And then the hall wind cold on the sweat that had drenched me. And looking for Brewer, knowing he wasn't there. And calling to headquarters and tell them to put out an all-points bulletin on Ray Brewer. And then to Park Avenue to ask a question. Why had Brewer wanted Lawson dead? What had Lawson been to a hoodlum like Brewer? Help me. In my back. Get in my what? back. Help me. I... You didn't... You didn't... Help. Down the long hall, I could see the parakeets preening, pecking into their clipped wings. The new stillness of the man lying there with a the knife in his back. Dr. Harlan Lawson. Dead. The nap of the thick rug furrowed where his hands had tried to tear life out of it. And suddenly the, the flute song of the parakeet started again. And it wasn't still anymore. You 
listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The sensational young tenor Mario Lanza will take the place of Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bergen on CBS while the famous pair are on summer vacation. Mario Lanza starts his new series tomorrow, and you'll be heard each Sunday this summer on most of these same stations. And while Jack Benny is off for Korea, Guy Lombardo and his orchestra will be on hand to entertain you in CBS familiar Jack Benny time. Last year's bride mannequins are dusted off, brought out of Broadway's basements, propped up on a rod and arranged tenderly at the side of last year's groom mannequins. And Broadway knows June is passing through. It presses its nose against the shop window, sighs at the cascade of white satin flowing slowly over the wax figure, sheds a tear at the coronet of cloth lilies of the valley, and blows its nose for the sweetness of it all. It's the time of youth, the two-week romp in the Catskills, the burial in the sand at Far Rockaway, the breathless ecstasy on the heights of the roller coaster at Coney, for the stay-at-homes, other sweets, other delights, the subway ball games, the band concerts in the mall, the moon-burned girls in the dark grass, and the my-hand-in-your-hand talk about two brothers dead of knife wounds. Summertime talk. At headquarters the next morning, it was difficult to talk about anything because Sergeant Tataglia had his mouth full of tacks and his fist full of hammer. Building something, Gino? Oh, it's you, Danny. Yeah, you might say I'm building... I'm building a site for sore eyes. Oh? You mind if I look? Oh, well, my pleasure. Pardon me for obstructing your view. Oh, nice. I think so also. A pinup picture of Mrs. T hammered to the door of my closet. This I consider a worthy hobby. Mrs. T? I call Mrs. Tartaglia that whenever I'm in a hurry. Mm. <laughs> consider her, Danny, in her Catalina swimsuit. Jones Beach underneath her. The Tartaglia progeny forming a garland of angels at her feet. Ah, nice family picture, Gino. Do uh, you mind taking the tax out of your mouth now? So as I can tell you about Ray Brewer, huh? So as you can do that. Naturally. Uh, permit me to close the closet door on Mrs. T first. I don't want every Tom, Dick, and... <clears throat> well, nothing on Brewer, Danny. The hoodlum killer is still at large. All points bulletins have been Nothing, sent. Nothing, huh? Bread and butter, there is something. I forgot. The Milfords, of which the hood spoke to you, is Milford's haberdashery on Madison Avenue. But Roman Curcio traced it down after thousands other Milfords. It seems... I'll check it. Well, don't go away, Danny. I got something else. Another pinup? Well, you might say that. Remember that Peggy Drake came in here with the snapshot of Brewer killing Lawson? What about her? Precinct 12 picked her up last night running down East 60th Street in her, you should excuse the expression, negligee. What? Was someone running after her? The precinct boys asked her the same question. She said no. She said she dared herself to do it, then she took the dare. So the boys decided on a small fine and let her go. A lonely girl in the big city. Sometimes it hits them that way. All right if I leave now? You always leave me, Danny. I'm used to it. Go, Danny. <laughs> Is someone helping you? I'm looking for Mr. Milford. Mr. Milford is dead. What? Twelve years ago. Like that. Zoot. He was discussing plans with a buyer and... I know. Zoot. Who are you? Uh, Mr. Milford, Jr. May I be of some service? I'm from the police. I want some information. Oh, uh, what is it you want? The police department called you a while ago. You said you had some dealing with a man named Ray Brewer. Oh, uh, yes, I did. I did indeed. You want to tell me about it? I don't see why not. Then tell me. Uh, surely. Last week, Mr. Brewer entered Milford's and was fitted for a complete outfit from linens to warachas. Warachas? Uh, Bootery a la Mexico. Uh, Mr. Brewer was going to Mexico. Uh, note that I said was. Uh, note that. Mr. Brewer changed his mind, huh? Well, that's a man's right. Mr. Brewer decided to stay around the city. Thus, he cancelled the Mexican clothes and ordered town wear. Uh, Gabardines. And he paid you? I only ask because it's been bandied about that Mr. Brewer is not a wealthy man. His uh, friend paid me. The friend who was with him when first he ordered. Uh, this friend? 
Here, this man's picture in the newspaper. The very one. Dreadful clothes, not ours. Is he from here in town? What's his name? It says right here, Harlan Lawson. Hmm. Ph.D. It says this chap was murdered. That's right. Do you have any idea why Mr. Brewer changed his mind about going to Mexico? None. He was so delighted, too, the, the first time he was in here. Showed me a travel brochure put out by the airplane people, uh, Central American Lines, I think. I, I've been to Mexico, you know, uh, ridden on a donkey. Thanks, I... Junior. Thanks a lot. May I be of service to you, senor? I think so. I'm from the police, Danny Clover. Oh, my privilege. Uh, you wish to tour Central America to observe our police methods? Mm -hmm. It can be easily arranged. I will speak to the Latin consul. I, I just want to know about Ray Brewer. Uh, about Brewer? Uh... Brewer? Ah, the name has a familiarity. Uh, see, si, see, si, senor Brewer. The man who wished to live out his days in Mexico, the land of tradition and romance. He's a murderer. Do you think he'll make it? What a dying man sets his heart to do is difficult to restrain him from, senor. Uh, this from my father, I learned. But senor Brewer will not make Mexico by way of Central American lines, senor. Of this, I am certain. Tell me why. Because only yesterday he canceled the ticket. It took me so long to prepare. He canceled the tour I had mapped for him. Acapulco, Zapateca, the floating gardens... When Brewer came in here to arrange his trip, was he alone? Uh, with another gentleman who subsidized the excursion. This one? In the newspaper picture? Mm, see, si, see si, this one. Uh, Dr. Lawson, a gentleman of refinement. Now dead, I perceive. Yeah. Brewer didn't give you an address by any chance. Oh, no, no, no. He simply took the cancellation money, told me he preferred your city. As who would not? You peddle tickets to romantic places and you like it better here. <laughs> who would not? Why pay extra fare, senor? Romance is where you find it. Oh, come in, Margolin. Sit down. Oh, Got anything? Nothing. Guy Brewer's hiding someplace. Where, I can't even begin to guess. Nobody knows anything. Stool pigeons, old friends of Brewer's, not a thing. Uh, if he gets out of the city, it's going to be tough. Yeah. How do you figure it, Danny? Figure what? Well, this, the case, the killing of the Lawson brothers. You know what I mean. You piece it all together, it comes out easy. Show me. Sure. Harlan Lawson wanted to get rid of his brother. He... For money? Maybe. But more than that, I think. Earl Lawson was a man who beat up the world. Harlan just stood there and cried for it. Well, Harlan was a social worker, Danny. He probably did a lot of good where it counts. Sure he did. But I met Harlan. It's the way he impressed me, Muggerman. He felt sorry for himself. Uh -huh. So he finds a little hood like Brewer hires him to kill Earl. Like you said. Harlan was a social worker. Brewer was in a charity hospital. That's where they met. Harlan found out Brewer only had a month to live, promised him a fling that month in Mexico for killing Brother Earl. Well, then why did Brewer turn around and kill the hand that fed him, if we go on the assumption that he killed Harlan, too? Well, Brewer killed twice, all right. The knife in Harlan matches the stab wound in Earl. He killed both brothers. But why? I don't know why he killed Harlan. Another thing I don't know is why Brewer changed his mind about going to Mexico. If we found mm -hmm. that out... We... Danny, all I can say is, thank goodness. Well, say it and sit down in a corner. Mugovan and I were discussing... It's it. about Peggy Drake. Peggy Drake? Say, isn't she the girl? Yeah, the girl who took the snapshot. She should have taken the snapshot and left the city. What? Just a few minutes ago, at five unto midnight, to be specific, she had a to-do with a cab driver, tried to force him to take a wardrobe trunk in his back seat, broke a window while so forcing. Quite a scene. The police suggested the moving company, and... And, and what? Well, give me a breathing spell, Danny. And Officer Padunik suggested his father-in-law and stood guard over the trunk until his father-in-law, the Murphy Movers, hauled it away. Thank Jeep as this girl leaves for her hometown of New Freedom, PA, in the morning. Where? New Freedom, Danny. The trunk has already left by Murphy Trucking Company, and the girl, Peggy Drake, leaves tomorrow. For which, leaving, the police only again wave the finger under her nose. Highway Patrol, Mugman, pick up that van. Escort it back to Peggy Drake's place. Right there. What do you know? So that's why Brewer changed his mind about going to Mexico. Then I waited. It was a little less than an hour when the phone call came. 
The highway patrol had picked up the van at the entrance to the Delaware Bridge. There was plenty of time. Time to grab a bowl of chili and walk over to the 60s, to the rooming house where Peggy Drake was staying. Inside, the banisters of the staircase had been worn smooth by a thousand respectable hands, and the color had just begun to drain from the flowers and the wallpaper. On the third floor landing was a trunk. Beside it, Detective Muggerman. She's in there, Danny. She know we're here? We talk loud. She knows. Stay with the trunk, Muggerman. Okay. Oh, it's you, Mr. Clover. Glad you're here. Come in. Please, come in. What goes on in your town? I don't understand you people. Something wrong, Peggy? There was all that noise a little while ago. I opened my door a bit. I saw my trunk. Explain it to me, Mr. Clover. You were sending it back to New Freedom, huh? Of course, where I live, where I came from. That's where you met Harlan, wasn't it? What's he got to do with I need some sleep, Mr. Clover. My bus leaves early tomorrow. You're not leaving. You want to bring your trunk back in here and unpack? I'm not leaving. Wait a minute. Margovan, bring that trunk in here. What are you doing? I don't have to unpack. It's pretty heavy, Danny. I'll need some help. Okay. I'll give you a hand. Yeah. You better grab the handle on the other side. Here. Okay, Danny? Uh-huh. Wait outside. Yeah. I wish you'd tell me what this is all about. How long did you plan to stay in New York, Peggy? Four days. And you needed a trunk that big for a four-day trip? That's a brand-new trunk, Peggy. Yes, I just bought it. It's for things I want to take home. Books, lamps. Books, huh? I like books. Let's see what you bought. Don't open that. Don't. Why not, Peggy? Leave me alone. What's the girl have to do? I come here for a good time. I'd say you had quite a busy trip. Running down the street at night in a negligee. <laughs> I had something to drink. I didn't know what I was doing. Then creating a stir with this trunk with a cab driver? It wasn't my fault. People here aren't helpful. Peggy, we're looking for a man, Ray Brewer. We want him for two murders. Brewer? You know him, Peggy. You took his picture, brought it to me. Oh, that's, that's right. I remember his name. I'm sure you do. Let's open the trunk, Peggy. No. Don't. Get it out of here. Take it away. Later. You took the picture, Peggy, because you knew the murder was going to be committed. The murder you planned so well with Get Harlan. Get out of here. Just get it out. Gave us a picture of the murderer. You figured by the time we found who he was, traced him, he'd be roaming around Mexico. And by the time we got to him, he'd be dead. Because Ray Brewer only had a month to live. I didn't do anything. I didn't kill anybody. It was Harlan. One thing is bothering me, Peggy. Why Brewer changed his mind about going to Mexico. He saw me taking his picture. We didn't tell him we were going to do that. You double-crossed him, huh? That's why he killed Harlan. That's why he was going to kill you. I from him. It's like a nightmare. Somebody grabbed me by the shoulders and choked me. And I was in the middle of the street, dressed, dressed. When you finally got back here, Ray Brewer was dead. He didn't live his month. His heart gave out. Let's open the trunk, baby. There he is, Ray Brewer. I won't look. I'm not going to look at him again. All the while I was putting him in there, staring at me, staring. And I couldn't get the trunk closed. His hand. I was alone, all alone. His face, staring at me. Dawn touches Broadway now. The remnants of the night are driven back into the earth. You walk the streets, and from behind a doorway, you hear the old sound, the sound of weeping. You know the nighttime will never leave. It's found its refuge. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat.
Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Totaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Peggy Weber was heard as Peggy Drake, Ted Osborne as Harlan Lawson, Anthony Barrett as Ray Brewer, and Don Diamond as Milford. For a full hour of outstanding musical entertainment, plus one of radio's biggest cash awards, play Sing It Again every week over most of these same CBS stations. Laugh along, win along with Jan Murray as he picks up his coast-to-coast telephone and invites you to sing it again and land a big batch of loot. It's exciting, it's outstanding radio entertainment. Stay tuned now for Sing It Again, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. Bill Anders speaking. This is CBS, where you meet adventure with Charlie Wilde. Sundays on the Columbia Broadcasting System. There's a full serving of laughs on the menu at Duffy's Tavern tonight with Archie the Manager, played by Ed Gardner. Archie's colleagues in comedy are Miss Duffy, Clifton Finnegan, and Eddie the Waiter. This Sunday, the big show comes your way once again on NBC. And just listen to a few of the stars who'll be with you. Fred Allen, Jack Carson, Mindy Carson, Ed Archie Gardner, Ed Wynn, and many, many more. And of course, your MC will be Tallulah Bankhead. Listen Sunday for The Big Show. Ladies and gentlemen, that phone bell means exciting adventure. Hello? Hello. The handsome young man answering the phone is Archie Goodwin. The mountain of a man engrossed in deep thought in the oversized armchair is Nero Wolf. Hey, boss. Oh, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf. There's a guy on the phone who wants us to take a case. Seems that someone was mad at a guy who was mad, and now this guy on the phone is mad, wants us to find out who did the killing. What do you say, Mr. Wolf? We need the money. <laughs> Hello? Yes, Mr. Wolf says he'll be happy to take the case. Just present yourself and a check for $2,000 at 601 West 35th Street at 11 o'clock. Mr. Wolf can't wait till you get here. He's dying to go to work. Goodbye. (sighs) Greatest detective in the world. The only trouble is... He is... Yes, listeners, Archie is so right. He is the greatest detective in the world, and the fattest, and the least energetic. He's Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you over this NBC network in a new series of adventures by Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight, it's The Case of the Beautiful Archer. That's a good title. And it was a good case, too. It began in the consulting room of Dr. Raynard Townley of the Townley Sanitarium, uh, skipping a jump north of Nyack, New York, when a very lovely young lovely glared across the desk at the good doctor. Shall we pretend you don't know who I am, Dr. Townley? How could we possibly do that, my dear Diana Lawrence? Twenty-three years old, daughter of one of our better-known sculptors, Michael Lawrence. You were born in Johannesburg, educated in London and Paris, and live at present a hundred yards from here in your father's cottage on Berry Hill Lane. How's that? It's intended to be staggering, isn't it? You take no cream or sugar in your coffee, were winner of the Women's National Archery Tournament for 1947, and have an exceedingly high temper. Let's stop the nonsense. You have an inpatient here named Willard Garth. Well, Willard Garth happens to be my fiancé. Yes, he has mentioned the fact during his analysis. And, um, well, has he by any chance mentioned his reasons for suddenly refusing to see me during the past five weeks? He didn't have to, Miss Lawrence. Well, what do you mean? I mean that I recommended he give you up as a bad job. What? Well, I suppose you had some purpose in saying what you did. Of course. I'm the boy's doctor. Uh, You think you're in love with Willard Garth, I know. But actually, 
You're infatuated with the Garth millions. You take a lot on yourself, don't you, Doctor? I consider it important to relieve Willard of all painful external pressure. You've done well for Willard, Dr. Townley. Relieving him of me? I think so. Now, let's see you relieve yourself of me. You, uh, purchased the gun for this occasion, Miss Lawrence? Yes. And what exactly do you hope to accomplish with it? A quick and complete reversal of your decision about me. I'm not as easy to handle as Willard is, you see. And if you intend to ruin my life, then I intend to end yours, here and now. The phone is ringing. Let it ring. Hmm? Just as you say. It's the house phone, Miss Lawrence. It may be Willard, you know. Oh, Willard? Yes, he uh, usually phones me from his room at about this time every day. Oh. Well, all, all right. Answer it, but be careful what you say. You're in command, it seems. Hello? Oh, why, hello. I thought it would be you, Willard. Look, my boy, Diana Lawrence is here. I've had a talk with her, and I've reconsidered my opinion. Yes, yes, I'm quite serious. If you're at all sensible, you see her regularly and plan on a marriage as soon as you're discharged. Yes. Oh, you do? Very well, I'll see if she'll talk to you. Uh, Miss Lawrence. Yes? Uh, do you want to speak with him? Uh, give me the phone. Of course. Here you are, and I'll uh, take this what, gun. You... There we are. Now, stand away, Miss Lawrence. But, 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 but Willard, Willard's on the phone. Willard is not on the phone. No one was on the phone. The ring came from the push-button bell under my desk here. Oh. Sometimes I find it convenient to interrupt my consultations with a phone call. Oh, you... You smug, deceitful, self-sufficient... Murder is a vexatious business. You'll be grateful to me one day. All right. Give me my gun and let me go. The gun, I'm afraid, stays with me. Here in this Majolica cabinet. I'd scarcely feel justified in trusting you with it. And now... With your permission, or without it, the interview is ended. Later that day, the phone in the Lawrence house on Berry Hill Lane began to jingle. And this time, it was no phony. Hello? Diana? Yes? Willard, darling. Diana, darling, it's Willard. Imagine... Has the doctor let you use the telephone just as if you were a great big adult? Oh, I've got to see you, sweetheart, and, and I didn't call you to argue. Love, beauty, understanding, that's what matters, isn't it? Isn't it? Do I hear the overtones of a change of heart? Oh, Diana, what's happened wasn't my fault. He poisoned me against you. Then why don't you walk out of that amateur nut house and stand up like a man? I probably shall, Diana. Now, please listen to me. He's letting me have the limousine tonight from 8 until 12. I want us to go for a ride and, and talk and talk and talk until everything is clear. Clear as a bell, my baby. Don't tell me he's trusting you to drive. Oh, no. No, one of the handymen here will show for us. Oh, say you'll come, Diana. Will you? Say it. Say yes. Say you will. Well, yes, Willard. I'll be glad to. Oh, eight o'clock, then? Eight. Oh, bless you. Bless you, my angel. <laughs> Oh, oh! so that's it. You want my father's money. That's what you love, not me. Willard, the chauffeur will hear you. It's the way Townley says it is. He's right. He's right. Oh, why did I let you talk me into this? What a fool I was to have come at all. You're sick inside, Willard. So utterly, hopelessly sick. Oh. Oh, so now I'm... I'm hopelessly sick. Yes. Yes, you are. You're, you're trying to confuse me. Take advantage of me. Wind me around your finger. Just because I love you too much. That's it. That's my illness. Of course, I see it now. You. You're the thing I must get rid of. You with your beautiful, beautiful face and your twisted values. You're at the bottom of all my agony. Willard! Willard! I'm saving myself. I'm saving myself. Once you're dead, the sickness is ended. I'll be safe. I'll be safe. I'll be safe. Willard. Well, 
Dr. Townley? Yes. Come in. Mr. Wolf's been expecting you. Come in, Dr. Townley. Come in. Have a chair. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. I'm so happy you've agreed to take this case. Have a glass of beer. Oh, no, no. Uh, never at this time of the morning, thank you. Well, Doctor, the newspaper's checked with what you told me. The girl and young Garth went out for a ride in your limousine last night. The car was driven by one of your handymen. Well, that's right. Haynes, his name is. And they never came back. Young Garth was found dead in the car with two bullets in him. The girl was gone, and also Haynes, the handyman chauffeur. Huh? Correct, sir. Have you any idea where he could be? No, sir. And the young lady, tell me about her. She's Diana Lawrence, daughter of Michael Lawrence. The sculptor? The sculptor. She lives with him in a small cottage near my sanatorium on Berry Hill Lane. An extremely aggressive and self-centered female with more than a slight flair for violence. Your description might easily lead me to the specter of this murder, sir. Well, I'm aware of that. And I don't think you'd be far off the mark. As I told you on the phone, she tried to murder me yesterday morning. Hmm. The police have made no headway in locating her? No. The homicide division has contacted her father, but uh, he's remained quite noncommittal. He simply says that uh, he's sure she's incapable of killing a fly and that he hasn't laid eyes on her since 8 o'clock last night. Highly suspicious behavior. She was unquestionably in the car with young Garth when he was murdered. Hmm. She wasn't alone in the car with him. You were you're referring to Haynes? Yes, but he can't be found either, remember? It appears that he failed to list his address on his job application. But somehow, Mr. Wolfe, I'm quite sure he'll show up this afternoon. Somehow, Dr. Townley, if I were you, I wouldn't be quite so sure. We must begin by facing the initial problem of locating our suspects. Archie. Yes, sir? Get out the car and drive up to the house on Berry Hill Lane. And then? There you will ask Mr. Michael Lawrence to be sensible enough to cooperate with us in finding his daughter. And if the answer is no? I recommend, Archie, that you flatly refuse to take it. Mr. Lawrence was no simple baby to handle. He was in a studio when I walked in, chiseling on a statue of a boy and a girl, both wearing less clothes than the law allows. And before I got a chance to state my name, he commenced giving me a free lecture on the marble work of art. She's good. Really good. She's practically superb. The Ariadne. The what, Ariadne? The girl in the statue. Oh. That's Ariadne. Tragic nymph of Greek mythology. Don't tell me you're not familiar with Apollo and Ariadne. All right, I won't. The Apollo, on the other hand, is unfinished. The face, you see, it uh, <clears throat> it lacks something. The passion of yearning, Olympian desire. And yet, you know, the two figures have motion. Like your daughter? Eh? Your daughter, Diana, she's got motion also. As I hear it, she's been in motion ever since she murdered Willard Garth last night in the back end of a limousine. <laughs> so you're another flatfoot? Uh, not exactly. I'm paid in private by Nero Wolf. Nero Wolf? Yeah. You don't mean that a creditable man like Wolf thinks Diana killed young Gar? Well, he'd like to talk over the possibility with her. How laughable. Look at that face. Is there anything of the murderous in a face like that? In a face like what? Oh, I'm sorry. Diana posed for the Ariadne, you see. And the likeness is exact. Do you think a girl of this type, classic, sensitive, civilized, could descend to the clumsy, brute level of murder? Well, it's... It's a little hard to imagine. There. Even you agree with me. On the other hand... Shall we discuss the other hand over a cup of coffee? I'm quite exhausted. If you insist. I do. Sit down and inhale the atmosphere of culture at its source. There's a pot warming on the stove. Pot of what? Coffee or culture? Huh. Well, wait to see what he means. Oh. Ah, never ignore a phone call. No, it might be something important. Yes? It's Diana, Father. Oh, uh... Oh, yes, Diana. It's, it's all over the papers. Yes, I know. Well, I, I don't think they'll find me where I am. And I'm staying here until things quiet down a little. Where are you, honey? Uh, what did you say? I said, where are you? You said, honey. Daddy, you never call me honey. Uh, I know, it's because I'm excited. Where are you, sweetheart? 
anybody find out? Not a soul in the world. Where are you? Well, you know where Tyne Pike turns off to the left beyond Bardsville? Yes. Well, I'm... Call me later, Angel. But, Father, I... Oh. Oh, get that motorman's number. You will live, my friend, but not long if you don't control your curiosity. With that mallet you hit me, what was the big idea? Do you really have to ask that question? Well, aren't you trying to trick my daughter into disclosing her whereabouts? The police are pretty interested in her whereabouts. Then let them find her. But you can't be surprised, my friend, if I choose to protect Diana's interests. So he's working on an Apollo and Ariadne, is he, Archie? Who cares about Apollo and Ariadne? The point is how he worked on my gourd. That, of course, is unfortunate, my boy, but... You get that, please? Mm-hmm. Hello? Inspector Kramer. Hold it. For you. Here. Thanks. Yes? Wolf? Ah, how are you, Inspector? I hear you're in on the Garth killing. Not very deeply, I'm afraid. We're still trying to locate the Lawrence girl. Well, you can forget about that. Yeah? Yes. We've already located her and released her on a habeas corpus. That sounds interesting. Her father had a lawyer on our heads before she was in here ten minutes. Too bad you couldn't have held on to her. Oh, I don't know. I'm not so sure we want her. Why not? Well, first of all, it's not likely she did it. No? No. Ballistics stated that the bullets that killed Willard Garth were not fired from point-blank range. And she was sitting beside him on the back seat. I see. Also, we found the murder weapon in the grass near where the limousine was parked. And she admitted it was hers. That sounds like a poor reason to release her. Well, the point is she wasn't in possession of the gun when the killing happened. At least so she says. No, who was? The doctor. What doctor? Townley. The guy who runs that sanitarium. According to her, he took the gun away from her for safekeeping at noon yesterday. There was a little more talk between them, something about fresh cigar ashes that were found in the dashboard ashtray of the limousine. After that, the boss hung up and exerted himself enough to put a call through to the Townley Sanatorium. I'm afraid the doctor is very busy just now. So am I, and my business happens to be highly important. Well, I'll say you called, Mr. And I'll ask him to contact you just as soon as he has a free moment. Do you happen to have a free moment, miss? Why, well, yes, sir. Could you spend it by telling me if that handyman, Mr. Haynes, is being located? Why, yes, as a matter of fact, he has. One of the staff just found out where he lives, Mr. Wolf. Well? He has a little cottage at 206 Dockside Road. That's out near Sheep's Head Bay. Thank you. Archie. I'm going someplace, I suppose. You are? You're going to Sheep's Head Bay. Hello there. Hmm? Looking for a guy I can't find. Oh? Yeah, his name is Haynes. Stopped at the cottage up there, but there's no one there. I saw you here on the wharf fishing, so I... What did you say his name is... Haynes. H-A-I-N-E-S. Oh, oh, Haynes. Yeah. yeah, do you know him? Well, there's a fellow named Hines used to fish no, out no, here. No, 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 not Hines. Haynes. Couldn't be Honeyburg? No, it couldn't be. The name is Haynes. H-A-I-N... Haynes! Give me a hand here, eh? <laughs> well, what do you know? <laughs> Funny, huh? That guy seems to think my name is Haynes. Yeah, so do I. You do? Yes, I... <laughs> I got back to our house, soaked to the skin and minus Haynes, and just in time to see the boss in the exhausting process of walking across the room to answer the phone. Hello? This is Dr. Townley. You called me. So I did. About the murder? More specifically, about the statement from Diana Lawrence that you removed a firearm from her possession yesterday morning. That's quite correct. It's here in my Majolica cabinet. Is it? Of course it is. I suggest you check. Just a moment. Wolf. Yeah? I'd like to see you at once. The gun, I suppose, has vanished. But how did you know? Because it is at ballistics, Doctor. It turned out to be the gun that killed Willard Garth. I... I see. Do you? Yes. And I understand everything now. It's all so crystal clear. 
Just how, Crystal Clear? I'm quite certain, Mr. Wolf, that I can put my finger on the killer. And I think it'd be well if you came here immediately. Oh, I'm afraid it's impossible, sir. Uh, there's an important operation scheduled, and I simply cannot leave. What do you suggest? Well, is it outside the realm of possibility that you come here? Is it, Mr. Wolf? Hello, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf? <laughs> When my boss has to leave the house, it's a major tragedy. Sometimes he rages, sometimes he curses the whole detective business, lock, stock, and barrel. And sometimes he keeps very quiet and grips the side of the car desperately and tries not to inhale any fresh air. This was one of the quiet times. Just go slowly, Archie, but get there as quickly as you can. Oh, you don't want a chauffeur, Mr. Wolf. What you need is a magician. Keep your eye on the road and don't strain yourself to make superfluous witticisms. Why don't you try relaxing a little? I hear there hasn't been a man-eating tiger sighted on the Sawmill River Parkway in the last 500 years. Your liberty is out of order. Don't try to make light of a deplorable situation. Here's the sanatorium. And there's Dr. Townley coming to meet us. It's terribly nice of you to have come, Mr. Wolf. I've heard about your aversion to traveling, and I appreciate your going to the trouble. Don't uh, mention it. Oh, Archie, help me out with my other eye. Yeah. Uh, there you are. Mm. Now, calm down. You're all in one piece. I think you'll find the trip highly profitable, Mr. Wolf. You'll consider it time very well. Hey. Hey, what's the matter? What is it? What happened? He's been shot. Hardly likely there wasn't a sound. This kind of shot doesn't make a sound, boss. What do you mean? Better take a look for yourself. There's an arrow in his back, and he's dead. We remembered that Dr. Townley had said Diana Lawrence had won the Women's National Archery Tournament for 1947. The Lawrence house was visible through the trees a hundred yards away. So we started for it and the sculptor's studio. There's no one around. So this is his lady's effort, Apollo and Ariadne. Yeah. Done a little work on it since I was here. The Apollo's face is more finished and... Hey, boss. Yes? You know, somehow or other, Apollo looks a little familiar. I wouldn't be surprised, Archie. I think if you examine it closely... Ah, our host. You remember me, don't you? I met you once at a dinner party at your house, the time they opened the new museum on 67th Street. Of course, of course, Mr. Lawrence. And to what do I owe the honor? It's not much of an honor. Dr. Townley has been murdered. No. I am afraid Mr. Goodwin is being accurate. He's been murdered with a bow and arrow. And what does that mean to you, Mr. Lawrence? I'm sorry. I've been a fool. An awful fool. You can't blame yourself too much. If you'd cooperated with the police instead of looking out for your daughter's interest, the man would still be alive. But I assure you that... Where's the girl? She should be here now. She phoned me a while ago and said she was coming by for passage money to Rio. You were looking for me? Lost. Diana, put the gun down, Angel. And tie a rope around my neck? Might I inquire if your plan is to kill us all, Miss Lawrence? Oh, what would yours be if the world was after you for something you didn't do? Wouldn't you be willing to risk persuading a jury of that? Thanks, no. I'll skip that chance. Father, Father, get me the money. Diana, sweetheart, don't make me a part of your murders. That's asking too much of love. Do, don't you know I'm not guilty? No, no, Diana, I don't. <laughs> Leave that gun away, Diana. Haynes. Looks like I walked in on the nose. That's him, boss, the guy who soused me. Take a little of your own advice. Relax, Archie. What do you want here, Mr. Haynes? I want to give up and try to straighten out this little deal. Mr. Lawrence. Yes? Here's your money back. You got a right to call me a welcher. I promised I wouldn't give evidence against the girl and you paid my price. But enough is enough and right here and now I'm unloading. Yes, what does this mean? It means I saw her do it. <gasps> oh, you, you stupid, lying, rotten... Oh, yeah. It's, 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 grab her, Archie. Grab her. Get the pair of them out of here. <laughs> What can I say to myself now? What can I do? 
I'm sorry, Mr. Lawrence, but it's not necessary to eat your heart out. Many fathers before you have done their best and failed. But I had a special duty toward Diana. Special duty? Yes. I... Well, you see, you'll find it out sooner or later, so I'd best tell you now. I'm not a real father. I adopted her nine years ago when she was 14. I see. And I should never have done it. I realize now that I wasn't equal to the task. Well, 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 all's not lost yet. They may not convict her, you know. Eh? I said they may not convict her. But how could they fail to convict her? She killed Garth, didn't she? Did she? She shot him. But the gun was in townless possession. She could easily have stolen that. She could have broken into his office later. It, it wasn't locked. What wasn't locked? The Majolica cabinet was... I mean... I believe you mean what you said, Lawrence, the Majolica cabinet. Though for the life of me, I can't see how you could know whether it was locked or not, unless you had the experience of opening it. Could it be that you went looking for the gun yourself after Townley said he had confiscated it? That you killed Townley with a bow and arrow which you handle as well as your daughter because he was just on the point of telling me that you knew where the gun was? And that you were the likeliest murder suspect? You must be mad. Oh, sir, not I. <laughs> but you are mad and more than a little. You hated Willard Garth. It was you who were making the marriage impossible. You loathed him, and in the end, you killed him. How could I have killed him? I'll tell you a little secret, Mr. Lawrence. The police found cigar ash in the dashboard tray of the death car. Chemical analysis showed that the ash was from an El Adoro cigar. What have you got in your left hand, sir? In my... Uh, an Elidoro cigar. And in my right hand, a derringer. Powerful and admirable little weapon, Lawrence. I suggest you show proper respect for it by dropping all this here and now. You don't wish to hear me say the rest, that you were horribly in love with Diana, your own adopted daughter, in love and hopelessly, eternally frustrated? You begrudge me the triumph of accusing you of having bribed Haynes to let you take his place at the driver's seat of the limousine and further bribed and threatened him into putting on his show of many pranks and false confessions to confuse us all beyond measure. You said I loved Diana. Would I do all this to her if I did? Oh, but of course, as love as yours is really hate. You were content to see her dead rather than relinquish her. Like all miserly, small-hearted men, you would rather kill the thing you love than muster the generosity necessary to seeing it attain happiness. That's enough out of you. I should think it was much too much. It is. Archie, my boy, I'm grateful to you, both for coming back into the house when you did and for being such a good shot. Hope you remember that next time you feel like insulting me. Hmm. <laughs> Tell me, what's with that cigar ash routine? Who told you the ashes in the limousine were from an Eladoro, boss? I never heard anything about that. <laughs> As a matter of fact, neither did I. No one could possibly have determined the brand by any chemical means in existence. I knew that, you see, and I took the long chance that Lawrence didn't. Oh, uh -huh. but I still don't get the mainspring of the deal. How did you know he was in love with Diana? That, oh, that was genius, I have to admit it. You see, it all hinged on the statue of Apollo and Ariadne. According to the Greek myth, Apollo fell deeply in love with the nymph, but because they were of different worlds, he was condemned to pursue her always and never to catch her. Well, what's that got to do with the price of eggs? Isn't it perfectly obvious? Didn't he tell you that Diana had posed for the Ariadne? Yeah, but I still don't... And you yourself remarked on the fact that the finished Apollo looked somehow familiar, didn't you, Archie? Yeah. Yeah, I did, boss. Don't you know why that was? You mean that... I mean that Michael Lawrence unconsciously revealed the true state of his heart. He didn't intend to, I suppose. But precisely and accurately, he chiseled the features of the tortured god in his very own image. Oh. And speaking of torture, Archie... Yeah, Will we be home in time for dinner? Oh, boss, you can't be that hungry. Oh, yeah, I am. Good heavens, Archie. Do you realize that I haven't eaten since lunch? You 
You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story by Peter Berry was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin and Gigi Pearson, Ted Von Els, Bill Johnstone, Peter Leeds, and Jay Novello. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Brave Rabbit. Don Stanley speaking. There's fun and laughs later tonight when Ed Archie Gardner stars as Archie the Manager in Duffy's Tavern. As usual, Duffy won't be there, but Archie will be there, armed with his own whimsical version of the English language. Another Friday favorite you'll hear later is The Delightful Life of Riley, starring William Bendix as Chester A. Riley. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. I've got a little office near 53rd Street on Broadway, 8th floor. My business? Trouble. What kind of trouble? Well, take your pick. If you come up with something unusual, a new kind of trouble, drop around and see me. Because I'm known along the big street as a shamus, a gumshoe. Or to the guy on Park Avenue as a private detective. If you happen to be stuck with your problem, for $100 a day in expenses, I'll chase it around until I can catch up and break its back. I average about 20 fast rounds a week with old man trouble, and so far, the decision's been on my side. But uh, don't misunderstand me. It's my business to beat him, but I respect him. Trouble goes to work with every trick in the book. So I play it the same way, and believe me, when I put him away for the count, I don't clap my little hands in glee. I know he's just taking a rest, and he'll be back again with some new stunts. Want to know how he works? Well, the other day, I was on the way to my office. I stopped at the corner, newsstand, 53rd and Broadway, to buy a paper and to say hello to an old friend. Hi, Mr. Diamond. Well, hello, Jeff. How's the newspaper business? Oh, swell. How's the detective racket? Oh, swell. Hey, you don't sound too happy. Jeff, I couldn't be happier if my hair was on fire. Take my advice, son. When you grow up, be sure and get a job that pays off every week in that little white envelope. Don't ever become a private detective. It's like a penny getting lost in a gum machine. Well, I'm going to stick to the newspaper business. Good for you. Say, I was just about to go across the street to Mary Lou's and get some ice cream. How about it? Can I buy you a cone? Now, that is a beautiful idea. Let's go. Aren't you coming to work a little late, Mr. Diamond? Well, uh, you see, Jeff, I, I was up kind of late. Research, you know. Yeah, I know. I see him going into your office all the time. That blonde last week stopped traffic all the way to 42nd Street. Yeah, she was lovely. Got tired of social standards and shot her husband right through his morning cup of coffee. Was that the one in the headlines? That's the one. Oh, hello, Jeff. Hi, Mary Lou. Take a seat, Mr. Diamond. Well, what did you and your friend have? Well, I'm going to have a double strawberry. How about it, Mr. Diamond? Sounds great. Two double strawberries. Oh, uh, this is Mr. Diamond, Mary Lou. His office is in that building across the street. Oh, how do you do? Mm, how are you, Mary? Well, all right, I guess. Business could get better, and I wouldn't mind at all. <laughs> Here are your cones. This is on me, Mr. Diamond. Oh, no, no, now put it away. Oh, now, come on. I asked you over, and that makes it my treat. Here's a five, Mary Lou. Mr. Diamond's money isn't any good today. Tell you what I'll do, Jeff. Give me a five a minute. Sure, here. Now, if you can tell me whose picture's on this bill, you can buy the cones. That a deal? That's a deal. Lincoln. <laughs> well, what's the matter? That's right, isn't it? Hmm? Oh, yeah. What's wrong? Where did you get this bill, Jeff? Well, I just made change for it a few minutes. Hey, what's the matter with that dough? <laughs> you two act like you've never seen a $5 bill before. Well, this Finn's counterfeit. What? That's right. Good job, too. You sure? Yep. One of the best, in jo best engraving jobs I've ever run across. Paper's not too good. Oh, that's swell. That's real great. 
I get just out of a whole five bucks. Who gave it to you? I remember the guy, all right. He came by just before you did. Made change for him, the heel. Yeah, five bucks is a lot of papers. I'll say it is. Well, maybe you're wrong. You could be. (laughs) Not Mr. Diamond. He's a private detective. Used to be a cop. Look, Jeff, mind if I take this bill along with me? Nah. What good's it gonna do me? Oh, it's not so bad. Here, I'll give you a good five for it. No, sir. You only learn by mistakes. I made a big one, so I'm out five. I'll get along. Look, it's worth the five. I'm just buying it from you. Uh, sure, Jeff. Uh, go ahead and take it. Uh-uh. Thanks a lot, Mr. Diamond, but I just can't. Okay, Jeff. Maybe I can find the guy who slipped this to you. Maybe we can get your five back. What are you gonna do? Ah, uh, take a run down to the fifth precinct. See how much of this stuff is floating around New York. Now, I want you to do something for me, Jeff. Sure, anything. I want you to keep an eye out for the guy who gave you this phone. I'm way ahead of you. Well, now, that's what I'm afraid of. I want you to promise me, if you do spot him, not to do anything until you get in touch with me. Promise? Yeah, okay. Well, I'll be at the station. Ask for Lieutenant Levinson's office. Right. Uh, here's for the ice cream, Mary Lou. Good ice cream, too. Oh, thank you. I make it here. Right in back. Take a quart home some night. I always do, but it generally has a cork in it. I left Mary Lou's ice cream parlor and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. I don't usually start something like that, but when a kid gets fleeced out of a whole day's pay, I get a little hot under the collar. I walked into the squad room and spotted Sergeant Otis putting shine on his big shoes. Oh, it's you, Diamond. Now, what good is that going to do you, Otis? You can lose a whole can of polish in the cracks. What do you mean? My shoes ain't cracked so bad. Well, maybe not, but I've seen bacon that looked better. Uh, uh. If you want to see the lieutenant, go on in. Thank you, Sergeant. Until we meet again. Uh, why don't you stop trying to be so funny? Sergeant, I'll do it if you'll do something for me. What? Cut off your head. That face could start a Harry Carey epidemic. Uh. Hello, Walt. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Now, what the devil's the uh-huh about? What do you mean? That bilious explosion you just popped up with. Uh Sound like you just swallowed a whole pineapple. Why? What do you mean, why? Who's dead? Huh? The body you said you found. The body I said... Uh Uh-oh, no, no, Walt. You're not built for it. Who? No, Walt. It's my routine. It won't work for you. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, sure you do. You wanted to know who's dead. Well, I'm not going to tell you. Huh? Don't try to be cute with me. You know what it's all about, and... I'm not going to be the fall guy. You just hunt for the body. Wait a minute. I don't know anything about a body. You wanted to know who's dead, didn't you? Sure, but that was just a gag. Okay, have your fun, but I'm not going to tell you. Tell me what? Who's dead? You mean somebody really is? What are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about what you just said. Now, who's dead? That's a stupid question. Why is it? Well, if you don't know who's dead, what the devil are you doing in charge of homicide? Go on over to the robbery detail. Now, you wait a minute. You said... Yes, Walt? Oh, get out of here. I did not. I never said, oh, get out of here. When I came in, I said, hello, Walt, and you said, "Uh uh-huh. Then I said, what do you mean, "Uh uh-huh? You wanted to know where the body was. I did not. I said, who's dead? Why? Oh, no, 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 please. I'm an old man. Oh, Walt, get away from that window and take a look at this. Oh, please. Do I have to? It'll probably explode. Now, be a good boy and open your riddle eyes. All right, but I just know I'll be sorry. Yeah. Hmm? You don't owe me any money. Well, if I did, I'd make sure to pay you off in this stuff. Why, what's wrong with... Where'd you get this? Some guy slipped it to Jeff, the newsboy. He got change for it. Oh, that certainly is a nice stunt. Well, maybe the guy didn't know he was passing counterfeit. I doubt it. You don't give a newsboy five bucks for a paper. Okay, tell me about it. Well, the stuff's been flooding the city. We can't get a lead. Picked up a couple of passes, but they won't crack. How do they work? Look, Rick, this isn't my department. The Treasury boys are working on it right now. Why don't you go over and talk to them? Well, if you want to be snooty about it. Now, you wait a minute, Diamond. Yeah? Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Is Mr. Diamond there? Now, wait a minute. Rick, it's for you. Yeah, wait just a minute. Here, Diamond, and if you're mixed up in something... Walt, be quiet. Hello? Mr. Diamond? Yeah, Jeff? Yeah, I just spotted the guy who slipped me the phony bill. He went into the bar next to the ice cream parlor. You stay where you are. I'll be right over. I'll be at the stand. Rick. Yeah? Please. Walt. Yeah? Bye. Paper, paper. Late edition paper. Jeff. Oh, Mr. Diamond. He hasn't come out yet. He's still in the bar. Come on. Where are we going? Leave your papers for a second. I want you to point him out. Okay. 
He's a big guy. You better be careful. Big guys always make me careful. You want me to go in with you? Just stick your head in the door and point him out, and then go on back to your papers. If I start bleeding, I'll scream. See him? No. Yeah, there he is. Over in that booth. Well, well, well. You know him? Yeah. Go on back to your stand. Oh, golly, Mr. Diamond, can I? No, Jeff. Go on back. Okay. Hello, Walker. Huh? Oh. What do you want, Shamus? Well, I'll have a talk. Mind if I sit down? Does it make any difference? Not much. Then sit. You uh, passed a phony five spot this morning. I did? Well, shame on me. How many more you got on you? I don't know what you're talking about. You want me to turn you upside down and shake it out of you? Diamond. Yeah? Boo. Walker. Yeah? Oh, hey, you... You want it back? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Oh. Now, now let's see your pockets. Okay, okay. Get on your feet. I want to see what you're doing. All right. Okay, dump them. Hey, hey, what's going on here? Just relax, bartender. I'm taking care of some business. Well, there ain't going to be any rough stuff in my joint, so you better relax, sonny. Yeah, make this guy take his big paws off of me. He's trying to shake me down. Oh, yeah? You want me to call the cops, sonny? Maybe that's not a bad idea. How about it, Walker? You want him to call the law? I don't care who he calls. Just get out of my way, Diamond. You're not going anywhere. Uh, now, I told you to lay off, Sonny, and I meant it. Now, let him go, you hear me? Look out, he's making a break. Just let him be. Get out of my way, Pop. You're too old to lose another set of teeth. I ain't turning you loose until that guy makes the street. Sorry, Pop, you better take a chair. <laughs> What happened? You see which way you went? Yeah, there it goes around that corner. Stay at the ice cream parlor, Jeff, so I can get you if I need you. I took off like a seagull in the hurricane. I turned the corner and spotted my man jumping into a cab, so I did the same. He led me across town to a little dive on 13th Street and got out of his cab. My boy parked up the block, and we watched while Walker looked around for a tail. When he was satisfied, he'd given me the shake, he went in. I paid off my cabbie and followed it was another bar, and Walker wasn't anywhere in the room. I sat down, ordered a beer, and waited. After about ten minutes, I saw a couple of guys wander out of a door in the back. A couple of minutes later, a couple of more wandered out. So I wandered in. It was a small-time gambling setup. The kind you can throw in the back of your car if the cops come. I started getting that lousy feeling again. You don't just walk into a place like that unless someone wants you to. And if they do, it's usually because they got it fixed so you stay around. Maybe permanently. What are you telling me for, Diamond? Why? Make you uncomfortable? Yeah. That's a cozy setup. Good way to get rid of bad money. Pay the winner off with counterfeit. I think we'd better go back to my office. Oh, I don't know. I might have a little fun here. I'll bet if one of those guys at the table knew he was going to be paid off in counterfeit, he'd just about tear this place apart. And you too. Diamond, don't be stupid. Oh, something new's been added. Yeah, and it makes so much noise when it goes off. Let's go back to my office, huh? For some reason, I just can't think of a good argument not to. This way. Have a seat. My uh, ankles get lumpy when I sit down. Bad circulation. Then stand on your head. Uh, it doesn't work. I keep talking to toes all day. How'd you get on to this setup? Oh, luck. You passed a bad bill to a newspaper boy. He spotted you for me. You know what happens to you? No. As a matter of fact, I was thinking what's going to happen to you. What do you mean? Treasury boys, homicide, fifth precinct. And tomorrow we're taking a full-page ad in the Times. You should do a big business. You're lying. Okay. I think I'll sit down while you wrestle with it. You mean the team I know about this place and me? The only way they'll get to know you any better is when they give you a room number at Sing Sing. Oh, you mind if I put my feet up? Oh, go ahead. He kept asking questions, not waiting for answers. He was good and worried. And as long as I could keep him that way, the longer I was going to keep on breathing. I don't believe one rotten thing you said, Diamond. Okay. He kept trying to convince himself that I was lying. He wanted to shoot me in the worst way. He moved around behind his desk and sat down. Bless his little heart. I had both feet on the front of his desk, so I shoved out his heart. I pinned him against the wall with the desk and jumped up to get better leverage. I shoved so hard the front of the desk nearly cut him in two. He was stuck and he couldn't use his arms. 
I, I can't breathe. You want to tell me about it? I, I don't know things. Okay. It will look pretty silly from the waist down. Come on, Walker. If I mash you anymore, they'll be able to use you for wallpaper. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now leave the gun in your pocket. When I pull the desk back, put your hands on top of it. You try a stunt and you end up in half. Uh, okay. What do you want to know? Who's the big wheel behind the counterfeit ring? You give me a chance if I tell you? No deals. I can't blame me for trying. All right, you try it. Now, you want back in the vice? No, 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 no. I'll, I'll tell you. Oh. Walker. Walker. <sighs> he died with his head rolled back and his eyes staring up like he wanted to starve for trying. Whoever shot him had been out in the alley and had nailed him through the window. I looked out, but the killer had disappeared... So I put in a call to Homicide, and finally, Walt and his boys arrived. Diamond, don't you ever get tired of corpses? Well, of course not. I just do my bit and then try to make you happy. Hey, you want me to call the wagon and get the corner down here, Lieutenant? No, Otis. I thought we might all sit around and wait for the dead man to say something. Oh, uh, I was only asking, Lieutenant. Well, start using that mallet head of yours, you mallet head, and make a report. Okay. Now, Diamond, I want to know how you got mixed up in this thing. Well, the dead man was the one who slipped the paper boy the phony five. I tailed him, and he was just about to tell me who was behind the ring when he got a hole in his head. Oh, he was going to tell you, was he? Just like that. What did you do, set his clothes on fire? No. We were playing truth and consequences, and he fibbed, so I... Now you stop that. This guy was the only link we had on the counterfeit ring. And you have to fix it so he dies. Rick, there's enough phony money floating around New York right now to start another Black Friday. This is the best setup we've run into since Dad Foster operated in 1937. Dad Foster? Yeah, Dad Foster. You remember hearing about him. Yeah, is he still doing time? No, he served his sentence and he's gone straight ever since. How do you know? Where is he? He runs a little saloon on 53rd Street. 53rd? <laughs> Thanks, Walt. Oh, now, you wait a minute. Who the devil are you calling? A quiz program. I want to win an electric chair. Oh. Mary Lou's ice cream parlor. Is uh, Jeff the newsboy there? Well, yes. It's for you, Jeff. Thanks. Hello? Jeff, this is Mr. Diamond. I want you to do me a favor. Sure, anything for you. Okay, now, you know the saloon next to the ice cream parlor? Yeah. You know the bartender? Yeah, old guy. Buys a paper from me every night. All right. Now, stay in the parlor and keep an eye on the front of the saloon. If the bartender comes out, find out where he goes. But for Pete's sake, be careful. Sure, Mr. Diamond. I'll do what you say. Is something up? Well, could be. Now, if anything happens before I get there, call Lieutenant Levinson. I'll tell you all about it when I see you. Getting to be a pretty important fellow, Jeff. Phone calls now. Oh, that was Mr. Diamond. He wants me to stay here and keep an eye on the front of the saloon. Okay? Oh, sure, of course. But why did he want you to do that? Oh, it's something big, I think. Something to do with the bartender that works there. The bartender? Yeah. I'll just sit up in front here and keep an eye out. Uh, look, Jeff, watch the store for me, will you? I've got to go in back and pack some ice cream to be sent out. Sure. Mary Lou! Mary Lou! Guess I'd better get it myself. Mary Lou's ice cream parlor. Can I talk with Mary Lou? And she went in back. I'll get her for you. Just a minute. Thank you. I tell you, it's getting too risky. That diamond's a private detective. Yeah, he came in the bar and started to rough up Walker. Well, that stupid Walker should have been more careful about passing out that money. What if Diamond catches him and makes him talk? He caught up. <laughs> but he didn't make Walker talk. What do you mean? I took care of Walker. I got a good shot at him from the alley. Well, maybe it's better like that. But look, if we don't... Hello? Yes? Mary Lou isn't here. Get off the line. What? What? Yeah, get off! Get me the 5th Precinct Police Station. It's a matter of life and death. I'll connect you. Oh, golly, please hurry. I'm ringing. 5th Precinct. Is Mr. Richard Diamond around there? He said to call Lieutenant Levinson. Oh, Diamond isn't here. Now, that is a lieutenant. You know where I can reach them? Yeah, but that's about set all. Who's this? I'm a friend of Mr. Diamond's. I'm in an ice cream parlor. Ice cream parlor? 
Look, son. No, uh, no. I just heard someone say that they'd killed a man named Walker. And I think I know who's behind the counterfeit ring. What's the address? It's... Uh, oh, oh. Hello. Mm. Hello, kid. Mm. What's wrong? Mm. Hello. <coughs> Lucky we came out this way. I wonder how he heard us. He walked back and opened the door. What are we going to do with him? Well, we'll tie him up and gag him. There's a closet in the back, and we can put him in there until he's safe to take him out. But he's making too much trouble the way he is. Okay. I can get him back there. You better go on over to the bar in case someone shows up. All right. Later tonight, I'll take the kid down to the river and teach him how hard it is to swim when he's dead. Listen here, young fella. If you're back here for trouble... Dad, I'm back for a lot of trouble, and I think you're going to help me out. You'd better leave, Sonny, or I'll call the law. Why don't you? What do you want? I want to know how long you've been back in the counterfeit racket. Now, look, Sonny, I've been going straight for a long time. You know something, Dad? I don't think so. Let's get down to the station and talk about it. You got a warrant, Shamus? I got a nasty disposition. You want me to show you? No. You want a gun, Dad? Why... What difference does it make? I'm going to look at it. A guy named Walker got dead from a gun. Now, let's let, let's see it. Sonny. Uh, what is it? I can't show it to you. Yeah, why not? Because I got it under the bar, pointed right at your belly. If I drag it out, it might scare the customers. Oh, it's like that, huh? It sure is. You see that door there in the back? I know. Uh, that's a good boy. You just keep walking along your side of the bar and don't try anything. I just had my floor scrubbed. It'd be a shame to spill you all over. Okay. Open the door. Go on now. Up the alley. You shoot Walker? I might have. Oh, well, you got your printing presses. You're just full of questions, aren't you, Sonny? Okay. Stop here. Behind the ice cream parlor, huh? Well, well, well. Mary! Uh, make mine hot fudge with the nuts. Mary! For just a minute. Say, hey, what's the idea? I thought you... Oh. Uh, good afternoon. I'm selling a new brand of Indian nuts. Great for banana splits. What's the shamus doing here? He's too smart. I gotta cut off his education. Are you crazy? This guy's got friends. That kid was calling the 5th Precinct, remember? Kid? Yeah, your, your little news hound. What did you do with him? He's all right until tonight. We got him locked up. Dad, I think I'll make you eat that thirty-eight. I don't think so. No difference if I kill you right here. Oh, hold it, Dad. We can't have a gun going off back here. Even if we could hide the shamus, they'd find the presses. Oh, so that's it. Those ice cream machines, the cover-up. Ain't he smart? What do you do? Ship the stuff out in ice cream cartons? What's with you? You want a tour of inspection? Come on, now, take it easy. He won't be smart for long. Well, how are you going to do it? We're going to take a walk, aren't we, Shamus? Oh, I have the most horrible instep. I'll never make it without skates or something. You'll make it. Come on, the car's around front. Hi. Hey, what's happening on the street? Oh, Dad. Yeah, no, no, it's only some drunk come out of the bar the wrong way. Funny, I didn't see him in there. Oh, this is very confusing. If this is a 53rd Street... Somebody's stolen some buildings. Oh, hi. Hello. Now, take it easy, Shamus. I'm putting the gun in my pocket, but it's still right in line with your belt. I'm going back inside. No, no, no. Play it straight. Just like we were talking. Well, you're pretty unsociable, to say the least. What's the matter? Can't you even say hello? I'm lost. Uh, sure, sure. You're you're in an alley. The entrance is right out there. Oh, yeah? Oh, would you mind showing me... I seem to be a little confused. Now, look, it, it's right up there. Just keep going. Hey, where'd you go? Oh, no. Oh, there you are, Lieutenant. Lieutenant. Get the cop. Look out, Walt. Get the girl, Walt. Come on, Dad. Give me that gun. Let go of me. Let me go, you lousy copper. You got him, Rick? Come on, play. Get the me. There. Now you will. Just take it easy, lady. Hey, what's going on? Otis. Yeah? Go out and start walking around the block. Huh? You hear me? Go on. Okay, but I don't get it. What do you want me to walk around the block for? I want you to get used to it, because that's what you're going to be doing for the rest of your time on the force. Uh... In Flatbush. Flatbush? Yes. <laughs> Gee, Mr. 
Mr. Diamond. Thanks for the dinner invitation, but where are we going? Well, I'm going to introduce you to Miguel. She's a redhead, Jeff, so no cracks about my office research. Oh, sure. But don't you think you should have called her first? How do you know she's got enough dinner? Jeff, this girl's got more steaks in her deep freezer than a bullfight arena sees in a year. Here we are. Yes? Oh, good evening, Mr. Diamond. Good evening, Francis. Uh, this is Jeff, Francis. He's going to have dinner with us. Hi. Oh, hi. Uh, come right in. Uh, Miss Asher's in the study, Mr. Diamond. Thank you, Francis. Uh, Mr. Diamond. Yes? You know the various items that you've left with me for safekeeping? Oh, uh, 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 look, Francis, I promise I'll get them out of hock as soon as I get a paying client. Oh, no, no, it's not that, sir. I didn't really want to hold them as security in the first place. But as long as you insisted in such a fine collection, I'd like to show them to, well, to my girl, sir. Why, sure, Francis. I didn't know you had a girl. <laughs> oh, yes, sir. She's the upstairs maid in the apartment below us. Oh. I'm afraid I told her a wee fib to get acquainted, as it were. She thinks I'm an undercover agent, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to prove it. Wow. Well, my gun and the badge should do the trick. And uh, if it doesn't work, just get under a cover. <laughs> oh, my George, that was the real... <laughs> yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, come on, Jeff. We're not appreciated. Rick. Oh, hello. Hello. Hello, and this is Jeff, the boy who's helping me send Dad Foster and company back to prison. Jeff, this is Helen Asher. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Jeff. They had him locked up in the closet for a couple of hours, and he looked kind of hungry when he got him out. Uh, how about it, honey? You think you can grind up another cow? Oh, well, there's plenty for Jeff and me, but you've got to make up for three things. Three things? Yes. First of all, you haven't called me in two days. Second, you're half hour late for dinner. And third, well, I'll tell you later. Uh, I'll leave the room if you want me to. No, no, Jeff. You stay right here. You're going to literally see a man sing for his supper. Helen. All right. Come on, Jeff. We'll go dig into those nice, fat, juicy steaks. Oh, boy. Steaks? Hey, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. My taste buds just started whipping each other. My vibrato may sound like a machine gun, but I'll do it. I thought you were kidding. Is he really going to sing, Miss Asher? No, I'm not going to sing Miss Asher. <laughs> I'm going to do a little song I used to sing with hip boots and a gondola. Oh. You're breaking my heart cause you're leaving You've fallen for somebody new It isn't too easy believing You'd leave after all we've been through It's breaking my heart to remember the dreams we depended upon You're leaving a slow, dying ember I'll miss you, my love, when you're gone I wish you joy, though teardrops burn But if someday should want to return, please hurry back, and we'll make a new start. Till then, you're breaking my Mr. Diamond, did you really sing in a gondola with hip boots on? Yeah, that's right, Jeff. Well, I know you don't need the hip boots anymore. Will you loan them to me? What for? I want to wait out of here. <laughs> well, get him. With that, you get two desserts. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Tommy Bernard, Sammy Hill, Lou Krugman, and Polly Bear. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. 
Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Saturday night brings you some of the week's best radio entertainment when you tune for the stars on NBC. Stay tuned to NBC every Saturday evening for a great lineup of programs, including Hollywood Star Theater, Ralph Edwards' Truth or Consequences, Your Hit Parade, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, The Judy Canova Show, and Grand Ole Opry. All the best on NBC. Stay tuned now for Victor Mature and Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. And now, Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Come in. Settle down and listen. Well, we're about to tell you a very important story. Have you ever looked at your children and wondered, what in the world are they thinking? What goes on in those tiny minds? You don't know, do you? Admit it, you haven't the faintest idea. Yet, you were once a child. So why don't you know? I'll tell you why. You have forgotten. And try as you will, you simply cannot remember what it was like to be a child. I don't know the reason for this, but perhaps it's because being a child is not always the happy thing we think it is. Didn't you mind being shut up in that dark room, Bobby? All by yourself for such a long time? Was it a long time? Three weeks. Is that a long time? What did you do, Bobby, all alone there? Oh... Listen to the silence. Talk to the dark. Our mystery drama, The Secret Life of Bobby Deland, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Michael Tolan. We said earlier that this story is an important one. Not because our small hero is an important figure. A boy of ten? How much time has he had to achieve importance in our world? No, we call our story important because it is our attempt to explore the inner life of one small child. An attempt which we admit may be awkward and incomplete because we have grown up and in growing up, grown stupid. All right now, children. Children. Playtime's over. Everybody inside. Go with Miss Hamill and Mr. Goss. <laughs> now we can talk better. Well, Mr. Collins, have you finally made up your mind about adoption? I, uh, I don't know that we want to go that far, Mrs. Appleton. Not, not just yet. You see, I thought if my wife and I could take one of the children home for a, a month, two months, see how it worked out. You see, our, our son died in an automobile accident a year ago. And Mrs. Carlin hasn't been really right since. Depressed, migraine, headaches, spends a good deal of time in bed. And I thought if there were a boy around the house, it might help her. Help me, too. You've been here several times, I... You've met all our children. There's there's one. I believe his name is Bobby. About ten years old. Bobby Deland? That's the one. I, I looked for him today when I was walking around the playground. I didn't see him. He's he's still here, isn't he? Bobby's still here. Oh, thank goodness. 
He's such an unusual boy. I'm surprised he wasn't asked for before this. He was. Uh, last year. It didn't work out. Can you tell me why? I can do better than that. I have a tape of the interview with the lady who tried to give him a home. It's a practice here to make tapes of the conversations with prospective parents. It saves confusion, possible embarrassment later, uh, if there's trouble. Oh, you're being taped right this minute, Mr. Carlin. I hope you don't mind. No, no, not at all. Now, look, I, I won't play it all for you, just the part that concerns us now. Everything we could think of to make Bobby happy, Mrs. Appleton. He seemed happy. There wasn't any way we could guess that he didn't like it with us. And, and then, then to wake up one morning and, and, and he was gone. Simply gone. I'm sure you did everything you could. Oh, oh we did. And he seemed to like us. Of course, he's naturally so sweet, so good. Except for the stealing. The what? Stealing? Oh, uh, look, I, I shouldn't call it stealing. Uh, we'd find little things missing. Little nothings. Once it was a frying pan. A, a wooden spoon one time. Oh, we found them later. Uh, in his room. Once he took the belt from one of my dresses. A leather belt. Not that I cared. That's enough of that. But I should tell you, Bobby's been guilty of petty pilferage like that here at the orphanage. A hairbrush belonging to one of the teachers. And... Where where did he go when he ran away? Well, the police found him that same night, wandering along a country road. There was a full moon. They had no trouble. And when the woman came to pick him up, he wouldn't talk to her. Wouldn't even see her. Didn't seem to hold anything against her. He just said, it was no use. No use? It's what he always says. Before? Several times during the last couple of years... Look, I'm telling you all this to let you know that if you take Bobby into your home, you're not getting the, well, the usual child. No child is the usual child, Mrs. Appleton. Well, shall we go and have a talk with him, see how he feels about all this? By all means. Oh. Oh, I should tell you, Bobby's in confinement. You don't mean solitary He's confined to one room without lights or windows. I know that sounds severe, but... It does. We've tried everything else. Even corporal punishment, though that's prohibited by law. It didn't do any good. He doesn't seem to feel it. How long has he been confined? Oh, nearly three weeks now. Mrs. Appleton, 24 days is supposed to be the limit before the victim goes mad. That's been established in prisons with grown men. Bobby's a boy. A most unusual boy. Shall we go talk to him? Please. This way. Uh, Mrs. Appleton, may I ask you, what is Bobby being punished for? What did he do? Oh, didn't I tell you? He ran away from the orphanage. That's the only thing he ever needs to be punished for, running away. Mrs. Appleton, when Bobby ran away from here, was it at night? Middle of the night, as near as we could tell. Oh, here we are. Was there a full moon that night? I don't recall. Does it matter? It might. Oh, here's my key. Bobby? It's Mrs. Appleton, Bobby. Yes, Mrs. Appleton. He's all right. You can come out now, Bobby. The door's open. Can you see? Yes, I can see, Mrs. Appleton. Does the light bother your eyes? Not very much. You remember Mr. Carlin, Bobby. It's nice to see you. I'm very well, Bobby. Thank you. I'm going back to the office now, and you two can have a nice talk. Thank you. You can join me there later, Mr. Carlin. Well, Bobby, I'm... I'm pleased you remember me. Didn't you mind being shut up in that dark room all by yourself for such a long time? Was it a long time? Three weeks. Is that a long time? What did you do all alone in there? Oh, I listened to the silence. 
talk to the dark. I see. Would you like to come and stay with me and my wife for a while? See if you like it. We have a big house. A very big house? <laughs> well, pretty big. With servants? We have servants, yes. And beautiful gardens and a big green lawn. Well, does it matter if it's a big house with a lawn? A big white house. And servants, does that matter? I don't know. I thought it did. I could sort of see it. Well, what do you say? Would you like to visit with us for a while? I think I would. There's a good school nearby if you'd like to go. I'm tired of memorizing things. Well, whatever you say. Now, why don't you go pack some clothes, and I'll go see Mrs. Appleton in her office and make the arrangements. Come in. Mrs. Appleton, that's a remarkable child. Oh, uh, close the door, will you, Mr. Carlin? Oh, yes. You've persuaded him? I'm convinced the reason Bobby can endure, even enjoy three weeks of confinement, is because he's able to hypnotize himself. And not only hypnotize himself, but put himself into a deep trance. Almost anyone can be hypnotized, but only one in 20 can hypnotize himself. And I've never heard of anyone who could put himself into a deep trance state. Well, supposing he can, what's the advantage of it? Why, it means that he can reach his unconscious mind. And perhaps unite it with his consciousness. A terribly difficult thing to do. And to do it alone, without any outside help. I, I never thought it was possible. Well, supposing he can do whatever it is you say he can. What of it? Mrs. Appleton, do you know what powers are locked in the unconscious? What forces, what instinctive knowledge, primitive memories? I've always thought of the subconscious as an untidy mass of very unpleasant emotions. It is untidy. But we've been taught the emotions are unpleasant. Because they lack morality and purpose. As indeed they do. Their only purpose being to express themselves. Most of us manage to live without expressing ourselves, Mr. Cole. Yes, but supposing you find one solitary human being who refuses to live that way. You mean Bobby. Well, Mr. Collin, if he's willing to go with you and you want him, I've checked you out and everything's in order. Oh, one thing, Mr. Collin, I hope you're not going to talk to Bobby about his mother. Why not? Why shouldn't he talk about his mother if he wants to? Well, it's not really healthy in his case. He makes up outrageous stories about her. Such as what? Oh, that she was fantastically beautiful. That she married into royalty, a, a prince or a duke. Oh, children often fantasize that way. Last year he told us that she was a movie star, imagine. <laughs> Who was she really? Oh, just a poor, pathetic woman on relief. I found that out from our records. I wasn't here when she brought him. But that was six years ago. He was only four. Is our unpleasant? The records say she simply couldn't afford to keep him. She's never been back? Never been back. Never called to see how he was getting along. Never sent him a present or even written him a note. Come in. Oh, Bobby. All packed to go home with Mr. Carlin? He has a big white house, Mrs. Appleton, with a big lawn and flowers and lots of servants. Haven't you, Mr. Carlin? Yes. I'm sorry about your wife. What? What about my wife? I'm sorry she's so unhappy. Didn't you tell me she's unhappy? And sick sometimes? I... I don't think I did. You must have. Or how would I know? Do we really know only what we've been told? Or what we've read? Or heard? I hate to believe that, because then each of us is only a jumbled mass of information. And very often, we go about spreading this jumbled information for others to pick up and repeat. No wonder the world is in such a turmoil, if all we know is what we've been told by people who only know what they've been told, who only know what... Oh, no, 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 there must be more. We can't go on this way. However... Having no solution at hand, I shall return shortly with Act Two. When 
one adopts a boy ten years old, it is not only the ten-year-old boy who has been taken into the new home. It is also the boy who was once nine, once eight, once seven, and so on. Clear back to the day an infant was born. And these early years are unknown, utterly unknown to the new parents. Just how unknown they are to the child is the subject of our story. We're almost there, Bobby. I know. You know? Well, I figured. You mean you felt it, that we were almost there? Something like that, I guess. Mental telepathy, maybe? What's that? Well, thought transference. I was thinking to myself, we're almost home, and the thought transferred itself to your mind. Is that what happened? I wasn't thinking about anything at all. It's when we're not thinking about anything at all that the thoughts of other people enter our minds. I'd like to think about that. Well? I think that's very true, what you said, Mr. Carlin. It's when you're not thinking about anything at all. That's when the good things happen. What good things, Bobby? Oh, all the good things. Mr. Carlin, you should have turned right there. No, no, that's Birch Tree Road. We live on a street... You should have turned there. Go back. Now, Bobby, Bobby, take it easy. Go back. Bobby, I know where I live and I know how to get there. Your telepathy wasn't in good working order that time. Now, here is where we turn. To the left. We go about a quarter of a mile up this road, and then we're there. It's pretty. Is it what you expected? Kind of. It smells nice. You smell something? It smells sweet. Very, very sweet. I don't smell anything. Oh, we're coming to the privet hedge. That's the sweet smell. (laughs) Imagine you picking it up way back there. Now we're coming to the house. It is white. I told you it was. And there's a lawn in front with flowers. I told you there would be. Well, here we are. But it's not a very big house. It has 16 rooms. And where are all the servants? Did you sleep well in your new room, Bobby? Yes, I did. It's a very nice room. Nicer than the orphanage? That was nice. But this is nicer. This morning, Bobby, I I want to take you to meet my wife. Her name is Anita, if you want to call her that. I think I should tell you she gets migraine headaches from time to time. I know. I knew she was sick sometimes. I think she's sick now. (laughs) No, she's not. I saw her this morning. She was fine. Come on, let's go upstairs. Okay. It's not very nice to be sick like that, is it? No, it certainly is not. I used to have asthma. That was terrible. What did you used to do about it? Oh, I made it stop. Made it stop? Just like that? Sort of. It was a long time ago. Here we are. Anita, may we come in, dear? Come on. Anita, this this is Bobby. Go away, please. She's sick. My dear, is it another migraine? Please. I can't... Bobby. Bobby, we'd better come back later. She's sick. You'll meet her tomorrow. Come on. Mrs. Carlin, I'm here. I know how much it hurts, but I want you to know I'm here. And I want it to stop hurting. Please. Try to look at me, Mrs. Carlin. Bobby, don't. When, when she's like this, it's no use. I want you to give me your headache, Mrs. Carlin. Uh-huh. I want you to give it to me. Look, Mrs. Carlin. Anita, look. Give me your headache. I want to take it away from you. I'm going to take it away from you. Do you hear me? I'm going to take it. You're going to give it to me. I'm going to take it. Yes, I'm taking it. You're giving it to me. You're giving me your headache, aren't you? Yes, you are. I know you are. Please give it to me. All of it. Yes. Oh, please. Oh. Oh, yes. 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 
It's, it's, it's gone. All gone. Bobby? Bobby, where are you going? It, it, it's all right. All right. Bobby? I, I couldn't help Mr. Carlin. I, I had to throw up. Well, that, that's all right, son. That's all right. How is Mrs. Carlin? She says her headache is gone. Yes. Of course it's gone. She gave it to me. And how are you? I think I'm going to be all right pretty soon. I never knew before what a migraine headache was like. Now I know. Mrs. Appleton speaking. This is George Carlin, Mrs. Appleton. I've got great news for you. Everything's working out? Three weeks now and everything's going wonderfully. He seems very happy here, and heaven knows he's made us happy. My wife hasn't had another headache since that time I wrote you about when Bobby cured her. You think he really did? Well, he did something to Mrs. Carlin. Perhaps he hypnotized her, I don't know. But her headache stopped. I was there. I saw it happen. Well, I have to take your word for it, Mr. Carlin. Uh, has he stolen anything that you know of? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Well, you'd better check. There's a belt of mine missing, but I'm sure I must have mislaid it. Look in his room. No, I wouldn't dream of doing that. The boy is happy here, and we're happy having him here. Has he talked about his mother? No, he hasn't mentioned her. Well, my advice is to keep it that way. I don't think I agree with that, Mrs. Appleton. You know what I told you. All you'll get from him is a lot of wild fantasy. At this point, I feel I'd like to hear anything Bobby cares to tell me. Don't want to take my advice. No, it's not that, Mrs. Appleton. It's that for the time being, I'd sort of like to follow my own instincts. You understand? I suppose so. I'll keep in touch with you. Please do, and good luck to you. Thank you. Oh, Bobby, I, I didn't hear you come in. Uh, that was Mrs. Appleton I was talking to on the phone. How is she? She's fine. Do you miss her? Not too much. Bobby, you know that black tooled leather belt of mine? Yes, I know that belt. I can't find it. Have you seen it? It's in my room. Well, did I leave it there, do you think? I don't know. I don't think so. By any chance, Bobby, did you take it out of my room? I think... I guess I did. I'm pretty sure I did. You want me to go get it? Oh, you can have it if you really want it. Only I'd rather you'd ask me instead of just taking it. But I don't want it. No? It's too big for me. Why would I want it? I, I don't know. I just saw it, and it reminded me of something. Reminded you of what? I was going to give it back to you. I didn't mean to keep it. I didn't even want it. All right, all right now. It's all right. Just put it back in my room when you get a chance, will you? I'll put it right back now. Now in the morning will be all right. Bobby... Do you ever feel you want to talk to me about your mother? My mother? Do you remember her at all? I know you were only four when she left you at the orphanage. She was very, very beautiful. What else? I'm not supposed to talk about my mother. Well, don't you want to? Not now, Mr. Carlin. All right. But if you ever want to, I'm here, you know. I know. George? George? Hmm? Oh, what are you doing up? Can't you sleep? Not for hours. Oh, the moon is so bright, I don't wonder. No, it's not just the moon. I I was thinking about Bobby. Oh, funny. I was thinking about him, too. I talked to Mrs. Appleton this afternoon. She asked me, did Bobby ever talk about his mother? He never does. That's what I told her. And she said, fine, keep it that way. But I said I didn't agree, that I thought he should talk about whatever he felt like talking about. Oh, you're absolutely right. Bobby came into the room about that time, and I brought up the subject of his mother. And all he'd say was, she was very, very, very beautiful. That's all? I tried to get him to go on, but he just clammed up, said I'm not supposed to talk about her. Mrs. Appleton probably told him not to. She has a point in a way. 
She says Bobby makes up wild stories about his mother, whom he hasn't seen or even heard from in six years. You mean since he was four? That's right. But he tells people, or used to, that she had dozens of admirers, finally married some title gen, became a movie star. Oh, George. Our children often do that. Another thing, Mrs. Appleton asked me if Bobby had snitched anything. And I told her about my black-tooled leather belt. Then when Bobby came in, I asked him if he'd seen it. And right away, he said, yes, it was in his room. Really? I asked him if he'd taken it. And he said he guessed he must have. Did I want it back? It was too big for him anyway. Now, isn't that peculiar? You know, I told you the woman who took him last year said he snitched silly things. A frying pan, a wooden spoon, a belt off one of her dresses. Oh, I wonder if that's where our little frying pan disappeared to. They were asking me in the kitchen if I'd seen it. What, there's a frying pan missing? Heavens, George, we, we have about 12 frying pans of assorted sizes. Is there anything else missing? No, nothing else. Oh. Well, unless you want to say one of my shoes is missing. One of your shoes? Those high-heeled things. I, I've given up high heels, and I put those out to give away. And next time I looked, there was only one. Must have gotten thrown out. Goodness, it would take one shoe. Who would throw away one shoe? Oh, George. <laughs> Look, come on back to bed. Maybe you can get to sleep. Yeah, maybe. That damn moon wasn't so bright. Shines right across the bed. Why don't you pull the curtains? You know what? It's a full moon. Well, pull the curtains and, and come to bed. <sighs> Ugh. Can you see or do you want a light on? Oh, I can see. What was that? What was what? Did you hear a door close? What door? It sounded like downstairs. There he goes. Bobby? Yes, and there's a full moon. Oh, George. Like before. Call him back. Go after him, George. No. No, I don't think I'm going to do that. Well, for heaven's sakes, why not? You can't just let him go wandering around all by himself. No, I don't think he's going to be just wandering around. You think he's going someplace in particular? Yes. Where? I don't know. And I don't think he knows either. But someplace. As we are all going, someplace. We don't know where, and there is no one who knows to tell us where. Yet very deep in our minds, or our hearts, or our tormented souls, we know we are going someplace. We can't see ahead, and it does no good to look back. We can only trudge on down the road to someplace. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. full moon with which Act Two ended has been wiped out now by the exploratory colors of the rising sun. And steadily down a winding road trudges a small boy, ten years of age, steadily, purposefully, toward a destination he could not name were you to ask him. It is Bobby Dillon. The thin little boy's arms start to wave wildly as a truck approaches. What's up, kid? Could you give me a lift? How far are you going? I don't know exactly. Down the road away. Come on. Get in. Here, let me give you a hand. That's a pretty big step up. I can do it. What you doing out at this hour? It's hardly daylight. I have to go see somebody. You expect it? Uh, yes, I'm expected. I didn't say when, though. Going to see your folks? My mother. Oh, your mother. Then I guess you know where she's at. Somewhere along this road. No number? No name? Like on a mailbox? I'll know when we get there. You've been there before, I guess. It's a great big white house with a big green lawn and flowers. I think I know the place you mean. And lots and lots of servants. 
Yeah. There it is. There it is. See? Right there. Stop. I want to get out. Stop the truck. I'll stop. And it don't jump. Hold on. I'm stopping. Now, wait a second, kid. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Hey, you had not order to go in there. Hey, you know what you're doing? You had not order to... Want to sit here, Baroness, under this tree? That all right? I'll fetch you some coffee, and I'll be right back. Excuse me, are you my mother's maid? <laughs> yes, yes, I am. Will you tell her I've come to see her, please? If she, if she feels well enough to see me. What's your name? Bobby Deland. Would you tell my mother? And how did you get in here, Bobby? Somebody dropped me off. Before. I'd been waiting till I saw all the servants come out of the house. Now, please, I'd like to see my mother. You mean that lady over there? Yes, my mother. Oh, I'm afraid that's not your mother, dear. That's the Baroness Horta. Well, her name before was Mrs. Dillon. Please tell her I want to see her. Oh, never mind. I'll... Oh, hold on now. Now, just a minute. Let go. Let me Not go. Not so fast, young man. Let go of me. Miss Copeland, what's going on? Oh, it's this boy. He wandered in here. He wants to talk to the Baroness. He's her son, he says. Well, then let him. Should I, Doctor? Why not? He may succeed where we failed. Go ahead, my boy. Thank you. Hello, Mother. I'm here. <laughs> Uh, hello, Mrs. Appleton. George Carlin. I wanted to tell you Bobby's been found. Thank you for not calling the police. Well, you know, I told you I saw him leave the house. I simply followed him in my car. It wasn't hard, so don't worry. What's that? Well, and, uh, I don't think that's necessary, but if you want to... Look, can't you tell me over the phone? Well, all right. No, no, I'm not at home. I'm at the place where I found Bobby. It's on Birch Tree Road, not too far from where I live. A big white house, very big, big lawn out in front. It's the Wesley Sanitarium. You know it? Well, I'm with Dr. Wesley right now. All right, we'll expect you. Mrs. Appleton's coming over, if that's all right, Doctor. Perfectly all right. She wants to tell me something, show me something. I, I don't know what. Tell me, Mr. Carlin... What made you think Bobby might come here? It was just a guess. But when I brought him home from the orphanage, he wanted to turn onto Birch Tree Road. Did he say why? He thought it was the road my house is on. Not that it had ever been at my house. All he knew about my house was that it was big and white, had a lawn with flowers and servants. He knew that because I told him. And I told him because he specifically asked. It seemed important to him, did it? Very. I was puzzled at that because he's not a snobbish sort of boy. Quite the contrary. That insistence on a lot of servants. Now I begin to understand. Your sanitarium does have a lot of servants. As well as a lawn and flowers. But the boy's never seen the sanitarium, has he? He hasn't even seen his mother since the age of four. Then how would he know? I suppose that when you think about dream about a certain person for such a long time and fantasize about that person the way he did about his mother. What sort of fantasies? Oh, wild ones. That she was much admired, much sought after, that she married into royalty, became a movie oh, star. Oh, no, hold on there. She did marry into royalty. You don't mean she's really a baroness? Yes, indeed. The Baroness Hortha. Well, I thought that baroness stuff was... You know, part of her dementia. The Baron brought her here. The Baron pays her bills. He's not very high up in the royal lists, but he's a Baron, nevertheless. The boy couldn't have known that. No more than he could have known Birch Tree Road. Now, about her becoming a movie star, 
the Baron told us that she made a motion picture a few years ago. Uh, actually, that's where he met her. He put up the money. She starred in it. Well, that's impossible, isn't it? Someone would, would have known, seen the picture, recognized her. I don't know who saw the picture, Mr. Carlin. It was a pornographic film. No. The Baron has made a good bit of money on pornographic films, I'm told. She made the film? Starred in it. She married the Baron? He's devoted to her. Well, then what happened? Oh, about a year ago, she became uh, uh, severely depressed. It, it went further into melancholia. Finally, she became very nearly catatonic, and he brought her here. She won't talk to him when he comes to see her. As she's never spoken to any of us. It was about a year ago, as I understand it, that Bobby began to talk about a big white house with a lawn and gardens and a lot of servants. Could he have known that she'd been brought here? To a place he'd never seen, didn't even know existed? It's a rare person who has a faculty uh, to sense what is going on. But if there is a great affinity between two people, I suppose a telepathic communication is... Uh, well, it's possible. Was there such an affinity? Between Bobby and his mother. After all, she abandoned him when he was four and never communicated with him after that. Communicated with him? I'd say by all the evidence, she communicated with him the whole time they were apart. She may not have known she was communicating, but her son was, on the face of it, so sensitively attuned to her and her existence, he could pick up waves that emanated from her that she knew nothing about. Uh, come in. Dr. Wesley, I hope I did the right thing. Oh, what's that? Well, I left the little boy with the Baroness. Is that all right? I think so. The Baroness has never shown the slightest sign of being violent. Uh, quite the contrary. Well, she does seem interested in him. I mean, she looks at him. Sounds like progress to me. So then I should just leave them together. Where are they? In her room. I'd say leave them together, but leave the door open. Yes, doctor. It will be astounding if she recognizes him, accepts him. It could mean she's on her way back. Dr. Wesley, this, this faculty you talk about, this rare ability to sense things, what is it? It doesn't have a name. Anyway, not a name that appears in scientific journals, but some clairvoyants have it, some mystics have it, some saints, I suppose. Many poets have it. It's an ability to reach far into oneself, to make contact. Do you know the poem called The Labyrinth? W.H. Auden wrote it. There are four lines from it that I quote to myself all the time. The center that I cannot find is known to my unconscious mind. I have no reason to despair because I am already there. Nice, isn't it? What, what does it mean? Well, come, come, Mr. Carlin. You know very well what it means. That if we only go deep enough into ourselves... We will find the center that will... that will stabilize us? Is that it? Give us peace? Is that it? The peace that passeth all understanding. Because I'm afraid understanding has very little to do with it. To think that a four-year-old boy could hold fast to the image of his mother through all those years. What else had he to hold fast to? And then find her by his own effort. Which only proves again, Mr. Carlin, we get what we want if we want it enough. Uh, uh, come in. Mrs. Appleton. I got here as soon as I could. Uh, Mrs. Appleton, Dr. Wesley. Please sit down, Mrs. Appleton. Oh, thank you, Doctor. Now, the boy's all right, Mrs. Appleton. You're not to worry. He's with his mother. His mother? He found her here, Mrs. Appleton. She's the reason for his running away all those times. <sighs> Mr. Collin, Dr. Wesley, I've brought something to show you. Something for you to hear. And what is that? Well, when you called me last night, Mr. Collin, I was so upset. Everything had been going so well, and then 
to have him run away again. Well, anyway, I couldn't get back to sleep. So I went down to the basement and I rummaged around among the old files and I found this. A, a tape? Yes. We keep tapes at the orphanage of all the interviews we have with prospective parents and with the people who leave their children for adoption. Well, this tape, this one goes back six years before I came to the orphanage. And it's a tape of... Oh, is it all right if I use this machine, Doctor? Oh, yes, go right ahead. All right. Now, I'll, I'll just play you the part towards the end. It's the tape they had running when Mrs. Dillon came to leave Bobby. You gotta take him or I'll, or I'll, I'll kill him. Look, I, I'm a cheap prostitute. I live in one room. I have to send the kid out to play in the street while I'm conducting my business. Now, how long can I go on telling him it's his Uncle Charlie I got up in my room? And another thing, I, I, I haven't got the greatest disposition in the world. And when I'm hungover, when my head hurts, I go crazy and, I, and I'm liable to, to hit him. And I, not just hit him. I'll hit him with anything that's handy. Yesterday, I hit him with my shoe. With a heel. My shoe. A spike heel this high. I mean, it doesn't have to be a shoe. I'll, I'll pick up anything and hit him with it. A, a frying pan, a, a, the belt off my dress, anything that's handy. <laughs> well, I wanted you to hear that, Mr. Carlin, because you said that Bobby had taken a belt at your house, and the woman last year said he took a frying pan. He took a shoe of my wife's. I think we'd better go see if everything's all right. Uh, come with me. He's right down the hall. How in the world did his mother come to be here? It's a long story, Mrs. Appleton. Well, how did he know she was here? That's an even longer story. Here we are. Is he in there? With her? Yes. Be quiet. I brought you some presents, Mother. Look. Here's a belt. And here's a frying pan. And here's a shoe. See, Mother? They're for you. With my love. <laughs> Mothers of the world, rejoice, for you are loved. Of course, in the human nature of things, you are simultaneously hated and by the same person. For no emotion as powerful as love can flourish unadulterated. Side by side with love goes hate. It is, you might say, a package deal. I'll be back shortly. Isn't our real life lived within ourselves? The posturing we do in full view of others, what is that but the antic behavior of a poor clown who needs to be applauded? The exterior life is really only incidental, yet we expend all our energy on it, while the interior life is left to its own devices, as though deeply ashamed of it. We wish to disown it. Our cast included Michael Tolan, Marion Seldes, Martha Greenhouse, Hetty Galen, and Gilbert Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Bye. Uh -huh.
Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents James Cagney and Pat O'Brien with Gloria Dixon in Angels with Dirty Faces. Lux presents Hollywood. It's melodrama we bring you tonight in the gripping chapters of Angels with Dirty Faces. The story of an obscure priest and a front-page lawbreaker, enacted by Pat O'Brien and James Cagney with Gloria Dixon. Our drama is an adaptation of the great screen success filmed by Warner Brothers. Our orchestra is under the direction of Louis Silvers. And as special guest, you'll hear the celebrated writer and authority on crime, Courtney Riley Cooper. And now, a word about our product. Have you ever heard a woman say this about another woman? She certainly isn't a bit pretty, and yet she's a... She's so attractive. Usually, it's very hard to say just what it is that makes one woman more attractive than another. So many things may be part of a woman's charm. Here's what Ginger Rogers says. Naturally, every woman wants romance, admiration. Yet many a woman who could be attractive loses out because she neglects daintiness. I always use Lux Toilet Soap as a bath soap, too. It makes a wonderful beauty bath. This nice soap has active lather that leaves skin fresh, delicately fragrant. Try it for your daily beauty bath. It leaves skin sweet, protects daintiness. And now, the producer of the Lux Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. (laughs) Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. You don't have to consult an atlas for the map of Ireland if either of tonight's stars happen to be handy. For in the honest faces of both James Cagney and William Joseph Patrick O'Brien are indelibly sketched the rugged contours of the Emerald Isle. There's a striking similarity, too, in the careers they've led. Both came to Hollywood from Broadway, both at about the same time. Both broke into big-time show business as chorus boys. Both can sing you a tune in the traditional tenor of the Irish. Or, if you prefer, both can play it for you on a piano. Both are stars at Warner Brothers Studio, through whose courtesy both are here tonight. And their most successful collaboration is tonight's drama, Angels with Dirty Faces. Pat O'Brien's training for our play started at the age of nine, when he attempted his first dramatic part and played an angel. Mr. Cagney's early years were spent in practically the same tough precincts that you'll hear about in Angels with Dirty Faces. Jimmy used to dive off docks for a swim in New York's East River, And the boy who taught him how was later signed up for an extended engagement at the big house. When our bantam star came to pictures, he required no instruction in fist swinging. The story is that between the ages of 11 and 17, Jimmy could never go to sleep at night unless he'd taken part during the day in at least one fight. Later, he used his right hand to play semi-professional baseball and hoped that someday it would hold the brush of a portrait painter, an ambition that has never been fulfilled. Pat O'Brien came to the footlights by way of Marquette University and the United States Navy. In New York, he shared a boarding house room with Spencer Tracy and the desperate responsibility of raising $5 a week for the rent. Off the screen, he's famous for his fund of anecdotes and his love of sports. Pat tonight plays Jerry Connolly. Mr. Cagney is Rocky Sullivan. And a very lovely young lady, Miss Gloria Dixon, is heard as Laurie. Her new starring role for Warner Brothers is in Waterfront. We ring up the curtain now, and the Lux Radio Theater presents Angels with Dirty Faces, starring James Cagney and Pat O'Brien with Gloria Dixon. A dead-end street in the slum district of a great American city. On the corner, weaving in and out of the maze of pushcarts, a newsboy calls the headlines of the afternoon edition. Further down the dark canyon of tenements stands a church. In the soft light streaming through the stained glass windows, Father Connolly leads the afternoon rehearsal of the boys' choir. Very good, boys. 
can go now. Next week at the same time. Hey, who do you think you're pushing? Well, I get you outside. I'll mobilize you. Me and no army. Yeah. Afternoon, Father. Well, son, what's troubling you? Oh, nothing much, Father. Only been bothering me about 15 years. Uh, what'd you ever do with those fountain pens to be snatching that freight car that night? What? Rocky. Rocky Sullivan, Rocky, you old... Hiya, Jerry. Why do you hear? What do you say? Oh, I'm fine. How are you, Rocky? All right. Don't let this paleness fool you. Well, same old place, huh? Fifteen years and it hasn't changed a bit. Remember old Father Boyle's vestry, Rocky? Remember it. He used to stand right where you are and ball a tar out of me. <laughs> well, I'm not going to ball you out. All I'm going to kick about is, why'd you stop writing to me? Oh, I'll be reasonable, Jerry. You know what happens to letters you write in prison. Everybody in the warden down to the screws reads them. And <laughs> what did I have to write about? Nothing happened while I was inside, and when I was outside, well, I figured you could always read the newspapers. It was always on the front page. Yes. Yes, I read all the newspapers, Rocky. Say, uh, Jerry, I, I always knew your, your mother wanted you to be ordained a priest, and I guess the only thing ever kept you back was me, but uh, how'd you finally come to do it? I'll give you the idea. Oh, I don't know, Rocky. I was just riding along on top of a bus one day, and passing St. Patrick's Cathedral, looking down. <laughs> it's not the idea, I guess. I got an idea on top of a bus once. Got me six years. <laughs> Come in. Say, Father, you're supposed to be down at the store. The fellas are all waiting for you. Oh, yes. Uh, run along. Tell them I'll be right over. Tell them to get started in the meantime. Okay, Father. Say, uh, what's your store racket, like, Jerry? You got the kids shilling over the parish? <laughs> no. No, it's a pet scheme of my own. I, I rented a store, Rocky. A kind of a recreation center for the kids. Oh, it's a sort of a kindergarten place, huh? No, no, it's more than that. For the older fellas, too. Oh. You know, it's helped tremendously to keep a lot of those kids from becoming... You mean, uh, becoming mugs like, uh, mugs like me, for instance? <laughs> uh, will you be staying here for some time, Rocky? Oh, I don't know. I don't know, Jerry. It depends on little business I got to take care of. Anyway, I got to find a room. Uh, why not around here, right in the parish? Well, why not? No place like home, is there? Uh, all right. Come on. I'll walk down the street with you. All right, good. Come on, throw the ball over here. I'll slap your ears down. Come on, fellas. Well, well, 15 years. Same old smell. I bet they ain't cleanest alley since I left it. Hey, Jerry, remember the time we swiped those pens? We beat it up that alley and right over the fence, huh? <laughs> yes. Yes, I got away. You got caught. <laughs> I never could run as fast as you. <laughs> You know, I've often wondered, Rocky, what if I'd been the boy who'd been caught that day? Well, you wasn't. No. No, I wasn't. Uh, uh, Rocky, why don't you drop in here at Mrs. Maggioni? She's got some furnished room. Mrs. Maggioni? I remember her. We took a lot of good lead pipe out of our basement. <laughs> well, I'll drop around tomorrow if you want me to. I swell. Oh, gee, Rocky, it's great to see you. Uh, you too. You too, Father. Well, <laughs> so long. So long, Jerry. Yes, what is it? I want to find out about it. Hey, you ain't Mrs. Maggioni. No, she's out. Just taking over till she gets back. What is it you want, please? I, uh, I want a room. Oh, well, there's one right down the hall this way. Oh, right, thanks. You know, there's something about your face that's kind of familiar. Nah, you've just been reading the funny papers. No, I mean that... Listen, sister, all I want is a room. Well, well, that's fine with me. Here it is. Mrs. Maggioni, you'll give it a good cleaning. That's all right. I've seen worse places. Yeah, I guess you have. Huh? How'd you happen to come to this house? Oh, you want references, huh? Well, an old friend of mine sent me, Jerry Conley. Father Jerry? Wait a minute, I get it now. You're, you're Rocky Sullivan. Yeah, that's me. You remember me? I'm Laurie Martin. Laurie Martin? That fresh kid with the long pigtails. Well, for crying out loud. Hiya, Lori. Yeah, remember the time about 15 years ago when you pulled my hat down over my eyes and I said I'd get even? No, I don't remember that. No, oh, well, I do. Hey, what the... Hey, come back here. <laughs> Cigarette, cigars, cigarettes. I'm sorry, sir. But you must dress in El Toro. These clothes will do. But only people in the evening dress are admitted, yeah, sir. What goes on here, Pierre? This gentleman wants this to... This gentleman wants to see Jim Fraser. Who? Jim Fraser, your boss, the guy who owns this joint. Where is he? Who are you? Rocky Sullivan. Mean anything to you? Yeah. 
from us. Hey, boss, Rocky Sullivan's here. Rocky Sullivan? Tell him I'm not in. Tell him... Hello, Fraser. Oh, Rocky. Well, uh, all right, Steve, get back to the job. Well, this, uh, this is a surprise, Rocky. Yeah. I uh, had the date on my calendar, but I thought you got out next month. Otherwise, I'd have been down to meet you. Oh, that's all right. Nice looking place you got here. Looks like you're in the money. Hey, you, uh, you know Mac Kiefer? I yeah, heard of him. Got the town tied up. Can buy it and sell it, huh? <laughs> well, we don't buy it. We just sell it. Uh, sit down. Thanks. Got that dough, Fraser? Dough? Yeah, dough. When I took the rap for you three years ago, you had a hundred grand of mine. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, it'll be a matter of only a few days. The end of the week, you don't have to worry about it, Rocky. I'm not worried about it. I'll take a few days getting it settled. I'll give you time to get that dough together and figure out where I come in. Where you come in? What do you mean? Which racket you want me to take care of, which section of town, and how much my cut is. Your cut? Yeah, we're partners, ain't we? You and me? That was the idea, wasn't it? I take the rap, you take the dough, use it to make connections for both of us. Wasn't that it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course, but, uh... You got things a little mixed up, Rocky. You see, Mac Kiefer's the boss. If you want a spot in the business, you got to take it up with him. Ah, no, no, I don't take it up with nobody but you, Fraser. I'm picking up with you where I left off. That was the idea, and we're going to stick to it. You understand? Well, of course, but... Uh... But what? Uh... Oh, come in, Mac. Hey. This is Mac Kiefer, Rocky. Mac, I want you to meet Rocky Sullivan. Well, I'm pleased to meet you, Sullivan. I know all about you. You're okay. When did you get out? This morning. Fine. What are you doing? Looking around. Well, maybe I might have a spot for you. Yeah, that's what we were just talking about. Uh, where are you stopping, Rocky? I got a room over in my old neighborhood on Dock Street, uh, number 24. Well, uh, I'll beat it now. I'll be up, say, uh, first thing Monday. Okay? Monday? Yeah, yeah, that'll be fine, Rocky. All right. Uh, good night, Mr. Keeper. Good night. Good night. Good night. Now, wait a minute. What is this, Fraser? That guy looking for a cut? He's looking for something, but it's okay. Don't worry. Hello. Get me Steve. Hey, what are you going to do? Leave it to me, will you? Yeah. But don't trip. Hello, Steve. Listen, that Sullivan guy just left. Put a couple of the boys on him. Tell them to watch their chance. Well, what else would I mean? We don't want that guy around. Come on, come on. Fork over that two cents. Ah, that wasn't no seven. Oh, it was so. Give him the two cents. Shut up, Johnny. Now, listen, Bim, give me that two cents or I'll take it out of your hide, see? Ah, uh, here. Yeah, you better. Hey. Hey, look who's coming. Hey, Johnny. Ain't that guy the new tenant upstairs? Yeah, that's him. Start playing with a ball, Bim. We'll give him the work. What work, Soapy? Ah, you dope. Bump into him. Keep him busy for a second. I'll frisk him. Oh, okay. Okay, Bim. Give him the rush. Hey, give me that ball. Hey, oh. out. <laughs> hey what's the matter with you? Don't go pushing out. Ah, you what? Speak. You what? Oh, <laughs> Tough guy, huh? Yeah. Hey, Bib, give me that ball. Try and get it. Yeah, come on, swing. Let's get that video. <laughs> hey. Hey, you kids. Why, what's the matter, Mr. Sullivan? Those kids just rolled me. Made me me wallet. <laughs> the great Mr. Sullivan. Well, that's too bad. Oh, no, it ain't. I'm going right over and get it back. Hey, hey, how much, Sophie? How much? 20, 25, 35. Gee, what a roll. There must be more than 100 bucks there. Yeah, 100 nothing. We're in a big dough now. What a whore. Six ways. Don't forget six ways. Don't worry. You'll get yours, crab face. All right, get him up. Hey, what is that? Huh? Hey, gee, it's him. Look out. Say your prayers, Muggs. Hey, mister, give us a break. I wasn't even there. Me neither. Shut up, you rat. Stop your squealing. All right, you chumps. <laughs> I'm not carrying no rod. But next time you try to hook a poke, make sure the guy doesn't know your hideout. Yeah. Yeah, wise guy. How did you know? Come here, sucker. You see that door? See those initials carved in the middle, R.S.? That's me. You... Say, wait a minute. Hey, you ain't Rocky Sullivan. Rocky Sullivan, can you imagine? He's trying to hook you. What a boner! Yeah, I guess the minute you saw us duck in the alley, you knew we were heading for the hideout. Yeah, and I took the shortcut. What'd I call you? Sophie. This squirt here is Bim. This is Swing. This palooka is hunky. I'm red. This is crab face. Crab face. Oh, sure. Glad to meet you, Rocky. Shut up, fellas. I want you to meet Rocky Sullivan. Hi, Hi Rocky. You okay. Hey, you took the room above us, didn't you? Number 24? Yeah, and you knew all the time I was living there? Sure, Johnny Maggioni told us. And you took a chance like that. Look, kids, never bother anybody who lives in your own neighborhood. You've got an awful lot to learn. Well, you ought to be able to dish it out. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Hey, who's that? Who is it? Hiya, Jerry. Hello, Rocky. What do you hear? What do you say? Oh, well, Laurie told me you were heading this way. Yeah. <laughs> you know these kids, Jerry? Sure, sure I do. Hello, Soapy. Hiya, Father. 
Harold didn't take you boys and Rocky along to get acquainted. Uh, hey, looks like you and a father are old pals, huh, Rocky? <laughs> take a look at that door again. Right next to my name's the initial J.C. That's Jerry Conley. No kidding. Hey, you mean uh-huh. father used to hang out down here with Rocky? Oh, we certainly did. Of course, just now we all hang out at the store, you know. <clears throat> I, uh... Kind of hoped you boys would be down at the store today for the basketball game. Maybe get into the block team. Nah, we're pretty busy today. What's the matter, Soapy? Why don't you want to get down to the game? Sounds like it ought to be good. Ah, for Pete's sake, what do we look like? Cream puffs or something? Playing around with a basketball all of a sudden. Well, I'll tell you what. Tell you what. I'll bet you a buck to a plug nickel none of you can get the ball past the other team, and I haven't even seen him. Go on, we run him into the yeah, ground. Yeah, we loiter him. Hey, will you come down, Rocky? Yeah, sure. Okay, I got a nickel, and we'll take you up on that bet, Rocky. You're on. Sure, yeah, we'll yeah. all split the winning. Hey, Fair wait enough. a minute, we ought each have a chance to practice up first. What? All right, boys. all right, boys, that's fine. The store's open, you can go over right now. Okay, fellas, let's yeah, go. We'll see you down, down there. Go ahead, kids. Go. See you there. <laughs> well, the young devils, I've worked on them for over a year, and I got nowhere. After ten minutes with you, I guess they'd jump through a hoop if you told them to. Maybe it's because I wear my collar frontwards. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, since you've been sponsoring my store, suppose we go over and see it. Now, I want to show you my library, too. Laurie takes care of that. Laurie, say, what's she doing down there? What is she, a sociable worker? <laughs> no, not exactly. But she's worked awfully hard helping me run things. You ready? Yeah, sure. Let's go. Come on. Well, game, ain't it? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I've been meaning to tell you, kid, that uh, yeah, you didn't turn out to be such a bad-looking dish. Thanks. We're a social worker. But, uh, you know, I can't figure out why some smart guy hasn't snatched you off. What do you mean? Some smart guy who's been in all the headlines? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Well, well, I gotta beat it. Uh, you gonna buy the house? Yeah. Okay, come on. Walk right. down with you. Hey, Rocky, watch out for that dame. She's a jinx. They put her last guy six feet under. What? Yeah, no kidding. They laid him out. Oh! Shut up. Come on, Lori. Say, well, what, what does Soapy mean by that crack about you? Uh, you and some guy. Oh, he, he meant Dan, my husband. He got it, huh? Yeah, four years ago. What happened? Well, what happens when a guy gets mixed up with a bunch of cheap eggs? You ought to know. What kind of guy was he? He was a swell guy. When we were first married. But he wanted more than he could get driving a cab. There was a lot of easy money to be picked up using a cab on some jobs, so... So we got in deeper. One night, they tried to shoot it out with a cop. What always happens, isn't it? Yeah, maybe, but people who don't know their business, small time is that... Hey. What's the matter? Who belongs to that blue sedan parked down the street? Where? Oh, oh I don't know. Nobody around here. Yeah, that's what I thought. Lori, is, is that old stone wall still up between these two houses? Well, yeah, but... Yeah. Now, good look, look. Make out this is your house and say goodnight to me and beat it in. Well, Rocky, Don't what... ask any questions. Do what I tell you. Good night, kids. See you tomorrow. Rocky, that car's moving. It's coming this way. Get going, will you? Get going. Beat it. Rocky! Who is it? All right, all right, you don't have to... Rocky, move back, Frazee. That's right, one phony move and I'm going to let you have it. Rocky, I... Yeah, I ain't dead yet. I knew all I could get behind. It was kind of handy. Lucky me, huh? I didn't have anything to do with it, Rocky. It's the truth, Rocky. I swear to heaven. I ought to give it to you now, Fraser. Rocky, you can't. You can't. Stop crawling. You got me hooked for a hundred grand. I'm going to get that for you. Oh, sure. Sure, of course. Eh? It's yours. I'll get it for you. All right, go ahead. Well, I, I haven't got it here. You, you don't think I keep that much around. I'll, I'll prove it to you, Rocky. I got a few thousand here in the safe. You're welcome to that. Now get you the rest. Shut up and get it open. Here. Here, you can see for yourself. Sit down. There, there isn't very much. Get over there and sit down. Hmm. Two grand. Yeah, yeah, that's all. And uh, those securities, I own some bonds. I don't fool with bonds. What's in this book? Well, that's that's just oh, a... Oh, can collect autographs, huh? Oh, some pretty important... Some very important people. Oh, that's nothing, oh. Rocky. It's it's just a few receipts, that's all. Yeah, quite a few. And from a couple of city officials who might be interested in know more about. Yeah, looks like you've been paying off the whole town. And you made them sign. That's how you held a club over them, huh, Fraser? Well, maybe I'd better hold a club. I'll keep this little book... Make things easier all the way around. Oh, now, listen, you... What's Keeper's number? His private number. Come on. Circle 0500. Now, look, I'll put you on, and you tell him I'll be up in the morning and that you want him to pay me that 100 grand. You got it? Yeah. All right, and one wrong crack, just one, and you won't have to do any more talking. Hello, Keeper. This is Rocky Sullivan. 
Yeah. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> now, I ain't no morgue. Wait a minute. Fraser wants to talk to you. Here. Hello, Mac. Rocky Sullivan will be at the El Toro in the morning. 11 o'clock. That'll give him time to get to the bank. At 11 o'clock. I want you to give him $100,000 on my account. Mac, you'll do it, won't you? You've got to. Okay, and, and no slip-ups, Mac. Tell him it's important. Important to you. It's important. Important to me. Well, you, you're all set. Not yet, I ain't. I'll be set when I get that dough. Well, you'll get it in the morning. Yeah? Well, just in case I don't, I want to know where I can reach you. I'll be here. No, no, I don't think so. I got a spot all picked out for you. A little apartment over on 8th Street. You're staying right there till I collect. Well, you can't do that. You... Get your hat, Fraser. I don't know whether you know it, but this is kidnapping, Rocky. No kidding. Get your hat. The curtain falls on the first act of Angels with Dirty Faces. Our stars, James Cagney and Pat O'Brien with Gloria Dixon, will be back shortly. Now in our brief intermission before Act Two. In the little white bungalow where the Smiths live, there's a family argument going on. For heaven's sake, Bobby, haven't you finished your practicing yet? No, I haven't. And what's more, I won't be finished for a whole half hour. You're just being mean and you know it. You know I'm expecting Bill and Guy. Yeah, and I know you're in love, and I know he's in love, and I know he's always hanging around, and I know... Oh, Bobby, please don't tease me. <laughs> oh, gee, sis, now, now don't cry. I'm sorry. Honest, I am. I'm glad I got a sister that's beautiful and, and the people fall in love with. Honest, I am. Yes, Bobby's secretly proud of his sister. She's one of those girls who knows it's important to make the most of her good looks. Important to take wise, regular care of her complexion. She uses Lux Toilet Soap because its active lather does a thorough job of cleansing. Carries away every trace of dust, dirt, stale cosmetics. It's foolish to risk cosmetic skin, dullness, little blemishes, and large pores. So use cosmetics all you like, but use Lux Toilet Soap regularly. It's worthwhile to care wisely for complexion beauty. Nine out of ten screen stars use Lux Toilet Soap. Here's Mr. DeMille. We continue Angels with Dirty Faces, starring James Cagney and Pat O'Brien with Gloria Dixon. With Frazier hidden away, Rocky Sullivan collected his ransom, $100,000 from Mac Kiefer. But then Kiefer acted quickly. After being assured that Frazier was free, he called in the police, and Rocky was picked up for kidnapping. Morning, paper, morning, paper. Rocky Sullivan arrested for kidnapping. Rocky Sullivan question on abduction charge. Paper, paper, paper. In Kiefer's office, Frazier, just returned from the apartment, sees the headlines for the first time. Two-gun Rocky captured, held under special guard, speedy trial assured. Mike, what is this? We're going to get that dough back, that's all. Mr. Rocky Sullivan goes up on a kidnapping charge. But we can't do that. Oh, no? I've already done it. But you don't understand. Sullivan picked me up at my home. He's got everything that was in my safe. The account books, receipts, names, addresses, everything. What's that? If he's prosecuted for the kidnapping, he'll talk. And he's got evidence to back it up. The whole town will be blown wide open. Are you dumb? All right. What are you waiting for? Get an order for his release and withdraw the charges. Go on, go on. Rocky Sullivan had been in the district only a few days before he kidnapped James Frazier, prominent attorney and playboy. $100,000 was the amount. 100 G. Hey, maybe that's what he gave you, Soapy. What? That envelope he gave you just before the cops grabbed him. Maybe that dough is in that envelope. Maybe it is, crap. Huh? Rocky, hey, 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 what is this? Rocky, what'd you do, break out? No, I walked out. Yeah, but it says in the papers... Never believe what you read in the papers, kid. The first you're in, then you're out. Boy, they certainly can't hold you, Rocky. How about the envelope, Soapy? Yeah, yeah, sure, I got it. All right, let's have it. Okay. Here you are, just like you give it to me, Rocky. Hey, is that the hundred grand of papers that you got? Listen, kids, you don't know no, not, nothing about this, see? No, nothing. no, I don't know nothing. And you know what happens to guys that talk? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, Rocky, you know me, you know all me. All right, all right, all right. Here you are, Soapy. Here's a little chunk of this dough. Cut it up any way you like. Gee, Rocky, thanks. All right, so long. I'll, uh, I'll see you in a couple of days, kid. Okay, okay Rocky, take good care of yourself. Here you go, Bim. Here's your cut. 
Fifty bucks, wow. Yeah, and the same for the rest of you. Fifty some millions. Boy, me old man never made that much in his whole life. Say, what are we going to do with it? Hey, this is burning a hole right through me here. I'm going to buy me a pair of chromium and play the brass. Ah, shut up. Come on, let's yeah, get out. Come on, let's get out. Get out. Where is it? Me, Jerry. Come on in. All right, Jerry. <laughs> what do you always you say? Well, certainly gave me a terrific scare, Rocky. Before I finished reading, you were arrested. There were new headlines and you were out. Ah, oh, there was nothing to it. Any guy with a record gets hauled in now and then, you know that. Just because you got nothing better to think of. <laughs> Looks like the kids are right. Said no jail could hold you. <laughs> Who? Soapy and his mob? No, no, no. Yeah. Some of the other kids down at the store. Uh, Soapy and his team were supposed to play that return game today. They haven't showed up. Rocky, you wouldn't happen to know where they might be, would you? Say, what am I, Jerry? That nice maid? No, Rocky, I didn't mean that. It... Well, I just thought they might be over here, sort of celebrating your release. After all, Rocky, it's almost a hero worship with them. Oh, nothing wrong with that, is there? Oh, I hope not, Rocky. Come in. Well, hello, Laurie. This is getting to be a big day. Yeah, well, I don't mind admitting I was pretty worried. You were? See, I ain't had nobody take that much interest in me in a long time. Well, Father, I finally located your precious angels for you. Well, where? Over at Murphy's pool room. What? Yeah, Soapy and his gang. Passing out beard all the kids in the neighborhood and throwing dollar bills around like confetti. I wonder where they got the money. I don't know. You You might ask them. Uh, well, I'll run along, Rocky. Mm-hmm. You coming, Laurie? No, Father. I want to talk to Rocky for a minute. All right, I'll see you later, will I, Laurie? Yeah. Rocky. Now, wait a minute. Look, kid, if you're as smart as I think you are, and we're going to get along, you're not going to ask too many questions. <laughs> Don't worry, I know all the rules. I know I'm backwards. All right, swell. Now, sit down a minute, will you? Maybe I had a couple of questions myself. <laughs> Rocky, you <laughs> crazy All right, sit guy. right down there, come on. <laughs> sit down. Come on, give me that chalk or I'll lamb your ears off. Hey, the eight ball in the corner. Oh, fuck you, don't. Yeah, buck I do. Look out, Bim. Wow. Oh, Come on, pay up, Crab. What in the Hey, hey, Soapy, where'd you guys get on the door? We wrote the Santa Claus. And when we woke up this morning, we found it in our shop. Cheese it, cheese it, Father Jerry. Hello, boys. Giving a party, Soapy? Uh, yeah, yeah, mm. sure. Everybody invited? Why don't you have it over at the store? Well, because we're having it here. Mm hmm. How about the game today? Aren't you boys going over and get it started? How about it, Soapy? Nine ball in the corners. Come here a minute. Look at me. Where'd you get all this money you've been spending? You didn't come by it honestly, I know that. Hasn't anything I've said to you in the past few years meant anything to you? Don't you believe me when I tell you that hanging around pool rooms, spending money you've gotten in some underhand, crooked way, trying to be big shots and tough guys, that it won't get you anywhere except eventually in jail... What do you say, boys? Come on along with me and cut out this stuff and let's get together at the store and figure the whole thing out. Look, Father, there's nothing to figure out. We're staying here. Well, all right. So long, boys. <laughs> What's the matter, Father? Couldn't you get the kids to heaven with you? <laughs> I don't often have to do this. Oh. That might help you along, mister. <laughs> That's, uh, that's what I want to talk to you about. Uh, look, you got the wrong slant, Lori. You've been listening to a lot of junk about crime don't pay. Oh, don't be a sucker. That stuff's for yaps and shoestrings, not for people like us. Look, kid, you got some glad rags, you know, something fancy, an evening gown, something like that. Well, get it now. We'll step out and do a little celebrating tonight, huh? What'll we be celebrating, Rock? Oh, this whole business. After all, <laughs> you don't get on the front page every day, do you? No. You don't get away from cops every day either, Rock. Yeah, uh, you're doing your smart. Come on, kid. Come on, Lori. It's uptown for us. Help you see those nice white lights. That's where we belong. You and me, Laurie. You and me. Come on. <laughs> 32 on the red. Oh, uh, Give the lady a stack of blues. Yes, sir. Hey, Rocky Sullivan. Yeah, what? My keeper says he'll see you now. Where is he? In the office with Fraser. Here you are, Laurie. Try your luck. I got some business to do. I'll be right back. Uh, Jim owed you the dough, and it all being a misunderstanding, we decided to call it square, Rocky. Square all around, with no hard feelings. You guys want to talk business? Yeah. All right, let's talk. Now look here, Rocky. Uh, what about those accounts you took from my safe? I figured out as a kind of insurance. You know, just in case you guys change your mind. Okay. 
Now, what do you want, Rocky? Nothing from you, Mac. Nothing. Just the original agreement between Fraser and myself. Fifty percent of his share and everything. Well? All right. And I'll take good care of those accounts. And I wouldn't try any more tricks, Fraser. Be kind of foolish. Because I'm giving those books some very special attention. Good night, boy. Having a good time, honey? Yeah, fine. You like this place? Why wouldn't I? Well, uh, I own a piece of it now. You... Rocky. Rocky, maybe you are smart enough. Look, baby, how'd you like to give up that tuber nickel job of yours and move in here? For doing what? Oh, be a sort of hostess in the gambling room. Walk around in a nifty dress. Play a little. Get the swanks playing. Give you a hundred a week in expenses. Rocky, it's... Well, it's... I know, I know. Jerry's been giving you an earful, but he don't need you down there anymore. I sent him ten grand this afternoon. He can start a real social joint now. You... Ten thousand dollars? Yeah, but, but don't tell him, will you? Don't tell him. I mean, don't tell him I sent it. Uh, I signed it a friend. Oh, Rocky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. Now, uh, what about the job? It's waiting for you. Okay, Rocky. Swell. Besides, uh, I need at least one friend in this place. Come in, Jerry. Hiya, kid. What do you, what do you say? They tell me he was outside. Say, what's the idea? Come up to try your luck? Mm-hmm. And I haven't got any money except this, and it isn't mine. Ten grand? Where'd you get a hold of all that? Where did you? Huh? Take it, Rocky, and thanks, but I'm afraid I can't accept it. Say, what's the matter? You silly or something? What's all this about? That ain't my money. I know that, Rocky. That's why I can't take it. Oh, now come down right, will you? You blow in here, flash that roll on me, you almost knock me over with it, and then tell me it's my dough and you don't want it. Rocky, you've got a great poker face. But don't forget, I've known that face for a long time. Oh, what's the use of pretending, Rock? You force Fraser to get you $100,000. Everybody knows it, Rocky. All right, so what? What's the difference where the joke came from? First of all, it's mine. Fraser owed it to me. Second, it's better you should have a chunk of it than him or me. All right, it's hot, but nobody's going to know that. Only you or me. That's just it, Rocky. Oh, don't be such an angel, will you? You want to build that center of yours so bad? Go on, get it started. I want to build it very badly, Rocky. But I don't want to build it on rotten foundations. Inside the center, my boys would be clean. But on the outside, they'd be surrounded by the same smelly corruption, crime, and criminals. Uh, yes, criminals, Rocky, yourself included. Criminals on all sides for my boys to look up to and worship, admire, and imitate. What earthly good is there for me to teach that honesty is the best policy when they see all around that dishonesty is the better policy? That the racketeer and gangster are respected and treated just like successful businessmen. Like a popular hero. You and the Frasers and Keepers and all those corrupt officials you've got in the palm of your hand, yes, and you've got my boys, too. And whatever I teach them, you show me up. You show them the easiest way, the quickest way to succeed is to do it with a gun or a racket. Well, I thought I could cure this thing from the bottom up, but I can't. So now I'm going to do it from the top down. Yeah? How? Rocky, I'm going to use your case as a crowbar to pry open and uncover this cesspool. I'm going to force the law, corrupt or not, to indict and prosecute and bring this mess into the clear light of day. There's going to be a lot of people step down, fellow. And if you're in the way, Rocky, I'll be sorry. But you're going to be stepped on just as hard. Hmm. All right by me, Jerry. You go to it. But you've got about as much chance of getting an indictment as I have of getting into the Bible Society. You'll find nobody gives a hoot about the whole thing. You'll hear them laughing at you. But go ahead, go to it. And if I'm in the way, why, do your stepping just as hard as you like. I will. Uh, Rocky, shall we, uh, shake hands? You know, just for being honest and for old times' sake. Sure. Good luck, Jerry. Happy hunting, kid. Station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a few moments, we'll hear Act Three of Angels with Dirty Faces, starring James Cagney and Pat O'Brien with Gloria Dixon. Now, it's intermission time. 
But before we introduce our guest of the evening, I want to ask the women in our audience a question. Have you ever really studied the lather of a complexion soap you use? Is it a rich, close-textured lather? Is it the kind of lather that will remove every bit of dust and dirt from your skin? Lovely skin is too important for you to risk choked pores because that's what brings the dullness and little blemishes that mean cosmetic skin. Follow the advice of lovely women everywhere and use the soap with active lather, Lux Toilet Soap. This gentle white soap removes dust and dirt thoroughly and helps keep your skin smooth and soft. Use cosmetics all you like, but use Lux Toilet Soap regularly. And now, our guest is presented by Mr. DeMille. On the subject of crime, Courtney Riley Cooper is probably the most widely read and most vigorous writer in America today. A close friend of J. Edgar Hoover, our nation's head G-man, he's also acquainted with people on the other side of the law and has known scores of the country's most notorious criminals. His latest book, Designs in Scarlet, is the result of a personal countrywide investigation into activities that tempt young people to go wrong, a condition for which we all must assume responsibility. When Mr. Cooper and I were writing on one of my pictures several years ago, we discussed many times the problems of youth and crime. He's a straight talker, and there's none better equipped than he to talk to us on that most vital problem, crime. We go to New York City and welcome Courtney Riley Cooper. I have happy memories of that association, Mr. DeMille. You know, I have just come up from my home in the Deep South, where they have a very descriptive saying. Down there, they believe that one of the worst things that can happen to a youngster is to be born with what they call a mouthful of want. If you could have only have walked through as many prison cells as I have, you would realize how many young people have possessed this mouthful of want and taken the wrong way to gain their ambitions. And the age limit in crime is steadily becoming lower. When I first became a police reporter a good many years ago, it was unusual to see a man go to prison who was less than 35 or 40 years of age. But today... Nearly 19% of all our crime is committed by youngsters. They steal half the automobiles and commit nearly a third of the robberies, holdups, burglaries, and larcenies. And they pay for it. In one prison, the hard-boiled guards no longer refer to the condemned cells as death row. They call them the kindergarten because so many young boys are there. <laughs> Incidentally, most of these young people are underfed and undernourished, either physically or mentally. They come from homes or neighborhoods where there's been a lack of guidance and proper discipline. And no matter whether they are from the biggest of cities or the smallest of towns, they are from a type of slums which should be eliminated. We must all engage the nation fight against ignorance, wrong thinking, lack of guidance, hero worship for the fellow who gets what he wants, no matter how he does it. Hundreds of thousands of youngsters are being fed on a wrong mental diet. Because of this, somewhere in America, tonight, right now, right this minute, boys and girls are committing major crimes at the rate of one every two minutes. And half these boys and girls are actually doomed to a life of habitual criminality to be sent to reformatories, prisons, and even to the death chamber. Somebody will stop this. And that somebody is every decent citizen in America. Clean living, honesty, integrity should be as great a basis of education as reading and writing. Hatred for criminals and disgust for crime should be as necessary a mental attitude as patriotism. This cannot happen as long as street corner gangs of dirty-faced angels worship the Rocky Sullivans of their block. Sure, it'd be great if we could only clean up our slums, the physical ones where poverty and hunger stalk, and the mental ones, which are even more dangerous. It would be wonderful if we could put in their place a love of honesty, of earnest endeavor, of eagerness to get ahead by decent, honorable means. To do this, we must all work together to achieve certain results. Now, for instance, I believe we should make murder a federal offense. We should take all police work out of politics. And we should dedicate ourselves to more good homes and fewer bewildered ones. But above all, we must stop glorifying crime and tell the truth about it. That it is cheap, cowardly, miserable. We can do these things, and we must do them. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. Keep up your fight, Mr. Cooper. Back now in Hollywood, we hear the third act of Angels with Dirty Faces, starring James Cagney and Pat O'Brien with Gloria Dixon.
Several weeks have passed, and Father Jerry has carried out his threat. With the aid of a public-spirited editor, he's placed the problem directly before the people an organized war against crime and corruption. Laurie is frightened. Desperately, she pleads with Rocky to give up his share in the rackets. You see what's happening, Rocky. This thing's going to grow. I know, I know. Jerry means it this time, and there's, there's no holding him back. What am I going to do about it? Come down to earth, Rocky. You can't go on kidding yourself forever. Look. Look, Rocky, you've got all the money you can spend in five years. Let's get out. What for? Well, Jerry's going on the radio tonight to demand a grand jury indictment. They'll have a warrant out before the week's over and you on the witness stand grilling you on this kidnapping business. You'll be nailed. <laughs> you know, baby, you're getting a lot of gray hairs over nothing at all. Oh, Rocky, snap out of it, will you? I'm afraid. And I don't want to lose you, Rocky. Don't worry, kid. You won't. <laughs> got to listen to me, Father Jerry. Why, they'd give you money to build a model center here near the church. Their influence to help you pull down the tenements and build decent apartments in their places. Oh, I know, Laurie. I know. Well, aren't those the things you want? Isn't that why you started all this trouble? No, Laurie, I don't want bribes. Well, then what do you want? What are you hounding him for? What are you trying to send him to prison for life for? You can't do that to Rocky. I won't let you. It isn't Rocky's fault, Father. He was just a kid who made a mistake and got sent up to a reform school. But he isn't bad. Not really bad. You know that. And, and no matter what he is now, or no matter whether he's right or wrong, we, we both love him, Father. Yes, Laurie, we love him. I've loved him since we were kids, six years old. We worked together, fought together. We stole together. Oh, I don't blame Rocky for what he is today. But for the grace of God, there walk I. Oh, I'd do anything in this world to help him. I'd give my life for him if it had helped. But it wouldn't, Laurie, it wouldn't. It'd still be these other boys. I don't want to see grow up like Rocky did. They have lives too, Laurie. I can't throw them away. I can't. <laughs> thousands are listening to this program tonight is proof to fling in the teeth of those cynics and skeptics that the public does care and does propose to do something about the appalling conditions I have tried to describe. You're going strong, Mac. No, we won't be tomorrow. We're going to take care of him tonight. Yeah, I'm talking to you, I have. He's not one of your mugs you can push around. Forget it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Tonight we have in our power to ask definitely incriminating questions of these officials and the power to demand satisfactory answers. What really is the truth in the case of the racketeer and gunman, Rocky Sullivan? Why did the police release him so suddenly with all the evidence they had piled up against him? Why did the prosecutor's office refuse to investigate? Tomorrow the new grand jury will meet, and tomorrow these questions must be answered. Turn it off, Fraser. He ain't gonna appear at no grand jury tomorrow shooting off his mouth. I say he gets it tonight. Not while I'm around. I'll wait, both of you. There's no sense in running ahead of ourselves. Maybe we don't have to go that far. Don't forget there's all kinds of grand juries and there's all kinds of ways to handle them. There's no sense going off the handle, Mac. Sure, sure, only I want to see some action. I don't care how we stop that guy, only I want him stopped. All right, fix it any way you like. But lay off the rough stuff, Mac. That's out. I'll, uh, I'll see you later. So long, Fraser. So long, Rocky. I hope you were stolen just now, Fraser. Because I meant what I said. Of course I was stalling. But look, you can't just bump this priest off. They won't stand for it. It's got to look like an accident. Yeah? I couldn't beat a murder rap now for any of us, but uh, I could beat it for a hit-and-run driver. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I get it. Call Steve and tell him. Yeah. Get your hand off that phone. Rocky! You're a smart lawyer, Fraser. Except you should have made sure I left. Get over there. Rocky, don't. Don't do it. I'll do anything, anything. Oh, uh, no, you won't. This is your last double cross, Rat. No. I told you it was hands off that priest at night. Don't shoot. Don't. And you wouldn't believe me. Drop that gun, Rocky. Make me drop it. <laughs> nice shooting, Keeper. You almost hit me. Oh. Oh. Steve. Steve. 
Steve. This is Kiefer. Get the cops. Sullivan. Rocky Sullivan. Oh. Yeah, take back. Thanks for the kills, too. Rocky Sullivan captured after gunplay. Take back. Rocky Be Sullivan captured a speedy trial, assured. Rocky Sullivan found guilty. Gangster guilty. 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 Gee, Sophie, do you think they'll point him in a chair? Nah, don't be a sap. They can't build a death house in a whole rock. You mean they'll blow and make a getaway? Just wait. That's all. Just wait. Rexy Sullivan sentence. Sullivan to get clear. Ain't too sentence to die in mud. Boy, I bet Rocky shows them mugs how to die. Sure he will. Remember what he said at the trial? He said he'd spit in their eye. Yeah, and he'll do it, too. Ha! <laughs> Rocky will laugh at those guys. Rexy Sullivan dies in mud. Rocky Sullivan dies next week. Rocky Sullivan dies tomorrow. Rexy Sullivan dies tonight. 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 Hey, Sullivan, that priest pal of yours is here. All right, get out. Listen, big shot, you got only five minutes, so don't stall around. Five minutes till that hot seat, and I'm going to tell the electrician to give it to you slow and easy. Get out of here. Somebody get this screw heel out of here. Get out of here. Hello, Rocky. Hiya, Jerry. What do you hear? What do you say? Uh, how do you feel? Oh, like a million. If it wasn't for just one screw around here that keeps putting the needles in me. Uh, how's Lori? Taking it kind of hard? Naturally. She loves you, Rocky. Yeah, poor kid. Never did get a decent break. I tried to give her one, but all I gave her was a heartache. You don't want me to administer extreme unction, Rocky? No, no, okay. We'll skip that. Well, then listen, Rocky, there isn't much time. I want to ask you a last favor. Hey, what's up? I can do, Jerry. Yes, sir. That's more than you could do under any other circumstances. Go ahead and spill it. If you have the courage for it, the kind I know you have. Oh, it ain't going to mean much to walk in there, that you mean. Oh, I know that, Rocky. It'd be like sitting down in a barber's chair. They're going to ask me if I got anything to stay, and I'll say, yeah, sure. A haircut, a shave, and a massage. <laughs> You're not afraid, Rocky? Yeah, they'd like me to be, wouldn't they? Uh, I wish I could oblige them, Jerry, but I can't. You gotta have a heart first to be scared, and I don't think I got one. I left that after me a little chunk at a time, and all the jails I've been in. But, Rocky, suppose I asked you to have the heart to be scared. What do you mean? Suppose at the last minute those guards had to drag you to the chair, screaming and begging for mercy. Suppose you turned yellow. Turned yellow? Say, what's got into you, Jerry? You were just worrying about me having courage. I know, Rocky, I did. But I mean a different kind of courage. The kind of courage that's born in heaven. I still don't know what you mean. Rocky, when I came up here, a crowd of boys saw me off the station. Soapy, Ben, Johnny, and all the rest of the kids. You know what they said to me when I left? They said, Father, tell Rocky to show him up there how to take it. Tell him to show the whole world the stuff a real guy has made of. Tell Rocky we're pulling for him and go out laughing. So what do you want? I, I ain't gonna let him down if that's what's bothering you. I want you to let him down, Rocky. You've been a hero to those kids and to a lot of other kids all over the country all through your life. Now you're gonna be a hero to them in death, too. That's what I want to prevent, Rocky. Just a minute, Jerry. You want me to pull an act? Turn yellow so, so those kids will think I'm no good? Yes. Yes. I want them to despise your memory, Rocky, and to remember you as a yellow coward rather than as a glorified hero. To be forever ashamed of you. You understand? Oh, you ain't asking much, Jerry. Oh, yes, I know what I'm asking, Rocky, but I thought maybe... Well, on account of being kids together, you, you might want to join hands with me in saving some of those boys from ending up. Oh, it's a great idea, a great idea, but you, you asked me to throw away the only thing I got left in the world. The only thing they haven't been able to take away from me. You want me to give them newspaper sob sisters out there a chance to tell the whole world another rat turned yellow. Well, you're asking a little too much. I won't do it, Jerry. You work it out those kids some other way. Oh, but I can't reach all the kids, Rocky. Thousands of hero-worshipping kids in a thousand slums in a thousand cities. Oh, don't give me that humanity stuff again, Jerry. I did enough of that in the courtroom. I opened up on everything. Name names, gave the low down on the whole dirty mess. Now, what more do you want? Oh, God knows I haven't the right to ask for anything more for myself, but... For... Well, don't. All right, Rock. You ready? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jerry, you, uh, you figuring on going in with me? You want me to, Rocky? Yeah, sure. It's gonna be kind of lonesome walking down that last mile. But, uh, look, kid... Do me a favor, will you? Just one. Don't let me hear you pray. 
Promise me that, Jerry. I promise. And, uh, you say goodbye to Lori for me? Yes. Come on, wise guy. Get away from me. Get your screw off me or I'll bust his face in. It'll be the last face you see, big shot. And it'll be laughing at you. Don't come near me in there, screw. I'll beat your brains out. All right. Step back, Edwards. You take his arm, Thompson. Atta boy, Rocky. Take your own company. So long, fellas. I'll be waiting for you all. Come on, Rocky. Come on, Rocky. Yeah. This is what they call the last mile, Jerry. But it's, uh, it's kind of a short one. Rocky, what I said before. No. Rocky, please. No, I tell you. No one will ever know, Rocky. No. Now, shut up. Stop here. Go ahead, Rocky. Rocky, please. Okay, Jerry. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, no. No, no, don't kill me. I don't want to die. Oh, please. Don't let me die. I can't. I can't. Oh, let me go. Please, please. I don't want to die. Don't kill me. Please don't burn me that girl. Don't burn me that girl. I don't want to die. Goodbye, Rocky. May God have mercy on you. Rocky dies yellow. Rocky dies yellow. Cowards, death. Say what this is. We're all about it. Rocky dies yellow. At the fatal stroke of 11 p.m., Rocky was led through the little green door of debt. No sooner had he entered the debt chamber than he tore himself from the guard's grasp and flung himself on the floor, screaming for mercy. As they dragged him to the electric chair... He clawed wildly at the concrete floor with agonized shrieks. A picture of of utter contempt. Rocky Sullivan died a coward's death. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I want rotten word of it. It's the same in the other papers, too, Sophie. They said it over the radio. I don't care what they said. He didn't die that way. Oh, not Rocky. Couldn't I tell you? It's a lot of lies. Hello, boys. He's Father Jerry. Hey. hey, let's ask him. He ought to know. He'll tell us what happened. Father Jerry, you were there. You saw it. What happened? Did Did Rocky die like like they say here in the paper, like a like a yellow rat? It's all true, boys. Every word of it. Then. He died like they said. Then, then what? He, he was a rat. <laughs> Boy, what a chump I was. I thought all the time. I thought... Sophie, I'm going to have choir practice tonight. I'll expect to see you all there, I hope. All of it. Yeah. Yeah, sure, Father. We'll be there. Okay, Father. Okay. Father Jerry... Yes, Lori. I know about Rocky. I knew you would. And now, let's say a prayer for a boy. A boy who couldn't run as fast as I could. Play has an epilogue, starring James Cagney, Pat O'Brien, and Gloria Dixon as themselves. And here they are. You know, Mr. DeMille, it was quite a shock to us to think that the Lux Radio Theater would do this play we've just finished. Shock? Well, if there's anything wrong with the play, don't you think you're a little bit late in bringing it up? Oh, don't get us wrong, C.B. There's nothing the matter with the play. It's just that, well, dirty faces on a Lux program? <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, we're not out of here yet, Jimmy. 
Wouldn't surprise me at all if Mr. DeMille suddenly produces one of his bathtubs and throws us all into it. <laughs> I'll overlook this feeble effort to twit me on my bathtub at Mr. O'Brien. After all, I must remember that we're temporarily neighbors now at Paramount. Yes, that's right, but I noticed that Paramount is courting Warner Brothers. At Warner's, I work with Jimmy and Angels with Dirty Faces, and I go to the other extreme and do a picture for them called The Devil on Wheels. Now Paramount wants me to disguise again a little number called Heaven on a Shoestring. They're all bent on keeping me off the face of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> now, wait a minute. We started off by talking about Lux Soap, and before we're completely sidetracked, there's something I really want to say to Mr. DeMille. It's just that I think that Lux Soap is about the grandest care under the sun for any girl who wants to keep her complexion looking its best. I use it, and that's what I think about it, Mr. DeMille. Coming from one so lovely, that, that's doubly appreciated, Gloria. But about this play we've done, it seems a long time since a play has brought home so forceful a moral in such dramatic fashion. What do you all think about it? Well, it seems that pictures really are beginning to educate instead of simply amuse. Maybe Angels with Dirty Faces help some kid somewhere to get the right kind of a start, and maybe it also help people to remember the really great and unselfish work that's going on without publicity, without fanfare, by men like the one called Father Jerry. Yes, and I was just thinking that it's rather a coincidence that we should have done this play on this particular night. It comes between two anniversaries, both commemorating men who set a kid's imagination on fire. Yesterday was the anniversary of Lindbergh's landing in Paris. Tomorrow is the anniversary of the death of Captain Kidd on a scaffold. Daring men, both of them, but one happened to be on the wrong side, like Rocky Sullivan. When boys learn there's just as much excitement in doing the right thing, that piece of furniture called the electric chair will soon go out of style. Good night, C.B. It's well coming back. So long, C.B. Bye, Mr. DeMille. Fly back to us soon again, Angel. A particularly important announcement about the play and stars coming to you next Monday will be given presently by Mr. DeMille. Heard in tonight's play were Frank Nelson as Frazier, Lou Merrill as Mac Keeper, Frankie Darrow as Sophie, Cy Kendall as a guard, Ross Forrester as Steve, James Eagles as Hunky, Frank Bielan as Crab, Joe Brown Jr. as Johnny, Harris Berger as Bim, Jackie Morrow as Red, and Forrest Taylor as Kennedy. Gloria Dixon appeared through courtesy of Warner Brothers Studio, where James Cagney has just completed Each Dawn I Die. Harris Berger is from Universal Studio, and Louis Silver is from 20th Century Fox Studio. He directed music there for young Mr. Lincoln. Be sure to listen to the new Lux daytime radio program, The Life and Love of Dr. Susan. The makers of Lux Toilet Soap bring you this enthralling story about the love and problems of a young, attractive woman doctor every afternoon, Monday through Friday. Look in your newspapers for the time and station. The Life and Love of Dr. Susan comes to you in addition to the Lux Radio Theater. Here's Mr. DeMille. It's an unusual program we bring you next Monday night, not only because of the importance of our stars, but because our play is one which has only just been released. It's our adaptation of the new Columbia Pictures Corporation film, Only Angels Have Wings, which incidentally has no connection with angels with dirty faces. They're different angels. The story is a highly dramatic romance, a thrilling adventure on land and in the air, played against a colorful South American background. And our stars playing the same roles they do in the picture are Cary Grant, Jean Arthur, Thomas Mitchell, Richard Barthelmus, and Rita Hayworth. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Jean Arthur and Cary Grant in Only Angels Have Wings with Thomas Mitchell, Richard Barthelmus, and Rita Hayworth. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products, presents Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve. 
Kraft brings you The Great Gildersleeve every week at this time, written by John Whedon and Sam Moore, with music by Claude Sweeten. We'll hear from The Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. First, a special message. This summer, four million emergency workers are urgently needed on American farms. You can help by devoting your spare time and energies to the task of cultivating and harvesting these vital crops. Plan now to be a Victory Farm volunteer. And now, here's good advice to everyone who's working extra hard these days. Help replenish some of that energy you use up each day by spreading delicious parquet margarine on bread, toast, rolls, and crackers. Parquet, you know, is one of the very best energy foods you can eat. And it's fortified by Kraft so that every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. So for delicious, satisfying flavor and for good nutrition, too, serve Parquet at every meal. Tomorrow, ask your dealer for Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, Parquet Margarine, made by Kraft. Now for the great Gildersleeve. A thing that's always puzzled Gildersleeve is how Bertie, working as she does in the back of the house, always knows what goes on out front. Yesterday morning, for instance, the family was sitting quietly at breakfast. Gildersleeve with his mind on his troubles, Marjorie with her mind on hers, Leroy with his mind on a cinnamon bun, when suddenly Bertie came charging in from the kitchen. I guess you can't well, don't scare me like that, Bertie. What is it? Yeah, what? Look there. Where? Across the street in front of the bullet. Well, I'll be. It's the undertaker's wagon. We don't usually call them wagons, Bertie. See, there's a man getting out of the driver's seat. By George, you don't suppose. I mean, I wonder if... I wonder who... I mean, I hope nobody... I want over and ask Leroy. Leroy, come back here. What's the matter? We don't ask about things like that. Now, sit down. Okay. Gosh. Man wants to find out something, the only way is to ask. Now, ain't that a shame? And the Bullets was given a party today, too. A party? Oh, here comes Judge Hooker. Maybe he knows something. It's a slim chance. He stopped to look. That man's opening up the back of the wagon. That's not a wagon, Bertie. I don't think we should all be standing here staring out the window. What's that he's taking out? <laughs> chairs. That's all it is. Oh. They've rented chairs for the party. Gee. Gold ones, too. I got to get over there and talk to Lily B. Doorbell. I'm coming. It's the judge. <laughs> Good morning, Judge. Come in. There seems to be quite a bit of activity across the street for you. Yes, and you was watching it. Mr. Gilsleeve is right there in the dining room. Good morning, Gildy. Marjorie, Leroy. Hi. Hi. What's going on? Going on where? Across the street. Is something going on? I hadn't noticed. Don't tell me you haven't seen Luther Peabody's hearse parked over there. I am not my neighbor's keeper, Judge. And I don't go running to the window every time a hearse drives up. <laughs> From the looks of things, however, I should say that the Bullards are planning some sort of social affair. Oh? Were you invited? Were you? No. Neither was I. It can't be much of a party. It's just for kids, isn't it, Marge? Don't ask me. Marshall Bullard's giving a dance for the kids in his class. Marge knows all about it. Oh? Is that so, my dear? You haven't said anything to me about it. I really couldn't say, Uncle Mort. The whole thing is a matter of the greatest indifference to me. Yeah, she just couldn't sleep last night, that's all. That is not true. Why don't you mind your own business? Now, children. She's just so because Marshall... I wouldn't go to his old party if he came crawling to me on bended knees. <laughs> You'd go so fast. And for you, I think you're a nosy, contemptible little boy. How do you like that? Well, we seem to have stirred up a hornet's nest. Nosy, contemptible... I'll punch her right in the nose. You're... You'll do nothing of the kind. You'll go upstairs to her and apologize. What? Go up and apologize to your sister. Apologize for what? Well, I don't know. But go up, <laughs> go up and see if you can't make her feel better. Make her feel better? How do you think I feel after what she called me? Go, Leroy. Okay. I may be contemptible, but nobody's going to call me nosy. I'll have to take that from anybody. Uh, I'm sorry, Horace. Oh, these little squabbles occur. Poor girl's upset, I'm afraid, and I don't blame her. Who do the Bullards think they are, anyway? I suppose my niece isn't good enough for them. Maybe they just forgot to invite her, Gildy. Maybe it was an oversight. Oversight, my eye. Bullard probably decided he didn't want his son seeing so much of her. Well, I don't want her seeing so much of him. Hereafter, let him keep away from here. Let him just keep off the property. Get out, Leroy! Get out! I'll tell you, you don't have to be rude about it! I didn't want to come in anyway, Aunt Maggie! Leroy! She threw me out! I didn't know! 
Come down here, my boy. I want to speak to you. And tell Marjorie to come on down, too. I'm supposed to come downstairs. Never mind why. He says if you don't come down right away, he'll come up here and get you. Oh, Leroy, I said nothing of the kind. Be right down, Uncle. Yes, yes. Judge, never have any children. I wasn't planning to. <laughs> They're a constant worry, particularly girls. You want me, Uncle? Well, I wanted Marjorie, really. I told her. Look, Leroy, try and be a little nice to your sister today. Yeah, I try and be nice to her. Well, she's upset. Let you and I see if we can't cheer her up. Ah, there you are, my dear. What are your eyes all red for? Shut up, Leroy. <laughs> Marjorie, I've been thinking. What would you like to do this evening? What do you think would be more fun than anything else? I don't know. Uh, well, think. Anything you'd like. Just name it. By golly, Gildy, that's going to be quite a party. Look what they're carting in now. Judge, would you do me a favor? What's that, Gildy? Go away. Well, I guess I can take a hint. No, Judge. I guess I know enough not to stay where I'm not wanted. It's not that horse, but right I now... I bid you good day. Oh, good day. Now oh, he's sore. No wonder you're never invited anywhere. Oh, <laughs> My dear, have you decided yet? What are we going to do for a good time this evening? I don't know. Anything at all. Anything you'd like. We'll show those bullards we can have a good time without them. What'll it be? I don't know. Don't just sit there and say you don't know. Think. I tell you, I don't care. I know something, Unc. It's Marjorie we're trying to cheer up, Leroy, not you. Oh, well, Marjorie would love this, Unc. She'd be crazy about it. Well, what is it? What do you say we all go out to Nipper Sink, to Schultz's Park? Y you mean go on the shoot the shoots? Sure. They got one out there that's a pip. Well, I don't know, Leroy. Marge, you'd love it, wouldn't you, Marge? I guess so. I don't care. You see, what did I tell you? Can we go on, huh? How about it? Can we go? We'll see. Yeah, did you hear that, Marge? I said we can go. Did I? Gosh, you you're the best uncle anybody ever had. What? I don't know any other kid in town whose uncle would take him to Schultz's Park. Yes. Their father, maybe, but not their uncle. All right, Leroy, we'll go. Hey, just for that uncle, I'm all the one. The front part. <laughs> Sit right where you are, Uncle. Don't, don't disturb yourself. I'll go. Gee, you this well. We're going to shoot the park, Marge. Hello, Leroy. Oh, hi, Mrs. Lassie. Come on in. Hey, Uncle Marge and me are going tonight. Oh, I'm terrible at guessing things, Leroy. Oh, good morning, Trot Martin. Ooh. <laughs> uh, hello, Leela. Uh, Marjorie, honey. Now, Marjorie's all right, aren't you, my dear? Yes, sir. We're all going out to Schultz's Park tonight and have the time of our lives, aren't we? Sure. Then you're not going to the Bullets party, Throckmorton? Are you? No, I... I decided not. Neither am I. As a matter of fact, I wasn't invited. Oh, well, I'm glad neither was I. <laughs> That's what I came over to talk to you about. I think it's a perfect outrage. I mean, I don't know them terribly well, but after all... I understand they're just giving the party for young people, Leela. Well, gracious. I may not be 14, but that doesn't mean... Now, I'm... don't get upset, Leela. Marjorie wasn't invited either. I was too invited. What's that? I said I was invited. I'm just not going. You didn't tell me you were invited. I give up. What's this all about? What are we doing going to Schultz's Park when you could be... Oh, she loves Schultz's Park. She'd rather go there than go to Marshall Buller's old party, wouldn't you, Marge? Leroy, if you please. Well, my dear? I wouldn't go to Marshall's party if it were the last party on earth. Why, Marjorie? Because when a girl you formerly thought was your friend turns out to be nothing but a... A wolf in sheep's clothing. She's talking about Francie. You keep out of this. A thousand pardons. Uh, well, who's Francie? My best friend. That is, she was my best friend. Francis White. That mousy little thing? <laughs> Do you really think she's mousy? Some of the boys seem to think she's kind of attractive. Oh, gracious, I don't know who'd look at her twice. Well, forget Francie. That's water over the dam. That's the end of a friendship, that's all. But Marshall, what about him? Well, I thought it was kind of funny when all I got was a regular invitation in the mail. What do you want to do, drive up in a gold limousine? Oh, will you keep out of this? 
Leroy, I think it might be just as well if you stepped outside. What do I do? You too, Throckmorton. Huh? Both of you. I think this is something we can talk over better if it's just between us girls. Well, I... Marjorie and I have some secret things to discuss. They're not for your ears. Now, run along. Please, Uncle Moore. All right, my dear. Come on, Leroy. Now, Ma... Wait a second. Shh. Now, I don't know what Marshall's done, Marjorie, but I can tell you this. You won't get anywhere by staying away from that dining. Well, what should I do? Go and make him suffer. Yeah. Come on, Martin, you're listening. Uh, <clears throat> get along, Leroy. Where are we going? Out on the porch. And by the way, my boy, while you're resting... I only said I'd mow the front, remember? <laughs> Nonsense. You've only mowed three strips. But it's hard. It wouldn't be if you'd mow the way I tell you. Now you bend down and throw your weight behind it. You show me. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> I'm going, Uncle Mark. I'm going after all. Going? Going where? To the dance. Mrs. Ransom told me just what to do. Leela. And I can hardly wait. Marjorie, I don't like that look in your eye. What did she tell you to do? Don't you tell him, Audrey. I won't. <laughs> What's come over my sourpuss? I'm going to the party after all. Yes, Leroy. Our little Cinderella is going to the ball. <laughs> I guess that means her poor old uncle will be spending the evening alone. Unless I can persuade the fairy godmother to keep me company. How about it, Leela? Oh, I'd love to. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What about me? You? What about Schultz's Park? <laughs> Schultz's Park. You promised, remember, Aunt? You promised. Well, it wasn't exactly a promise, Leroy. Not a promise. I already mowed half the lawn. Well, it was Marjorie that I promised anyway. Now Marjorie's going to the party instead. And besides, I... Now, don't you start crying. That's no fair. I practically kill myself mowing the lawn practically, and then you tell me... Well, gracious, I certainly don't want to be the cause of it. I thought... Hold on, everybody. Hold on. I know what we'll do. What? I don't know. (laughs) The Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. Six letters, P-A-R-K-A-Y, spell parquet, and three little words tell why your whole family will like it. They'll like it because it tastes so good. And that's plenty good enough for the millions of families who daily enjoy parquet. In fact, millions prefer parquet to any other brand because it tastes so good. Try it. Discover for yourself how good parquet tastes when you spread it on bread, toast, and rolls. See if you, too, don't prefer Parquet's fresh, delicate flavor to any other brand. And don't forget, there's wonderful nourishment in Parquet margarine, too. It's tops in food energy value, and Kraft fortifies every pound of Parquet with 9,000 units of important vitamin A. So buy this nourishing spread that tastes so good. Ask for Parquet margarine made by Kraft. It's preferred by millions to any other brand. Now, let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. We find him partaking of a cold supper in the company of his nephew, Leroy, since Bertie is off to help Lily be at the Bullards. Well, my boy, this is just like camping, isn't it? How would I know? I've never been camping. Oh, that's right. I guess you haven't. We'll have to go on a camping trip one of these days, just the two of us. Pass the ketchup, please, please. I suppose we'll go to Schultz's Park someday, too. Now, Leroy, a decision has been reached, and we'll stand by it, won't we? Ha! See here, young man. Well, look at Marjorie. Long dress. You'll be the belle of the Bullard Ball, my dear. Do I really look all right? Oh, beautiful. Doesn't your sister look nice, Leroy? Yeah. 
Gosh, you look grown up or something. Leroy, what a sweet thing to say. I don't suppose you meant it. Yeah, something looks different. It's my hair. This is the way Greer Garson wears hers. Do you think it's too early for me to go over? Oh, I don't suppose so. Francie's father dumped her over there about five minutes ago. Francie, I've got to get over there right away. You don't have to worry with Greer Garson's hair. Goodbye, Auntie. Goodbye, Leroy. <laughs> Goodbye. Have a good time. So long. Well, my boy, you'll be going to parties like that pretty soon. I have to send you to dancing school one of these days. Oh, me? Marge must have forgot something. But you sit there and finish your beats. I'll go. Oh, hello. I want Leroy to play with me. Oh, for corn's sake, Craig Bullard. <laughs> <laughs> well, come in, Craig. Uh, lots of excitement over at your house today, isn't there? I want Leroy to play with me. Yeah, I heard you. <laughs> Is it true you're going to have an orchestra over there, Craig? Hi, Leroy. Hi. Why, George, if he was my kid. I... I've got five dollars, Leroy. What was that? I've got five dollars. Well, well, where'd you get five dollars, my boy? He's kidding. He's always claiming he's got a lot of money. I've got five dollars. See? Well, what do you know? Didn't swipe it, did you? I didn't have to. They gave it to me. Oh? Who gave it to you? My mother gave me two dollars, my father gave me two dollars, and my brother gave me one dollar. He stinks. <laughs> now, Craig, that's not a nice thing to say about Marshall, is it? He's my brother. Yeah, I guess he's got me there. <laughs> hey, uh, how'd they happen to give you all this stuff, Craigie? They gave it to me for staying away from the party. They thought I wanted to go. Hey, I guess that's fair. Everybody's getting something out of this party but me. Craig, Marjorie, Bertie, everybody but me. Can't we go to the amusement park, please? I told you, Leroy, some other time. Can Leroy and I go to the park? No, Craig. I've got five dollars. Leroy hasn't. <laughs> I think Craig was offering to take me, Unc. <laughs> Weren't you, Craigie? Nope. <laughs> this is not a financial question, Leroy. I don't want you going to the park without me. Oh. Well, gosh, I don't see why everybody should get a reward but me. I'm not made of money, and I'll not have you squandering it. Oh, squandering it. I'll spend it on something worthwhile. I know. I only need around two dollars to fill my war stamp book. Dollar sixty, I think. Well, uh, we'll discuss it some other time, my boy. Now, you and Craig think of some nice way to play. Okay. Say, uh, Craigie, you know that magic trick you like? Which one? Where the penny goes into the matchbox. Come on upstairs. I'll show you how to do it. Okay. Come on, Craig. I think you'll like this trick. Okay. Wait a minute. Mr. Gildersleeve, would you hold my five dollars while I'm up there? Oh, of course not! <laughs> Simply don't understand why there's never any hot water in this house when I want to shave. Well, I guess Marjorie must have taken a pretty long bath. What the... Can't be Leela. Leroy! Oh, Leroy! Leroy! Darn kid never hears when you want him to. All right, all right. Good evening, Mr. Gillespie. Phoebe! I must apologize for disturbing you. You were shaving, I see. What? Lather on your ear. Oh? I say I must apologize for disturbing you. Not at all. Come in, Phoebe. Oh, I can't stay. The fact is, I... Is that for me, Uncle? No! Why didn't you answer it? I didn't think it was for me! Well, if you think... <laughs> what were you saying, Phoebe? Well, I just delivered some ice cream across the street, and now I can't get my car started. Oh? Out of gas? No, it seems to be in the battery. I just thought if I could use your phone... Well, I... let me try pushing you first, Phoebe. Oh, no, I see you're all dressed up. <laughs> Must be a woman in a template. Well, maybe there is, and <laughs> maybe there isn't. That's what I say. <laughs> Come on, Phoebe, where's your car? Right out front here. Well, let's go, huh? How are things over at the Bullards, anyway, Phoebe? Sounds like quite an exclusive affair. Oh, no, I wouldn't say that. There's all kinds over there, including riffraff. Oh? You don't say. Who, for instance? Well, I've got to be discreet, Mr. Gildersleeve. Some of my best customers are riffraff. 
Yeah, I'll have to hand it to you, Peavy. You're pretty cagey. Oh, you know, you know, yes, you are. <laughs> uh, is this your jalopy? This is my shining chariot, yep. Yeah. All right, get in your shining chariot and turn on the ignition. I'll shove. Well, Mr. Gildersleeve, I, I don't know how to thank you. Don't thank me till she starts, Peavy. I'm afraid that'll be too late. When this car starts, she starts. <laughs> well, never mind. Just get in and steer. All right. Ignition on? Yes, sir. Put her in neutral till I get her rolling, then put her in the high. Okay. <laughs> Leroy, you go to bed. I can't. I've got a guest. Well, send him home. Okay. Go home, Craig. <laughs> Darn kid, he hasn't got the manners of a tomcat. <laughs> Here we go. Have you got her in gear? I think so. Well, for heaven's sake. Uh, you uh, comfy, Leela? Mm, it's nice out here. Only I feel kind of sad, Throckmorton. Sad? Why should you feel sad on a nice night like this? Oh, looking across at the boys and girls circling around over there and laughing and flirting. I declare it just seems ages since I've been to a party. But, Leela, what's the best part of a party? Isn't it sneaking out with somebody and looking for a hammock? Well... Well, we got the hammock. <laughs> it's not the same, Throckmorton. We haven't had the fun of sneaking off. Oh. Well, all right. Let's pretend, then. You pretend you're Lady Whatchamacallit, and I'm Lord So-and-So. And we have a rendezvous. Now, you're here waiting. I don't like that idea. You should be waiting for me if you're any kind of a gentleman. You, I'm a Lord, Leela. Oh. Well, okay. I'm waiting for you. I'm pacing up and down, then, anxiously awaiting my lady fair. <laughs> oh, this is fun. Well, hurry up. I can't pace all night. I got flat feet. <laughs> Silly. Ah, but hark! Methinks I hear the footsteps of my love approaching. Tis she. Leela, my darling. Throckmorton. <laughs> Come here, Leela. Now, Throckmorton. <laughs> hey, Uncle, that you? Yes. <laughs> Leroy, what are you doing out of bed? I can't sleep on account of the music. It's nonsense. Music will put you to sleep in no time if you'll just let it. I did, and then it stopped and woke me up. Go back to, <laughs> go back to bed, Leroy, and go to sleep. Okay. Oh, hello, Mrs. Ransom. I didn't see you. Hello, Leroy. Well, good night. Good night. Good night, Leroy. Now, where were we? Oh, yes. <laughs> no, Throckmorton. Got to start all over. Uh... Would you like me to tell you a story, Leela? Hmm. All right. Uh, what kind of a story? A true story. True story. Uh-huh. Okay, let me see. Uh, once upon a time, there was a handsome water commissioner. I said a true story. <laughs> well, uh, once upon a time, there was a water commissioner. And one day, he met a beautiful lady named Leela. That's more like it. She was the most beautiful lady he'd ever seen. She had blue eyes mm -hmm. and lovely silken blonde hair mm -hmm. and a beautiful, smooth, white complexion. Mm -hmm. And when the water commissioner saw this beautiful creature, he forgot everything. He just took her in his arms. Drop, <laughs> Leela, please. Stay on. <laughs> Leroy, I told you to go to sleep. I can't. There's a fly in my room. <laughs> Well, kill him. I tried, but he's too quick. And put your head under the covers. I'm afraid I'd smother. I'll sm Wait a minute, Leroy. I think I know what's the matter here. Come over here for a moment, young man. I'm sorry, Unc. I just can't seem to get to sleep. If I gave you two dollars, do you think you'd be able to doze off, Leroy? I sure try, Unc. Here. Gee, thanks. I'm not going to spend this money, you know. Yeah, I know. Now, go to bed. I'm going to use it to fill up my war stamp book. 
Then pretty soon I can get a bond. And you know, a bond by 750 machine gun bullets. That's fine, Leroy. Or a bond will buy gas to fly a B-29 15 minutes. Or it'll buy two tires for a Jeep. Yeah. Or it'll buy... I know, Leroy. Now go to bed before I take back the $2. Okay. Good night, Uncle. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Ransom. Good night. You know, Throckmorton, I don't like the way that boy said good night to me. Huh? He sounds as if he thought something was going on. Oh, no. <laughs> Leroy is just a child, Leela. Besides, there's nothing going on. <laughs> that little devil. <laughs> oh. oh, I just love that song. Yeah, so do I. Good night, sweetheart. Sleep will banish sorrow, tears and party may make us forlorn, but with the dawn, a new day is born, so I'll say good night, sweetheart, though I'm not beside you. Good night, sweetheart. Still my love will guide you. Dreams enfold you. Leela. Sitting in a hammock on a nice night in June with a pretty girl is easy to forget there's a war on. But the Japanese are a long way from being licked. I suppose you've all seen the pictures of the Saratoga, and you know what a terrible pasting she took from those Jap suicide bombers. We've got to realize that the Japs are going to fight more and more desperately as we close in on them. That's why our men need every advantage in material and equipment that we can possibly give them. That means bonds. Let's see that no American is left fighting with his bare hands because we didn't dig down in our pockets for the money to buy guns. It's not a question of how much we think we can spare, but how much they need. Nimitz and Marshall say $14 billion. Let's give it to them. Good night, everybody. on this program was directed by Claude Sweeten. This is Vern Smith speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Kraft invites you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. When some foods get scarce, do our American homemakers take it sitting down? No, ma'am. That's when many resourceful women are right on their toes, reaching into the pantry shelf for some tangy, golden Kraft salad mustard. Why, there are dozens of appetite-rousing ways you can serve Kraft salad mustard with whatever foods are available. Kraft salad mustard blends with luscious smoothness into keen-tasting cream sauces for hot-cooked vegetables, adds delicious flavor to cheese fondues and Welsh rabbits, Puts an extra tempting tang into French salad dressings, gravies, pickle relishes, and barbecue sauce. So perk up your meals with the zestful flavor of Kraft salad mustard. Get this other delicious variety, too. Kraft mustard with nippy horseradish added. Buy both kinds and please the whole family. Ask for Kraft prepared mustards. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. <laughs> it's The Great Gildersleeve starring Harold Perry in a new season of Fun for Everyone. Brought to you by Kraft. Makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. No, Leroy. No, no, no. For the thousand and one time, no. Do you get it? No. What did he say, Leroy? He said no. Where is he? Out on the front porch on the swing. What's he doing? What do you think he's doing? Just lying there. Let me try him. You stay here. Well, it looks as if they were closing in on Uncle Throckmorton. But before they corner him, here's a special message from Kraft. Get a picture of this. A steaming hot dinner roll, fresh out of the oven, with its fragrant aroma tempting your appetite. But wait a moment. The picture isn't complete. Not until that roll is covered with a delicious spread, slowly melting into each fluffy morsel. And that's the spot for smooth, delicate-tasting parquet margarine. Parquet's fresh, light, taste-tempting flavor has made it the favorite spread in millions of American homes. It's smacking good on hot rolls, toast, bread, pancakes, and waffles. And if you haven't tried Parquet, believe me, you have a taste treat waiting for you. Get a package of delicious, economical Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, Parquet margarine at your food store tomorrow. Just taste it, and you'll know it's good. Because parquet margarine is made by Kraft. Now let's return to the great Gildersleeve, where we left him taking his ease on his front porch, stretched out comfortably in the swing. Hmm. Got to oil this thing. It squeaks... Unky, darling. Yes, my dear? Unky, mind if I sit down? Go right ahead. Oh, don't move. I don't want to disturb you. Sit down, sit down. There's plenty of room. Just move my feet. Well. <laughs> yeah, I know. I got to oil it. Unky, darling. Yes, my dear? Would you like this pillow under your head? I had it under my head. It's too hot. Oh. Would you like me to swing you a little? Mm, that would be nice. Unky. Yes? You're sure I'm not crowding you? Oh, for corn's sake, ask him. Y ask him what? What's he talking about? Come out here, Leroy. You want me, Unc? Leroy, you dope. What did I do? I was just getting around to it. Now listen to me, both of you. There's no use getting around to anything, because you're not going to get around me. Do you know what he's talking about, Marge? I know what you're up to. Uncle Mort, really, I don't know what you're thinking, but all... Never I... mind. Now listen to your uncle. Listen to your uncle. You too. I'm listening. I've explained to you, children, this is my vacation. And I've told you both nine million times we are not going to Grass Lake. Oh, Uncle, oh. uncle Mort, you don't understand. I understand perfectly. What don't I understand? The Bullards are going. They're going this afternoon. The Bullards are nothing but social climbers, if you want my opinion. And you may tell them I said so. Uh, no, don't do that. I don't see what the Bullards have got to do with it anyway. Ye gods, you practically lived at the Bullards all summer. It wouldn't hurt you to see a little less of them, particularly that Marshall. Very well, if that's the way you feel about it. But it might interest you to know that it wouldn't surprise me if I married Marshall one of these days. I'll bet it would surprise Marshall. Oh, shut up! Leroy, you talk much too much. Hand me that newspaper. I'm sorry if I said anything about Marshall. Marshall's all right, in his way. That kid brother of his. Phew, that Craig. Unc. Yes? Uh, never mind. What is it? I was going to ask you something, but if I asked you, you'd say no, so I guess I won't ask. If it has anything to do with Grass Lake, your assumption is correct. Gee, I haven't been swimming all summer, hardly. Some boys get to go swimming all the time. Yes, yes. Last time I was in swimming was the 4th of July. Yep, 4th of July. That was the last time. 
The last one I had, 4th of July. Some vacation, no swimming. All I do is hang around the house. I've probably forgotten how to swim. Don't blame me if I fall out of a boat someday and drown. Then stay out of boats. Go away, Leroy. Go find something to do. What? Don't ask me. That's just the trouble. There's nothing to do around here. Don't tell me that. Why, I could be busy every minute if I wanted to. I just don't want to. Don't give me that look, Leroy. Huh? Don't sit there looking like a sick spaniel. Go do something, or I'll find something for you to do. Okay, okay. Ye gods, I'll be glad when school starts again. Man works hard all year. He's entitled to a little relaxation. Instead of running around all over the country. Brass Lake. I'd like to see anybody get me off this porch. I'd like to see anybody get me out of this swing. Bertie, on the porch. I brought you something, Mr. Gilfrey. A pitcher of nice cold lemonade. Well, that's mighty thoughtful of you, Bertie. Yes, sir. I said to myself, it's such a hot day, I said. I bet Mr. Gilfrey would like something cold to drink in case he gets thirsty. Well, you were right, Bertie. Set it right down here on the porch where I can reach down and grab it. Oh, my goodness. I forgot to bring you a glass. I'll go get you one. Who wants a glass? Here. I'll drink it out of the pitcher. Oh, Mr. Gilsey, that's no way. <laughs> My goodness, look at that man drink. <laughs> ah, boy, that hits the spot. I think I'll hit it again. <laughs> oh, Mr. Gilsey, suppose somebody was to come along now and see you. <laughs> ah. Let me go get you a glass. Folks will think we don't live right. Now, that's nonsense, Bertie. The best people drink out of pitchers. Tastes better that way. Do you mean to tell me you've never drunk well water out of a bucket? Old oaken bucket? No, sir. All cool and dripping right out of the well? No, sir, I haven't. Neither have I, but I've always wanted to. <laughs> yeah. I heard about a lady once she drank well water and it had polywogs in it. Oh, go on. It's a fact. She was sitting up one night playing dominoes and all of a sudden they heard a croak. They had to rush her to the hospital and operate. Bertie. They took a frog out of her that big. Bertie, that whole story is nothing but plain superstition. Maybe so, but it's a fact. Did you know the lady this happened to? No, sir, but I knew a carpenter that put a new roof on the house she lived in. That was some years after she moved out. Oh, I see. And do you know they told him that to look at that woman, you never would have guessed that she once had a frog inside of her. So my advice is... Stick the lemonade. Yeah, I'll do that, Bertie. Thanks for the advice, and thanks for the lemonade. Yeah, I'll finish it later. Uh, uh, M- Mr. Gillespie? Yes, Bertie? Mr. Gillespie, I've been thinking. Pretty hot weather for that, isn't it, Bertie? Yes, sir, that's what I was thinking. It's so hot and all, and here it is, Labor Day weekend, last weekend of your vacation. Yeah, don't remind me. We ain't had no vacation at all, hardly. Oh, I don't know. You ain't. You really ain't. And you worked so hard all year. Yes. Yeah, that's true, Bertie. Yeah, it's quite true. Just lying here on the swing all the time. That ain't no kind of vacation. But I like lying here. I find it restful. I know, but that's no These are strenuous times, you know, Bertie. A man has to husband his strength. Big things ahead. Big problems. Reconversion and all that. Wears you out just to think about them. (laughs) Then you hadn't ought to think about them. You know, maybe if you was to get out of town, maybe if you used to go to some nice place for the weekend. You know, some nice place like Grass Lake, maybe. Birdie, who sent you out here with that lemonade? Who sent who out where? With what lemonade? You get out of here, Birdie, and you take that lemonade with you. <laughs> hey, no, wait a minute. Yes? I might have one last sip. <laughs> You'll have a sip, he says. There. Take it away now. Take it back to Marjorie. And you tell her for me, Bertie, I'm not stirring off this porch. Yes, sir. And I'm not either. No, by George. I'm not. Well, if it is... Hey, Peavy. Oh, hello, Mr. Gillespie. Is it hot enough for you? (laughs) <laughs> I'm just about to ask you the same thing. Well, what's your hurry? Come on up on the porch. 
Well, I can't really stop, Mr. Gildersleeve. I guess to be getting down and open up the shop. I'm pretty late as it is. That's nonsense. Come on up and be sociable. Well, yeah. lying on the swing, I see. Yeah, just taking it easy, Peavy. Uh, uh, the only way to enjoy life, especially on holidays. Ah, I wouldn't say that. Mrs. Peavy and I planned a little jaunt for the weekend. Mistake? That is, Mrs. Peavy planned it. I'm going along. Driving out to visit a cousin. Cousin Clara. That is, she's a cousin of Mrs. Peavy's. No relation of mine. Sounds like a whale of a time. Well, I wouldn't say that exactly. As a matter of fact, if I knew any way to get out of it... Peavy, I... any man who takes his car out on the road this weekend is a darn fool. I'm trying to say. Well, I may do it, and I may not. I don't know. I'll never forget the day the war ended. Why? What's the war got to do with it? Well, when I heard the news, it came right in the middle of supper. Uh, Miss Peavy cooked me some rhubarb that evening. I'm very fond of rhubarb. Stewed rhubarb. I got the Studebaker down off the blocks, and I backed her out into Elm Street. Oh? Uh-huh. Well, what happened? Well, the light turned green, and my goodness, those drivers. I ran her right back up to drive and put her back on the blocks again. I, I never saw anything like it. <laughs> so, as I say, we may be driving out to Cousin Clara's, and we may not. What are your plans for the holiday, Mr. Gildersleeve? My plans, Peavy, are to spend Labor Day right here in my own front yard, on my own front porch, and not stir off it. A very wise decision. Of course, you haven't my problem. Though I shouldn't refer to her as a problem. Mrs. Peavy and I usually see more or less eye to eye on things. More or less. Oh, who's the little fellow coming up to walk there? Huh? What? Oh. That Bullard kid. Oh, cunning little tyke, isn't he? Mm-hmm. Cunning like a fox. Oh. Hello, Craig. Can Leroy play? I guess so. This is Mr. Peavy, Craig. You know Mr. Peavy. I want Leroy to play with me. <laughs> well, Leroy's upstairs, I think. You can go up to his room and see if you want. I want him to come out and play. <laughs> He'll have to take that up with Leroy. He's upstairs. Mr. Peavy and I are trying to talk now, Craig, so... Tell Leroy to come down. <laughs> Look, Craig, you little so-and-so. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, he's only a child. Well, he started it. Uh, perhaps you don't understand, Craig. Mr. Gildersleeve and I are trying to talk about something important, so... Uh... Why don't you just run along and... I want Leroy to play with me. Yes, I know, but Mr. Gildersleeve's already told you that Leroy's upstairs. So if you'll just go I on... want him to come down. Listen, little boy, I don't care what you want. You go on about your business. <laughs> if you'll excuse me, Mr. Gildersleeve, I think I'll be going on about mine. Yeah, I don't blame you, Peavy. <laughs> I'll leave you with your little friend. I hope you have a nice holiday, you two. Yes, you coward. Well, what are you looking at? Well, don't just stand there and stare. Kid gives me the willies. Well, say something. I want Leroy to play with me. All right. Oh, Leroy. Yeah, what do you want? Uh, hurry down here, my boy. Company. <laughs> Dirty trick. But now maybe I can get a little peace and quiet. Uncle Mort, guess what? <laughs> Marjorie, never frighten a man like that. I'm sorry, Uncle. I didn't know you were asleep. Oh, Uncle, guess where I've been? You seem out of breath. I've been over at the Bullards. No. And guess what? They've asked me to go to Grass Lake with them. Well, how'd you work that? They're leaving this afternoon. And guess how long they're staying? Till Monday night. Can I go? Is well, it all right? Uh, Please say I can go. Please yeah. be a nice uncle and say I can. Well, I... They've got it all arranged about the rooms at the hotel, I mean. Marshall's going to sleep with somebody. And Mr. Bullard's going to sleep with somebody else. Well, well I... I don't know. But Mrs. Bullard and I are going to share a room together. They've got it all arranged. Can I go? Please. Well, I don't see why not. Certainly. I think that'd be fine. Oh, Uncle, you're so wonderful. That takes care of her. Oh, I could love you to death. <laughs> no, no, no. Marjorie, do you want to break? the swing? <laughs> What's going over her? Uh, nothing, Leroy, nothing. Get up, my dear. And let's keep this quiet. I won't say a word. Say a word about what? Oh, nothing. Where's Craig? I thought you were playing with Craig, Leroy. He's upstairs. What's he doing? Hiding. But you're not looking for him. Nope. Leroy? <laughs> All right, George, I've got to hand it to you. Why didn't I think of that? Listen, I asked the question. What's going on here? What's she feeling so good about? Well, I'm not feeling good, particularly. I mean, why shouldn't I feel good? After all, it's natural, isn't it, to feel good? Oh, 
here comes Judge Hooker. Hello, Judge. Good morning, Marjorie. Leroy, Gildy. Well, this is a glorious day, isn't it? Glorious. Glorious beginning for a glorious weekend. Gildy, what are your plans? My plans? Never mind what they are, because they've just been changed. My plans, Judge, are to spend the weekend right here where I am. Why, you old stick in the mud. You can't stay here on Labor Day. Now, listen, I got an idea. It's wonderful. Why don't we all drive out to Grass Lake? Yeah, oh, hang the golf tournament out there, and we can post the golf, golf, golf it. What's this about Grass Lake? Why has everybody got to go to Grass Lake? Well, Labor Day weekend, Gildy. You always go somewhere Labor Day weekend. Why go to Grass Lake? Where else is it to go? Well? It's a golf tournament, Gildy. Open to everybody. I've given up golf. Haven't played it in a year. Not that I couldn't beat you, you old goat. Prove it. Yeah. I don't need to. Come on, Unc. Show them. I'm betting on you. It's much too late. Everybody in town is going to Grass Lake. We couldn't get reservations. I phoned this morning. Uh, they had one double room left, and I reserved it. Just on the chance. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's the problem of the children. Oh, you don't need to worry about me. I'm already going with the Bullards. What? Hey, that's a big jip. She gets to go and I don't. That's no fair. She always gets to go everywhere and I don't get to do anything. That's a jip. Be quiet. I don't care. It's a jip. Please come, Uncle Mort. It'd be such fun if we were all there. Big jip. Come on, Gildy. Now, don't be a wet blanket. We'll find a place for Leroy. I can sleep in my Boy Scout sleeping bag. We'll have more fun than a barrel of monkeys. Mr. Gilsey, I heard what the judge said and I think you ought to go. Yeah, oh, come on, Gildy. For the love of my wife. Quiet! <laughs> Listen, all of you, let me make myself perfectly clear. I have not the slightest intention of going to Grass Lake now or ever. Do you understand? We are not going to Grass Lake. And that's final. So, we went to Grass Lake. But that's another story. And before we get into it, here's something of importance from our craft representative. Mr. Lang? Yes? You're just the man I want to see. Why can't I always buy parquet margarine when I go to the store? The war is over, isn't it? Well, sure, everyone knows the war is over. But everyone doesn't know that our American food is still helping to feed a good part of the world. That accounts for temporary shortages of parquet and food stores. And today, lots more people, you know, are buying parquet margarine because it tastes so good when you spread it on bread, hot toast, and rolls. I guess everyone in my family will agree to that. They think parquet is tops for flavor. And do they know what a wonderful aid parquet margarine is to good nutrition? Nutrition? You mean, uh, like food energy? Yes, of course. Parquet margarine is one of the richest energy foods you can serve. And it's also a dependable source of important vitamin A the whole year round. It's so economical, too. Right you are. And the good news is that more and more parquet margarine is becoming available in food stores throughout the country. So look for and buy this delicious spread with the fine, fresh flavor. Ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Now let's return to the Great Gildersleeve. Well, as I say, we drove out to Grass Lake, Leroy and the judge and I. It's a four-hour drive. We made it in eight. You know, Labor Day weekend. Come on, Gildy. They're honking at you. I can hear them. The thing is stalled. Step on the starter. What do you think I'm stepping on? Oh, shut up! Is the ignition on? Of course it's on. Well, then you flooded it. Hey, I'm Man. Not now, Leroy. I'm hungry. Try it again. Hey, come on. Listen, you want to make something out of it? Just get the car going, Gildy. Get the car going. That's easy enough to say. Well, if you hadn't flooded it like a fool. Well, like... I suppose you could drive it better. Well, I certainly hope so. Very well, Horace. You know so much, you take the wheel. Go ahead. I wash my hands of it. Where are you going, huh? Around to the other side. Hey, you The good humor, man. Oh, nuts. All set? Go ahead. I'd just like to see you. <laughs> just as I thought. The ignition wasn't on. Who turned it off? I never touched it. I was back here all the time. Well, go ahead, Judge. If you're going to drive, drive. Well, we started off. I'd like to say at this point that the judge is without doubt one of the worst drivers in the whole of North America. Every time we came to a curb... Oh, stop the car! Stop the car! Boy, that was close. 
Look, Horace, either I drive this car or I get out and walk. Have it your own way, Gilda. Have it your own way. Shove over. Get off of my foot. Well, if you'd get out and walk around instead of making me crawl over you. Hey, Unc. What? There's a man. He's selling popcorn. That's nice. All right, all right. That's right. Strip the gear. They're my gear. Hey! Watch it, Gildy, watch it. Listen, who's driving this car? Yes, me, nobody. Oh. Yes, it was a lovely trip. We started before lunch, and we got there too late for supper. It was after dark, and you couldn't see a thing. But there we were at beautiful Grass Lake. File out, Leroy. Leroy, wake up back there. Huh? What? We're there. Hooray! Judge, you take the grips and I'll get the golf bag. No, Gilly, I'll tell you. Why don't you take the grips and I'll take the golf bag? Judge, do we have to make a whole great big thing out of this? No, Gilly, of course not. Then don't be an old woman. Let's get this darn trunk open. Your uncle is evidently a little short-tempered, Leroy, as a result of his long trip. Leroy, you take your sleeping bag. What's happened? I don't suppose they have a bellhop in this broken-down hotel. Well, as a matter of fact, Gildy, we're not staying at the hotel. Oh, what? No, we're staying at Honeymoon Cottage. Judge, you didn't tell me this. Well, it's perfectly all right, Gildy. It's owned by the hotel. Hotel was filled up, but it's right next door. Honeymoon Cottage, huh? All right, come on. <laughs> Honeymoon Cottage. What memories it holds for me. In that room, that dear little room where we spent the night. They called it a double because it had a double bed. That's all it had. Holy smokes, is this where we sleep? Quaint, isn't it? You didn't mention the double bed, Judge. You didn't tell me about that. Well, I'll tell you, Gildy, Labor Day... You old goat, you knew about this all the time. Do you expect the two of us to sleep in that thing? Unless you want to sleep on the floor. <laughs> Leroy is the lucky one. He brought a sleeping bag. Uh, Leroy, how would it be? Oh, no, you don't. This sleeping bag is mine. I got it for my birthday, and I'm sleeping in it. I'm going to take it out on the lawn and sleep there. Oh, no, you're not. Why not? Because guests will be walking on you. You're going to sleep right in here with us. Oh, corn. What's the use of having a sleeping bag? I'll tell you, Leroy. There seems to be a little balcony outside the window here. You could spread your sleeping bag out there. Hey, not bad. Somebody at the door, Gildy. Yeah, I'll go. Can Leroy play? What? You here? I want Leroy to play with me. Well, he can't. It's past his bedtime and it's way past yours. Now get... Uh, go back to your room. Ye gods. That was the little Bullard boy, wasn't it? Yes, it was, Judge. We drive all the way up here, 125 miles, and what do we get? Can Leroy play? I give up. Let's go to bed. <laughs> Go to bed. Ha! To bed, but not to sleep. Ever try to sleep with an old goat like Judge Hooker? All knees and elbows. And his feet, cold, like two dead flounders. Kept telling him to get them off of me. Get them off of me, Hooker. What's that? What's that? Shove over. You're hogging the bed. How can I be hogging it? I'm falling out. Well, somebody's hogging it. I'm a little quiet in there. How can anybody sleep? Pipe down, Leroy. Pipe down. Well, I turned my pillow over and I tried again. The judge didn't have any trouble, though. He was asleep in no time. Oh, fine. I lay there and listened to that for a couple of hours. And then, finally, I began to doze off. I began to dream. Oh! Oh, shut up! I want Leroy to play with me. 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 Oh, shut up! Gildy, what's the matter? Oh, shut up! Gildy! Oh, be quiet, Judge. You want to wake the whole hotel? What's going on in there? And nothing, Leroy, nothing. Go to sleep. The judge just had a bad dream, that's all. <laughs> Turn over, Horace. Try sleeping on your little tummy. Yes, 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 yes. And try to keep your knee out of my face. Yes, yes. Then it began all over again long struggle to get back to sleep. I tried to think of pleasant things. I tried to think of my bed at home. No good. Tried to think of Leela. 
tried to think of the way she looked. Somehow, I couldn't quite remember. Then suddenly, suddenly I met someone that I'd never met before. And oh, she was beautiful. She was awfully beautiful. Funny. Neither of us said a word. I guess because no words were needed. It seemed as if we'd known each other all our lives. I just took her hand and she took mine. And we walked together down to the shore of the lake where the moon was shining. And there I took her in my arms. Gildy, let go, let go. Eve, what you for? You're strangling me. Oh. Eve. Sorry, Judge, sorry. Say, for corn's sake, what's going on in there? Uh, nothing, Leroy. Go back to sleep. Fat chance. Fat chance. There was no more sleep that night. 5.30, daylight began to ooze in under the shades. I couldn't stand it. I got up quietly and began to dress. Now what, Unc? Shh. Don't wake up the judge, Leroy. Get your things on. We're getting out of here. We're going back to town. What? Don't start a fuss. I'll make it up to you some way, my boy. I'll make it up to you. Okay. Shh. Some night, hey, Unc? Yeah, some night, Leroy. We got dressed and packed our things as quietly as we could. Then we tiptoed to the door and opened it. Have we got everything? What about the judge? How will he get back to town? Oh, he'll get back. He has friends. Look at him lying there. I hate a man who sleeps with his mouth open. Close his mouth. Close the door, Leroy. Softly. Softly. Wait a minute, Gildy. I'm coming with you. Oh! <laughs> Why, the old goat. So it was back to town, back to good old Summerfield. Yeah, there were traffic jams five miles long. But we didn't care, did we, Leroy? Nah, they were all going the other way, the dope. Yeah, that's right. We made wonderful time, and before we knew it, there we were, home sweet home. Uh, uh, and that, my dear is why you never saw hide nor hair of us at Grass Lake. But, Uncle Mort, I don't understand. Leroy never once got a chance to go in swimming? Yeah, but Sunday I had a banana split and a strawberry soda and a cherry phosphate. And today I had a battleship Sunday and two root beer floats. Mm-hmm, and that cake, Leroy. Yeah. Yeah, I think Leroy and I have reached an understanding. That's why he's always going to do as I tell him hereafter. Aren't you, Leroy? That's right, Uncle. And never beg to go places or be allowed to do things when I don't want him to. That's right. And always do the chores that have been assigned to him without being told. And pick up my things and always keep my room neat. Mm Mm-hmm. This is too good to last. You better tune in next week, folks. Leroy, are you feeling all right? I don't know, Uncle. I'm not sure. Good night, everybody. Leroy, you come with me. The Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekin. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. special. We mean that very special kind of cheese food women are finding so useful in meal planning. It's Pabstet, the delicious cheddar cheese food that melts, slices, toasts, and spreads to perfection. There are a hundred tempting uses for Pabstet, and there are two delicious varieties, Golden Pabstet and Pimento Pabstet. Buy both kinds for a variety of main dish and luncheon time treats. Be sure to add Pabstet cheddar cheese food to your shopping list tomorrow. This is the National Broadcasting Company.